This is Not Alone, Hidden Wonder, written by Craig A. Falconer, narrated by James Patrick Cronin. Part 1. The Vault Wisdom Begins in Wonder. Socrates Saturday G-99, Fraser Steading, Thurso, Scotland the Scottish air was still and peaceful. Given all that had happened at Colin Fraser's coastal farm over the past two weeks, this in itself was very noticeable to the two drilling operators who had remained stationed on site throughout and often with no one else for miles around. But as their new colleague from Timo Fiori's space station got ready to pilot a drone carrying rover into the alien vault beneath their feet, Neither of the men were under any illusions that the peace would last for long. G-98, Emergency Medical Ward, Space Station, Il Cercatore. A day after Piper McCarthy risked her life for the greater good, and just minutes after she regained consciousness, she sat upright in a hospital bed with her parents by her side. The doctors employed on Timo Fiori's space station were the best of the best. Throughout the previous night, they had soothed Dan and Emma with frequent reassurances that Piper would be with them again soon, once her body finished shaking off the immense shock of the impact she felt when the final pulse hit in Scotland. Piper's condition had been their greatest concern, of course, but as soon as the doctors shared their total confidence in her recovery, the parents found a great deal of their stress and attention turning towards an issue for which no such reassurance was available. Beyond the orbital research station, the remarkable gate which linked Earth to the distant planet of New Kerguelen had completely disappeared at the moment of the final pulse. Given that all cooperation between humanity and New Kerguelen's friendly race of messengers depended on the gate's presence, this was a problem with far-reaching consequences. Even more upsettingly, however, the gate's sudden disappearance also brought with it a great personal cost due to the fact that Tara and Clark McCarthy had crossed the gate to New Kerguelen with their young son just minutes before their only route back was ripped away. The family had made the journey to avoid the effects of the final pulse, which had been felt on the space station as well as on the ground. Tara felt the earlier pulses more than anyone else aside from Dan and Piper due to her previous experience of being uplifted by the messengers using their outmoded cable-based method. The group's prime concern about how Tara might fare when the final pulse hit related to something else, though. The fact that she was eight months pregnant. The imminence of her second child's birth had been why the wider group so firmly encouraged Tara to take refuge on New Kerguelen, and more than a little ironically, it was now why they were so distraught that she now found herself stranded rather than safe. Aside from the natives, New Kerguelen was home to only a small population of human scientists who were chiefly employed in the construction of a spacecraft fabrication facility, and it was certainly no place for a human child. When Piper woke up, the news that her Aunt Tara and Uncle Clark were stranded on the other side of the gate with little Aiden knocked the wind out of her as soon as she heard it. These feelings more than cancelled out the previous relief that had come when Dan told her she had succeeded in containing the pulse's kinetic effects. No one had even considered that the gate might be vulnerable to any kind of damage at the hands of the pulse, let alone vulnerable to disappearing, and the sheer helplessness they now felt only served to make things worse. Emma tried not to fixate on how helpless her younger sister Tara must have been feeling, literally stranded on an alien world during what should have been an exciting and positive period of her life. For Piper, digesting the news only now, distressed empathy over how this situation must have felt on the new Kerguelen side of the gate was also difficult to shake. There was a deeper point to this, too, since Piper imagined that Tara and Clark could quite possibly be sitting somewhere on New Kerguelen under the painful assumption that the pulse had destroyed life on Earth at the same time that it eliminated the gate. That had been the forecast for what would happen if Piper's attempts at containing it failed, after all, based on a frightening archaeological discovery of evidence that the same thing had happened on New Kerguelen many thousands of years earlier. 
The only messengers who survived the extinction-level event on their side of the gate had been those sheltered from it by the deceitful architects, an alien race named after their design and construction of that very shelter. Communication between Earth and New Kerguelen in the tiny window of time between Terra's trip across the gate and the gate's disappearance at least gave everyone on the station the comfort of knowing that she and her family had arrived safely, and this was a comfort they were very grateful for. There had been a brief moment prior to Terra's departure when the prospect of her going alone had been raised, to save her son Aiden the potential disturbance of a trip across the gate. She and Clark had done all they could to make the five-year-old boy's life as normal as possible, free from as many alien influences and dramas as they could manage. They had felt great relief when Aiden was born without any of the uplift powers that made Piper's early years so complicated, a difference attributed to the fact that Tara herself didn't possess any of her previously held powers at the time of her daughter's conception or birth, which couldn't be said for Dan in relation to Piper. But Clark McCarthy would have jumped into the vacuum of space without a suit or helmet before he would have left his wife to make an interplanetary trip on her own, however instantaneous it was, and the promises Alessandro Bonucci made about the voyage's safety were enough to convince him that making the trip was in his family's best interests. Even now, no one on the station could be sure that Clark and Tara had made the wrong choice. Dan reported an unprecedented pain at the back of his neck when the final pulse hit, and everyone knew that Tara's advanced pregnancy could have made a similar jolt extremely dangerous. New Kerguelen was no hellhole either, as Dan had tried to console Emma through the night. Tara had also been there more than once and had earned the undying admiration of its citizens for selfless risks she had taken during dramatic crises in years gone by, he pointed out, and the planet had changed a lot since then, due to the presence of human scientists and workers. It wasn't as though Terra had been stranded on a desert island, Dan said, or that the medical care she could receive in the planet's human-staffed infirmary would be considerably inferior to that available on Earth or the station. Emma heard all of this and appreciated where it was coming from. But when her little sister was stuck on an alien world with no clear prospect of ever getting home, Words could only go so far. Does Alessandro think there's any way we can fix it? Piper asked, blurting the question out after many seconds of ponderous thought. She shifted her weight on the bed in a manner that made her relieved parents think she wasn't injured in any lasting way. Do we have any plan for reopening the gate? Dan and Emma shared an uncomfortable glance. It's not so much that the gate is closed... Dan said, taking it upon himself to field the question. Piper, Alessandro said the gate is gone. The girl swallowed hard. But if anyone can bring it back, he can, right? Again, her parents shared a brief and wordless glance. It was certainly true that Alessandro Bonucci, the station's lead physicist and all-around scientific figurehead, was more likely than anyone else to have any chance of solving a problem like this one. He had been closely observing the gate for over a decade and conducting all manner of tests to boot, so on the face of it, Piper's optimism didn't seem too misplaced. Indeed, Dan and Emma had both asked similar questions of Alessandro when he first broke the harrowing news. His face had said it all in that moment, just as theirs did now. There must be a way... Piper said. What about the vault? You said the door is open and Godfrey wants to send people in, right? Doesn't Alessandro think there could be something down there that helps us, I don't know, reinstate the gate? Whatever is in there causing the pulse caused this, so maybe it's our best chance of fixing it. A probe is going down today, Dan replied. It's probably in there right now, in fact. It's the Scottish drilling guys we worked with on the ground, Davy and Stevie, along with Geo. They're going to send us data as soon as they've seen it. Whatever is in there, we'll know soon. Just as Dan finished saying this, the only messenger remaining on Earth's side of the gate came hurrying into the room. Melly, a kindly doctor and empath for New Kerguelen who was now even more alone from the rest of her kind than Tara's family were from theirs, wore the widest smile anyone had ever seen. New Blast Key! 
she exclaimed in the language of her people. New blast key! Piper smiled right back at her. Shablen key, she replied. Unlike their remarkable daughter, neither Dan nor Emma could understand a word Melly said without help from the vocal translator in the station's control deck. It didn't take any mind-reading uplift powers or even a particularly keen level of empathy to get the gist of what was being said, however, with Melly clearly ecstatic to see that the young human she had known and loved since infancy was okay. Piper, tell her what you saw, Dan said. You know, the vision you had when the pulse hit. The girl's eyebrows rose on consideration of this. The remarkable moment had come only a day ago, and she had told her parents about it just a few minutes ago. But the harrowing news about the gate had so totally taken over in her mind that this had temporarily slipped away. Upon recalling it once more, Piper wasted no time in telling Melly what she had seen in the brief seconds when she felt the pulse's effects before being overwhelmed and knocked unconscious. In that moment, she had experienced a crystal clear vision through the eyes of someone else she immediately understood as being like her. No one outside of the McCarthy's inner circle had ever been uplifted by the messengers in any manner, and no one at all besides Piper had been able to utilize any of the related powers since the first relatively weak pulse hit Scotland two weeks earlier. The realization that there was someone else like Piper made very little sense, and raised all manner of uncomfortable questions about illicit alien-related research that had long been rumored on Earth. As soon as Piper's words sunk in from Ellie, it was apparent that the only messenger currently anywhere besides New Kerguelen was skipping surprise and moving straight to concern. Beatful, Nasaku, Melly uttered in a far flatter tone than her usual sing-song manner. Dan and Emma looked at Piper for a translation. She says we have to tell the others, the girl relayed, providing one right away before pivoting her weight to get out of bed. She was briefly unsteady on her feet and gratefully accepted her mother's arm of support, but within a few steps she was walking with nothing more than a minor limp. Nuda bis rankal, Melly went on as she walked just ahead of Piper, leading the way to the control deck. Gon slick velo, basharef. Piper turned once again to her parents, relaying the words in a manner they could understand. She's scared, the girl said. By your vision? Dan asked. Piper nodded. What exactly did she say? Emma asked, now too concerned herself to be content to wait the minute or so it would take to reach the control deck and its vocal translator. She said this is very bad, Piper replied, and that if I felt what I think I felt, we've got a lot more to worry about than what might be in that vault. G-97, Fraser Steading, Thurso, Scotland Every time either of the drilling operators stationed in Scotland opened the door of their cabin for some fresh air, they were reminded of how much had changed since they arrived. Every time they gazed around the desolate landscape and listened in vain for a sign of life, they were reminded of just how much had been lost. This field on the edge of Thurso, a small town plucked from relative obscurity and thrust into the global spotlight in a way only Birchwood, Colorado had ever matched, had been the epicenter of a series of disasters without precedent. On eleven occasions, the ground under the cabin had pulsed upwards, while something buried within it emitted kinetic energy stronger than any storm ever recorded. Outside of a central safe zone some forty meters in diameter, within which lay both the cabin and a deep shaft that had been drilled beside it, the pulses had completely flattened everything in their path. The affected area doubled in size on each occasion, culminating with physical devastation across an area stretching some 123 kilometers from the point of origin. The subterranean object responsible for the carnage had since been confirmed as extraterrestrial in origin and was now best understood as a subterranean vault. Only a day had passed since the twelfth pulse, which was known to be the last due to a convergent formula that had forecast its timing to the millisecond, but most of the world's citizens had since slept soundly after breathing the deepest sighs of relief they'd ever known. 
And now, within the next few minutes, the two on-site drilling operators and an experienced archaeologist were set to introduce a series of remote-controlled drones to obtain the first sight of that vault's interior. This move was proving politically controversial in some quarters, at a time when most felt politics should be completely pushed to the side, and among the general public it brought a mix of interest and trepidation. Pretending the vault wasn't there was simply not a reasonable option, not least of all since a new threat might be present inside which could perhaps only be dealt with if it was discovered promptly. But almost as soon as Interspace Contact Agency Chairman William Godfrey publicly referred to the colossal object as a subterranean alien vault in the aftermath of the final pulse, TV airwaves and social media feeds had been overflowing with rampant speculation. The three men tasked with capturing the first footage and data readings from the vault avoided any vocal speculation, but their proximity to the vault's doorway meant that their imaginations were understandably running wild, even more so than those of the population at large. Although no one had been in the vault, its door was open thanks to the selfless risk of young Piper McCarthy. A lot of last-gasp teamwork went into locating the alien artifact which acted as a key for the mysterious door, but Piper alone had made the sacrifice that prevented a global cataclysm. The 14-year-old girl, born with uplift powers her father had been temporarily granted at the time of her conception, had been badly hurt, but thankfully not critically injured in the incident an incident which saw her use her power of telekinesis to contain the pulse's kinetic effects within a force field near the source. News that Piper had regained consciousness reached the trio on the ground shortly before the equipment they were about to deploy into the vault, and it lifted their spirits to no end. All three knew everything that had gone on, unlike the general public who couldn't know about the girl's powers for very good reasons relating to her continued safety in a world where that kind of difference would provoke extremely unwelcome attention from some quarters. The recently discovered historical context provided by a similar event on the planet of New Kerguelen made it crystal clear that Piper's actions had saved billions of lives, but the manner in which she did it would have made her a pariah in the eyes of those who had come to fear anything related to alien powers and technologies. Even when they were used for unequivocally positive ends, such as in this case. By blunting the Pulse's kinetic onslaught, Piper had single-handedly ensured that no one else was killed or even injured directly by the hurricane-like force which had flattened ever-larger swaths of the Scottish Highlands during each of the eleven pulses that preceded her final intervention. Secondary effects of the twelfth and final pulse did lead to tragic deaths in several parts of the world, where electrical surges had been felt at the times of the earlier Scottish pulses and where far greater surges brought mayhem on the final occasion. William Godfrey wasted no time in promising retribution against whoever was ultimately found to be responsible for the chaos and tragedies of the past two weeks, but few had any idea quite how he expected to hold accountable an unseen enemy with such power at their disposal. Godfrey had his reasons for issuing such firm comments, with public morale being at the top of the list, but in private, even he knew that sweeping the vault to make sure it wasn't going to cause any more physical problems was the real priority. The man who had rounded out the cabin's usual duo into a trio was an archaeologist by the name of Gio Nunes, who typically lived on the Il Circatore space station and who had played a major role in discovering the key-like artifact Piper used to open the door seconds before she blunted the final pulse. Geo's presence was enthusiastically welcomed by the two local drillers, whose last fortnight had involved more than enough pressure for their lifetimes. Winning a race against time to find the source of the pulses with drilling equipment they were used to operating had been hard enough, and piloting high-tech drones would have been several steps too far. The pair, who introduced themselves to Geo by their nicknames of Davy and Stevie, just as they had to the McCarthys, were proud of the work they had done and enthusiastic to continue it. Their latest task involved loading an astronomically expensive rover into the lift they had installed in the shaft for Piper's benefit a few days earlier, and once it was lowered to the doorway, there was nothing left to do but watch as Gio Nunez took control of the vehicle and tested its movements at the bottom of the shaft. All good, Gio said, 
paying close attention to the live video feed on the cabin's primary TV monitor. The vehicle was capable of very deft movements, and Gio was one of few people trained to operate its intimidating-looking remote control. Neither Davy nor Stevie would have known where to start, but Gio had reiterated on several occasions that what they were about to do was a team effort. For their part, Davy and Stevie's careful drilling had made the door accessible while avoiding any damage to a vault their horizontal measurements had estimated as being at least 1,000 meters in length. Gio Nunez had more than a few feathers in his cap from important excavations and discoveries over a long career, but while whatever his rover and drones were about to find in the vault would likely blow everything else out of the water, he knew in his heart that none of the credit was his. A team of people he was proud to call his friends and colleagues had made this moment possible, along with his new comrades in Davy and Stevie, and a large part of Gio wished the likes of the McCarthy family and Timo Fiore were also sitting by his side as he got ready to guide the vehicle into the vault. A stomach-churning side effect of the final pulse meant that they all currently had something else on their plate, something so personally harrowing that it superseded even the imminent illumination of where the pulses had come from, and this weighed on the ground-based trio's mind, too. Full steam ahead, whenever you're ready, mate, Davy said, speaking in a Scottish accent Geo was still getting used to. Time to roll, Stevie added. No one could yet predict what consequences their discoveries would have for humanity at large, but before long the McCarthys and everyone else would be facing up to what truly lay beneath the Scottish Highlands. Okay, Geo said, breathing deeply as he gazed down at the remote control in his hands. He nodded intently to psych himself up. Let's do this. Once and for all, let's find out what's down there. Aye. Stevie said, sharing an uneasy look with Davy before reverting his gaze to the TV monitor that would soon be relaying footage from every last inch of the vault. Or who? G-96, Public Hall, New Birchwood, New Kerguelen. The short answer is that we still don't know. Clark McCarthy said, addressing a room full of human scientists and construction workers. All were deeply concerned about the news from Earth, or more accurately, the complete lack of it. As soon as anything is at all clearer, you guys will know too. A day earlier, the arrival of Terra and Clark, along with their young son Aiden, had been greeted warmly by most of the planet's native population and human workers alike. Those who were less happy were the few who knew about the pulses that had been ravaging vast areas of land on Earth since the emergency evacuation of a couple who had thus far avoided introducing their son to anything alien-related. No one resented the McCarthy's arrival in any fashion, and those with negative feelings felt them for the situation that had necessitated the trip rather than the trip itself. Terra had been dearly missed by the messengers, who had viewed her as something of a people's princess since her initial visit with Dan McCarthy and Billy Kendrick a full fifteen years earlier, when what they saw as her poise and grace had de-escalated a conflict that looked for a while like it could wreak havoc on both sides of the gate. Clark, for his part, had never before visited New Kerguelen. Despite this, though, he had been a subject of legend among the natives for many years, the messenger's leader, Leisha, had developed a very strong bond with Clark and would never forget the way Clark had thrown himself in front of a bullet during a failed assassination attempt at William Godfrey's ICA building in Buenos Aires. Someone who Leisha looked up to couldn't fail to hold a special place in the collective mythos the messengers had developed over time regarding their human friends, and Clark's first few minutes on the planet had been more than a little awkward as he was mobbed by well-meaning aliens who wanted a closer look and in some cases tried to shake his hand in the peculiar way they knew humans were so fond of doing. The planet's native inhabitants looked at Clark in genuine awe. He wasn't all that much taller than some of the human scientists and construction workers, but he was built differently, built bigger, and carried himself in a manner that added at least a few inches to their perceptions. Indeed, just a day after arriving, the natural air of authority Clark exuded 
saw to it that he was the one delivering the latest update about a situation with the planet's Skygate portal to Earth that was causing great consternation among the whole population. Shortly after the McCarthys crossed the gate, and at the precise moment when the last of Earth's twelve destructive pulses had been forecast to hit, all signals emanating from the gate ceased in an instant. And although the gate was still visible to the naked eye in a way it always had been, unlike on the other side where its orbital distance from Earth was so much greater than this gate's was from New Kerguelen, absolutely nothing was coming through. Following Clark's brief post-arrival discussions with Leisha and his old buddy Billy Kendrick, he had told the general population the full reason for his visit and as much information as he had about the pulses. If there was ever a time for dishing out partial truths and drip-feeding bad news, he knew this wasn't it. Some were naturally worried that Earth had been destroyed, and Clark couldn't flat-out deny that there was an unwelcome logic to thinking so. Test signals that the planet's human scientists fired at the gate were bouncing right back, like light off a mirror, and the timing of the change couldn't be ignored, given that it had all happened precisely when the pulse hit. One of the planet's leading engineers, a well-respected individual by the name of Kajil, who had been the first observer of signs that revealed a long-gone gateway to a different planet had in fact been a time gate, stood at the meeting and said something more optimistic than any other viewpoints that were shared. Kajil's argument eased the minds of many of the attendant humans, all of whom heard it courtesy of the uplift telepathy patches they wore to enable interspecies communication, and it was convincing enough for Clark to think it was worth a try on Terra. Her planned hour-long journey to escape the Pulse had already gone on far too long, and Terra either couldn't or didn't want to get too comfortable on a planet she loved, but didn't want to stay on for a moment longer than she had to. Alien empaths, based in the infirmary where Terra was sleeping to enable routine monitoring, conducted only out of an abundance of caution, they told Clark, reported that she was experiencing potentially dangerous levels of helplessness. This would have been concerning even if she wasn't so heavily pregnant, they said, so it was very important to keep an eye on her and ensure she stayed as comfortable as possible. The empaths, who didn't have any magical or supernatural powers as Clark used to think that designation suggested, but who were simply able to sense and interpret deep changes in emotional states, also said that she needed space to process things, but not so much space that she would feel completely alone. Clark himself wasn't in the clearest state of mind for walking fine lines like this, but with Tara carrying so much more weight than him in a literal and figurative sense, he did all he could to stay diligent. When he arrived back at the infirmary to check in on her after his relatively successful meeting with the rest of the station's human dwellers, Clark shared the one point Kajil mentioned that was giving him a real reason to hang on to hope. It was certainly true and certainly concerning that all communication from Earth stopped exactly when the final pulse was forecast to hit, Clark admitted, seeing little point in trying to paint this any other way. But what Clark claimed as a source of hope, somewhat counterintuitively, was the fact that all the signals that New Kerguelen's human scientists and their messenger helpers fired at the gate did bounce back. If the signals had gotten through without reply, Clark said, this would have added weight to the uncomfortable but understandable theory that the final pulse had devastated Earth and the station, leaving no one to reply. But he took pains to reassure Terra that this wasn't what had happened. The signals we're sending from here are just bouncing straight back, he told her, so there's no reason to think something has happened to everyone on Earth. It seems like something has happened to the gate itself probably because of interference from the pulse, but that's a lot better than what I was thinking before we saw Kajil's test results, don't you think? As she had been for a deeply disconcerting portion of the time since all communication to and from Earth ceased, Terra stayed completely silent. She was badly shaken up and was too worried to even appreciate Clark's laudable efforts to lighten her mood. Then, of course, there was the baby due in less than four weeks, but kicking noticeably more than he had been a day earlier. That Terra's mind even had to consider the thought that an alien world was no place for a newborn baby said everything, and not even Clark's calm and stoic presence 
could offer its usual reassurance. We're getting home, he vowed, believing this with every ounce of his being. In all truth, he would have said it in that moment even if he didn't, given how important it was, for one very obvious reason, to keep Terra's spirits from getting dangerously low. Everyone here is working on fixing the gate, and you can bet everything that everyone on Earth, and especially the station, is working on it too. Alessandro is going to be on this, and you know how smart he is. If my brain fell out of my head, I would trust that guy to build me a new one. Then there's Piper too, okay? Everyone is pushing for the same thing. So whatever happens in the short term, and even if Clark Jr. is born here, we're all going to make it home. At last, Tara lifted her head and looked at Clark. Her eyebrows furrowed, only slightly, but more than any part of her face had moved lately. Clark couldn't keep a straight face for another second. Clark Jr.? Tara asked with a weak but meaningful chuckle of her own. You're lucky you're so... far away. He walked over from the doorway and kissed her forehead, happy to see a modicum of her usual verve returning, and hopeful that a solid sleep would help her recover some of the rest. Catch some winks while you can, he suggested. Aiden wants to look at all the statues in Central Plaza tomorrow, so you're probably going to be listening to a hundred old messengers' life stories for most of the afternoon. Tara faked a snore to pretend to be asleep. It was about as convincing as her attempts at playful deceit ever were, which was to say, not at all, but Clark was majorly heartened that she was seeing the funny side of things. We are getting home, darling, Clark said one last time from the doorway as he headed back out to check back in with Billy and the scientists. When his mind flitted back to the heartbreaking look on Billy's face when he first broke the news about Timo's illness, a follow-up thought entered Clark's mind. The thought grew even stronger when he stepped outside the infirmary building and looked up at the ever-so-slightly discernible outline of the gate in the planet's sky. Clark couldn't afford to entertain the notion that Earth had been devastated by an unchecked convergent pulse, and he had too much faith in Piper and others to think that could have come to pass. But the fact that the gate seemed to have been critically damaged by the pulse filled him with a burning rage aimed squarely at the beings who had set those pulses in motion. Nick Mason had earned a prime spot on Clark's shit list with his poisoning of the good and innocent Timo Fiori, but the architect's evident attempt to wipe out human life across Earth as they had across most of New Kerguelen was on an altogether different level. One way or another, there would be hell to pay for whatever had happened on Earth, and Clark McCarthy was ready to collect. We are getting home, he thought to himself, meditating on a thought that arose so often it was becoming something of a personal mantra. And then, we're getting even. G-95, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Cercatore. On the very short walk from Piper's private room in the station's otherwise empty medical ward, Chip Petrovich was the first to catch sight of them. Hey, kid, he happily yelled, running over from his previous spot in the hallway. Chip, a sometimes shady but loyal lawyer who was firmly within the family's circle of trust, had been closer to Clark than the rest of them and was as worried as anyone else. He was naturally delighted to see that Piper was okay, both for her own sake and that of her worried parents. There was another aspect to Chip's gladness, though. Put simply, Piper McCarthy had the brightest mind anyone had ever encountered and was a powerful ally in their battle against challenges and forces that weren't yet fully understood. The girl was also the only individual on this side of the gate, including Melly, who retained any of the incredible and potentially crucial uplift powers. At least, so Chip thought. Wait, what's up? he asked, slowly cottoning on to the concern on the family members' faces. Emma tilted her head to silently encourage Chip to follow them into the control deck, where she hoped Alessandro and Timo would already be present and where the vocal translator would allow Melly to converse with everyone. Her concerns over Piper's vision were in turn concerning the girl's parents, and they both felt that all of this should immediately be shared with the others on the station as well as key figures on the ground. 
Alessandro and Timo were in the control deck, and both reacted in precisely the same two-stage manner as Chip, first with joy at the sight of Piper awake and on her feet, and then with major trepidation at the sight of her and Melly's expressions. You know about the gate, Alessandro asked, hoping Piper was only upset about this. While Piper replied in the affirmative but explained that something else had come up, Alessandro's words were translated and uttered aloud by the device he and Melly had cooperatively developed. This vocal translator had become worth its weight in gold since the telepathy-enabling uplift patches that the station's scientists used to use to communicate with her had ceased to function two weeks earlier. Nuda bis rankal, Melly replied. Gon slick velo, basharef. Within a few seconds, the words were repeated by a soft computerized voice. If someone else has the powers we now lack, we are in serious trouble. The five human adults present in the room all looked confused, but Dan and Emma considerably less so than the others, given that they at least knew something about the vision Piper had experienced at the moment of the final pulse. What am I missing? Alessandro asked his laser-focused analytical mind enabling him to get round to a question like this, while Timo and Chip were still gazing at each other in shock, as though wondering whether the other was as lost as they were. Remember when I was a baby? The girl began. Before Melly helped get rid of the most intrusive of my powers, I had a connection to my dad that was basically remote viewing. At certain times, I could see things through his eyes, as if they were my own and you started to think it happened in moments of intense emotion. Remember that? Alessandro didn't speak, but his eyes encouraged Piper to continue. She did. Well, while I was down there at the vault's door, just after it opened when the pulse started to hit, I connected to someone else. It was short, but it was clear. I saw a field and a water tower through a window, and whoever it was, I felt like they were scared. What do you think was going on? The Italian asked, once again retaining a focus that was beyond any of the others as they listened along in increasing shock at what Piper was revealing. This time she paused in thought. I don't know. We know the pulses have some effect on the powers, so it could be that the final pulse made me hypersensitive to someone else I've always had a latent connection with. Or maybe... Melly's voice interrupted, cutting Piper off and leading the others to focus on the translator in anticipation of the English words it would speak almost instantaneously. But you shouldn't have a connection with anyone else, the gentle but clearly frightened alien stated. It was only ever your father. Who else is there? This question stumped everyone, not least Piper herself. I don't know, she repeated but maybe someone else has been researching the powers after all, like we always thought. Maybe they worked something out and the pulse raised my sensitivity enough to make me notice someone who's been uplifted for a while. I really don't know. A tense silence circled within the station's control deck, lasting until a gruff utterance from Chip punctured the air. His theory, which he felt was more of a realization or confirmation than any kind of guess, took only one word to express. Mason. Piper met Chip's gaze and nodded in agreement while trying to force a brave face. U.S. President Nick Mason, a longtime opponent of all interspecies research and cooperation, who many thought protested against such things with a suspiciously devout ferocity, had been a thorn in the side of reason for what seemed like forever. Scaremongering and grandstanding were Mason's two favorite activities, but the idea that one of the very shady corporations he'd been linked to over the years might have cracked the uplift powers gave the group concerns of an all-new kind. You really think so? Dan asked, speaking to no one in particular. I hate to say it, Piper chimed in, but I think Chip is probably right. Mason knew about the first pre-pulse warning jolt back when I was the only one of us to feel it, and until now we had no idea how that was possible. But if Mason or someone close to him has been uplifted, and if somehow they didn't lose their powers at the same time everyone else did, maybe they felt the warning jolt and that's how he knew. Alessandro sighed. And then, 
Pretty much everyone at the ICA has suspected him of illicit uplift research, and this could be the proof. But right now, proving it is a lot less important than dealing with it. Because if he's working with people who managed to reverse engineer the powers from any of the uplift patches we used to use on Earth, the fact that he has the powers at his disposal isn't the big deal. The big deal is what he might do with them. Do we know where Mason was when the final pulse hit? Emma asked. I'm sure we can find out, Alessandro replied. I suppose then we could see if the surroundings match what Piper saw. Is that what you're thinking? Emma replied in the affirmative, but before she could get many words out, an out-of-character interruption came from Timo Fiori. Timo, who had held his tongue until now while trying to make sense of a highly opaque situation, was scratching his chin very quickly in uncomfortable thought. Alessandro, get Godfrey on the line. We need to tell him this, and I need to tell all of you something else. I apologize in advance for having kept it from you for so long, but goodness knows we've had enough to worry about. Chip, the only person present who knew what Timo was alluding to, kept a well-practiced poker face. Melly, who was also in on Timo's unfortunate truth, but far less adept to dealing with even momentary dishonesty than Chip, looked altogether more uncomfortable. You should tell me before you tell Godfrey, Emma suggested. I know he's on our side, Timo, but sometimes the things you think it's okay for other people to know are... Please, Timo interrupted with far less energy than before. This is going to be hard enough, Emma. I don't want to argue. As tears began to well in the billionaire's eyes, Emma's expression morphed from one of frustration and abstract concern over who knew what into a much realer worry about her friend's well-being. She had known Timo for more than fifteen years, in which they had together endured more than enough highs and lows for fifteen lifetimes, but never before had she seen him like this. Are you okay? she asked, although Timo's current posture and expression would have made something like, was wrong, more appropriate. No, Timo said, forcing out the first word of a truth he had kept hidden for too long. Alessandro. Make the call to Godfrey. There's something I have to say, and I only want to have to say it once. G-94, Fernstone House, London, England. ICA Chairman William Godfrey, currently fighting all kinds of administrative and political fires from within a secondary residence he maintained in London, accepted a video call from the station in a manner that suggested he had very little time. Yes, Alessandro, he said, his voice coming through a brief moment before the video feed appeared. Godfrey liked and respected Alessandro, but looked absolutely shattered, due in no small part to some obstructive filibustering from the ICA's American delegation as President Mason attempted to force a moratorium on the study of the vast alien vault in the Scottish Highlands until the matter could be fully debated by the agency's assembly. Although Godfrey was hardly known for his recklessness, what exactly there was to debate about trying to find out what was inside a vault that almost destroyed the world before it had the chance to try again was lost on him. The frustration etched on his face made Godfrey look every one of his seventy-plus years which wasn't always the case for a man who had endured at the top level of British and international politics for longer than many of the station's inhabitants had been alive. As the video feed from the station kicked in on Godfrey's end, however, that frustration instantly fell away. Piper, he beamed. Oh, what a joy to see you're okay. How are you? Do you remember much of what happened yesterday? That's what this is about, the girl replied. We wanted to tell you. Godfrey pushed several papers to the side of his desk and repositioned his laptop so Piper and the others could see him better. Please do, darling. But really, I'm just so thrilled that you're awake. You had us worried there. I hope your folks have told you how many people you saved and how grateful they would all be if we could tell them. I hope you realize the scope of what you did. And if you've heard any bad news about New Kergelen... I hope you'll trust that I won't rest until that problem is solved. Piper nodded. I know. Thanks. 
Unlike when most other politicians spoke, or indeed sometimes when he had to be coy about certain things in public, Piper always knew Godfrey was telling the truth when he spoke to her. She hadn't been alive in the days when Godfrey had been a thorn in her parents' side, Emma's in particular, and had always known him as a kind man. The ICA chairman's transformation had been so gradual and so sustained that Emma no longer saw Godfrey as a scheming politician any more than Dan any longer saw her as the all-business PR guru he first met during the heady days of the IDA leak when she first saw his increasing celebrity as a route to easy money. And about what you wanted to tell me, Godfrey prompted, not quite impatient but certainly eager to hear it. Without wasting any more time, Piper retold everything she could remember about her brief connection with another seemingly uplifted individual and the visual images that remained hazily imprinted in her mind. When she was finished, Godfrey sighed deeply and shook his head. Mason, he said, he knew when the first warning pulse hit, and we already thought the only way he could have known was if he had some kind of access to uplift-related technologies or even an uplifted individual. For all we know, that individual could even be him. G-93, MacDonald Hotel, Orkney, Scotland Buoyed by the news that Piper McCarthy was okay, which came in a very quick text message from the station courtesy of the ever-thoughtful girl herself, Carrick Thomas and Serena Cruz sat down in their hotel for the most comfortable and enjoyable dinner of their remarkable and unexpected stay. Two short weeks ago, Carrick had been at home in Wales while Serena had been in her university dorm in Dallas. Their proactive reactions to the first pulse on mainland Scotland had brought them into the McCarthy family's world and, just as importantly, had brought them together. With the destructive pulses in their rearview mirrors, and confirmation received that Piper was okay, both Carrick and Serena now, for the first time, had emotional space to feel as deeply glad about being together as they were. Circumstances had thrown them together, and so much time in each other's company had brought them close in a sense that extended far beyond the physical, to the extent that neither had any doubt they would still be together in another two weeks, regardless of what events fell in their path before then. Just a short drive from the Orkney Hotel, where they had been stationed for a few days, lay the ancient site of Scarabray, the full importance of which would be understood by the world at large only when the dust had settled on everything else. It was there that a disc-like alien artifact had been discovered decades earlier, before being mistakenly categorized as an out-of-place Viking relic. With some help from Timo Fiori's senior archaeologist, Gino Nunes, the unlikely duo had ultimately sourced the artifact from a museum in Edinburgh just in time for Piper to place it in the groove where it fit perfectly. On the door of the subterranean vault that lay just 50 kilometers south of Scarabray, in an otherwise inconspicuous field on the rugged coastline of the Scottish Highlands. Information received from archaeologists on New Kerguelen, from the archaeologist no less, in the shape of Carrick's idol Billy Kendrick, played a great part in assisting the Earth-based team's last-minute efforts to prevent a cataclysm of the kind that had fallen upon the messenger's home world. Evidence found there revealed that disaster had struck thousands of years in the past when the same kind of convergent pulse killed everyone who hadn't been sheltered by the devious and distant race of so-called architects who had placed both vaults and set the harrowing events in motion for reasons known only to themselves. The urge to find those reasons had been at the forefront of Carrick's mind when he first woke up that morning, along with the confusing matter of why the ancient architects had provided the residents of Scarabray with a key to access the vault after the pulse, but hadn't provided a shelter for anyone on earth to survive it. Mysteries aplenty swirled in his mind about the other sites that had been affected by damaging electrical surges at the moments of the Scottish pulses, too, and he and Serena had spent most of the day brainstorming about that. For her part, Serena couldn't shake the feeling that the series of locations was a clue that could ultimately lead them to something that would do much more than just satisfy their curiosity. Both held out a degree of hope that they might be invited to explore the vault when William Godfrey chose his team, 
but neither were going to hold their breath. Their speculative work at connecting locations and seeking meaning where others saw coincidence had already found the key that literally opened the door to the vault, but rather than feel like they were owed a place on the team, both Carrick and Serena were determined to spend their time on what they could control. Illuminating more of the kinds of things that might not be priority-level considerations for others was valuable work, they both felt without having to say, and finding the underlying truth of why iconic sites like Machu Picchu, Giza, and Stonehenge had experienced pulse-related surges was exciting work in itself. While Carrick was the self-avowed conspiracy theorist among them, Serena's long-held curiosities about the untold stories of ancient peoples intersected perfectly with her interests in the more esoteric offshoots of geosciences, her chosen field of academic study. She believed it was possible that ancient people in various parts of the world may have built their key sites in areas where unusual energy was felt, in contrast to the perhaps more obvious theory that the visiting architects had been attracted to such sites once they already existed. The limited information humanity had on the timelines involved was her key reason for considering this line of thought, given that the artwork found at the Turkish site of Dortlu Tepe revealed a visit from the architects some 12,000 years ago, long before the Great Pyramid of Giza or the temples of Angkor Wat were constructed to name just two of the sites on what seemed to be some kind of alien hit list. On the house, a young waiter announced as he placed an expensive-looking bottle of champagne on the couple's table. Really? Serena asked. Wow, thanks. Yeah, thanks, buddy, Carrick added with a wide smile. Everything related to their stay was effectively free for them, anyway, covered by either the McCarthys or perhaps by Timo, but the new couple were extremely grateful for the gesture. The gesture came even though none of the hotel's staff had any idea of how important their joint role had been, much less that Piper wouldn't have even been in the drill shaft if they hadn't found the key and thus wouldn't have been able to contain the potentially world-ending final pulse. There was as little ego in either individual as there was in any of the McCarthys either, so this was going to remain the case. Their very presence had made them interesting to the staff, however, during a time when all other tourists and, indeed, many locals had been fleeing as far as they could from the increasingly powerful mainland pulses. This interest had reached new heights in the previous 24 hours, ever since the footage of Dan McCarthy stepping out of an alien craft in front of Edinburgh Castle had hit the airwaves. Dan was there to urgently collect the artifact that had been identified in the nearby museum, whose curator had since addressed the global media with information on its newly illuminated alien origin and its point of discovery. We're going to get so much business when things go back to normal on the mainland, the waiter said. When things settle down, the numbers of tourists coming to Scarabray are going to be off the charts. You guys have really put Orkney on the map. I guess Edinburgh is going to see a hell of a boost too. Not that it needs it, the young man chuckled to himself. Well, thanks again, Serena said, raising a glass. Tell everyone we appreciate it. We all appreciate what you guys did, the waiter replied. We know that guy you were with works for Timo, and that it was you three who figured out we needed that artifact to open the vault. I don't even want to think about what would have happened if you didn't. Carrick nodded. Maybe fate was on our side, he said before turning to Serena and delivering a phrase she had used more than once. Sometimes things just work out. She grinned. Although there was much still to be discovered and many problems to solve, least of all the repair or reinstatement of an interplanetary gate that was so far beyond her understanding she didn't know which word was more appropriate, Serena felt a broad sense of calm. The relentless countdown to the forecast moment of the final pulse had been mentally draining like nothing she or anyone else had ever experienced. To the extent that she was still operating amid a rush of blissful level of relief, she imagined wasn't all that unlike someone might feel after skydiving or coming face to face with a great white shark. Humanity had defeated the shark for now, and that was reason enough to breathe easily after a long and exhausting bout of anticipation. But in moments of reflection, Serena knew there was still blood in the water and an alien vault in the ground. The waiter smiled again and turned to leave. He then stopped, though. 
Despite every other table in the hotel's restaurant being unoccupied, even at this peak dinnertime hour, he nevertheless glanced around furtively to make sure no one else could be listening in. See? He whispered, leaning in much closer than before. Yeah? Carrick asked. Do you guys have any idea what's in the vault yet? I won't tell anyone. Carrick laughed at the bold straightforwardness of the question. Sorry, buddy, but no one knows yet. This was true for now, of course, but Carrick hoped and expected to have some insight very soon. Gio Nunez was currently in Thurso, leading the initial vault scanning operation with an array of mapping drones and a rover that wouldn't have looked out of place on the surface of Mars, so it seemed inconceivable that some information wouldn't make its way to them before long. What neither Carrick nor Serena knew was that while Geo was set to remain in Thurso, they wouldn't be in Scotland, or even on Earth, for all that much longer. G-92, Fernstone House, London, England As William Godfrey's stated suspicion that the seemingly uplifted individual Piper detected during the final pulse might have been President Mason himself sank in, the others were all quiet. Despite how crazy this sounded on the face of it, none of them were particularly surprised that Godfrey had arrived at the same conclusion Chip landed on a few minutes earlier. Mason's smug behavior at the International Trade Summit, which was interrupted by the pulses, went beyond his usual posturing and spoke of a man holding some serious cards. Godfrey had played a few bluffs in his time and always had a grudging respect for anyone who tried to pull one off at his expense, but that wasn't what was going on here. Comfort would certainly have been the wrong word, but a degree of consolation came from the fact that he at least now knew his suspicions had been correct. With all of the uplift patches on the station, and even Melly's previously innate uplift abilities still out of commission since the very first pulse, anyone on Earth who still retained any such powers must have gained them in a very unusual way, as Piper had via an accidental timing of birth, and the level of coincidence that would have been required for Mason not to be somehow involved didn't even strike Godfrey as something worth considering. Similarly to how the others had already reflected upon it when they heard the news, Godfrey's mind instantly shot to Mason's history of very public opposition to anything alien-related. But if Mason had indeed been tied up with illicit research in the way Godfrey and many others had long suspected, the ICA chairman began to think that Piper's recent revelation might be a very positive development. His own suspicions around Mason had been so strong that this was more of a confirmation than any kind of surprise, and if anything Piper saw and recalled could pin the charlatan of a president's crimes upon him, the world could even end up being a better and safer place than it was before the pulses kicked off. Such a scenario was a long way away, of course, but in this uneasy time of unexplored vaults and disappearing gates, Godfrey quite naturally found his mind looking for a positive angle when few others were presenting themselves. We were thinking Mason, too, Piper said, breaking a lingering silence that Godfrey had spent pondering as many possibilities as he could think of. But I didn't see anything that either supports or weakens that idea. There was a field I'd never seen before, and there was a water tower, but that's all that was clear. It was through a window, the window the person was looking through. I couldn't sense any thoughts, just a feeling of fear. I don't know if that's because the pulse was coming and everyone was scared, or maybe if the person felt my intrusion and got spooked by that. What do you remember about the field and the water tower? Godfrey asked. You're already helping, Piper, but anything else you remember could give us a location. Piper thought back, calling upon her usually flawless memory. The image had been brief and so much had been going on around her at the time that it received far from her full mental focus, and she was, in fact, now focusing on the memory a lot more intently than she had focused on the connection at the time. A brown field, brown with soil, and a green crop that hadn't been growing for long, the girl said. It was short. I couldn't say what. The sky was clear, but not all that bright. Maybe either dawn or dusk, I didn't see the sun, and I don't know what direction the window faced. Godfrey nodded quickly. Excellent. And the tower? White, 
the girl continued. It was one of the ones that looks kind of like a golf ball on a tee, and there was a black H, but that was the only letter I could see. Maybe the first letter of the town name? Piper looked to her mother as she said this, as though automatically seeking her view before anyone else's. Emma smiled, not having to force it. Perfect, she said. I mean, how many water towers can there be, especially with the right kind of field nearby? We'll get on that right away, Godfrey insisted. But first, Melly, can I ask you a few things? As soon as these words were relayed by the vocal translator, Melly encouraged him to go right ahead. Thank you, he said. Once again, there's no pressure on you here, but anything you do know could be very helpful indeed. With that said, regarding the concept of remote viewing, I recall Leisha and Sacco had never experienced such a thing and didn't even understand the concept when Piper was an infant. We only knew about it because Emma experienced it secondhand while using one of the deep-dive telepathy patches to see exactly what was going on in her rapidly developing brain. And when you first met Piper back then, didn't you suggest that she had a special connection to Dan rather than any broader remote viewing ability? That's all correct, Melly replied. The computerized voice the words came in was one the humans were by now used to thinking of as hers, as much as the sing-song-like tones that actually left her alien lips. There has never been a power of such a kind among my race. Piper did have a connection to Dan and no one else, and I dealt with that not by stunting her mind, but by shielding his. The ability for Piper to view the world through Dan's eyes, often involuntarily, would have been an ability capable of ruining two lives. But as I said, I didn't stunt the child's mind to stop that. I shielded Dan's. Hmm, Godfrey mused. And Piper, you've never had any visions of connections like this before, with anyone else? You won't get in trouble if you say yes, I promise. Piper shook her head. Never. But if this isn't a power, why am I feeling a connection to someone? It made sense when it was my dad, but not a stranger. Rather than Godfrey, who only upturned his palms in admission of having no good answer, it was Chip Petrovich who replied. That's a good question, he said. Maybe just because this is the only other person who's been fully uplifted? If Mason or one of the dodgy companies he's tied up with have reverse-engineered the powers, maybe they've been focusing on a single test subject, or maybe this is the one with the strongest powers— I don't know, but it's all possible. Everyone gave Piper a few seconds to think, which she was clearly doing very hard. I just, I don't get why I wouldn't feel a connection to someone I'm more, you know, connected to. She glanced at Emma again. You, Aunt Tara, I don't know. You guys have had the powers too, and you felt the pulses. Why this random person and not you? I'm just spitballing here. Chip chimed in again, but maybe the energy released by the pulse would have given you a connection to your Aunt Tara if she was on this side of the gate. Maybe she was ruled out because of the gate. Maybe your dad was ruled out because of how Melly shielded his mind back when you were a baby. And maybe this new guy popped up because he's been uplifted in a way that made him susceptible to, you know, just like the three of you guys felt the pulses more than the rest of us, since we've only ever been temporarily uplifted by the patches, this guy might have been uplifted for real by whatever tech masons got his grubby little hands on. While this theory, as sound as any other, rattled around the humans' brains, Melly issued a note of caution. This Nick Mason is who you all think is connected to this, but we don't know that yet. I understand why you think it but we don't know it. If only one of us still had the telepathy, Dan groaned. I never really appreciated how easy stuff like this used to be when we had to find out if someone was lying and we were able to do it just like that. No one could disagree with this, but there was no way around it. Piper's once innate power of telepathy had been gone for years and hadn't returned along with the telekinesis she'd been quietly nurturing for the last few years before revealing it to her stunned parents just a few weeks ago. Melly, for her part, no longer possessed any of her own uplift powers and retained only a strong empathic ability to judge the mood and intentions of others. 
This only worked up close and in person, which ruled out any hopeful attempts to utilize it on the staunchly anti-alien president who had long rallied to ban cooperative messengers like Melly from Earth's orbit as well as its surface. It's Mason, Timo Fiore announced with an authority that caught the others by surprise. Since Timo had been quiet for so long, and since so much else had come up during the call, the others on the station had momentarily forgotten that he had an announcement of his own to make. We've suspected for a long time that Mason is mixed up with some extremely questionable people, or maybe I should say he's been working with them, since mixed up makes it sound like he's been dragged along against his will, and we now have proof. It gives me no pleasure to say this, but that man is our enemy, and he will stop at nothing to get what he wants. Proof? Godfrey asked, sudden hope in his voice. You have proof of this already? Not of this, Timo replied. At least not yet. But Chip has been investigating something for me within the past month or so, and Mason is nailed to the wall. Chairman Godfrey, we'll actually need you to assist in sourcing some security footage from inside the ICA building in Buenos Aires. Clark knew what I'm about to tell you, but the proof came only once the pulses had kicked off. I couldn't distract anyone from that, which was far more important than me, and the final pulse gave us an unconscious Piper and Clark's family stranded on the wrong side of the gate. All I'm saying is, I didn't keep this from you all for any selfish reasons, and I'm only sharing it now because it's pertinent if anyone is having doubts about what kind of man Nick Mason is and what kind of people he runs with outside of the Washington bubble. Timo's words could hardly have struck the others as any more ominous if he had written them down and underlined them in bold red pen, and every eye and ear was trained closely on him. Chip, the only person who knew what Timo was about to say, looked to the floor. I'm dying, Timo said. And I'm dying because Nick Mason had me poisoned. G-91, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Cercatore. You're dying? Emma gasped in reaction to Timo's shock announcement. Like the others, she was entirely fixated on this aspect of the news rather than the associated and confidently stated revelation that Nick Mason was responsible. The process has been ongoing for a while and will accelerate from here on out. Timo glumly replied. Chip found and followed a trail of breadcrumbs that leads right to Mason's door. And Chairman Godfrey, as I suggested, unfortunately, we believe the deed occurred inside your doors at the ICA building in Buenos Aires. There has to be an antidote, Dan interjected, like Emma, far more immediately concerned about Timo and his health than by who was responsible for damaging it. If there's poison, there's an antidote, right? Surely, if you tell the doctors and let them run some tests on... A handful of doctors have known for a while, Timo cut in, reluctant to let any hope build when there was no prospect of it coming to fruition. They've conducted every test you can imagine and have been sworn to secrecy. Who else knows? Godfrey inquired from the other end of the video line. Clark, Timo replied. He only found out when Chip reached him earlier in the week, after getting back from Russia. Everyone turned to Chip, their eyes asking the question with no need for their mouths to say anything. It was a modified Russian toxin, the lawyer explained. It's nothing to do with Russia per se, just like it's nothing to do with the American government per se, but the core toxin is old and it's Russian. I was looking for a trail that would lead to the culprit, and I was also looking for an antidote, offering enough money to make me absolutely sure it doesn't exist. If it did, we'd have it. Although he was a lawyer by trade, it didn't take long in Chip's company to know there was a lot more to him than this occupational moniker alone might have suggested. He had come into the McCarthy's circle due to his work with Phil Norris, back when that particular old friend had been covering up a more natural terminal illness of his own, and that seemed like a good fit, given some of the circles Phil had moved in throughout a life lived without much in the way of caution or mundanity. 
Chip and Clark, meanwhile, went all the way back to their school days, and his father went back even further with Henry McCarthy. With his flashy outfits and penchant for a questionable deal or two, Diamond Darko Petrovich had been a larger-than-life character around Birchwood long before Dan was born, let alone before his initial alien expose brought the town to global prominence. That was why Phil had chosen Chip to assist in tying up his fairly complicated business affairs before his own condition deteriorated too far, and the junior Petrovich won over Henry in no time. As was always the case, reputations didn't come from nowhere, and Darko's son proved to be a chip off the old block in more ways than one. Like his father, Chip went well beyond the call of duty for those few individuals he truly cared for. A trip to Russia to engage with high-level underworld figures on Timo's behalf exemplified this trait more than anything else ever had, and it said a lot about Chip that none of the others were particularly surprised to hear about this aspect of the whole sorry situation. Mr. Bird knows too, Chip said. He was there with Clark when I arrived. We couldn't tell Tara, not when she was pregnant and already dealing with the pulses on top of that, but that's it, no one else. The people I had to deal with along the way are the kind of people who deal in discretion on a daily basis, but none of them knew who I was there to help out and who I suspected of doing the deed. Mason should have no idea I'm on to him because I haven't had any contact with anyone even remotely connected to him. So what's the trail? Godfrey asked. And what's the motive? Piper chimed in. Although her tone was very straightforward when she raised this question, no one considered Piper also naive for doing so. Indeed, one trait of her brilliant mind was its eagerness to ask for explicit clarification of anything uncertain. She wasn't alone in wondering precisely why Mason would target Timo either, but some of the others had firm ideas as a starting point. My money is on Monopoly, Chip replied. If Mason and his corporate allies really have cracked the uplift powers, that can bring advantages in every field you can imagine. And when you think about how hard he's rallied against Timo's research up here, understanding it all in the context of Mason seeking a monopoly on the powers makes it a lot easier to make sense of. No one could disagree that there was an element of uncomfortable logic to this. Chip continued. For a long time, I wondered why he kept picking fights with Timo and making comments about some of you guys, but now I can see. If everyone has a horse, it can be a close and even race. But if you're the only one with a horse, you can go further and faster than everyone else. If you can do that under the cover of darkness like Mason has been trying here, all the better. I'm stretching the metaphor here, but it's like he's been trying to ban horses while keeping his own hidden away. Whether he has to hide it away forever or not, Having something no one else does can bring all kinds of advantages. William Godfrey nodded. That's right along my line of thought, he stated. But what about the trail you mentioned, Chip? How firm is that? How did you find it? And where did it lead? Chip nodded. As briefly as I can, Timo's doctor identified what they thought was a toxin a few months ago, and he asked me to look into it as discreetly as I could. Timo is standing right here and he can speak for himself, but when the richest man in the world gets poisoned, you're going to have too many suspects to deal with if you don't start drilling down fast. Pretty soon after I started digging into things, I found out that a biochemical lab in Honduras got a delivery of the toxin, and a Honduran ICA delegate got a shipment of something from that lab two days ahead of a trip to Buenos Aires, a trip for the summit Timo went to, and a summit where that delegate shook Timo's hand. If anything happened in my building, he's done, Godfrey stated without inflection. His face was wrought with anger and sadness, but his voice remained remarkably calm. Well, Chip went on, Mason had a long meeting with the Honduran delegate and no one else the day before he met Timo. The delegate then died in a car accident an hour after he landed back in Honduras, tying up the loose end. Oh, and if anyone needs anything else, back in Mason's trading days, which only takes us back a few years before he had to divest, he held a controlling share of a shell company that operated the Honduran lab. I'm not saying the guy Piper had a connection to is going to be in Honduras, because it doesn't sound like a water tower you'd see there, but that shell company is going to hold answers, just like Emporion brought everything together all those years ago. 
when we finally exposed what the likes of Blitz Media and John Cole were really up to with their neck-deep corruption. Piper inhaled deeply. So it sounds like Mason is bang to rights, doesn't it? And maybe by looking into this company and what other facilities are linked to it, we can find out who I felt the connection to and what's been going on with their secret uplift research? I really think so, Emma said, breaking a long spell of speechless listening. Getting some kind of recording or footage from the ICA building would be priceless for taking him down for good, but that's a ways away. While the guys on the ground scan the vault and the physicists here on the station keep trying to make sense of what happened to the gate and hopefully bring it back, we need to find this water tower and we need to find out whatever kind of powers might have been granted to the person who was looking at it. Talk of the damn devil, Alessandro grunted, raising his hand and pointing a finger to one of the TV screens across the room. The others followed his direction and saw that President Mason himself was standing behind a podium in the White House, evidently preparing to deliver a very rare direct briefing to the attendant press pack. This was anything but Mason's typical way of doing things, and the sudden change in approach brought nothing but trepidation to the PR-savvy Emma in particular. I don't like the look of this one bit, she said. And by the end of Mason's statement, the group's words and feelings would be a lot stronger than that. G-90, White House, Washington, D.C. In front of a small press pack, which had gathered at short notice to hear his words, U.S. President Nick Mason stood behind his podium with a very stern expression on his face. It was very rare for him to speak directly to the cameras in this manner, which only amplified the already rampant speculation about what he was going to say. The only official comment from Mason's office since the final pulse passed without total destruction had been a very short message of condolence to the loved ones of those who had died due to the secondary effects of electrical surges. In that comment, Mason didn't directly pin the blame on the ICA for what had happened, but nor did he reference the organization or its chairman at all. That was about to change, to no one's surprise, and Mason had a lot more to say on the matter than a written message could fully convey. Young and brash, Mason was as sharply dressed as ever as he took a deep breath to dive into the opening of his prepared but unrehearsed remarks. Every eye in the room was trained on his lower lip as his teeth momentarily bit it in a very uncharacteristic display of nerves. Those who knew Mason best knew this wasn't for the cameras, and they were now even more interested to hear what words would follow. Everybody in here knows I'm a doer, the president began, his unadulterated New York accent coming through clearer than ever. I'm not a talker. I don't love the sound of my own voice. I don't call you guys to come in here when there's nothing important to say. And when there is, I don't take 20 minutes of beating around the bush to get to it. The irony wasn't lost on some of the press pack that Mason was prefacing a supposedly straight-talking announcement with a meta-level introduction about how straight-talking he was, but in reality there had always been something about the cadence of his words that did make him an excellent and engaging speaker. Mason and his arch-rival William Godfrey could hardly have been more different, and the chalk and cheese variation in their manners of speech the brash American upstart on one hand, the ultra-refined and dynastic Englishman on the other, was perhaps the most obvious and tangible example of this. The difference ran much deeper, though, and more to the point, they weren't coincidental. In an age of ever-increasing polarization, people like Godfrey and Mason had attained their positions in no small part due to society's preference for extreme personality. It had been around 20 years since Godfrey first became the UK's Prime Minister, thanks largely to a campaign which played up his aristocratic family links and positioned him as an antidote to the artificially progressive metropolitan elite. Godfrey's speech patterns and mannerisms were a throwback to bygone days, which appealed to an electorate fed up of politics as usual and the seemingly endless parade of careerist copycats who preceded him. Mason, meanwhile, was quite simply the anti-Godfrey. Everything he was and everything he did stood in direct contrast to the ICA chairman, and not by accident. Put simply, Nick Mason was who he was because William Godfrey was who he was. 
I gathered you here today to talk about what happened yesterday, Mason went on, and more importantly to talk about what is and isn't going to happen tomorrow. No one knew quite what Mason meant by this, but the way he set it up certainly had the desired effect of making them curious. The presence of this vault constitutes a global emergency. Hundreds of American citizens are dead because of the electrical surge in the area around Mesa Verde, and my heart goes out to them. In normal times, that would be all we were talking about. Hundreds of American deaths caused by an alien structure. But that's not the only thing American families have been talking about today, because American families are terrified of what's going to come next. For two weeks, I've been trying to get a full international team on the ground in Scotland, and for two weeks, I've been shut out. Just what the hell are they up to? Just who the hell does Godfrey think he is? And don't even get me started on Prime Minister Logan rolling out the red carpet for the ICA and the anti-American McCarthy's to deal with a problem on her country's soil. If we'd found this thing here, we would have dealt with it, and no one would be dead. Mason paused there to let his words sink in. They were baseless, but they were strong. And as per usual, strong was all he was going for. He glanced quickly at his scribbled bullet point notes, which he always preferred over auto cues, reading the last line before turning the page. You can blame the architects for the piles of corpses around the world if you want, he said preparing to wrap up this topic in the most inflammatory way imaginable. But I blame Godfrey, Logan, and the McCarthys. G-89, 10 Downing Street, London, England. Diane Logan watched through gritted teeth as Nick Mason spewed his venomous and blame-apportioning nonsense to untold millions of viewers. The no-win situation she had been placed in when the need for mass evacuations became clear was worsened by her domestic political opponents seeking to nitpick holes in the details. In her mind, that had been irresponsible and petty at a time when party politics had no place in the urgent discussions and planning, but none of their interjections had come close to the kind of inflammatory comments Nick Mason was once again making in Washington. With the vault being explored as Mason spoke and with Godfrey confident answers would be found before long, Logan had decided to keep a low profile on the media side of things and comment only on the crucial recovery projects that would imminently begin in the Highlands. That was more important to her citizens than a pissing contest with Nick Mason, who by no means spoke for the people of America any more than the likes of John Cole had ever spoken for the people of Britain. Mason's day would come and very soon if Godfrey's confidence was justified. When it did, Diane Logan would laugh last. But for now, while the sharp-suited monkey flung shit in the air without any regard for where it landed, she would keep her head down and bide her time. G-88, White House, Washington, D.C. Seconds after brazenly and irresponsibly blaming two world leaders and the McCarthy family for the tragic loss of life which their collective actions actually kept to a minimum, President Nick Mason appeared energized by the shocked reactions his words drew from the press pack. If this had all happened here, we would have dealt with it properly, he insisted, but I damn sure would have let international observers keep an eye on our response, and that's the word, international. Cooperation between nations. That's how this should have been handled. But no, along comes Godfrey and up goes the curtain. The great people of this country didn't elect me to roll over to William Godfrey's ICA, and you can bet your bottom dollar I'm going to keep to every promise I made. Godfrey and his ICA cannot shut us out from whatever they're planning to do in that vault. Him and Logan have been pretty smart in how they've danced around certain clauses of the ICA charter, because if they had officially declared this as an emergency, we would have been entitled to send in a representative to oversee their response on the ground. And however they want to dress it up, everyone knows they made a political decision. The American people don't zip up the back, and neither do the great people of Scotland who have seen a huge area of their highlands decimated by these pulses. In what world was this not an emergency? It doesn't add up. Mason exhaled sharply through his nose. 
but you want to know what does add up? He continued, speaking more quickly and with ever more intensity than he already had been. What does add up are the tens of thousands of preventable deaths that happened all around the world yesterday, from Cambodia to Peru and especially in the great countries of Malta and Egypt. I'd have a better idea about all of this if I had any access to all of this, but it seems to me like the aliens who planted this damned vault in our ground have targeted our ancient heritage. It's an attack on the world, and I can't stand by and let the response be dictated by a self-serving egomaniac like William Godfrey. Crisis keeps Godfrey in power. Never lose sight of that. Allowing aliens to live and use their powers within Earth's orbit gives the ICA something to regulate, which gives the ICA a reason to keep existing, which gives William Godfrey a chair to keep sitting in. That is why he lets the aliens stay on Fiori's station, and that is why he's always been in bed with the McCarthys. Self-preservation is the only language Godfrey speaks, and if putting the world in danger is what it takes, whether that's by letting aliens operate in our skies, or whether that's dithering in the face of a subterranean threat, putting the world in danger is what he's going to keep doing. I stand here today to vow that I will not stand idly by and allow that to happen. For someone who claimed not to love the sound of his own voice, Mason had certainly gotten into quite the flow. At the end of the day, we don't know what the vault is, he said, upturning his palms and raising his hands in frustration. We don't know what's inside it, and maybe most importantly, we don't know what Godfrey and his goons did to it when they drilled into the ground and found a supposed door. All we know is that tens of thousands of people are dead. And another thing. Two weeks ago, Godfrey was at Logan's throat just like he was at mine. Then these pulses start and suddenly they're best friends? The timing is a little bit suspicious, don't you think? I'm not saying anything, I'm just calling what I see. But what is for sure is that whatever it is they've found, they don't want us to see. And make no mistake that this is about us in particular. They don't want us involved, but why? Maybe it's because they don't want us to know what they've been up to. Again. I'm just asking questions. Many members of the media had questions of their own, but no real hope of being able to ask them, since the only thing rarer than a direct announcement like this from Mason was one followed by a Q&A session. He didn't seem like he was finished, though, so they quietly hoped he would get to some of the points rattling around their minds. Who knows? This supposed discovery of an artifact could even be a total concoction, dreamed up to cover up something else. Maybe they've been conducting illegal uplift-related research on Earth. After all, if they were going to do something like that, wouldn't they choose one of the most remote locations available to them? Like, I don't know, the most northerly tip of Britain? This accusation, the first direct and tangible one Mason had made so far, drew expressions of new levels of shock and surprise. So, with all of this in mind, I'm right now calling for an immediate halt to all ground activity in Scotland. Our delegates in Buenos Aires are in the process of invoking Article 6.4 of the ICA Charter. This relates to halting dangerous activity, and it only requires a 26% vote to immediately pause all nationally or ICA-led alien-related operations within a specified member state until the whole assembly is satisfied that it's safe to proceed. The vote will be a formality, because we already have more than the 26% we need. Godfrey and Logan are both legally required to follow the will of the assembly in both letter and spirit, so ignoring the vote is not an option for them. When the assembly convenes on Monday, less than 48 hours from now, further exploration of the vault will be impossible until Godfrey and Logan open themselves and their actions up to proper scrutiny. This revelation was what Mason had been building towards, and it was a big one. Blocking all operations in Thurso wasn't something anyone had considered within his power, but thanks to an American-aligned voting bloc in the ICA Assembly and a relatively obscure clause in the agency's founding charter, it now seemed very much like it might be after all. I couldn't in good conscience invoke this clause when the world was quite literally counting down to disaster, Mason explained, preemptively addressing a point he knew many would be wondering about, not least because I knew Godfrey and Logan would sooner stop digging than start cooperating. But now that they've failed to protect the world's people at the very least, and quite possibly taken actions that have actively contributed to tens of thousands of deaths, I can't stand by for a second longer. William Godfrey stood in London a few hours ago and spoke of vengeance against whoever did this. 
To my mind, that sounds an awful lot like deflection and projection rolled into one. If he wants to put the past behind us and start cooperating, we can have a team in Scotland within hours. I'm willing to be the bigger man. But if he continues to be obstructive, we will take the legal route on Monday and put a block on all vault exploration. And I hope everyone realizes that if that comes to pass, it's Godfrey's fault. Mason took a half step away from his podium, signaling that he was almost done. Indeed, only one more line was left to come. Man to man, Godfrey, I've got a message for you. You can stand there all you want and talk about holding the responsible party to account. But let me tell you this. When your obstructive inaction kills hundreds of my citizens and when you block access to the object that caused it all, I hold you responsible. And if you don't reverse course on this, I will hold you to account personally and very, very firmly. I'm going to be in New York tomorrow night for a live discussion on Focus 2020. If you're half the man you used to be, I'm sure you'll be willing to join me. Cameras clicked and feet shuffled as Mason walked away. No one asked any questions, knowing full well they wouldn't have been answered. But across Earth, and particularly on the Il Cercatori space station high above it, one question was rattling around in many minds. Just what in the hell was he playing at? G-87, Fraser Steading, Thurso, Scotland on the ground in Scotland, Gio Nunes and his local helpers sat in their cabin in utter disbelief over what U.S. President Nick Mason had just said. The international politics of the situation, as deep and dirty as that side of things always was, didn't interest these men to any real extent. All they cared about was whether the politics would get in the way of the vault-scanning endeavor they were currently undertaking, since they really were doers rather than talkers, and wanted nothing more than to see what was down there and deliver the data to those who needed to see it on the space station and in London. With Mason's threat of pursuing a full block on all research at the vault now hanging over them, the men felt the weight of a new imperative to complete the process as quickly as possible. Scanning the vault with remote-controlled drones was a necessary precursor to manned exploration, and regardless of when that would become feasible, it remained crucial to get as much information as possible while the getting was good. So far, Geo had skillfully piloted and remotely unloaded a rover into the vault after Stevie and Davy carefully lowered it down the wide drill shaft they had dug and secured several days earlier. Like everything else around the vault's discovery, this had been a team effort, and it remained so. The two Scotsmen were naturally far more familiar with the televisual equipment inside the cabin, where they'd been cooped up for the past two weeks, than Geo was, and they were likewise more comfortable in the small space. They made everything as easy for their visitor as possible, though, giving him the rundown of their systems and helping him to connect the rover's main video feed to their largest monitor so Geo could get a much clearer live view than if he used a smaller screen that was built into the rover's remote control. That large screen monopolized Geo's attention for an hour or so, as he maneuvered the rover around the edges of a seemingly empty and cavernous room that extended some 800 meters at its longest edge. Stevie and Davy, when drilling horizontally in search of an edge to the huge object before they found the door which identified it as something with a hollow interior, had estimated its total length as at least 1,000 meters, so Geo was keeping an open mind that there might be some kind of second door on the inside. Like a fair number of others, Geo was operating under the impression that what was widely being termed a vault might in fact be an abandoned spacecraft of some kind. The word vault came from an ancient record found on New Kerguelen and could easily have been lost in translation, many of the group figured. A lot of them guessed William Godfrey had perhaps used the term vault because it had less immediately frightening connotations than a potential alternative like vessel, and brought more comfort than an uncertain term like object or artifact would have. Publicly introducing a word like spacecraft would have been unwise and perhaps even irresponsible of Godfrey, so Geo could see why he avoided it. A comment from Stevie as the rover made its way into the vault was also still echoing in his mind when the Scotsman vocalized his curiosity about not just 
what might be found in the vault, but who? Gio Nunes was better positioned than anyone else in the world to get some answers to these questions and many others, and the brief distraction provided by the others watching Mason's announcement on a smaller screen served only to focus his mind even further as soon as it was over. By the time it was over, Gio's rover was almost empty of the 30-plus individual drones he had let into the vault in the vehicle's trailer. Most of these drones were of the descriptively titled Boundary Finder class, which did as the name suggested, and were designed for use in caves and mines. Such drones sought walls and attached themselves when they found them, communicating with each other to provide the most even coverage they could. Each was equipped with highly acute sensors for monitoring all manner of atmospheric data, which would be sent to the station for further analysis within the hour, and they also included powerful lights to illuminate the target area in a far more literal sense. Alessandro Bonucci had asked Gio not to activate the lights until everything was set up. Gio gladly followed this instruction after receiving the explanation that it could be worthwhile to get the atmospheric data before introducing an unnecessary variable, since illumination might very slightly alter the readings related to temperature or any other data points affected by light among the hundreds the drone's sensors were set to record. That's the ten minutes up, boss, Stevie announced a few seconds before the countdown timer expired. It had now been ten minutes since the last of Geo's boundary drones positioned itself on its chosen point of the vault's distant wall, which was the minimum length of time Alessandro had asked him to wait before proverbially flicking the light switch. The ten minutes passed quickly due to the distraction of Mason's comments and the questions they raised, but the trio in the cabin were nevertheless itching for a sight of whatever was sitting underneath them. So far, they had only seen night vision images from the rover, and even then, the field of view had been very limited, since Geo was under clear instructions not to drive it around until the vault was well lit. Geo hadn't paid a whole lot of attention to most of the incoming data readings, which it was his job to gather rather than analyze. What he couldn't miss, however, was just how deep the vault was. While he had been picturing something akin to a long submarine, it now seemed like a long blimp might be a more accurate comparison. The rover had descended a fairly long ramp at a very steep angle, traveling almost 100 meters below door level and resulting in a floor position almost 200 meters below the high point of the ceiling. Quite how this thing still couldn't be detected in aerial and satellite deep scans by Timo Fiori's state-of-the-art equipment was something the best minds on the station were still wrestling with, so Geo tried not to beat himself up for having no idea. Do one of you guys want to press the button to light it up? Gio asked. After all, you and your drill found it. Davy shook his head. On you go, mate, but thanks. Speak for yourself, Stevie cut in. That would be amazing, Gio, if you're sure. Gio handed him the controls. Just make double sure you press illuminate and not detonate, okay? Stevie's face whitened. D detonate Davy howled in laughter beside him. He's joking, you idiot. Just hurry up and get a press, they want to see. Oh, Stevie said, not even able to try and pretend that he'd been playing stupid. Well, here we go. Gio and Davy stared intently at the big screen as Stevie's finger pressed down on the controls before his eyes joined theirs in watching for the big moment. In a sudden flash, thirty boundary drones lit up the vault's interior and gave three men in a Scottish field the first interior view of the colossal alien vault whose pulsating energy releases had killed tens of thousands of helpless people. But as the image settled on the screen, none of them knew quite what to say. Part 2. The Void Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. Sir Walter Scott G-86, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Tricatore. Just when you think someone can't be any more of an asshole, Timo sighed in reaction to Nick Mason's remarkable public proclamations. Oh, sorry, the Italian then added upon noting Piper's presence within earshot. Don't worry, Emma replied, appreciating it all the same. There are a few stronger words than that one running through my mind, believe me. 
I just literally cannot believe he's publicly accusing us and Logan of carrying out uplift research on Earth. He's projecting so hard he could get a job in a damn cinema. He's rattled, Godfrey said, a calm voice as ever. Which means he's dangerous, Emma replied. We've seen that before with John Cole and Jack Neal, and we're seeing it again now. He is rattled. I think he knows we're onto something. If not with the poisoning, then maybe the connection Piper felt. Melly, when Piper got that vision, do you think the person on the other end felt something too? Whether that was Mason or someone he's in contact with, do you think they felt something? The alien, always more lost when human concerns turned to politics than at any other time, was glad to receive a question she at least had some kind of insight on. There is no reason to think they would, she replied, the vocal translator once again proving its worth. When Piper was connected to Dan in such a way, long ago, he was none the wiser. That's right, Dan said. But I don't know about the rest of this. Isn't this just Mason doubling down like people like him always do? We know he wants rid of Godfrey and the ICA, we know he talks smack about us every chance he gets, and we know he rose to power by building this kind of siege mentality that everyone except him has hidden motives. His whole identity is anti-alien. So when something like this happens, not that there's even been anything like this, I guess, of course he's going to react like this. He makes mountains of molehills all the time. But this actually is a huge deal. Why are we surprised that he's making a mountain out of a mountain? Godfrey and Emma exchanged a pensive look via the screen. Dan, Godfrey sighed. He's not making a mountain out of a mountain. He's covering the mountain in petrol and firing missiles at it. Alessandro Bonucci, a physicist who sometimes dreamed of one day finding a dimension where politics had never been invented, closed his eyes and sighed. Forgive me, but we have a lot on our plate here. We have the vault, we have the gate, and we have the uplifted individual somewhere near a water tower. Does anything that Cretan just said directly affect anything we were planning to do within the next 24 hours? No, Emma said. Alessandro breathed a sigh of relief, but the moment was short-lived. Well, Godfrey chimed in, it doesn't necessarily affect anything you were planning to do within the next 24 hours, Alessandro, but to ensure you can stay on track beyond that, when he's talking about forcing a block on all ground research in Thurso, it certainly changes my immediate plans. Emma, I have an idea to work around the ICA Charter if necessary, but it's not going to be easy, and it's not going to be pretty. Go on, she encouraged. I also want to take him up on this Focus 2020 invite for tomorrow night, Godfrey said, going on in the literal sense of introducing a new thought rather than expanding on the last one. In the meantime, I strongly feel we should publicly disclose news of the gate's disappearance. Emma listened intently, not immediately signaling any disagreement, but looking as though she hadn't expected Godfrey to suggest this. The ICA has been running in need-to-know mode since the first pulse, Godfrey continued, so at this point only staff members directly involved in observation and signal monitoring are on the fringes. They don't know about Terra and Clark, but enough people know about the gate for there to be a non-negligible chance of something leaking out. If it did, it would get back to Mason and he would have a fresh new stick to beat us with while he cried cover-up and conspiracy. I'll put out a written statement without fanfare, just to cover our bases. No one objected to this idea. They had all been hoping the gate could be somehow restored before a moment like this arrived, but clearly that hadn't come to pass. Getting on top of the narrative so that the news could break as a revelation rather than an expose was a factor worth considering, as the group knew only too well from walking similarly fine lines in the past. I have to let Mr. Bird know first, Dan said. He knows they were going to New Kerguelen, so he can't find out the gate is gone when he's watching TV. He deserves better than that. For sure, Chip Petrovich nodded in full agreement. He's a good guy, old Bird. He'll be broken up by this however he hears about it, but it would be way worse if he found out from a press release or from Mason breaking the news on Focus 2020. Precisely, Godfrey said. Though the ICA chairman was responding to Chip, his eyes focused mainly on Emma. 
she hadn't reacted at all to his suggestion of accepting a challenge to appear on Focus 2020, which remained the nation's foremost current affairs show and could still bring in trend-defying viewing figures well into the tens of millions whenever a blockbuster guest was on the panel. Even with the long-standing and peerless host Marion de Klerk having stepped down several years earlier, the show retained its air of importance and gravitas in the capable hands of Maria Janzik, a one-time ACN beat reporter whose stellar work and knack for a story had seen her rise through the ranks to this most coveted of all media positions. To my mind, the timing of the show presents a golden opportunity, Godfrey went on. This is a chance to knock Mason down a peg or two while his support base is listening, which isn't a chance we often get. He's not someone used to having to hold his own against dissenting voices for more than a few seconds at a time, so I really do think I can give him quite the hiding. We can also fish for comments that can later implicate him even further when we unveil the evidence we're going to gather on his double dirty work with the toxin and the uplift research. I'm on board with that, Emma said, surprising no one but greatly relieving Godfrey. He could and would have done it without her, given the importance in his mind of seizing this opportunity, but her sharp instinct for message management and handling the likes of Mason was one he had come to value more with each passing year. But yeah, Chip Petrovich chimed in from Timo's side. Godfrey, if you're getting into all of that tomorrow, I really want you to make sure you do whatever you need to do tonight to find the security footage or at least some audio recordings from his meeting with the Honduran guy at the ICA. Can you do it tonight? I can, and I will, Godfrey said. We'll talk again after this about the precise details of the meeting so I can hunt everything out as efficiently as possible. But if your suspicions are correct about the nature of their meeting... Mason could be absolutely banged to rights with just this one piece of evidence. I trust you have backups on backups on backups of everything you've gathered about the facilities and corporations that pinned it all on him in the first place. Backups on backups on backups on backups, Chip grinned. And I guess I don't have to say that whoever you work with to get the security footage has to be someone we... I trust my security staff with my life every day I step into that building, Godfrey butted in. And I trusted them with mine, Timo Fiori couldn't help but interject. The words, infinitely sharper than any Timo normally uttered, seemed to take all of the air from the room. On the other side of the screen, Godfrey's eyes fell closed in sorrow. The words hurt, but only because they were so true. We're about to find out how the delegate smuggled a toxin into the building, Timo. But I wouldn't be surprised if it was in a capsule he'd swallowed or something like that. But I take the point. And believe me, Mason is going to pay for this. He'll pay before your time is up, I promise you that. Timo held Godfrey's eyes. He wasn't angry at him and knew he meant every single word he said, but the point had to be made in the context of Chip's reminder to be careful of who else had to be informed about any of this to facilitate the search for more evidence. I can never apologize enough that this appears to have happened in my building, Godfrey sighed, talking out of regret rather than guilt. And I will leave no stone unturned in making sure everyone involved goes down for it, whether they're in Washington or Honduras, I'll stake everything on my belief that there's no weak link in Buenos Aires, but for now, I'll act as though there might be. And hear me when I say this, Timo. If you want Nick Mason's head on a plate, I'll make sure you get it, even if it costs me my own. We'll get him together, Timo said, and that was all. Okay, young Piper interjected, clapping her hands together to put all that behind everyone. So, tonight... Alessandro is waiting on data from the vault to arrive any time. Some of the other physicists in the labs are still studying the spot where the gate used to be, and I'm working with Chip to get a short list of possible locations for the vision, right? Based on facilities we know are linked to Mason, and also just looking for a database of water towers or something? Emma, who Piper was looking at as she asked this, nodded in general agreement. Carrick and Serena would be good for something like that too, the water towers, they were working on lists of sats for the pulses, looking through old records and stuff like that. 
We could ask them to get involved, and I'm sure they'd love to help. Can they come here? Piper asked, somewhat comically, turning her head a full 90 degrees to address the question to Timo, who did, after all, own the station and have final say over who boarded. The billionaire shrugged while nodding, an odd mannerism he used quite often when expressing what he felt to be an obvious agreement with something. I believe Clark promised Serena a trip to the station, back when he first reached out to get her involved in all of this when she stumbled across the bird cam footage of the first pulse and shared it with Carrick. I gather she's remarkably sharp, but Clark has never broken his word, and I'm more than happy to keep the streak going. The mention of Clark drew a sad silence Timo had neither intended nor anticipated. Clark and Tara, as well as the baby they were expecting and the young son they had taken along on what was supposed to be a short trip to the safety of New Kerguelen, were never far from anyone's thoughts. The immediate problems caused by Nick Mason, as well as the stunning revelation that Timo was slowly dying at his hand, had, however, given everyone something else to worry about for a short while. And as difficult as the problems caused by Mason were, let alone the tragic reality that Timo wouldn't be around for much longer, the hierarchy of sadness for the McCarthys was easily topped by half of their family being helplessly stranded on the other side of a gate they had no idea how to repair or replace. I should really get to it with the sourcing of this security footage, William Godfrey said, taking it upon himself to break the silence. In mind of everything we've discussed, I'd like to come up to the station tomorrow morning and discuss things with you, then head to New York for the show. Time zones are on our side, Emma. I'll fly from London to Inverness very early in the morning, and then someone can pick me up from the station. We'll have until well into the British night before I have to go to New York for 7 p.m. Eastern time. Arriving over the city in a flying saucer from the station would set the cat amongst the pigeons, so I suppose we should find a quiet spot to touch down and drive in from there. Emma laughed at his comment, a welcome moment of humor, and agreed with all the rest. The others said their goodbyes to Godfrey. And remember, Timo, the ICA chairman said, if you do ever want Mason's head on a plate, just say the word, and it's yours. The call ended on that note, with Godfrey's firm words echoing. The ICA chairman wasn't someone who made a habit of saying things he didn't mean, and that reflected just how much seething rage he felt for Mason. Emma was last to turn away from the blank screen, unable to stop thinking about what might happen when Godfrey and Mason were in the same TV studio the following night. Focus 2020 had seen its share of happenings over the years and decades, with more than a few involving either her or Dan, but this would be on another level. And the more it ran through her mind, the more Emma felt like this was a level she wasn't too sure she wanted to see. G-85, Fraser Steading, Thurso, Scotland. Gio Nunez stared at the screen in the small cabin from which he was scanning the vault, dumbfounded by what he saw. Or, more to the point, Dumbfounded by what he didn't see. There's no there, Stevie astutely observed. Zelch, Davy added. Absolutely bugger all. Geo knew the old axiom that the Inuit supposedly had twenty words for snow, and he was beginning to wonder just how many the Scots had for nothing. The visiting archaeologist soon felt the weight of both men's stares and turned away from the screen to meet them. I think there's going to be another door inside, he stated. I'll send some of the boundary drones to other spots to check for differences in the density of the walls, and I'll take the rover for a spin to see if any areas seem different from the rest. Dan says the messenger's spacecraft and the corridors in the Great Shelter had doors that were barely visible until something touched them, and we know that was all architect technology, just like this thing. I'll admit I wasn't expecting to see a whole lot of nothing when we lit it up, but we haven't even scratched the surface. Aye, there has to be something, Stevie nodded. He sounded confident and wore an expression to match, buoyed both by Geo's expectation about a door and by the fact he had a plan of action to look for it. Despite the initial shock of seeing an empty chasm, none of the men had any real doubts that there were secrets and answers down there waiting to be found. For Geo and his allies, 
Now, more so than ever, as Nick Mason's threat of imminently blocking further vault research hung over their heads, all that counted was finding them. G-84, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Tricatore. When everyone gathered around Alessandro's main control deck monitor to witness the arrival of the first images from inside the vault, their reactions were much like those of the trio on the ground in Thurso. Put simply, there was nothing there. Dan likened what he saw on the incoming video feed to a hangar, and couldn't help but think back to the secret facility he'd been taken to in the wake of contact day, when government scientists first scanned his brain to see what a cable-based connection with the messengers might have done to it. The others reacted with various forms of surprise, some edging towards disappointment and others more so to relief. Maybe you need to touch the walls to activate another door or something? Dan said, following a thought already referenced on the ground. It was like that inside the great shelter on New Kergolen, plus the messenger's mothership, and we know the same architects are behind all of those. They put this in the ground, they built the shelter, and they granted the messengers all of the advanced tech they have. A possibility of something like that has been firmly in my mind, too, Gio Nunes replied. Emma chimed in next. Maybe there will be a door, and maybe someone does need to be down there to open it, but we can't think about sending someone in there until it's been checked a lot more thoroughly than it has so far. There could be traps or anything, just as likely as there could be doors. Nah, Piper said with a very dismissive shake of her head. Nah, her mother echoed, not thinking much of Piper's tone. It doesn't make any kind of sense for there to be traps or anything like that in there, the girl expanded. They wanted people to go in there, remember? Not us, obviously, but the people at Scarabray, where they left the key. They wanted them to go in, I guess. Maybe if they'd been sheltered from the pulse by some structure like the one on New Kerguelen. Something must have changed in their view of humans. But when they put this vault in the ground, they planned for people to go in. Whatever is in there, it was meant for humans to find. Well, Timo Fiori mused. We don't for sure know that the architects left the key at Scarabray, only that it ended up there. Orkney made a great deal of sense right until the find on New Kerguelen told us that the final pulse would wipe out life across the entire world. Until then, we didn't think the pulse's effects could cross water, so it seemed like Orkney was a perfect place to leave a key if the architects wanted to raise the mainland for whatever demented reasons they might have had. To be honest, when I hear myself, I see that nothing about what we know so far makes a great deal of sense at all. We'll hopefully have a lot more insight from the vault soon, though, and then the whole picture will be clearer. Timo looked across to the large analog clock on the wall, set to UTC, which he almost always did out of habit despite having a digital watch on his wrist and several computer screens in front of him. Has Godfrey seen this yet? he asked. I'll tell him next, Gio said. Timo shook his head. Don't worry about it. I will. He's got a lot on his plate right now. Following this understatement for the ages, Timo then asked Gio to share his own take on the data he'd gathered so far. There really isn't a lot to go on just yet, the archaeologist turned drone pilot admitted. We can't see anything from the initial scans, but we're going to look up close on every surface in case there are any hidden doors just like Dan mentioned seeing in those other alien settings. The intersection of the vault we've mapped so far isn't as long as the guys here expected the whole thing to be, based on the horizontal drilling they did last week. There is one bizarre phenomena that's making mapping the entirety of the object a lot more difficult than I expected, but it doesn't seem like one with any kind of solution. Geo shared his screen with the team on the station, bringing up a densely packed table of readings which seemed to indicate signal strengths. The readings the group saw took things from weird to weirder, and it was becoming increasingly clear that while the vault appeared empty to the naked eye, it was absolutely bursting with mystery. G-83, New Care Grill and Bar and Grill, Birchwood, Colorado Less than an hour after he received the grim news in a considerate text from Dan McCarthy, 
Walter Byrd sat among a stunned crowd of viewers as the main TV inside New Care Grill and Bar and Grill displayed a press release from William Godfrey's office. It was short and to the point, revealing to the public for the first time that all communication had been lost with New Care Galen, the planet after which the pub was named, at the precise moment of the final pulse. Furthermore, no instrumentation on Earth or the Il Tricatore space station could any longer detect any sign of the gate in the constantly monitored orbital position it had held for more than 15 years. It was universally known, if not universally supported, that dozens of scientists and support staff from almost as many countries currently called the alien world home, and the realization that those people were stranded without any clear hope of getting home added a heartbreaking human angle to the story. Despite the persistent whipping up of anti-alien hysteria by the likes of Nick Mason and a growing wave of reactionary populists across much of Europe, polls and social media meta-analysis consistently showed that a strong majority of Earth's citizens supported continued engagement and technological cooperation with New Care Galen's friendly messengers. Without a human angle, the loss of humanity's only means of contact with the aliens would have been an upsetting thing for billions of people to hear. But with the human angle of brave researchers separated from their Earth-based families, perhaps forever, gut-wrenching was a far more appropriate adjective than upsetting. To maximize immediate interest in a story that hardly needed any upselling, the ACN production team then filled the screen with two faces above the headline, Lost in Space. On the left was Leisha, New Kergalen's unanimously popular leader, and the messenger best known to viewers due to his central role in several key events over the years. Even though the messenger's browless and neotenous faces were different enough from human faces to make telling them apart from each other rather difficult, almost everyone would have recognized Leisha without the caption that identified him. The face on the right, meanwhile, needed no caption and didn't get one. It belonged to Billy Kendrick, the intrepid archaeologist who had been just as central to humanity's early years of contact as the alien on the left. Billy wasn't quite as universally adored on Earth as either he or Leisha were on New Kerguelen, thanks in large part to people like Nick Mason frequently painting him as a traitor to the human race. He was, however, widely respected and loved across generations and continents, with many viewing him as a bastion of bravery and quiet dignity, even in the face of all that had been thrown at him since the bygone days of the IDA leak when he had been shunned by the mainstream and painted as a played-out whack job. In the bar, where Mr. Bird had decided to spend the day to stave away his loneliness and keep himself from going crazy over the news for a few hours at least, several people began to openly weep at Godfrey's public announcement that the gate was gone. For Mr. Bird, that initial moment of desolation had already come when he first heard the news. For him, it was even starker, what with the worst news of all being that Tara, Clark, and Aiden had reached the other side of the gate just before it disappeared. If this had been publicly known, given the borderline messianic adoration a lot of people felt for the McCarthys, the outpouring of grief around the world would have been many times greater than it was going to be already. Mr. Bird couldn't even imagine how things would be there in Birchwood if the close-knit townspeople knew and he fully agreed with the decision Godfrey, and likely Emma, had made in leaving this detail out. Mr. Bird knew what kind of people Dan and Emma were, not to mention the Italians on the space station, and even Godfrey in recent years, and for that reason he knew they would have pulled out all the stops to try and rescue the humans on New Kerguelen, even if a trio so dear to them hadn't been among the stranded. That said, however, he knew there was bound to be a natural drive to give 110% when close loved ones were involved, and upon trying to look on the bright side, the old man considered that this could only help the chances of a rescue plan coming to fruition. Being in New Care Grillin wasn't always easy for him, since the place was home to so many memories of quite literally hundreds of consecutive nights spent there with Henry McCarthy and the bar's owner Phil Norris, the Three Musketeers and Old Boys of Birchwood, of whom Walter Byrd was the last man standing. The continued tears from other booths made it all too much to take around ten minutes after the news first broke. He got up to leave, but upon reaching the door found himself sighing at an all-new and unwelcome development. Outside, several local news vans had already rushed to the site 
and a trio of police officers were in the process of setting up barriers to keep the inevitable crowds at bay. Back to this, then, Mr. Bird thought to himself, certainly not having missed the invasive media scrums that used to descend on Birchwood like clockwork whenever any alien-related story hit the airwaves. It was, however, understandable to him that the media wanted to report on such things from Dan's hometown, and especially against the backdrop of the old drive-in where he had first revealed much of the evidence of a government cover-up, and of course, where the messengers themselves had first openly walked on Earth to converse with him on contact day. Mr. Bird was a well-enough-known face to garner attention when he stepped outside, and as the first reporter to spot him rushed forward, he was suddenly very glad of the police and their barriers. Questions came at Mr. Bird from all angles, mainly asking whether he knew anything else, but what he knew above all else in that moment was that he had to keep his head down and say nothing. As far as the public knew, all members of the McCarthy family were on Il Cercatore. Mr. Bird made the short walk to his car as briskly as he could, desperate not to let anything slip. He wasn't going to say anything, of course, but he'd grown media savvy enough over the years to know that all it took to set the gossip mill and muckrakers into action was a surprised expression in the face of a cleverly worded question. He reached his car and drove away, making eye contact with no one until he finished the short drive home. When he got inside, he couldn't help but look out his window and across the street to the old McCarthy house where Henry had raised the boys. It was still in the family, but Dan and Emma lived in the next house along which she had bought from old Mrs. Naylor before the two were even a couple. Both houses were empty for now, but what stung Mr. Bird was that the old farmhouse at Eastview was empty too. It had been through its share of high-profile owners, passing from the titanic Richard Walker on to the much-missed Phil Norris, who then left it to Clark in his will. Mr. Bird had been sitting on the porch looking over the cornfield with Clark and Tara just a few days ago, and the possibility of never seeing them again was one he couldn't even begin to get his head around. In recent years it had come to seem to Mr. Bird like life was now taking more things from him than it gave, but this latest loss, which he hoped and prayed would be a temporary one, was perhaps harder to take than any other. He sat down and opted not to turn on the news, wisely thinking it wouldn't do any good to follow the emotionally manipulative network's take on a story that was more than upsetting enough on its own. Instead, he flicked the station to the ball game and got as comfortable as he could for what he hoped wouldn't be too long of a night. But expecting restful sleep with the issue of the gate weighing on his mind was like expecting Christmas in June. So the best Mr. Bird could really do was devote his energies to the hope that there wouldn't be many nights like this before the determined geniuses and devoted family members on the station found a way to make things right. It might have been a long shot to end all others, even for them, but there was no one Mr. Bird would rather have been counting on. G-82, Control Deck, Space Station Il Cercatore The initial data is frustrating, Alessandro Bonucci admitted, but it is not entirely surprising. What are we looking at? Dan asked, speaking for everyone else, too. Oh, sorry. These are the strengths of the measurable signals from each drone inside the vault, Geo explained. Normally, at the depth they're at, we'd be seeing levels at 100%, even through steel. Clearly, as you can see, we're not seeing anything close to that. Our transceivers on the ground are picking up some signal strength, but we have very good reason to think it's all leaking through the open door. The numbers on the screen were starting to make a little bit more sense now, but gaps remained in Dan's understanding. The door is still partially open, Geo continued, since we naturally don't want to risk fully closing it in case we can't get inside again, so there is some signal leakage there. The higher values you see here are the drones closest to the door, and those are the ones communicating most effectively with our above-ground sensors. No signals whatsoever are getting through the vault, which is something I'd struggle to believe if I wasn't seeing it with my own eyes. These are powerful data signals that penetrate everything we've ever tested them with even at massive depths and huge distances. Dan's eyes, more interested now that there was some real context to make sense of the data, scanned every line of numbers until he felt like he'd gotten to grips with the explanation. 
the pattern was clear. The drones contain signal tech we've reverse-engineered from New Kergelen, Geo went on. But they also emit standard waves as a secondary test point, and we're seeing nothing from those signals either. That might seem obvious, since the modified alien signal tech is much stronger, but it's worth pointing out because it rules out any possibility that the Architect's Vault does something to the signal technology they created. What we're seeing is that it does something to all signals. It blocks them from getting in or out. If the door was fully closed, we'd be staring at a screen full of zeros. Hmm, Piper uttered, in a slow manner that suggested she had something else to say. The others faced her while she thought it over. So I guess this is why no one could see the vault from above, even with the aerial deep scanning equipment Billy used to find Dortelutepe fifteen years ago? Maybe the vault's exterior is made of some material we don't know about, one that shields heat signatures and blocks all kinds of signals. You know, like total stealth. Maybe, Timo Fiori replied. We know the vault doesn't contain a vacuum or anything of that nature. Not when the door is open, and we're seeing no major atmospheric differences on either side. But this question of the vault's actual composition is making me wonder just how safe it would be for anyone to be in there for any length of time, regardless of what the main data readings tell us. There are so many unknowns here. The material could be toxic. The air could be noxious in ways our equipment can't detect. We just don't know. If we had no urgency here, we could keep scanning while slowly introducing plants and water and basic animal life to see how all of that held up. As it is, anyone who goes in to explore will definitely need an exploration suit and a strict time limit on their shift. It's made of metal, Alessandro said very plainly and very curtly. We've looked at the door and it's an alloy we could make if we wanted to. The outer shell, at least, is nothing remarkable. What I think they have in place here is a technology similar to another one we've reverse-engineered in the past fifteen years, Geo. Namely, the shielding that's used to keep humans safe during a trip across the gate to New Kergelen. At first, that protection came from the pods, Dan, you'll remember, but more recently we worked with the messengers to develop the transition room on the craft, which enabled far more people to pass in a single trip. But the pods were made of glass, Dan said, both confused and surprised to be hearing about this for the first time. They were, Alessandro replied, and that point actually helps with the explanation. You see, it was effectively double-glazed, two layers of glass separated by air for insulation purposes, you know. But in the case of the pods, instead of plain old air, the gap between layers was filled by a highly charged signal, almost like a current, for ease of reference. That was in place to protect human travelers from whatever interference might have come from the gate, so it makes sense to think of it being used more specifically as signal-blocking technology. And you reverse-engineered it? Piper asked, sounding more than a little impressed. I had very little personal involvement, Alessandro said, downplaying his role as his lack of ego usually saw him do. But our team did, and the walls of the transition room were shielded using that technology, if the team could have physical access to a piece of the door, I think we could get to the bottom of it in no time. A new voice entered the conference, tinged by a strong Scottish accent. We can cut you off a bit of the door if you want, mate. The voice belonged to Stevie, one of the drilling operators working with Geo above the vault in Thurso. He wasn't visible on screen, but his well-intentioned interjection brought smiles to all of those who were. You wouldn't really get much useful information from it, though, would you? Piper asked, turning again to Alessandro. Usually I'd be with you in saying let's find out as much as we possibly can about every single thing we can get our hands on, but we do kind of have bigger fish to fry here, don't you think? The Italian nodded. I appreciate the offer, my friend, he said to the unseen Scotsman, but I think it would be a needless risk. I know the door isn't going to be closed, since, like Gio said, we don't want to find ourselves in a situation when we can't reopen it. However, closing the door in an emergency situation doesn't seem like a fallback option we should throw away unnecessarily. Cutting off a section of it to study would do that. I have no personal concerns about human explorers entering the vault, providing they wear a suit, as Timo suggested, because those suits provide a fully controlled and stable environment with enough oxygen supply for many hours, a lot longer than anyone will need. 
Do you have the suits in different sizes? Piper asked. Rarely had one question said so much, and never had one question brought more discomfort to the girl's parents. You're safest up here, Alessandro replied, as diplomatically as he could. Piper returned his gaze unflinchingly. And planes are safest on the ground, Alessandro, but that's not what planes are for. That's not where a plane's potential is fulfilled. I'll keep you all posted on how things play out with our close-up scanning, Gio Nunes announced after a long and uncomfortable silence. I wish you all the luck in the world with everything about the gate in the meantime. After a few quick goodbyes, the call was over. The fact that Geo's well wishes were limited to the observations and analysis the station's physicists were conducting of the orbital location where the gate used to be reflected not so much that he thought it was the most pressing challenge they faced, although with Terra stranded in many ways it was, but rather that as far as he knew, it was the only major challenge they faced. For now, Geo knew nothing of Piper's connection with another seemingly uplifted individual or indeed the group's discovery of the lengths Nick Mason had gone to in poisoning Timo. So far, the clearest motive anyone had suggested for Mason's actions in Buenos Aires, particularly when considered alongside his undying calls for a full ban on all alien-related research in Earth's orbit, as well as on the ground, was his desire to secure the advantage of a total monopoly of access to the uplift powers. Now that those powers seemed to have been reverse-engineered or otherwise mastered by one of the shady biotech corporations Mason had been heavily involved with over the years, the group hoped it wouldn't be long until they could find something to decisively pin it all on him. Geo's ignorance to this was partly down to the fact he was currently working alongside two civilians, trustworthy though they were, but primarily because he simply didn't have to know right now and had more than enough to occupy his mind. Within a few minutes, Timo shared some quick text messages to and from William Godfrey on the two core subjects of the moment, the vault and Nick Mason. He efficiently looped Godfrey in on the ground team's progress so far and explained that he'd asked Geo not to report anything directly, given the greater urgency of what Godfrey himself was working on. There was no big news on that quite yet, understandably so, given how little time had passed but Godfrey insisted he was highly confident of being able to source some security footage that would bring Nick Mason down once and for all. And while the ICA chairman found the lack of anything much to speculate on regarding the initial images slightly underwhelming to his naturally inquisitive mind, he noted that this at least left him free to focus full-heartedly on the other matter at hand. Godfrey would be in Thurceau the following morning, and then on the station shortly afterwards, providing all the time they would need to pore over the latest findings from the vault and hopefully some incriminating ones from Buenos Aires. Shortly after that, Piper announced that she was going to try to catch a few hours of sleep before there was anything new and tangible for her to deal with. It sounds like tomorrow will be packed, she said, and I feel pretty tired after everything that happened. Of course you will be, Dan replied gently. You were out of it until a few hours ago, darling and no one has ever gone through what you did yesterday. Emma inched to Piper's side and put an arm around her. We'll talk to the doctors for a second to check everything is okay, then hopefully we'll be able to go to your usual room in the dorms. It's more comfortable than the hospital bed for sure. Piper smiled. It was nice to think she had a usual room on board Il Cercatore, which had long been her favorite place to visit since she had always been allowed and encouraged to share the same mental gifts she had to hide away on Earth to avoid raising suspicions. It was difficult to see any good in a situation that saw tens of thousands dead and Tara's family stranded on New Kerguelen, so for Piper, this small bright spot of spending so much time on the space station was a minor consolation, rather than anything to shout about but with positivity and understandably short supply, she made an effort to take moments of happiness wherever she could find them, and however brief they might be. I just can't believe you want to go back down there, kid, Chip Petrovich mused from a seat at the other side of the control deck. You sure do walk the walk. That's not something to think about for tonight, Emma said. The comment, very noticeably stopping short of ruling such a thing out, brought a wide-eyed smile to Piper's face. Piper and Emma had clashed during the countdown to the final pulse about the girl's desire to selflessly fulfill her unique potential in helping humanity however she could, 
which ran counter to Emma's naturally protective instincts. A few incisive comments Piper had made about the responsibilities that came with her gifts caused Emma to see things differently. But what had since really flipped things in her motherly mind was how much harm Piper had avoided by taking an action Emma would have ruled out if she had asked for permission before doing it. For her whole life, Piper had done things that constantly reminded those close enough to know her that she really was a child like no other. But in generating a force field which contained a kinetic pulse that was otherwise on course to end all human life on Earth, Emma had come to view Piper as something much more than a special child. Piper possessed great power that she only ever wanted to use for good. And in a world like this, Emma was beginning to think she was no one to get in the way of that. Piper knew her powers and their limits better than anyone else, and she was better positioned to know how and when to use them. In the days to follow, however, as the multiple plans the group were working on accelerated and led to unimagined discoveries, the powers the group had so far witnessed at the hands of Piper McCarthy would look like absolutely nothing. The best and the worst was yet to come. G-81, Planetary Research Committee, New Birchwood, New Kerguelen. New Kerguelen's Planetary Research Committee, home of Billy Kendrick's office and base for the archaeology and exploration-focused activities he carried out to satisfy his own insatiable quest for discovery, was all but empty when Clark McCarthy entered. You'd make the worst ninja, Billy called without turning away from his screen. He would know those footsteps anywhere. But have you ever tried auditioning for the part of Godzilla? Clark laughed heartily. And I guess you're the nerd who tries to warn everyone I'm coming? Something like that, Billy chuckled. But how are you? He added, wheeling out the empty chair next to his own. Looking more than a little deflated, Clark sat down. He had delivered a fairly rousing speech the previous night in an effort to keep morale among the human workers stationed on the planet at a reasonable level which was a lot harder than usual when those workers had understandable doubts over whether the gate that represented their only way home could still function, and whether there would even be a home to return to. Clark hadn't sat on the fence in telling them that the gate's return was a matter of time, when rather than if, but Billy knew him better than most. Always the tough guy, Clark couldn't fake his feelings in Billy's presence. Sometimes his outward-facing embodiment of strength was necessary for the greater good, such as when continued harmony among a group of agitated and fearful workers was on the line, but Billy knew there was no ego in anything Clark did. He did what he had to do, never less and often more, and there was a lot for Billy to respect in that. Is she going to be okay? Clark eventually asked. Billy stayed quiet for several seconds, looking closely at Clark. He wasn't a broken man by any means, but there were signs that some of his resolve might be starting to break. You're all going to be okay, he said after several seconds of thought about the best way to phrase this. We're all going to be okay, Clark, every last one of us, but especially you and your family. But this isn't where we should be, Clark said. He was staring at the floor as he spoke and being very uncharacteristically open about his feelings. This in itself was a concern for Billy, but Clark's unease really couldn't have been any more natural. Breaking it all down, Billy didn't know how the storm could have been much more perfect to break a man than stranding his family on a foreign planet when his wife was about to give birth and when neither had any real reason to have confidence that the rest of their family and friends back on Earth were still alive. Clark might have been looking at the floor, but Billy imagined he would have been curled up on it if anything like this had happened to him. To top it all off, Clark was also carrying the weight of some terrible news about Timo that not even Dan McCarthy or Alessandro Bonucci had been privy to, and which his wife still couldn't know. That one piece of news about Timo's terminal condition had knocked the wind out of Billy all by itself which gave him an even greater appreciation of the compounding pile of everything Clark was living with. The human doctors here are as good as any on Earth or the station, Billy said. No human has ever been born here, but we're fully equipped for the eventuality, and we have skilled medics with plenty of delivery experience. I won't lie, I checked on that yesterday because I was a little bit worried myself. Like you said, 
This isn't where anyone thought you and Terra would be for this. But four weeks is a long while, Clark. There's every chance you'll be home long before then and looking out over that cornfield. I'd say with a beer in your hand, but it's probably going to be a baby's bottle. Clark nodded several times, feeling boosted by Billy's positivity. He didn't like asking for help and, despite his better efforts, couldn't shake the urge to bottle things up for fear of looking weak. Not his favorite of all the traits he inherited from Henry. But Billy made him feel more at ease than anyone with the possible exception of Mr. Bird. But I didn't come in here to talk about myself, Billy, he said. I heard you were still in here and I just wanted to see what's keeping you so busy. Billy gestured towards his large curved computer screen. Several aerial shots of an island, captured by mapping drones, were dotted around different areas of the huge screen. Simple, Billy said. I want to go back to the Isle of Answers and find the vault. G-80, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Cercatore. It didn't take long for the station's medical team to give Piper the all-clear, even factoring in the few minutes they spent gently admonishing both her and Emma for the unauthorized discharge of earlier in the day. Everyone could see the funny side of a young doctor reluctantly laying down the law to Emma McCarthy as he stuttered nervously through the discharge protocol, which he reminded them was to be followed in the unwanted event of anyone else ever being treated in the station's hospital at a later date. That's you told? Piper whispered as she and Emma headed for the room Timo and the station's on-site housekeeping staff had kept ready for her. This earned a playful elbow in the side from Emma, who was glad of the few moments of normality. That walking to a small dorm room on a space station now felt like normality said a lot for how crazy things had gotten lately and was a reminder that perspective really was all about relativity. Can you stick around for a while? Piper asked when they reached her room. Of course I can, Emma replied, sitting down next to her on the edge of the bed. Always. Piper smiled. When it eventually faded, a look of curiosity tinged her expression. How much do people know about me now? She blurted out. Emma's furrowed brow expressed her confusion with no need for words, inviting a clarification which quickly came. What does the world know? How much of what happened is public news? Ah. Emma said, tipping her head back slightly in understanding. People know you got hurt because you were down there putting the artifact in place when the pulse hit, but the story is that you were down there because you're the smallest and there wasn't much space. Everyone knows you put yourself on the line and almost died saving the rest of us, so the main parts are all true. Did you get hurt? Piper asked. When I pushed you back, I didn't mean to, I just had to make sure you didn't try to reach me while I was putting the force field between us. Emma shook her head. Nothing sore enough to even register at the time over all the adrenaline that was pumping. But there is a pretty gnarly bruise on the small of my back from where I hit into the edge of the lift. So I guess I owe you one. The wink that came with these words drew laughter from Piper. She had her own aches and pains from the impact of the pulse's kinetic force, but fortunately nothing that the standard painkillers she'd been given couldn't dampen to well within manageable bounds. Piper's mind was clear, which struck her as the more important thing, since bodies got beaten up and rehealed all the time, whereas there was no similar weight of references to draw when considering whether a brain exposed to the pulse at close range would have the same luck. Can we watch some of the footage from when it all happened? The girl asked. I feel like I experienced something different from all of you guys, let alone the people who only got to see it on TV. I don't think I'll sleep as easily as I expected earlier if I still have a lot of questions in my mind. Emma reached for the TV remote. Do you just want to see the broadcast from when it happened? She asked, feeling like this would be illuminating for her, too. She figured it could be quite instructive for the following day's work, when she got down to helping William Godfrey get ready to verbally eviscerate Nick Mason on Focus 2020 in a manner that would appeal to the general public's sensibilities over everything that had happened. Knowing how what happened had come across on TV was a crucial part of that, Emma was coming to think as soon as Piper brought the idea up, and watching it now would save time the following day and allow more constructive one-on-one -on -one time with Godfrey. The main thing for right now was helping Piper sleep, though. 
and of the two birds Emma could kill with this one stone, that was the one she cared about most. The TV was only on for around 25 minutes, but this was more than enough to give them both some eye-opening realizations of how things had come across for the billions of people who had been watching through their fingers as the red countdown timers in the corner of their screens approached zero. The first network's live footage they watched back was ACN, which completely blacked out at the moment of convergence and didn't return for almost ten seconds. A massive outpouring of relief occurred in the studio when it dawned on everyone that they had made it to the other side. This pattern was common across all satellite or internet-based networks in all countries due to the pulse's brief but total effect of overwhelming all broadcast signals and cellular communication. As seconds turned to minutes, the joy in the ACN studio turned to desolation as news filtered in that huge problems were being reported around the world. In the broad vicinities of areas near the famous sites, which had been affected by electrical surges during the earlier pulses. Scenes of burning planes and industrial disasters made the jubilation of just a few minutes earlier look more than a little out of place. But no one could fairly blame the anchors or guests for reacting to what had seemed at the time like a close escape. In reality, it had been a close escape from total destruction that would have made the sporadic incidents, as tragic as they were for those involved, look trivial in comparison. A far more measured degree of positivity returned when the anchors relayed the news that the twelfth and final pulse hadn't decimated any wider area of the Scottish Highlands than the 123-kilometer radius zone that the previous pulse had flattened. This really was good news, since the difference between 123 kilometers and 246 kilometers amounted to the continued existence of the major cities of Aberdeen and Inverness, by far the most populated in the north of Scotland. Both had been evacuated in any case, of course, with everyone who wanted to leave already having been safely moved south. Nevertheless, it was very good news that the curtailment of the pulse's kinetic effects before reaching the cities would ensure untold resources were saved and that huge numbers of people were able to move back home immediately. The losses to those further north were terrible, but because the numbers were relatively few, they could receive meaningful assistance from the rest of the country. If a much bigger chunk of Scotland, or perhaps even Great Britain as a whole, had been flattened, any real recovery would have proven a lot harder. Finally, helicopter footage from the sea near Thurso captured shots from the field at the center of everything. The highlight to this section came when a UFO uncloaked itself just beside the cabin, moments before Emma emerged from the lift shaft with a motionless Piper in her arms. In the present, Piper looked away from the TV and watched her mother's reaction. Tears were welling in Emma's eyes, but she stubbornly refused to let them fall. I didn't think about how hard that must have been for you, the girl said. Emma blinked hard. Don't start now. It wasn't half as hard as what you did. Not even close. The more Piper watched, both of the footage on the screen and her mother's uncharacteristically fragile reaction to it, the stronger her conviction came to set things right in every way. The very last news item she watched was a replay of William Godfrey's stirring speech from a few hours before she woke up, in which he vowed vengeance against those responsible for the destructive pulses. The girl previously concerned only with seeing Tara, Clark, and Aiden again, as well as doing whatever was necessary inside the vault to ensure it posed no future threat, felt anger building for the first time. Like Godfrey, she felt a burning rage coursing through her, aimed squarely at the architects who had caused all the problems her overstretched family and their inner circle were now trying to deal with. They really will pay for this, she said to Emma. Mason will pay, but so will they. As long as we're all safe and as long as we're all together, Emma replied. I'd be happy to never think about them again. Piper nodded as she shifted in the bed to get ready for sleep. She didn't agree, and for the first time in her life, felt a real thirst for vengeance. But this didn't seem like something her mother had to hear after all she'd been dealing with throughout the day and with all that was likely still to come. Good night, she said, closing her eyes. Good night, sweetheart, Emma replied. Sleep tight. G-79, Planet 
Planetary Research Committee, New Birchwood, New Kerguelen. Finding New Kerguelen's vault will give us an idea of what's in the vault on Earth, Billy Kendrick said. And if the pulses did have something to do with screwing up the gate, then it might just give us a way to set that straight. The second part is maybe a long shot, but when have I ever shied away from a long shot? The aging archaeologist's hair was now white rather than silver, and his skin had wrinkled, as that of a man who'd spent most of his life in the sun typically did, but his boyish grin was as enlivening and infectious as ever. But I want to explore all of these islands, he went on. Some of these images are of different islands, aren't they? Clark asked in belated realization. He noticed then that the coastlines were slightly different shapes, and the pattern of tree coverage likewise different, but the fact that they were either all the same size or more likely had been blown up to the same size on the screen made it quite understandable to have thought each was a different shot of the infamous Isle of Answers. A bunch, Billy said. As you can see, some of them have the same level of tree coverage or even more, which means there could be all kinds of stuff under there. One thing the other islands lack are underwater transcripts around their coastline, so I don't think we'll be finding any vaults there. But that definitely doesn't mean there won't be some animals scurrying around or maybe even some ruins waiting to be found. You think? Clark asked, genuinely interested thanks in no small part to Billy's undying enthusiasm. Billy nodded. Absolutely. And a find here, pound for pound, tends to be a lot more illuminating than a find on Earth. You see, every nook and cranny we've found on this planet so far has been filled with transcripts and native writing telling us what we're looking at. From the outpost I found with Dan, Boone's Hall of Memories, and then the pyramid we found last week. The kind of records that have been kept here are like something from a dream an archaeologist would have and then wake up thinking it was too good to be true. But that's what this place is like, Clark. When Billy spoke about things he was passionate about, like this, it was difficult for listeners not to get swept along in the wake of his enthusiasm. He hadn't been a record-breaking podcaster, arena-filling public speaker and massively successful tour guide for nothing, after all, and few things got him going like ancient alien discoveries. You see, the history of what the architects did here is so deep and so deceptive, there are bound to be more secrets that I couldn't even hazard a guess about right now, he went on. Just remember, a week ago we didn't know there had ever been a population of messengers living anywhere except this little peninsula. Now that we know one distant island was inhabited, it changes our expectations about each of the others. The potential is incredible, and I really feel like the limiting factor is our imagination. Sanctuary was incredible for its own reasons, and Dordelou Tepe set a lot of things in motion. But there's just something about New Kerguelen. It's definitely one hell of a place. Clark could only agree. His own mind now turning to some of the things he'd noticed most clearly in a visit he hoped wouldn't have to go on for much longer. That was no slight on the planet itself, and certainly not on its inhabitants, of course, but simply a reflection of Clark's driving desire to bring his family home to where they belonged. One thing no previous visitors ever really talked about when they discussed New Kerguelen, for reasons Clark couldn't begin to understand, was how trippy it was to walk around on a planet with two suns. The lighting and shadows of objects always started to look off if he looked in one place for too long, and the first sunset he'd experienced was more eerie than spectacular. When he tried to make sense of why no one else had made a bigger deal about this, only ever mentioning it in passing the way someone might say some foreign country they'd visited was unusually humid, the best explanation Clark came up with was that an obvious self-selection bias meant that everyone else who came to New Kerguelen knew way more about astronomy than he did and had doubtless read a lot more sci-fi books than the flat zero he had ever picked up. With that in mind, he figured that they might have been more familiar with the idea of there being two suns in the same sky, which made it less of a shock to their systems than it was to his. When Clark gazed back to the screen and then to his old friend, a new question entered his mind. Say, Billy, if you could go home, would you? I know the doctors don't think it's safe because of the hit your heart took when you spent too long on the other side of that crazy time gate, but I mean, if you knew it was going to be safe. Or do you like it here too much? There's more to find here, Clark, 
Billy replied, not just answering the question but saying more about himself in one sentence than some public figures managed in entire autobiographies. And a lot less politics, Clark chimed in, saying quite a lot about himself in much the same way. The trains run on time, Billy went on, the joke drawing a full-on blurt of sudden laughter from Clark, his expression then turned more serious as another thing he wanted to discuss while he had Clark's ear came back to the front of his mind. Everything okay? Clark asked. He couldn't miss the sudden change in Billy's expression. The old archaeologist forced a nod. I've just raised something with Leisha and he wasn't particularly receptive, but I want to clear it with you before I mention it to anyone else. Yeah, Clark said, his curiosity heightened by the uncertain tone Billy used, as well as his words themselves. Billy gulped, underlying that uncertainty even more clearly. Okay, but remember it's just an idea, so don't shoot the messenger. G-78, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Tricatore. Soon after, she was sure Piper was sound asleep, Emma returned to the control deck where she walked in on a fairly deep-sounding conversation between the only two people still there, Dan and Alessandro. We're firing constant and variable signals at the gate's orbital location, Alessandro was saying, but so far we're getting absolutely nothing back. None of our instrumentation has detected its presence since the moment of the convergent pulse when it just... went. The gate to New Kerguelen? Emma asked, announcing her presence with a question designed to turn her 99.9% .9 certainty that this was what they were talking about into 100% certainty. Alessandro nodded. So what are you doing in terms of the gate research I've heard people talking about? She asked her tone neither accusatory nor impatient. Is it more like waiting and hoping? I'm certainly holding out a modicum of hope that the gate is somehow still there on the other side, Alessandro said, stating this out loud for the first time. He was always loath to say anything that might give the listener more hope than he felt was merited, and as he approached middle age, he was now just about old enough to know that other people reacted more emotionally to news about things they were invested in than his scientifically driven mind typically did. Do you mean that you hope it's still detectable in their sky? Dan asked, either visually, like it always was, or even just through some other observation? Precisely, Dan, the Italian replied. I'm hoping they can see it or at least tell that it's still there, and if they can, then I'm hoping someone on New Kerguelen decides to try and force their way through it. Billy told me years ago that the natives worship the ground Terra walks on, and we all know how much Leisha thinks of Clark. If there's anything the messengers could possibly do to fix this, I'm sure they will. So the main hope is that they can still detect the gate in the first place. On all of those points, there's nothing we can do besides wait. There is another element to my hopes about the gate, though. It's one I hesitated to share in front of Piper, in case she got overly invested in what remains a huge long shot. Emma and Dan both implored Alessandro to go on, their expressions doing all the work and leaving no need for words. Well, he began, taking a brief second to consider how best to phrase his point without giving Piper's parents too much hope either. While I do live in measured hope the old gate will return, I have a team of remarkably intelligent physicists working around the clock on what it might take to make a new one. I can't state strongly enough that this is a million to one shot, but in due course, I think it will be a shot. What's the due course? Emma asked, jumping immediately to this. If there's something we can try to bring Terra home, why aren't we trying it now? Needless to say, this is not a problem we anticipated having, Alessandro replied and while portal-like technology of the kind we see in the gate is something we've been working on for a while, none of it has been with the goal of reaching New Kerguelen. We're collating every data point we have about every journey that's ever been made across the gate, but it's a very ambitious plan. I'd call it a moonshot, but at least we know where the moon is. That's our main challenge here. Emma didn't know how to feel about any of this, and could quickly see why Alessandro had kept it from Piper. His tone oscillated from scientific excitement to expectation-managing realism, 
sometimes multiple times within a single sentence. What kind of work goes into that? She pushed. What are the team actually doing? Here, nothing, Alessandro replied. But with the equipment and particularly the small colliders within the heartbeat probe, I've been doing some remote-controlled experiments around dimensional flux for a few years now. That probe contains robotics equipment far beyond anything anyone knows about, which reflect the benefit of Fiori Frontieri not having a commercial structure that would require us to divulge such things to investors. This wasn't quite all French to Emma, nor was it the kind of clear answer she'd been looking for. She tried again. But what are you actually doing? What are you actually studying? Things the more cautious among us didn't want to do on Earth, or even this close to it, and things that aren't on any lists of the experiments we're officially conducting on Heartbeat. I'm sure you remember how much of a huge deal the probe was when we launched it, but it's largely been forgotten by the mainstream media. To my mind, it's the single most important probe ever launched, not just because of how far and how fast it's traveling beyond the sun, but because of some of these things we're doing. Things like what? Emma pushed. Or if I won't follow it, things related to what? Interdimensionality, the Italian calmly replied, uttering the word like he said it a hundred times a day. Emma gulped. Oh. G-77, Planetary Research Committee, New Birchwood, New Care Galen. As Clark looked on with an intense expression, Billy eventually forced out the idea he wanted to clear with his old friend before taking it to anyone else. Well, Clark, he said, pushing away all final hesitation. Hypothetically speaking, if for some reason the gate isn't fixed soon, what would you say about a serious effort to repair or reverse engineer the elders in the old shelter? You know, the radios the architects put there, dressed up as all-knowing machine gods so the messengers could communicate with them? I know what the damn elders are, Billy. Clark snapped, giving more than a hint as to what he thought of Billy's idea before he was even finished sharing it. The topic of so-called elder revival had been rearing its head every so often for the better part of fifteen years, ever since Dan and Tara first laid eyes on the suddenly unresponsive machines and broke the news to the dejected messengers that they were merely radio-like communications devices rather than anything more alive or intelligent. Billy held his eyes. I know you didn't like the idea on Earth, but... But nothing, Clark interrupted. Jesus, Billy... Since I didn't like the idea, we've learned that those bastards use their pulses to commit genocide on this planet's whole population other than one chosen group, and I've personally felt the effects of the pulses on Earth. The fact I'm not on Earth with my pregnant wife and five-year-old son right now is an effect of those pulses, and you're going to sit there and suggest— I didn't suggest anything, Billy interrupted in return without raising his voice or harshening his tone. All I've been considering is the written record the islanders left behind before the last pulse wiped them out, which spoke of a single architect returning long after the others had left them. It apologized for what was coming their way, but couldn't stop it, and the image of one seemingly friendly or at least neutral architect arriving long after the others sends my mind straight to that night in New York. Dan said it was friendly and his attitude to Elder Revival softened. He's the only one who spoke to that architect, but I think it might be the same one who touched down here. And all I'm saying is that if all else fails and desperation kicks in, this could be a tool at our disposal. That's all I'm saying. And you won't be saying it again, Clark replied very firmly. They're liars, murderers, and cowards, Billy. And if I ever see one, well, it'll know how I feel. Clark rose to his feet to leave. Clark, I didn't mean to- No, Clark interrupted one last time, sighing along with the word. I'm sorry. I know you're trying to help Billy, and you did help me earlier. Thanks for that, for real. And there might be a backup option if all else fails. But come on, man. The elders ain't it. Billy gave a casual shrug. He appreciated Clark's comment and willingness to climb down from his angry ledge rather than leave for the night on bad terms, and didn't take his stringent rejection of the elder-related idea personally. So when do you start planning for your next island adventure? Clark asked, 
firing one final question at Billy before setting off to check on Tara and Aiden, then hopefully catch some sleep of his own. When do I start planning? Yesterday, Billy smiled. I'm hoping to set off in the morning. G-76, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Turcatore. No, Dan stated, replying to Alessandro's apparent assertion that crossing the gate to New Kerguelen might involve an interdimensional transition. Maybe, the Italian retorted. At least hear me out, okay? Dan silently encouraged him to continue, owing him this at least. I already mentioned the analysis of data logs from previous trips, Alessandro said, but at this juncture I think it's very much worth remembering how important those have been in the past. Just think back to when the young alien engineer Kajil noted a discrepancy in a time log that ended up revealing that the gateway from New Kerguelen to the planet of Sanctuary was a portal through time as well as space. We know that isn't the case with our gate to New Kerguelen, which has no time element, but we're now looking very closely at the logs and indeed at the objects and individuals who have made that trip with the view of determining if any dimensional flux has occurred. I've made that trip, Dan replied automatically. Alessandro nodded. And brain scans taken before and after some of your passages are among the data we're looking at most closely, Dan. Some of the scientists we've sent to New Kerguelen were scanned during their trips, so we're currently looking at those most closely of all. Gate research and analysis wasn't an urgent priority until 36 hours ago, so we're at an odd stage at the moment, where we're just getting going, but also feel like we're at the most likely point to be close to a major breakthrough, if you follow what I mean. So you have been doing experiments about this kind of thing on the heartbeat probe, Emma said. But you haven't really had an extensive, concerted series of analysis on the data from previous trips? Just so I'm following. Things were getting relatively technical, if only compared to how deep Emma usually let herself fall into scientific discussions about such things. But the issue of how the gate worked, and how it might be reinstated, was perhaps the most consequential subject Emma could think of. At the very least, it was tied for first place with uncovering the mysteries of the vault and the seemingly uplifted individual who most thought would turn out to have very close links to President Mason. Far more so than usual, Emma was making a very considered effort to listen to everything Alessandro said. We have looked at the data in the past, he said, and more recently we scanned the traveling scientists to make sure we had information from the very moment of transit, which is coming in handy now that we're looking more specifically for clues about what exactly they were passing through. Stop me if I lose you here, because this is possibly the hardest part to swallow. Some of our physicists, and I count myself as having one foot in this camp, believe that every trip ever made through the gate to New Kerguelen might have involved an instantaneous dimensional shortcut of some kind. Emma and Dan each understood every individual word of what Alessandro said, but that didn't mean they really understood what it meant. Dan was first to vocalize his confusion by referencing something he heard from the horse's mouth during his first ever meeting with the messengers, in the serene surroundings of Lolo National Forest all those long years earlier. It's not in a different dimension, he said quite insistently. The messengers told me, no ifs or buts, that they were from another place, but not another dimension. They're bona fide extraterrestrials, not extra-dimensionals. Alessandro nodded quickly, as though he'd been expecting a comment like this. But my words were very deliberate, Dan. I said trips across the gate might involve a dimensional shortcut, not a shortcut between dimensions. Emma held her hands up in front of her, palms out, as though pleading for restraint in the face of gunfire. Okay, now I'm lost, she admitted. The Italian took a moment to develop a nascent metaphor in his mind, then tried his best to relay it. If you imagine crossing a river from one side to the other, he began, you start and finish your journey on land, but you pass through the water. It's a lot quicker than walking all the way to the end of the river, so you put on your waterproof boots and you step right in. You see, we know without doubt that the gate is a shortcut, and we know without doubt that Earth and New Kerguelen exist in the same time and the same dimension, but what some of our scientists believe the gate is a dimensional shortcut not a shortcut between dimensions as such, since we begin and end on the solid ground of the only dimension we know, more like a shortcut across another dimension, 
in the same way our land-to-land -land shortcut involved the passage through the river. So the gate is the river? Emma asked. I don't think so, Dan chimed in. I think the gate is the boots, right, Alessandro? The river is a hypothetical other dimension that the gate flips us in and out of to enable some shortcut. Is that right? Although they hadn't all the way come to terms with what he was getting at, Alessandro considered the metaphor a success in having gotten them thinking along the right lines. The gate is the boots, in that it keeps us safe and dry while we take our shortcut through the river, Alessandro said. To labor the analogy, and sadly we now find ourselves standing at the river's edge with no sight of the bank beyond, we have no boots or any other means capable of carrying us to our destination, and we really can only live in hope that morning brings a clearer horizon. I live in hope that one of our physicists will wake me in the middle of the night with news of a breakthrough, because I live in the knowledge that everything that has ever been achieved was once achieved for the first time. This station is filled with the best minds there are, and I like to think that there really is a first time for everything. This was a nice sentiment, if lacking a little in Alessandro's usual scientifically grounded manner, and the McCarthys left the occasionally dense conversation with both more hope and more understanding of the Italian's complex gate-related considerations than they'd had at the beginning. But when we're talking of hopes about the gate, he said, holding up a single finger to indicate one last point, it would be remiss of me not to say that our biggest hope by far on that front is discovering something within the vault that enables the gate's repair or replacement. I don't know what that would be, but I can't shake the idea that when a pulse that came from the vault got rid of the gate, something in there just might be able to bring it back. And it definitely makes sense to be tackling things from multiple angles, like we are, Emma nodded in agreement. The guys on the ground are handling the vault, and you and your team up here seem to be as on top of the hypothetical dimension stuff as anyone could be. Emma and Alessandro instinctively gazed at Dan when their own conversation was complete, seeking his instinctive reaction. I've got one more point I wanted to mention too, but Alessandro, now I'm starting to think it might be linked to what you think we might find in the vault to help us with the gate. And since you've been talking about long-standing research dating back to the old days, I've got to know, how much research has actually been done on the elders I found on New Kerguelen? The elders? Emma said, sure she must have misheard and that her husband wasn't really asking about the radio-like machines the architects had used to manipulate the messengers from afar to such an extent that the messengers thought the machines were their gods. You really want to pick up the phone to the monsters that put the vault in the ground and set the pulses in motion to ask if they'll fix the gate? My brother and nephew are stuck on the other side, Dan replied. I know we're all mainly thinking about Terra, myself included, but I don't want to lose sight of that. I think especially if we're working on the assumption that the architect who would hear the call is the one I spoke to in New York, and probably the same one who warned New Kerguelen's ancient islanders about what was going to happen there, it might not be the worst idea to think about it. That's all I'm saying. Emma couldn't think of any worse ideas off the top of her head, but she didn't want to start an argument when her disagreement had already been calmly and plainly stated. It's definitely not your best idea, Dan, Alessandro said, slightly less tactful than Emma had been. If you're asking my view on the wisdom of using a device like that if we found one, my answer is no. If you're asking my confidence level as to whether or not I could repair one of the dismantled devices we've already studied if we knew it was safe and necessary, my answer is probably not. So you have tried, Dan asked. We've looked and we've analyzed, Alessandro said. But for better or worse, we never fully got to grips with the complex radio-like waves they seemed to have emitted. We've seen their inner workings, but we've never seen them working, if you see my distinction. Those inner workings point to the reception and transmission of waves very unlike the more standard radio waves the messengers used for their own long-distance communication, which we were famously able to reverse-engineer and use for cross-gate communication until the gate disappeared. In short, I wouldn't be confident. Good, Emma said. 
Because, Dan, those monsters caused the pulses. You seem to think the one that landed in New York is your friend or something, but even if he didn't put the vault there or have anything to do with the pulses, are you telling me he couldn't have stopped them or at least warned us in advance? The mere threat of a nuclear escalation brought him here back then because he'd supposedly come to see humanity as worthy of protection. But kinetic pulses flattening everything in their path and building up to an extinction-level event didn't get his attention? Dan shrugged. Maybe once the vault was there and an ancient sequence had been put in motion, there was nothing the rogue architect could do to stop it. Emma looked at him blankly. At the end of the day, we don't know, he went on. But we all have to admit that. We just don't know. Those three words apply to almost everything about the architects. We don't know how many of them there are, we don't know where they're from, and we don't know whether or not the one in New York had permission from the others, or if it was maybe even the last one left. Granted, we don't know if it was telling the truth about everything, but it said a lot of its kind had been lost during experiments with time gates. It sounded like he'd been alone for a long time. And one thing he was definitely straightforward about was when he told me Piper would be important for humanity. Emma looked at Dan inquisitively. But if you think this rogue somehow knew Piper was going to save us from something like this, doesn't that mean he must have known the vault was there and decided not to tell you? In fact, if he is the one who visited New Kerguelen thousands of years ago and warned the ancient islanders about their vault when it was already too late, why didn't he warn us about ours while there was still time? Time for what, though? Dan replied with a question of his own. If he couldn't stop it, he couldn't stop it. Alessandro couldn't miss the McCarthy's change in referring to the so-called rogue architect as a he rather than an it. Emma shrugged. I don't want to argue, Dan, but this isn't the way forward. You're right that there's a lot we don't know about them, but we can still try to reason based on what we do. And two things we know for sure are they planted pulse-emitting vaults to wreak havoc on two planets and that they manipulated the messengers for thousands of years and gave them self-serving orders and limited permissions dressed up as wisdom and logic. We're not arguing, Dan said. But don't forget about one permission they gave Lisha and Sacco back when the messengers still saw the elders as living gods. The permission to knock Il Diavolo off course. We would have been dead fifteen years before the first pulse if the architects hadn't let them interfere like that. So we can't pick and choose what actions to ignore. I'd bet good money the same architect from New York was the one who authorized the comment intervention. The last thing I'm going to say is a direct quote from the Islanders on New Kerguelen. Emma sighed. This was written in the pyramid Billy found about the architect who returned and spoke to them. All that leaves their mouth are lies. He apologized, worthlessly, and left us to die. That's not someone we want to deal with, Dan, and I would really appreciate it if you don't mention this to anyone else. We have multiple lines of attack to deal with Mason, the vault, and the gate, some more promising than others, but this is better left where it is, okay? I think you'll feel the same way in the morning. Dan gave a good-natured shrug, taking his wife's rather blunt words in the spirit intended. I'm not attached to the idea or anything. I'm just looking at all angles. I know Godfrey would be dead against it anyway, after everything he said on TV earlier about making them pay. Piper isn't exactly their biggest fan either, Emma said. But yeah, I think we should get a few hours while we can and be ready for a big day tomorrow that could easily be a huge one. Piper was on the button with that idea. Alessandro said his goodnights, leaving them to it and returning to his computer for a few more hours of work. Dan yawned on the way to their room, feeling the tiredness hit like a tree branch in the face as soon as he let the overdue notion of sleep enter his mind. He had a feeling Emma would be proven right about a huge day to come. But neither of them even knew the half of it. Sunday. G-75, Fraser Steading, Thurso, Scotland. As the helicopter that had carried William Godfrey from Inverness Airport prepared to touch down near the operations cabin from which three men had been mapping the vault beneath their feet, his mind was so full of anger and dismay, he could hardly think straight. During a long and uncomfortable night, 
Some of his most senior and trusted security staff at the ICA building in Buenos Aires worked tirelessly to pore over every second of footage from the night Nick Mason met the Honduran delegate suspected of poisoning Timo Fiore. A slow-motion assassination like this was the lowest of the low in Godfrey's mind, the calling card of the real weasel, one who wanted his deed to look like some kind of natural viral decay. It was only thanks to Timo's world-leading doctors on the station that the toxin had been detected, and even then, their best description of it prior to Chip Petrovich's investigative intervention had been as a parasitic pathogen. The paper trail Chip pieced together seemed likely to open doors to schemes Godfrey wasn't sure anyone really wanted to uncover, but for now the full focus was on one scheme in particular. Ruthlessly, callously, and most of all brazenly, ICA security captured by hidden recorders confirmed that Mason had indeed recruited a corrupt delegate to poison Timo. The two hadn't sat down and had a long conversation detailing every aspect of their plan, and nor had a briefcase full of money been exchanged, but there were more than enough explicit comments to nail Mason to the wall. Chief among these was his reminder for the delegate to be careful not to get anything on his fingers while he slipped the ice cube into Timo's glass. There was unfortunately no footage from the next day of the man actually carrying out that final act due to the painfully ironic presence of Godfrey himself between the best-placed security camera and the glass in question. The previous night's recording also included a promise from Mason that the delegate's full payment would be waiting for him when he got home to Honduras. As well as explicitly implicating Mason in the criminal plot, this promise also reminded Godfrey of just what kind of man he was dealing with in the shape of President Mason. After all, the Honduran delegate didn't make it home. The level of happenstance required for the car accident that killed him to be mere coincidence didn't even merit consideration, Godfrey figured, when it so obviously looked like Mason clearing out the only loose end that could otherwise trip him up. As it turned out, the delegate and his connection to a local biotech facility had been crucial threads in the illuminating tapestry Chip was ultimately able to weave and it wouldn't be long until Mason was paying for his sins. On top of this, the revelation that Piper McCarthy had felt a connection to a seemingly uplifted stranger during the moment of the final pulse had everyone within their circle speculating as to just how closely linked to that Mason would eventually be proven. Coincidence was the word of the hour, and the fact that Mason had known about the first pre-pulse warning all but convinced Godfrey that he must have been in the loop, somehow or another. This point had been made well during a discussion with everyone on the station the previous night, and Godfrey was now beginning to wonder just how much of Mason's political and financial success had been down to his access to some level of neurological uplift. The young president had developed something of a Midas touch in the final two years of his investing career, earning him a moniker of Super Forecaster that he had worn with glee. The sudden turnaround in his fortunes and his rapid rise to the top suddenly made a lot more sense than it had just 24 hours earlier, and Godfrey tried to retain a tiny consolation that at least one good thing would come out of the unadulterated shitstorm that began with the first pulse, Nick Mason's departure from public life, and ideally his arrival in a public prison. A thought crossed Godfrey's mind of how much money young Piper McCarthy could have made in the same period if her remarkably gifted mind and its skills of pattern recognition and prediction had been turned to similarly self-serving ends. Godfrey had long reflected on how lucky the world was that its richest man was someone motivated by the greater good, a Fiori rather than a Mason, but a similar consideration now joined the fray as he pondered the heightened levels of good and bad that could be done with an overabundant bounty of neurological power rather than one of money. Uplift powers like Piper's, quite rightly, weren't for sale, and Godfrey's mind lit up with disaster movie scenarios of what could happen if someone as recklessly egomaniacal as Nick Mason really had somehow stumbled upon them. What had truly sickened Godfrey to the pit of his stomach, however, were the views of utter desolation that had dominated his vision from every angle shortly after he got into the helicopter. The initial flight from London had been a relatively normal one, negatively tinged only by the uncomfortable footage he had watched for the tenth time 
after making sure it was securely shared with the team on the station in case anything happened to him or his computer before he reached them. Inverness Airport, meanwhile, had been bursting with individuals and families arriving back on government-funded flights after the mass evacuation of a few days earlier. Godfrey couldn't begrudge the smiles on the faces of the children who were delighted to be going home, nor the visible relief etched on their parents' expression. From there, however, as Godfrey boarded the waiting helicopter and continued further north to Thurso, he barely saw another soul. What he saw instead through the window was a vast expanse of desolate landscape, with regal trees and lovingly constructed homes alike, all flattened by the penultimate pulse. Buildings lay in ruins and vehicles lay in pieces, all adding to a scene that was more worthy of the disaster movie scenarios he'd been imagining than anything Hollywood could ever come up with. Godfrey had spent many happy summer months in the Highlands as a child and felt a close affinity with the area, but his primary sadness was for the people whose lives had been upended. The land would recover as it always did, and indeed large forests were still standing due to the density or protection the trees provided each other everywhere except at the edges. What might have happened to the rich diversity of animal life within those picturesque forests was a question for another day. Since all electronic monitoring equipment had been decisively destroyed and the area was still sealed off to humans for safety reasons. Five minutes from here, Chief, Godfrey's Scottish pilot called. The pilot wasn't overly concerned for his own safety and understood they were going to land in the circular safe zone where no effects of the pulses had been detected until the moment of convergence. Godfrey responded with a silent thumbs up which was really more of an upwards hand movement. Try as he might, the ICA chairman simply couldn't take his eyes from the upsetting scene beneath him. Anger swirled within him along with the sadness aimed currently at the alien architects who had caused all of this. Mason was never far from Godfrey's mind, but if one thing could momentarily push him to the side, it was certainly the determination for vengeance against those who had brought this chaos to earth. He would see to it that they paid for this, if it was the last thing he ever did, and the price would be high indeed. G-74, Infirmary, New Birchwood, New Care Galen. How do you feel today? Clark asked, checking in on Tara as soon as the doctors informed him she was awake. She turned to see him at the door and smiled. I'm fine. When do you think they'll let me out of here? There can't be many kinds of tests left to run that they haven't tried already. That Tara was frustrated to still be under medical observation was a very good sign in Clark's eyes, because for a while she hadn't been saying much about anything and seemed to be shaken into a borderline stupor by the gate's disappearance and all it meant. She was now starting to get back to herself, one step at a time, and he really didn't think it would be long until she could join him and Aiden in their plush but hopefully temporary home in the planet's HRZ. The human residential zone housed dozens of scientists and support staff in pristine surroundings that in some ways felt like a retro-futurist vision of communal tranquility. Clark had been made to feel more than welcome, with his biggest issue so far being total lack of company for Aiden. There were no other human children on New Care Galen, removing a typically key outlet for the boy to burn off his excess energy. There were a lot of young messengers, on the other hand, and the sight of little Aiden watching a group of them playing from afar was hard for Clark to take. The aliens hadn't excluded the boy, but with no means of communicating, it just wouldn't have worked beyond the novelty of the first few minutes. Aiden was an outsider on New Care Galen and would likely come to feel like it more and more with each passing hour, Clark feared, which to his mind only raised the urgency of the gate's return to function. We could always give him a patch so he can talk to all the little messengers, Tara suggested. She voiced this idea without Clark even having to mention the topic out loud, which spooked him for a brief moment until he remembered that they were both wearing telepathy patches. Because he had gotten so used to living without access to such things, going back to long before the powers stopped working on Earth's side of the gate, the fact that the patches enabled thought-based communication between humans as well as between species had temporarily slipped his mind. What was almost as surprising as receiving an answer to his unasked question was the nature of that answer, 
with Terra seemingly not just willing but enthusiastic to have given their son a patch of his own so he could talk with the planet's native children. Neither Clark nor Terra wanted to think about being away from Earth for a minute longer than they had to be, but making the interim period as comfortable as possible for Aiden did seem like the kindest thing to do. For the first five years of the boy's life, they had done all they could to keep him away from anything alien, keen to give him the kind of normal life that had been sadly impossible for his doting cousin Piper, but the last few days had seen all of that change. From the moment Aiden had traveled to the station and laid eyes on Melly, there had been no going back. And once he passed through the gateway to an entire alien world, brimming with messengers who were excited to meet him, the Rubicon had well and truly been crossed. Needless to say, his parents hoped there would be some going back in their future very soon, going back to the rest of their family and Earth and the station, who, they hoped beyond hope, had survived the final pulse and were just temporarily unreachable due to whatever kind of impact it might have had on the gate. We'll wait till you're out, Clark said, speaking out loud despite evidently not having to do so, purely because communicating telepathically with his wife felt a little bit too alien even for him. That'll be a big moment when he first talks to the little messengers. You should see it. At the moment, Aiden was in the family's HRZ home with two human nurses who kindly volunteered to keep an eye on him. Both were women in their early twenties with younger siblings of their own back on Earth, which couldn't help but remind Clark of Serena Cruz in a manner that made him more comfortable leaving the boy with them than he might otherwise have been. It wasn't for long in any case, only while Clark checked on Terra, but Aiden would have been happy enough to spend all day playing with the building toys that had been brought in from a nearby classroom. The toys were designed for the messenger's very differently shaped hands, but Aiden didn't know that and simply took gripping and stacking them as a fun challenge to overcome. One thing everyone had always said about Aiden was how easygoing and adaptable he was, and this had never been more apparent than in his short time on New Care Galen so far. I really hope they let me out today, Tara sighed. I'll bring him in to see you if they don't, Clark replied. I didn't really want to bring him into the hospital, but you're a lot better than you were at first, and obviously he misses you and keeps asking when you'll be back with us. Tara couldn't remember exactly how she'd been at first, and that was probably for the best given the emotional state she'd been in. She didn't doubt Clark's judgment for a second, and knew she must have been in a bad way for him to ever have considered keeping Aiden away as the best course of action, but there was no sense in dwelling in the past, and she tried to focus solely on how much better she felt now. Everything in that regard was tremendously relative, of course, with the stark reality of being stranded on an alien world with a baby on the way, something that Tara couldn't keep out of her mind for long. A doctor's gentle suggestion to do all she could to think one day at a time got through to Tara, but the main difference between now and a few days ago was that Clark's optimism of the previous evening founded in a native engineer's confidence that he might be able to restore the gate's passability, had clearly rubbed off on her. That enabled a much better night's sleep than her last few, which made a major difference on its own, given all the pregnancy-related strain and tiredness she'd been feeling even before her evacuation mission across the gate. Kajil's input more broadly increased her hope that Earth really could be fine, with the pulse having affected only the gate itself. I'll go and get one of the doctors for an update on the discharge plans, Clark said. But, oh yeah, I spoke to Billy last night and again this morning. Yeah? Tara asked, sensing an upbeat change in her husband's tone. Clark nodded. He's heading out on an expedition today, with Leisha's blessing, back to the Isle of Answers to look for the vault, which he thinks could give us a lot more information about the pulses and maybe something that will help at the gate. A smile spread across Tara's face. She'd always loved Billy and had grown close to him during some challenging adventures of years gone by, and knowing that he was stepping up his efforts to make things right gave her hope that a solution might not be too far away. Kajil thinks everyone on Earth will be working to fix the gate right now, Clark said. But we're not resting on our laurels here, either. Billy is doing his thing and Kajil thinks he might be able to force it open independently of any new discoveries. Leisha is less sure about okaying his idea, 
but the main thing is there are a lot more ideas floating around now than there were two days ago. We're moving forward. And soon we'll be moving home, Terra said optimistically, but with a great deal of faith. Soon we'll be moving home. G-73, Fraser Steading, Thurso, Scotland. A few minutes after the desolation of the Scottish Highlands had brought burning thoughts of vengeance to William Godfrey's mind, a very striking visual came into view up ahead. With the rugged coastline framing the scene and the desolate town of Thurso fading underfoot, Godfrey saw the cabin in Colin Fraser's field. He then saw signs of the enormous shaft its drilling operators had dug, and as his eyes darted between the two, he felt for the first time in the harrowing journey a new swelling of hope. Just days before the final pulse hit, no one had known where it was coming from. Through concerted effort and teamwork, British agencies on the ground and Timo Fiori's team in the sky had brought together all the equipment they could think of to enable urgent but careful excavation of the field, and the drillers' timely work had led to the discovery of the vault just in time. As the helicopter touched down, Godfrey's mind continued along this welcome train of positive thought. After the vault was discovered, the teamwork had continued with two young individuals recruited out of desperation by Clark McCarthy coming up trumps with their last-minute discovery of the artifact needed to open the door. No one knew exactly how much of a role that played in allowing Piper McCarthy to achieve the final success of containing the pulse, but records discovered on New Care Galen suggested that opening the door may have been absolutely crucial. With these thoughts in his mind, focusing on the power of human ingenuity and the commitment of a solid and reliable team, Godfrey recognized that the future didn't have to be as bleak as the present. Before he disembarked, five individuals emerged from the cabin to greet him. Gio Nunez was flanked by the Scottish drilling duo of Stevie and Davy, while Carrick and Serena themselves were also present after taking a choppy but necessary helicopter ride of their own from Orkney to gladly accept the invitation to help out with a thus far undisclosed project on the station. Godfrey grinned as he stepped out and spoke loudly over the final whirring of the chopper. Good morning, everyone, he roared. It's good to see you all. The second half of Godfrey's greeting came as the helicopter fell silent, causing his words to hit the air far more loudly than they had to. This brought light laughter all round and punctured any tension that might have developed in Godfrey's cooperative but imposing presence. Carrick Thomas, the young man said, stepping forward with his hand outstretched. And I'm Serena Cruz, the bright-eyed young woman by his side chimed in. Godfrey grinned. As if I don't know the two of you. Where we'd be without the artifact you discovered, I don't even want to consider. He then moved on to the drillers, thanking them for their role, and finally to the only individual among the group he'd met before. I gather you're staying here? Geo nodded. At least until we've finished the mapping and close-up scans. Anything new overnight? Godfrey asked. It's coming, the archaeologist replied confidently. But as for you guys' ride... Geo trailed off as he turned around and held up two hands in double OK sign. Immediately, a grounded alien spacecraft appeared around 200 meters away. Whoa, Carrick and Serena uttered in unison. The reality of where they were going and how they were getting there only now sunk in fully, just as the scale of the Pulse's devastation only sunk in for Godfrey when he'd flown over it minutes earlier. As the old saying went, seeing really was believing. And as William Godfrey set off for the Il Cercatori space station with Carrick Thomas and Serena Cruz, ably carried by some highly trained human pilots, all three would soon be seeing things they could never have imagined. The same held true for Geo and the drillers, too, as their search for a breakthrough in the vault continued without relent. Some fears were building about the square root of nothing they had found so far, especially as the rover neared the end of its meter-by-meter -meter close up surface scanning but the trio's occupations ensured they had more experience of waiting patiently than the average man. Drilling and field archaeology had a lot of things in common, with the obvious one being the frequent hoping that something would show up underground. 
and with the sun still climbing on a crisp Scottish morning, they didn't have much longer to wait now. G-72, arrival point, space station Il Turcatore. I can't believe we're actually here, Serena beamed as the bona fide alien spacecraft she was traveling in docked on Il Turcatore. Serena had seen some views in her time, but the blanket of stars visible through the saucer-shaped craft's circular window had to be seen to be believed. This was the very craft that had stunned the watching world by touching down in front of the iconic backdrop of Edinburgh Castle just a few days earlier, but no earthly backdrop could possibly compete with the jaw-dropping visuals she was currently taking in. Hell of a bird's eye view, huh? Carrick chuckled from her side. Serena and Godfrey both laughed. It was a good line, as was typical for the quick-witted Carrick, given that the catalyst for the chain of events that had ultimately brought Serena here was the remarkable footage of a ground pulse in Colin Fraser's Thurso Field, footage recorded by a tiny camera strapped to a falcon, which she found via an online subscription service called Bird's Eye View. As she got ready to step into the rarefied air of the space station, Serena knew she should have been counting every one of the lucky stars glistening in front of her. The discovery of the artifact Piper used to open the vault's door in the nick of time wouldn't have come to pass if it wasn't for an article mentioning Scarra Bray in the in-flight magazine of Serena's flight to London. So, while she would never take credit for her actions, she certainly understood the help her presence had provided. She had heard of the butterfly effect, of course, but Serena Cruz now couldn't help but reflect that if the right falcon hadn't flown over the right field at the right time, the all-important chain of events would never have gotten rolling, and life as everyone on Earth knew it would have been a thing of the past. Let's go in then, shall we? Godfrey suggested. He understood why the young couple were taking their time and trying to take everything in, and he certainly wouldn't begrudge them that. Time was of the essence, however, what with his own need to discuss the plan of action for dealing with an increasingly aggressive and now proven killer in the shape of U.S. President Nick Mason. There was a lot more to deal with than that, as it went, and Godfrey really was glad that Earth rotated the right way for his current purposes, with the time difference between the UK and New York ensuring he'd have a reasonable number of hours to handle everything that had to be handled before his trip to the Big Apple for a man-to-man -man showdown with Mason in the unparalleled crucible that was Focus 2020. I could never get used to this, Serena said, turning to face the ICA chairman. How many times have you been here? Godfrey blew air from his lips as he started to count as best he could, but quickly gave up. My fair share, he eventually said. But the views do get better, he added as an aside to tempt them along. It worked well, bringing both Serena and Carrick forward so their pilot could lock up the craft's main chamber and let them into the station's main structure. Carrick knew that structure like the back of his hand and could quite literally have found the control deck with his eyes closed. He owed this familiarity to the hundreds upon hundreds of hours he'd spent playing the official Il Tricatore video game, in which the player could assume a variety of roles, including those of Timo Fiori and Alessandro Bonucci, chief executive or chief scientist, along with the alternative option of creating a startup character to rise through the ranks. He had usually played as Timo, purely because this enabled the construction of even grander modules than those that already existed. He knew from a few articles and interviews that the typically media-shy Alessandro had never been too hot on the idea of being a playable character in a best-selling video game, not least because jokesters sometimes uploaded compilations of the character doing and saying foolish things. Most of those posts were in good humor, but the massive viral spread of the Oopsie Bonucci meme now meant that a generation of younger children knew him primarily as that character rather than a real scientist. The power at the character's disposal, essentially the ability to conduct all kinds of tests and experiments, led to a viral challenge among players who took it upon themselves to destroy the station, and sometimes even Earth, in the most ridiculous way possible. Timo rarely let a day go by without gently teasing Alessandro by showing him the latest viral Oopsie Bonucci video, usually complete with close-up images of the character's troubled face immediately prior to the moment of destruction. It never failed to make Timo laugh, and from time to time, even Alessandro couldn't pretend it wasn't funny. 
The sizable royalties for use of his likeness didn't really register for Alessandro, a man who didn't care much for money but fully acknowledged that was an easy position to take when he'd been a made man for decades and had a job for life at Timo's side, and what he always tried to remind himself of whenever a mean-spirited video from the game reached his inbox was that young people were at least playing a game about space science. If 99 out of 100 people who watched the Oopsie Benucci videos laughed at him and one felt inspired to dig deeper into the physics or astronomy that underpinned the games, Alessandro considered the whole thing worthwhile. For her part, Serena had always had a fairly keen interest in space, but nothing close to Carrick's level of borderline obsession. For this reason, while she was excited to venture onto the station, she would be doing so with far less idea of what awaited around each corner. Carrick couldn't pretend he didn't envy this, imagining that viewing everything through virgin eyes would have added even more wonder than the bountiful amount he was sure to feel, but then considered that he would get the best of both worlds. In knowing what was coming when, he could watch Serena's face and see it light up, a sight that even the stars couldn't match. Do you know what's coming next? He asked her as they neared the exit of the arrival and departure area's cavernous waiting room. The area's inner layout had much in common with a bus station, they both felt, just far more tastefully decorated and with 24-7 views of the stars rather than stray cats and uncollected trash. She shook her head, smiling in excited anticipation. Good, Carrick smiled back, encouraging her to lead the way and step forward onto the section of floor that would engage the automatic doors. When Serena took the step, the only thing that opened wider than the doors was her mouth. No audible gasp came out, but she stood frozen on the spot in amazement at the wondrous sight. I do remember the first time I saw that, Godfrey chimed in, Serena's reaction strong enough and wholesome enough to break his urgent focus for at least a few seconds. Quite something, isn't it? To call the cylindrical walkway quite something was perhaps the grandest understatement Serena had ever heard, but all she could do was nod dumbly in agreement. Only a few steps ahead of the spot where she currently stood, the stars weren't just visible overhead or through a window. No, within the walkway, the stars were visible everywhere. All Serena could compare it to was the same thing a lot of other first-time visitors did, namely the kind of shark tunnel she'd walked through in large aquariums, where the water completely enveloped a short walkway to give an eerie feeling of immersion and proximity. Although there were no sharks on Il Cercatore, as Serena Cruz took her first step onto the ultra-thick but ultra-clear glass-like material of the walkway's floor, she felt very much like she was dipping her toes in the ocean of space. A sea of stars positively swirled around her, around her, above her, and even under her feet. Only when she turned back to see if Carrick was as amazed as she was did Serena see what was visible underfoot in that direction. Hanging like an ocean blue marble on an invisible cosmic string, her home planet and its suddenly evident curvature humbled Serena like nothing she had ever seen. There were people on Earth who had been born in an era when no one had ever left and now she found herself on a space station that had, until recently, acted as a midway point to the gateway connecting Earth to a distant alien planet that would have been dismissed by most as a concept belonging in science fiction, even at the time of her own birth. Seeing Earth from above was humbling in itself, but reflecting on all the discoveries and progress that had gone into making this moment possible gave Serena all new levels of appreciation. When she looked back to Carrick, she saw his eyes light up at something else, or, as it turned out, someone else. Serena spun back around in the direction she'd been walking and saw Piper McCarthy standing next to a real-life extraterrestrial. Piper ran forward and threw her arms around Serena, who she'd bonded with instantly during their brief time together in London, while Melly remained stationed at the far end of the walkway. The alien the first either of the station's latest visitors had ever seen in the flesh, raised a hand and waved slowly as a natural and heartwarming smile spread across her decidedly unhuman face. Pulling out one more understatement to go with all the others, Serena had just one thing to say. I think I'm going to like it here. 
G-71, Central Plaza, New Birchwood, New Kerguelen. As had become something of a tradition on New Kerguelen, a large crowd of messengers had gathered in their capital city's Central Plaza to see off a group of voyagers who were about to depart for distant shores. In the past, crowds like this had gathered to watch particularly momentous gate crossings, including the Leap of Destiny the brave trio of Dan, Tara, and Billy Kendrick had taken across an untested gate which carried them to the miraculous world of Sanctuary. Billy was setting off again today, albeit not across a gate, and he was as happy as everyone to count Terra as one of the faces in the crowd. Discharged from the planet's human-staffed infirmary after successive days of clear physical and emotional progress, Terra stood at the front alongside her husband Clark and their son Aiden. The boy was still gazing around in the same level of awestruck wonder he had exhibited when they first arrived, and if anything, he was even more enthusiastic now. Clark figured this was because even though Aiden hadn't really understood the strain Tara was under, physically and emotionally, he knew something wasn't right with his normally upbeat and playful mother. Having her back at his side and smiling again was exactly what he needed. Needless to say, the boy knew nothing whatsoever about the potential permanence of their stay on New Kerguelen. Clark had been telling him they were there for a fun vacation, while Piper and the others made sure Earth was going to be safe and ready for his new baby brother. Thinking about the baby always brightened Aiden's mood, even when it was low. So keen was he to have a little brother like several of his closest school friends did, and this had been no exception. Billy made a point of chatting with the boy before he commenced his departure speech, as well as taking a few moments to check in with Tara and make sure she was as okay as she looked. She insisted she was, and Billy promised he would come straight back from his archaeological mission as soon as anything happened with the gate. Normally I'd ask you not to leave without saying goodbye, he said, but if you guys get word that the gate has become passable again but might not stay that way for long, for the love of God, go. We can talk over video like we always did, but like I said, I'll try to get back immediately. Hell, hopefully I won't even reach the intersection of the island before the gate is back up and running. Are you having to walk inland again? Clark asked, more than a little surprised that this seemed to be the case. I know you walked from the coast last time, but that was because Leisha didn't want to flash teleport your team somewhere that you might not have been able to get back from if the uplift powers stopped working here like they did on Earth. He still thinks the same, Billy shrugged, tipping his head towards the alien leader in question with an only slightly exaggerated roll of his eyes. Clark still didn't fully follow, and called Leisha over with his hand to make the point. I get that you might still be worried about the powers stopping working all of a sudden, Clark said to the alien leader, but now you know the island is safe and that a crew can survive there for as long as they have to. So how come we don't get someone who's fully uplifted to flash the team out to the island? Then, if there was a problem with the powers at some later point, we could send the conventional craft to get everyone who's stuck there. What's the journey time? Most of a day? Don't you think it makes sense to skip that if we can, when every hour could count more than we know? Leisha appeared to consider this, while Billy nodded in impressed approval at Clark's point. What you say makes sense, Clark, the alien telepathically replied but I've placed a ban on all non-emergency utilization of teleportation over any distance. If another pulse-related event was to interfere with the powers, we have no idea what would happen to anyone who was in the process of teleporting or of being teleported. Granted, the process is extremely quick, but we know that the first pulse on Earth arrived without warning in a moment no one saw coming, so the chance is too great. The probability is low, but the level of the risk is not one I can sanction, particularly to cut a non-urgent journey's duration by a matter of hours. The final sentence of Leisha's reply, although not delivered sharply as such, nevertheless seemed to imply that he wasn't too hot on the idea of Billy's crew conducting their search for the vault at all, or at least not right now. It's not too long of a trip, Billy chimed in, accepting a decision he would have had no recourse to contest, even if he'd wanted to. But thanks, Clark, 
I'll see you soon. Billy waved to Aiden and Tara as he walked forward to the spot from which he was set to address the crowd. The chance of the timing working out as bad as in that picture you painted would be one in a bazillion, Clark whispered to Leisha, unnecessarily saying the words at any volume, only out of habit. Leisha nodded slowly in his trademark way, all the way up and all the way down. Exactly, Clark, he said. One in a bazillion, not none in a bazillion. And with anything related to the architects, it's always the one we have to worry about. G-70, Control Deck, Space Station Il Cercatore Although Carrick and Serena's awestruck wonder had grown and grown as they proceeded through the station towards the control deck with Piper and their new alien friend, the urgency of several matters at hand quickly brought their excitable spirits back down to earth. Within a few minutes of arriving, during which time they enjoyed warm reunions with the McCarthys and equally warm belated meetings with the others, both of the youngsters felt the colossal weight of a piece of news Godfrey had kept from them during the flight up from Thurso. That Timo seemed to have come to terms with his poisoning at Nick Mason's hands did absolutely nothing to blunt the shock that came with hearing the news for the first time, and when Godfrey encouraged Alessandro to play some of the incriminating video and audio footage he'd sent up from Earth, all of it recorded inside Godfrey's ICA building in Buenos Aires, the shock on the McCarthy's faces all of a sudden matched that on Serena and Carrick's. It doesn't get any clearer than that. Emma said, first to react out loud. Mason's instructions for the Honduran delegate to take care with the toxin-laced ice cube he slipped into Timo's drink was a clearer piece of evidence than any of them expected to find. In one sense, however, Emma wasn't alone in being more shaken up than relieved. Like the others had felt in all kinds of situations recently, seeing and hearing something proven real with her own senses like this was so much more powerful than simply knowing it to be true. As soon as Dan began trying to quickly bring the new arrivals up to speed on the group's working theory for Mason's motive, his desire to ensure a monopoly on access to uplift-related technologies, he realized there was something else they didn't know about. Piper took it upon herself to take over at that stage, succinctly telling Carrick and Serena about the remarkable connection she had felt to a distant and apparently uplifted individual at the moment of the convergent twelfth pulse. They listened closely, particularly when Piper got to the part about her potentially important sighting of a water tower and the fact that she had asked Timo to invite them onto the station to help in the group's quest to locate the right spot with a view to finding the individual in question. Both were honored to hear this, but there was little room for that in their minds, given how shocked they were by the broader issue of someone else seemingly having the powers. We think it's tied to Mason, Chip Petrovich said. Since he had knowledge of the first pre-pulse warning that Piper was the only one among us to feel, we think one of the shady biotech firms he has ties to reverse-engineered the uplift tech, one way or another, and that Mason might owe everything he's got to the advantages that brings. I know if I'd had access to these powers back when I needed money, I would have stretched them within an inch of their life in poker games and God knows what else. So, you give that kind of power to a guy like Mason whose goal is to dominate everything and everyone around him, this is how it goes. He climbs and people die. Godfrey nodded. It's imperative we find the location as soon as possible. Would you two be willing to work with Piper and start searching out candidate towers? I wouldn't imagine you need to be micromanaged on that, but I'm sure I speak for Timo in saying you can consider all of the station's resources at your disposal. Absolutely, Serena replied enthusiastically. Any way we can help? We do have a few things to go on. Alessandro chimed in. The position of the sun, the size and angle of a field she saw, the color and style of the water tower itself, those are the variables we've discussed, but any more you can think of could only help. I know it would be too easy to say, whatever you did to find the artifact from Scarabray, do it again here, the Italian said with a wry chuckle. But if you can do that again... No pressure, then, 
Carrick grinned, taking the challenge in good spirits. I guess we've got to do something to earn our keep, and I suppose the view here is going to be even better than the balcony we had in Orkney, huh? I'm afraid we only have a box room left, Timo interjected. He couldn't keep a straight face long enough for Carrick or Serena to buy it, though, quickly breaking into a grin. No, of course not. I'm sure you'll like the room, but to be honest, I don't expect any of us to be getting much rest for the next. Well, however long it takes. We're expecting final data from the vault any time now, as I'm sure you know from your brief meeting with Geo and the drillers, and from there, we'll have a decision to make about the next course of action on that front. But either way, you three have the location to work on, while Chip and I will do as much digging as we can into Mason's business dealings in case that leads to some possible facilities. And we'll be getting Godfrey ready for Mason tonight, Emma said as Dan nodded in agreement by her side. Serena couldn't help but notice that no one mentioned the gate, whose disappearance had stranded Tara and her family on New Kerguelen. She and Carrick had decided not to raise this point until someone else did, since there was absolutely nothing they could do to help with whatever steps were being taken in an effort to bring the other half of the McCarthy clan back home to Earth. She also couldn't even begin to imagine how all this must have felt for Emma, knowing her heavily pregnant younger sister was so far away with no way home. Serena's own short time with Tara, along with Clark and young Aiden, had been enough for their warmth to shine through. The color of the skin under Alessandro Bonucci's eyes suggested that he hadn't closed them for more than a blink's duration in at least a few days, and Serena tried to take a modicum of comfort from the fact that if anyone could do something about the gate, it had to be the foremost physicist of his generation. That Timo hadn't mentioned Alessandro as being focused on anything else made her think he probably was working on the gate, but the lack of attention drawn to whatever he was working on simultaneously gave her doubts as to how much hope the group was holding out on that front. There's something I just have to ask about that none of you have mentioned, Carrick suddenly said, speaking in a tone that gave Serena cause for concern that he was going to broach the gate subject after all. Shoot, Dan encouraged. Okay, well, Mason wants to block all work on the ground. Geo and the guys are worried about that, but it doesn't seem like anyone here is giving it much thought. But 26% of the ICA assembly... If this thing goes to a vote, the U.S.-aligned block is more than big enough for it to sail through. And okay, Chairman Godfrey, I'm not suggesting for a second to know half as much about this as you do, but everything I read last night about the ICA charter says it's cast iron and there's no way around this. If the Assembly calls for a block out of trumped-up safety fears, we have to stop, don't we? Godfrey's head was nodding very slightly but very quickly, almost vibrating rather than nodding, and not so much in answer to Carrick's question as in appreciation of how thorough and insightful it was. Everything you say is correct, but there is a way around it. It's politically fraught, like few moves I've ever made, but the only cooperation I need is from Prime Minister Logan. There's one thing she has to do in order for us to circumvent Mason's move. There is? Emma asked, hearing this for the first time. And what exactly would that be? Immediately withdraw the United Kingdom from the ICA. Godfrey deadpanned. Emma returned his emotionless gaze. Oh, well, if that's all, she replied, not intending to sound quite so acerbically sarcastic as she did. It's not as crazy as it sounds, Godfrey retorted. And Logan is already on board in principle. None of this has been good for her, so she's only too glad to leave the responsibilities and attention to me. The clause Mason plans to invoke, Article 6.4, allows 26% of the Assembly to force an immediate pause on all nationally or ICA-led alien-related operations within a specified member state until the whole Assembly is satisfied that it's safe to proceed. In layman's terms, neither a national government nor the ICA can investigate an alien discovery in the boundaries of any member state without the whole assembly's approval. For all intents and purposes, it was put in place in case something turned up in a country that wouldn't pay much attention to safety, but for our current purposes, the pertinent point is that it only applies to member states. 
When Logan withdraws, the Assembly no longer has any power over anything on, or in, UK soil. She can still invite the ICA's assistance, but whatever help I volunteer to send is technically no longer matter of the Assembly's concern. A slow smile spread across Emma's face. She should have known better than to doubt Godfrey's Machiavellian instincts, the very ones she'd had to contend with in years gone by. Just like he felt about her, it was nicer to be on his side than up against him. Mason's not going to like it, she said. But what can he do? Precisely, Godfrey said. Just like William Godfrey, however, Nick Mason was not a man who could be wisely underestimated. G-69, Central Plaza, New Birchwood, New Kerguelen. We found more than we bargained for last week on the Isle of Answers, Billy Kendrick said, addressing the crowd that had gathered to wave off the crew of his latest archaeological mission. Some of it answered questions we'd never even thought to ask, but some of it raised all new ones. Today, we set off in search of answers to those questions. The crowd responded in their typical way, waving their arms high in the air in their cultural equivalent of applause. Chiefly, Billy went on, we now know there's a vault buried on that island, and we now want to know what's inside it. Our friends on Earth also discovered the vault the architects placed there, and they had warning of what was on the way because of what we discovered on the island. I have every faith that they will have succeeded in preventing the chaos that fell upon this planet thousands of years ago, and I have every hope that one or both of the vaults, here or there, might hold the answer to restoring communication across the gate. Hands rose into the air again, although this time Billy saw far more reserved expressions, as though many of the messengers were acting more optimistically than they felt. Truth be told, Billy himself was speaking more optimistically than he felt, just as he had been since all communications from Earth ceased. This wasn't the first speech Billy had delivered since the gates stopped working, but he'd been heartened to hear that Clark had addressed a room full of concerned scientists the previous night. Clark's strong presence and natural aura of authority couldn't fail to calm some nerves, Billy thought, or at least to delay, if not rule out, any potential unrest that could otherwise have kicked off among a group of people stranded untold miles from home and who might have begun to question whether their hosts could have been doing more to look for solutions. In the immediate aftermath of Earth's final pulse, however, the responsibility of maintaining hope and order had fallen squarely on Billy's shoulders. As well-liked and respected as Billy was among New Kerguelen's messengers and humans alike, in the presence of Tara and Clark McCarthy, he would ordinarily have expected to defer the unofficial, big, societally meaningful position of human leader to whichever one of them wanted it. It hadn't quite worked out like that, though, since as soon as Earth's final pulse knocked the gate out of position, by which time the McCarthys had hardly got their feet on the ground, neither of them were well-placed to lead anyone. Terra had been desolate in a way Billy had never seen, even in the darkest days of the countless challenges they had faced together on three different planets, and it was something he dearly hoped to never see again. From that moment, Clark had his hands full, keeping Terra and her understandably frayed mental state above water, all the while trying to keep little Aiden's spirits up and tackling his own deafening concerns about not only his immediate family and future child, but also all the friends and family members they had left behind on Earth. Now that Tara was back on her feet, figuratively as well as literally, Billy felt no hesitation about his imminent expedition. The new first couple of New Kerguelen was as capable as anyone ever could be of shepherding the planet's diverse population through these choppy and uncertain waters, and the best thing Billy could do now was leave them to it, while he and his crew set off for the Isle of Answers in search of a way to bring them home. Every word Billy uttered was met with rapt attention from the watching crowd, with its alien constituents in particular hanging on each thing he said. As bright and resourceful as the messengers were, and as much effort as had been put into educational programs to teach younger generations their own history and enable them to reach their potential, there was little doubt in anyone's minds that the messengers as a whole 
viewed humans as more advanced than themselves. This belief was valid in many senses, since the remarkable uplift powers and transport-related technologies that had made the messengers seem far more advanced than humans during their initial landings on Earth had long since been exposed as gifts left by the deceitful architects. That those gifts were granted as a means of enabling the messengers to conduct their assigned work, of keeping a watchful eye over the Earthlings' speed and direction of development, spoke very much to the idea that the architects considered humans as the race with greater evolutionary potential too, and the complexity of human societies and interactions certainly far exceeded anything seen on New Kerguelen. The enormous caveat that had been long understood on Earth, however, was that the messengers had been stunted for thousands of years by the architects' invasive interventions. Billy's very recent discovery that New Kerguelen housed at least two distinct messengers' civilizations prior to the architects' arrival was rewriting this history, and more to the point, underlining the level of disruption the architects had caused. It was now clear that the enormous and frightening visitors from afar hadn't just caged every member of Leisha's ancestral civilization within a great shelter on the edge of New Birchwood, but had, at the same time, ruthlessly eliminated every member of however many other civilizations had once dotted the planet's varied surface. The messengers' peculiar history, and particularly the several thousands of years they spent taking the word of their supposed elders as gospel, had resulted today in a society which sought and valued the clarity of a single leader. Leisha had come to assume this role over time, slowly but surely rising above his close partner Sacco in the population's eyes, largely due to his role as chief liaison with Earth. The pedestal on which the messengers placed humans in their own minds meant there was always room next to Leisha for a human leader, however, and that was the mantle Billy was now glad to be handing to the McCarthys. He hoped they wouldn't hold it for long, since he hoped they wouldn't be there for long, but he had no qualms about their ability to live up to the role in the meantime. The gate is still there, Billy said, pointing up to the spot where the glistening effect it had on the surrounding sky was just about visible to the naked eye. And where there is light, there is hope. If the situation hadn't been so urgent and unsettling, Billy would have considered one of the main benefits of his trip the additional information he was likely to glean about the ancient islanders themselves. Learning that their ancestors had been wise and seafaring people prior to the architects turning them into obedient lapdogs would be powerful for the present-day messengers, he felt, and might finally have led to a break from their feelings of inferiority in comparison to their human friends. Part of Billy was still seeking to do that. He wanted to inspire a spirit of discovery and passion for history that he hoped would outlive him on New Kerguelen even if every other human understandably left if and when the gate resumed function. His prime and total focus at the moment, however, was discovering something that could assist in making sure the gate's restoration was a case of when rather than if. The planet's ancient islanders had already played a crucial role, what with their written recordings having come in very handy by informing Earth about the potential importance of opening its vault before the final pulse hit. Finding something as directly significant as that would have been beyond his expectations prior to that first expedition, so as Billy stepped towards the craft that would carry him back to the island in search of the vault itself, he truly believed the optimistic words he was delivering. My team will be in touch with Leisha often, the aging but endlessly adventurous archaeologist said, stepping onto the craft's ramp. As soon as we find something, you'll know, and I want everyone to remember that our friends on Earth will likewise be working around the clock to fix the gate that links us. It doesn't matter who gets to a solution first, but we're going to be working with the same urgency we'd have if we were the only ones who can do this. I will be back soon, my friends, and so will the good times of connectivity and cooperation we crave. Thousands of raised arms waved more enthusiastically than ever, thrust in the air by an alien crowd which was truly moved and spirited by Billy's closing words. Clark and Tara applauded with clasped hands, as per the customs of their kind, but little Aiden raised more than a few smiles by throwing his arms upwards and waving them from side to side. Billy pointed to the boy and gave a warm thumbs up when he caught sight of this, and in doing so, brought huge attention upon himself. 
Being the opposite of a shy child, this didn't deter Aiden from his decidedly alien-like expression of support. His own smile grew wider and wider as several young messengers stepped away from their parents to join the intriguing mini-human. Around ten alien children gathered around Aiden and merrily copied his actions, which included the introduction of his own flourish in the form of some contagious hip-swinging. What looked like an interspecies dance party was a sight for sore eyes and couldn't help but take Tara back to her first visit to New Care Galen when she had been moved by the sight of carefree alien children playing in a courtyard. That had been the moment when she realized just how alike the species were, but the sight before her now took this to all new levels. If she and Clark hadn't already talked about giving Aiden a telepathy patch so he could converse with the messengers, she would certainly have been raising it now. For the moment, however, the language of dance was doing the trick. Billy Kendrick then made eye contact with Clark before he stepped onto the craft, winking in the direction of the elder McCarthy brother in a manner that told him the situation really wasn't hopeless. Clark winked back and nodded firmly. Tara was okay. Aiden seemed full-on happy as he continued to settle into his new surroundings, and Billy, in search for a pulse-emitting vault like the one that had disabled the gate on Earth's side in the hope it could recover it from here, seemed to have a plan of action that made a great deal of sense and felt like a lot more than busy work for the sake of maintaining morale. Surrounded by hopeful aliens, a happy child, and a healthy wife, Clark McCarthy truly felt for the first time in a long time like things might actually turn out all right. As optimism flowed through Clark's veins, he made a conscious effort to let it spread. This optimism, valid but fragile, was nice while it lasted. G-68, Fraser Steading, Thurso, Scotland Several hours after William Godfrey graced the men's cabin with his presence before taking Carrick and Serena along with him to Il Churcatori, Gio Nunez sat alongside his colleagues Stevie and Davy with an increasing level of frustration etched on his face. The Scotsmen were great and welcome company, always cracking jokes at each other's and their own expense, and always making Gio's life as easy as they could with frequent offers of drinks and snacks. The archaeologist's frustration was instead due to the complete lack of progress his rover and drones were making in the vault under their feet. Or, more to the point, he was frustrated by the absolute lack of discoveries the scanning devices were sending his way while they did make unrelenting progress across every inch of the huge subterranean object's inner surface. More than 99% of the floor had already been subject to close-up scanning and as yet no signs of well-disguised doors or anything else had been found. Although none of this was Geo's fault in any way, he couldn't help but feel like he was failing in his given mission of finding out what was inside the vault. Upon considering that nothing wasn't an answer to this mission-driving question anyone had even considered before the rover and drones first crossed the threshold the previous night, Geo's disappointment grew. What he hated more than anything was the knowledge that he was going to have to deliver the news, or lack of news, to the station, where the others wouldn't perhaps feel an instinctive disappointment in him, given how confidently he had stated his belief that the drones he was so adept at handling would deliver results within no time. The last area of the vault that was yet to be scanned up close was the extreme far side, in a small patch further from the door than any other. If Geo had been less emotionally involved in the whole process, which could only have been fairly expected of a robot amid the carnage of the past few days, he might have figured that the furthest point from the entrance door, the point nearest the back wall, was just the point most likely to be where his rover might find another door. Or, as it turned out, something much more intriguing and much more unsettling than that. Result, Geo called. He was responding to a flash of light that began pulsing on his remote control even before the visual feed of the anomalous find that triggered the alarm appeared on the cabin's main monitor. Easily standing out on the otherwise uniform floor, this visual anomaly had caught the rover's keen eye as soon as it fell within the state-of-the-art camera's field of view. But while what filled the screen was certainly easy for the men to see, 
it was anything but easy for them to explain. Is... is that what I think it is? Geo asked, stammering out the question after the trio shared a long, stunned silence. Shut as hell looks like it, Davy offered. Stevie? To his left, Stevie gazed intently at the screen and gulped. I mate, he said, struggling to believe his own next words before they even left his lips. That's a human handprint. Part 3. Showdown He will win who knows when to fight and when not to fight. Sun Tzu G-67 Control Deck, Space Station, Il Tricatore After a morning of focused work across all of Il Tricatore's sectors and those occupied by the McCarthys and their inner circle in particular, progress had been made on multiple fronts, William Godfrey had talked Emma into committing to join him in New York for the Focus 2020 showdown with Nick Mason, for one thing, not that she'd taken much persuading to assist in a behind-the-scenes preparation role. Chip Petrovich and Timo Fiore had meanwhile made significant strides in their search for potential links between the Honduran lab, where Mason's toxin had been modified, and facilities belonging to other biotech companies he had once held major stakes in. No one had ever been under any real illusions that Mason had cashed out of all his potentially controversial investments when he made his long-shot presidential bids, and the spiderweb of connections that existed between firms for whom his previous involvement was the only obvious commonality added weight to such suspicions. Their work was ongoing, and they fully expected it to soon cross over with the search being conducted in Piper's bedroom by the girl and the two other closest to her age, with whom she felt a natural and easy friendship. Carrick and Serena, for their part, quickly came to feel as though their role was largely to throw the right questions at Piper's remarkable mind and act upon whatever came out. Serena asked some highly specific questions about the distant trees Piper recalled from her brief but crucial vision, as well as some about the clouds. Although Piper's memory was the closest to flawless of any in the world, however, the fact that she hadn't paid any attention to those variables at the time meant that they weren't etched in her mind. The field, Piper did recall in some detail, struck both Carrick and Serena as something that could maybe serve as a confirming factor once they nailed down some candidate images of water towers that fit the bill. Nothing about her recollection of the field gave them much to go on, unlike her three specific points about the water tower's color, shape, and lettering. Serena was doing things the old-fashioned way, in her own words, using her laptop to perform image and web searches using combinations of words she thought might help. Piper was simultaneously using one of the station's many free-use tablets to seek information on just how many freestanding water towers existed in the United States, on the basis that some knowledge of just how big this haystack was could usefully inform which strategies would be most appropriate in her search for the crucial needle in question. The biggest breakthrough so far had come from Carrick, and it came with more than a little irony. Not entirely dissimilar to Serena's utilization of the Bird's Eye View app a few weeks earlier, when she was searching for potential shots of Colin Fraser's field, Carrick's early searching discovered a database-style website compiled and frequented by self-avowed water tower enthusiasts. After his initial shock wore off that there was such a thing as water tower enthusiasts, Carrick got down to some analytical brainstorming of ideas for how to sort and filter the website's overwhelming number of images in an advantageous and time-efficient way. If the website had featured a searchable and tagged database, enabling him, for instance, to see results that included only white towers and only those with black lettering, the whole escapade would have been far more straightforward. All the work that had gone into the website still made his team's work a lot easier than it would have been without it, however, so he tried to be grateful for what was at his disposal rather than frustrated by what wasn't. The zoomable map with pin-style markers for each tower could prove particularly useful, he figured, especially when Chip and Timo presented some general areas of interest. Those would be a good place to start zooming in to see if any suitably white and round-topped water towers were present anywhere in the vicinity, 
and Carrick hoped it wouldn't be too long until it came up Trump's. The distinct work his trio and the Chip Timo team were conducting in trying to locate the source of Piper's vision struck Carrick as attacking the same problem from two angles at once, in a manner that made a lot of sense to him. It really was one hell of a proverbial haystack, and having two teams searching the opposite sides simultaneously could only help. All of the work being conducted on the station quickly fell to the back of everyone's mind, though, just as soon as Alessandro announced over the intercom system that Gio and his driller friends in Thurso were on the line to share the results of their full sweep of the vault. Piper literally sprinted to the control deck as soon as the message rang out and none of the others were far behind. Chip and Timo were last to arrive, albeit not by much, with the latter moving with slightly less verve than he used to in the first externally observable sign that his body was beginning to feel the effects of the toxin Nick Mason had shamefully and despicably inflicted upon him. Dan alone noticed Timo's labored movements, and it broke his heart to see the once sprightly man grimace as he took a seat. It went without saying that Timo was sixteen years older than when Dan met him, just like Alessandro was, but all changes to their appearances and mannerisms since then had been gradual. The effects of the toxin, on the other hand, seemed to be hitting Timo like a bad and fast-acting flu. The closer Dan looked, the more signs he noticed from the bloodshot left eye to the barely discernible twitching lip. Dan's mind looked for ways to dismiss this as less telling than he was fearing and found one in the hope that Timo might simply be exhibiting symptoms of an understandable lack of sleep. Timo had been as busy as anyone, Dan reasoned, and had, after all, been living with not only the weight of a terminal diagnosis, but the difficult pressure of feeling like he had to keep it from his closest friends while they were dealing with the pulses. Only Gio's voice coming through the speaker pulled Dan's attention away from Timo, and all things considered he was very glad of the distraction. The control deck's vocal translator was powered on and functioning as Gio spoke, but its volume was dialed down with Melly standing right beside it. She didn't anticipate participating in the conversation, so didn't have to have it loud enough for the humans to hear, but she did want to follow along and thoughtfully did so at a volume that wouldn't disturb them. The mapping and internal scanning is complete, Geo said, and we have found one area of significant interest. I'll show you the images in the order we saw them, with no comment on what we think, until you've had your own chance to take this in. Are you ready? Yeah, everyone said truthfully, but incorrectly. They might have thought they were ready, but the image of an unmistakably human handprint set into the floor of the colossal vault was just about the last thing any of them could have imagined. What the? Chip said, leaning in towards the screen as though expecting a closer look to reveal that his first impression was wrong. No one else said anything for several seconds, and the next voice was once again Geo's. And then this image came in, he said. The screen flicked to a new image, which was taken with a wider-angle lens and showed not one handprint, but two and in a twist that utterly confounded all of them, the other far larger handprint perfectly fit the image of the terrifyingly alien hand everyone remembered from either first-person experience or TV footage of the tall and frightening being who touched down in New York City 13 years earlier. The silence was now realer than ever. Within the room, some minds were running a mile a minute in search of some explanation that made sense, while others were effectively at a mental standstill in the face of something that made less sense than anything else they had ever seen. They put the vault there and left a key because they wanted someone to go in it, Piper said, her young voice the first to rise above the parapet. We talked about that. We don't know why they didn't shelter anyone, and we don't know why they chose where they chose for either burying the vault or leaving the key. But we know there was a key, and we know they left it so they wanted someone to go in. Serena was first to catch on to what Piper seemed to be getting at. They wanted someone to see this, she chimed in supportively. And they wanted someone to touch it, Piper stated, finishing the setup. I think it's a lock. Dad, you said there are walls inside the messenger's ships and inside New Kerguelen's shelter that you have to touch to activate. Maybe this is like that. 
Maybe a human hand opens an unseen door. The guys on the ground did say their horizontal drill measured the whole vault and that those external measurements are longer than this mapped chamber. A human hand and an architect hand, Dan replied. He half inflected this into a question. It could be either or, only needing one or the other, Piper said without missing a beat. She gulped. And I think you know what I'm going to say next. Emma looked away from the screen for the first time and met Piper's gaze. I'm going to New York, Emma said, in the craft. We can think about this and the guys can run more atmospheric tests, but nothing is happening today, okay? Tomorrow we can talk. Today, she shook her head. Piper nodded. Yeah, I know. We only have one craft and the show is literally time sensitive. But Gio and the guys have plenty of lights down there, so sunlight doesn't really matter when it comes to that. We can weigh it up as soon as you get back, because I do think it's possible it might only need an architect handprint or a human handprint to open a hidden door that'll let us find what's really down there. And like I was saying... Emma couldn't help but grin at the selfless and determined daughter she had been lucky enough to raise. I know, darling, she said. There's only one way to find out. G-66, RMXT Studio No. 1, Manhattan, New York. It's been a while, hasn't it? William Godfrey said to Emma as they drove into the parking lot at the rear entrance to RMXT's world-famous Studio No. 1. Both had arrived for Focus 2020 panels several times in the past, and as Godfrey hinted, none of Emma's visits had been recent. No single visit for anyone began like this one, though, since no one had previously arrived in New York from a space station having made the trip in an alien spacecraft. The craft touched down well out of the city, to minimize the chance of anyone seeing its temporary uncloaking when they stepped out and walked down the ramp. It wasn't a secret, they would deny, since everyone knew the McCarthys, if not Godfrey, had been staying on the station of late, but photographs and especially live video of their arrival would have played into Nick Mason's hands and given further ammunition to his increasingly inflammatory anti-alien, anti-Godfrey, and now even anti-McCarthy rhetoric. Once they got into a car and made the final leg of the journey to the studio, though, things had come to feel a little more normal. Emma was firmly in business mode to an extent she hadn't been for over a decade, while Godfrey was just as keenly pouring through the latest social media meta-analysis data to see which elements of Mason's recent scattergun attacks were going down well with the public and which should be avoided. They knew one very damaging thing about Mason, that he had ordered Timo Fiori's poisoning, and they had incontrovertible proof of it. But while intensive investigations were ongoing about his apparent links to an uplifted or otherwise gifted individual, the McCarthys and their inner circle didn't plan to drop the Timo bombshell immediately. Leaving Mason enough rope to hang himself was the best way forward for now, Godfrey had stressed most firmly, and Emma agreed. Another consideration was that if Mason found out that they knew about the poisoning, he might become skittish with worry that they also knew about his links to the kind of illegal uplift research he rallied against so firmly and so consistently. But Emma and Godfrey had both been around the block enough times to know that they weren't the only ones currently weighing up the pros and cons of showing their cards. And as their car reached the studio complex, they couldn't help but wonder just what cards Nick Mason might be holding close to his chest and just what else might be up his sleeve. G-65, Human Residential Zone, New Birchwood, New Kerguelen. A few hours after Billy Kendrick's departure for the Isle of Answers, Clark and Tara were nearing the end of a very important conversation with their son, Aiden. Breaking from a consistent five-year effort to keep the boy from as many alien things as they could, they were now just minutes away from placing a painless uplift patch on the back of his neck to enable him to communicate silently and effortlessly with the messengers who had taken to him like flowers to sunlight. The questions of painless had thrown a late spanner in the works when the boy, enthusiastic to receive his patch, had asked them to promise it wouldn't hurt. Both Tara and Clark had rushed to say it wouldn't, speaking with complete honesty. 
The patches were the only form of uplift technology Clark had ever experienced, and he vouched for the fact that the worst thing Aiden might feel was a slight resistant stickiness when it came time to remove the adhesive patch. Like taking off a band-aid? Aiden had asked. Yeah, his mother replied, and we'll be gentle with that. Believe me, it's nothing compared to what the messengers did to me before your Uncle Dan and Billy found these patches inside the outpost. They stuck the sharp cable into my neck when I first got here because I wanted to be able to talk to everyone, just like you want to be able to talk to everyone now. But I would never say yes to something that would hurt you like that, even though you do want to talk to everyone. Clark nodded in agreement. And once you take the patch off, that's it. That part won't hurt either. But once it's done, you'll never feel anything again and you'll go completely back to normal. Since Clark and Tara were already wearing patches, she was able at that point to silently share an uncomfortable thought that popped into her mind following what Clark had just said. But you felt the pulses on Earth, she said without making a sound. You only ever used the patches, but you still felt the pulse in your neck. Not as bad as me and Dan, and obviously not as bad as Piper, but you still felt it. So the patches do change something, and it doesn't go away when you take them off. Clark's expression reflected his conflicted thoughts, torn between viewing this as a worthwhile consideration and thinking that if that ended up being anyone's biggest concern, things would be going pretty well. I hardly felt it, he silently replied. And if there are ever any more pulses, Aiden and everyone else is going to have bigger things to worry about than that. We've gone so far out of our way to give him a normal life, and he's missed out on so much. But as hard as we tried, Tara, here we are. All we can do is be in this together and make things as easy for him as we can. And as someone who felt that tiny little pain, I'm going to vote that the best way to do that is to give him a patch. Are you guys talking about me with your patches? Aiden sharply observed as an unusual silence continued. Tara chuckled. She then glanced at Clark and nodded, appreciating the balanced honesty of his reply. Her own concerns had never been huge, only popping up at the last minute and only raising the question as to whether uplifting Aiden was the kindest course of action rather than making her think it wasn't. Of course we were, she grinned at her son. We only have until you put this on, so we're making the most of it. Aiden mocked a scowl. What Tara said wasn't strictly true, since experienced patch wearers could direct their thoughts solely to the listeners they wanted to hear them. The crucial flip side of this point was that no one could eavesdrop. An altogether different and altogether more powerful red patch was required for the kind of deep dive into someone's thoughts that enabled that kind of intrusion, and there were no circumstances in any world that Aiden's parents would ever let him within sight of one of those. Leisha had wisely placed a full ban on the red patches, which had costly and painful effects on their wearers, but in skilled hands could work without the knowledge of their violated subject. The standard telepathy patch currently in her hand, and on the way to her son's neck, posed no such threat. And as she put it in place, the boy wriggled and giggled in reaction to how cold it felt on his skin. Is that it? he asked. You tell me. Tara replied silently. Aiden's eyes lit up like he had just unwrapped a box containing every Christmas present he'd ever asked for. Can you hear me? He said to Clark. Clark covered his eyes with his hands and roared with laughter. Of course I heard you, he silently stated. You were still speaking out loud. Oh, Aiden said. Tara put a finger to her lips. Aiden focused his thoughts. How about now? Tara smiled widely, as did Clark. There was no going back now. We're going to keep talking normally to each other, Clark reminded the boy, himself speaking out loud once more. We can practice whenever you want, but this is so you can talk to the messengers and hear them. Do you want to go to the courtyard and play with some of them now? Of course I do! The excited boy beamed back, jumping to his feet. Before Clark and Tara were standing along with him, though, Urgent footsteps in the hallway caught their ears. The door then burst open, not even giving them time to wonder if the approaching feet were headed their way. They had been, clearly, and they belonged to Tara's chief nurse from the infirmary. Spotting Aiden, but not knowing he was patched, the woman telepathically delivered the message she'd sprinted here to share. 
I don't want you to be alarmed, but Tara, we need you back in the infirmary. It's about the baby. Tara's hand immediately reached for Clark's as he felt his throat tighten and a weight pressing down on his shoulders. The baby? Aiden asked, revealing to the nurse that he was patched, and simultaneously revealing to his parents that she had understandably not taken the care to direct her thoughts only to them, since she had no reason to think the boy would pick them up. You mean my brother? No one said anything for several seconds. The silence was oppressive, but everyone's minds were too full of uncomfortable thoughts to notice. Could you call the girls who watched him yesterday and get them to come and play with him again? Clark asked the nurse, focusing his thoughts to make sure Aiden didn't hear. She quickly said yes. We're going to go for a little while, but we'll be back soon, okay? Clark said, turning to Aiden. You're going to play with the nurses from yesterday, and then I'll take you to the courtyard like I promised. Aiden nodded slowly. But is he okay? He asked, understandably fixating on the news this nurse had brought. He's fine, the nurse replied, relaxing Clark and Tara's minds before the follow-up sent them spinning again. He just might have to come out and join us a little bit earlier than we expected, that's all. Tara looked only at Clark even as the nurse spoke. Fixing the gate or hoping someone on Earth did the same had felt like a race against time since no one knew if the passage would be safe for a newborn baby and thus how long they might have to stay if it was fixed too late. Hope of any kind of a normal life for a child born on an alien world seemed more than a little forlorn. And as one uncomfortable reality sank in after another, Tara tried in vain to focus on the positive that Clark and Aiden were with her even if Emma wasn't, and that the nurse seemed fairly confident the baby was healthy. The nurse smiled, putting the bravest face on things that she could manage. Aiden, your little brother is about to become the first person ever born on New Kergalen. G-65 RMXT Studio No. 1, Manhattan, New York Memories flooded through Emma like whitewater currents as she walked through the labyrinthine corridors of the studio complex. She had been present when a huge architect descended from the sky outside during a live episode of Focus 2020, crushing the tips of skyscrapers before touching down and connecting itself to her husband in a manner that had made everyone who saw it fear for Dan's life. Despite this, however, the clearest memories of all came from even earlier when Emma had been Dan's company-appointed PR manager rather than someone he knew in any personal capacity. On that occasion, Dan's first time on live TV, Emma coached him through a tough showdown with the likes of Joe Crabb, and the day had brought them closer together. Dan appeared remotely from a sister studio in Amarillo, but the corridors were so similar that nostalgia carried Emma back there, rather than to memories of walking this corridor more recently. The irony wasn't lost on Emma or Godfrey that they had found themselves on opposite sides of some very heated episodes of Focus 2020, as well as one particularly heated pre-show incident in these very corridors. All of that was behind them, though, and when they reached Godfrey's assigned dressing room, it was straight down to final preparations. There hadn't been much discussion on the station of their strategic approach for handling Mason, mainly because the others trusted Emma and Godfrey's instincts and because they had known this time would be available, and so it was best to use their time on the station to assist everyone in the multitude of other matters that all seemed set to come to a head at some not-too-distant crescendo. Nick Mason had recently said a lot of things that couldn't go unanswered, but Emma spent most of the few hours before the show prepping Godfrey for new comments. While this wasn't quite a full-blown mock debate, and she certainly couldn't bear to play the role of Mason even for a short time, it made sure Godfrey stayed nimble. They both knew Mason was smarter than almost everyone else gave him credit for, and in Emma's estimation, he might have said some things in his recent press briefing with the sole intention of making Godfrey think those were the lines of attack he would pursue during their live showdown. Some were clearly red herrings, like his frankly laughable suggestion that the vault in Scotland might have been placed there by Godfrey and Logan to cover up some ill-fated uplift research that really set the pulses off. As the show drew near, Godfrey asked Emma's thoughts on hinting at some of what they knew 
if it seemed necessary to stop Mason and his flow. Not announce anything to the public, Godfrey said. Just enough to make Mason wonder how much we know and how we know it. There is a fine line between hinting at it and actually saying it, Emma replied. But for our purposes, I don't think that line matters. The key thing is that we don't want him to know we know. I know you're going to have the urge to humble him and knock him out of his stride with a comment about it when he gets into a groove, which he will at some point because he is a powerful speaker and Maria will give him uninterrupted time. But don't. Absolutely, Godfrey nodded. When you've got your enemy surrounded, you don't give him hints. Nick Mason, backed into a corner, would be an even more dangerous animal than the one we see now. When the truth comes, it won't bring death by a thousand cuts. That was the one thing the French got right. A guillotine is hard to beat. As the show drew near, Emma came to focus on how she felt Godfrey should react if Mason played his childish game of I know something you don't know. If he starts hinting that he knows something important about the pulses or the vault, like he did at the summit two weeks ago, give no indication that we're on to him about any of it. In fact, I think it would be best if you look flustered and irritated when he says that, if you practically beg him to tell you by saying it's for the greater good that you all share information, that makes you look like someone who cares more about the world's safety than your own image. You know what I mean? Godfrey scratched his chin for a few seconds. I do, he eventually said, showing with those two words that he really was someone who cared about the greater good more than his own standing. That hadn't always been the case, and perhaps highlighted the way in which Chairman Godfrey was most changed from the younger self of his days in frontline British politics. He now took his core responsibilities as ICA chairman very seriously, the responsibility to protect Earth's best interests in the face of any alien-related problems, one of which was Nick Mason. His willingness to follow most of Emma's advice, while never unquestioning, meanwhile spoke to the unparalleled esteem in which he held her PR instincts. Godfrey seemed to be at the top of his conversational game, and the latest updates from the station suggested good, but not yet decisive progress in the search for Piper's all-important water tower. So spirits were high when the alarm rang to call him to the studio. Emma wished him luck as he set off down the corridor. Godfrey, she called after a few seconds. One more thing. The ICA chairman turned around to face perhaps the only person he didn't mind calling him solely by his surname. Yes? Game face. Godfrey smiled and set off. Emma watched him for several seconds and then felt a hand on the back of her neck. She turned her head sideways to look around, expecting to see a technician or other staff member there to tell her that Godfrey had forgotten something. But the hand wasn't tapping her neck. It was resting. And rather than a member of the studio's staff, it belonged to the President of the United States. How's my game face? Mason whispered. Emma swiped his hand away and stepped back. Too shocked to say anything, she only stared angrily in his beady eyes. Hmm, yours is very intense, he winked. Dan's a lucky man. This comment was so outlandishly inappropriate, it broke Emma's momentary stupor and made her laugh heartily. You're not his type, she shot back. More of a challenge than he's used to, I'm sure. Mason said without missing a beat. Not everything he said made sense, but Emma couldn't deny he had the gift of the gab. But I better take my seat for the show, and you better take yours, he went on. Something tells me it's going to be a good one. Emma didn't say anything. Oh, Mason said, stopping after just a few steps to glance back. And when you get back to the station in the little spaceship you came down in, send my love to Timo, will you? I hear he's been feeling, you know, a little under the weather. Dangerous world out there. Guy like that, he's got to be careful. Emma made every effort to keep her expression blank, even as her accelerated heartbeat and scrambling mind seemed as though they were engaged in a race like none she'd ever known. Come on now, Emma, the sleazeball grinned. If I didn't want you to know, do you really think you would? Surely young Nick has earned some more credit than that. 
At that, Mason set off and didn't look back. And with Godfrey well out of earshot and all his devices left in the dressing room, as per the show's rules, all Emma could do was watch Nick Mason saunter down the corridor and hope beyond hope that they hadn't just stumbled into a very costly trap. G-63, New Care Grill and Bar and Grill, Birchwood, Colorado. In an increasingly familiar bid to avoid the loneliness and troubling thoughts that came with the prospect of another night on his own at home, Walter Byrd had made his way to New Care Grill and Bar and Grill to watch the big Focus 2020 panel that the whole world was talking about. Before the show began, the network aired a 30-minute documentary about the day a monstrous alien architect touched down outside the very studio in New York where William Godfrey and Nick Mason were all set to go head-to-head. -head. As far as Mr. Bird was concerned, the footage that aired should have come with an age rating consistent with the level that would be applied to the kind of horror movie an alien like that would normally be seen in. He had seen more than a few such movies over the years, and never once seen anything as chilling as the architect. No live footage had aired out at the time due to the signal interference caused by the hovering mothership the monster arrived in, and Mr. Bird recalled only too well what it had felt like sitting in this very bar with Henry McCarthy and trying to assure him that Dan would be fine. Upon seeing the footage again now for the first time in many years, Mr. Bird found himself wondering all over again just how Dan had been fine. Like the far less intimidating messengers had on contact day, the architect connected a cable to the back of Dan's neck to enable communication. Entirely unlike on that occasion, however, the link-up to the visiting architect had caused Dan to float unconsciously in the air. Emma and Clark, who had been unfortunate enough to have to witness it all up close, described the cable as looking more like a tentacle, and Mr. Bird could certainly see why. When the most troubling footage finished, the documentary cut to various snippets of interviews with Dan recorded in the days, months, and sometimes years that followed. He spoke of his conflicted feelings about the visitor from afar, which he felt at the time and had never been able to shake. There had never been any doubt in Dan's mind that the architects as a whole could and should be considered as devious fiends for the cruel and deceitful betrayal they inflicted upon the good citizens of New Kerguelen for so long. In his mind, though, the honesty, and on some subjects the outright helpfulness, of the only individual architect he had ever met made him think the ones who had inflicted all the suffering on the messengers were long gone, and that this lone wanderer, perhaps even having gone rogue from his own species, wasn't all that bad. Being more than two weeks old, the documentary naturally didn't touch on the unfathomably destructive pulses that had recently rocked Earth and historically cleansed New Kerguelen from subterranean vaults left behind by ancient architects. As the documentary ended, and the intro music for Focus 2020 began to play, the final, and somewhat sentimentally personifying words spoken by its narrator, echoed in Mr. Bird's mind. We don't know if he'll ever be back, and we don't know if we'll ever know his full story. But one thing is for sure. The rogue architect will be out there, no doubt looking down as we look up. The idea of the architect looking down sent a chill up Mr. Bird's spine for reasons he couldn't quite place given Dan's insistence that it seemed surprisingly friendly, or at least neutral. He couldn't shake the fear, though, and was anything but alone in that. Of the tens of millions of viewers focused on events in New York, none wanted Focus 2020 to be cut short by an architect arrival like it had back on that fateful night. Of all the things the world needed, Mr. Bird considered with more than a hint of trepidation, that was most certainly not one. G-62, RMXT Studio No. 1, Manhattan, New York Welcome, everyone, to a very special and hotly anticipated edition of Focus 2020, the show's host, Maria Janzik, said into the main camera directly in front of her desk. Maria had taken over the show's hosting duties since Godfrey's last appearance on the show, replacing the truly stalwart Marion de Klerk, who had sat at the helm for decades. 
Her replacement was broadly seen as a friend of the McCarthy's due to a strong working relationship she had shared with Emma during the heady days of the IDA when Dan had few friends in the media and naturally wanted to converse with them rather than the sharks that circled everywhere he went. Another novelty for everyone was that tonight's panel consisted of only two guests rather than the usual four to six. The network supremos had understandably figured that anyone else would just get in the way and take airtime from the two voices the American public wanted to hear more than any others. At least, they figured anyone who might have accepted an invite would get in the way. There would always be a spot for extra guests with the surname McCarthy, Fiore, or Logan, if they wanted it. The final change, reflecting a changing of the times as much as anything else, was that the show now aired for 30 minutes instead of 60. The two ad-free 20-minute segments that gave the show its name had been replaced by two 10-minute segments at the same time Janzik replaced a clerk, and the move had been considered a firm ratings success. Measurable trends showed that most people who engaged with Focus 2020 content now did so in the form of short snippets shared on social media, and the network's decision-makers believed they were simply moving with the times and reacting to a generational decline in attention spans. All data bore out that 20 minutes was quite simply too long for the average modern viewer to remain focused on one topic, and apparently, even tonight's perfect storm of a showdown hadn't merited a reversion to the old format. In case my guests need any introduction, Maria continued, on my left we have former multi-time British Prime Minister and long-standing chairman of the Interspace Contact Agency, William Godfrey. The studio audience, vetted by security teams as thoroughly as a visitor to a bank vault, clapped politely. It was too early to tell whose side most of them would be on, but Godfrey was operating on the assumption that Mason's famously competent ground operations team had likely secured and distributed a majority of the gold dust tickets by any means necessary. And to my right, I'm joined by President Nick Mason. The second applause was certainly louder, but far from raucous. Not as bad as Godfrey expected. Maria remained focused on Mason. Now, President Mason, would it be fair? Just Nick, he interrupted. I'm here tonight in the capacity of a concerned citizen, Maria, so Nick is fine. I know Chairman Godfrey likes to throw his title around, but we're cut from a very different cloth. Polyester, by the look of it? Godfrey shot back, running his eyes up and down Mason's suit. I'll be honest, Nicholas, I'm surprised that jacket even passed the studio's fire regulations. Much of the audience laughed at this, making Godfrey think once more that it was fairly even split. For that crowd, as well as the viewers at home, there was always something in the contrast between Godfrey's hyper-refined English accent and the zingers he rattled that made them even more impactful than they otherwise would be. But while the audience was laughing at the line about the suit, it was the Nicholas that irked Mason, exactly as Godfrey intended. This single word quickly and utterly undermined what Mason had thought was an easy winning position on the contrast he drew between their preferred terms of address. Now that he had nailed his colors to the mast in stating that the names didn't matter, Godfrey could rile him all night. As I was saying, gentlemen, Maria cut back in, speaking in a tone that suggested she wouldn't have much patience for pettiness. President Mason, would it be fair to characterize you as falling on the alien skeptic side of this debate? In the same way a buck is skeptical of a rifle, Mason shrugged, quick-witted in a way Godfrey couldn't deny and knew he would have to watch out for. Maria turned then to him. And Chairman Godfrey, I suppose it goes without saying that you see cooperation between species as an undertaking to defend and protect. It does, he confirmed. But I'll say it anyway. Our world is enriched by cooperation and communication with others. We should not let the dastardly actions of the architects pollute discussion of our long-standing relationship with the messengers of New Kerguelen. Everything will come out in good time. When there aren't public security issues tied in to what I'm able to say, but I want everyone to understand that assistance from New Kerguelen allowed us to contain the final pulse which would otherwise have threatened life as we know it. The vault we're dealing with in Scotland, despite the obstructive efforts of this charlatan in his disco suit, has been there since long before we met the messengers. But because we met them, 
and because they're so driven to cooperate and assist us whenever we can, we're still here to talk about it. Mason retorted with some predictable and tired arguments about the messenger's supposed penchant for violence, based on one single occasion when Leisha had killed a would-be assassin who tried to take out him, Godfrey, and Clark during a media event in Buenos Aires. The next few minutes were spent debating the character of the messengers as a race, which was something Godfrey hadn't expected to get into, but something he was glad to spend time on since it was such comfortable ground with little in the way of meaningful barbs to deflect. I think our viewers would now like to hear some more about the vault itself. Maria chimed in, sure enough saying what millions around the country were thinking. The nature of the pulses is a matter for scientific analysis, but all the questions around what we do next are tied to this vault. Chairman Godfrey, you want to explore it immediately, but President Mason... He shook his head. If Godfrey wasn't rash, he'd be nothing. All these comments promising that they'll pay for this without even knowing how he could ever reach them and without knowing what this is. Or maybe he does know, which is a whole other issue. But all the rest of the world knows is that a bizarre alien artifact just killed tens of thousands of innocent people, and our ICA chairman's first reaction is to get on TV and start grandstanding and saber-rattling, just like he always has. Godfrey kept quiet, handing Mason as much rope as he could. The president clicked onto this, though, and simply returned Godfrey's stare. Maria stepped in. Some people would say it's often wiser to let sleeping dogs lie she said to Godfrey, and perhaps that exploring a vault we know nothing about so soon after it emitted the pulse is unwise. Some people say all kinds of things, Godfrey replied, but no, that argument cuts no mustard with me. There's no sleeping dog here, Maria, but I'll tell you this, if there's a fox in our henhouse and you find yourself the good fortune of encountering it while it sleeps, you owe it to those hens to slit the bastard's throat there and then so let me state this as plainly as I can. They sought to eliminate life on our planet, indiscriminately. We were united in their crosshairs, and if we stand divided in the aftermath, we risk falling. Maria then announced that they were reaching the end of their first segment, which caught Godfrey off guard since he was so used to the old longer format and had gotten right back into the familiar rhythm. Things had gone well, though, and having spent the first half feeling Mason out, he was ready to start forcing the issue after the break in an effort to force him into letting something slip. At least, that had been the plan. Join us after the break, when we'll discuss the news Chairman Godfrey recently shared about the apparent disappearance of the gate to New Kergelen, Maria said. Future cooperation with the messengers rests upon this, and we'll discuss what kind of work is underway to ensure... Oh, please, Mason interrupted. This was rude, but what came next was something else entirely. Godfrey only cares so much about fixing that gate because Terra crossed it before the last pulse and is stuck on the other side, he said, casually groaning out the words with a wave of his hand as though this wasn't the bombshell he'd been waiting to drop since the moment he sat down. Godfrey breathed slowly, keeping the straightest face he could. From a position of relative strength, he was now grateful to be saved by the halftime bell. If he could have wished for one thing in the world above any other in that moment, it would have been a direct line to Emma McCarthy. Oh, Mason added as the first half outro music began to fade in, biting a grin as he glanced between Godfrey and the stunned audience. Were we not supposed to know that? G-61, McCarthy Dorm, Space Station, Il Tricatore. Nick Mason's revelation about Terra, both how he knew it and the fact he shared it, shook everyone on the station as soon as the words left his mouth. While Dan was with Chip and the Italians in the control deck, Piper had invited Serena and Carrick to her room to work some more on the quest to isolate the right water tower from her vision. They had worked while listening to the first segment, not having any time to waste and figuring that there weren't a whole lot of advantages to actually watching a show that was so totally based on discussion. The Tower View website Carrick discovered proved very useful, and in the past few hours the trio had found three candidates for the tower Piper could have sworn she saw through a window 
while she had somehow been connected to a distant individual and able to remote view the world through their eyes. One tower was in Wyoming, one was in New Mexico, and the third was in Montana. Using all available images from all available sources, Carrick and Zarina provided Piper with slideshows and 3D recreations in a bid to trigger something decisive in her mind. All three towers had fields nearby, and all three fields passed Piper's eye test of being within the realms of what she thought she could remember about that aspect of the image, which she had paid less attention to than the tower itself and the blue sky it was set against. So far, however, she could only say she thought Wyoming was the most likely because of a potential similarity in the cloud cover. She couldn't be sure of that and realized only too well that a cloud pattern spotted from a given location on one day could be very different the next day. Narrowing it down to three white round-topped water towers with town names beginning with H was an impressive feat in itself, she told the somewhat disappointed couple, and she further tried to raise their spirits with the assertion that Chip and Timo's research into facilities linked to Nick Mason's shady business interests could soon make one of these locations seem more likely than the others. There really was a small enough number to start working with, she stressed, and they had done a great job to get that far. The team effort involved Carrick writing a script to scrape all images from the Tower View website that contained roughly the right amount of white, which found two of the three candidates, and Serena's more active web searching for combinations of keywords, which found the third. We'll bring this to the guys after the show is done, Piper said. They wouldn't look at it right now. The couple agreed. Definitely, Serena said. Like everyone else, she was confused and worried about Mason's knowledge that Tara was stranded on New Care Galen, but she was currently feeling glad that she and Carrick had at least been able to productively distract Piper like they had. She was a remarkably stoic and resilient 14-year-old, as well as a remarkably gifted one, but Serena knew that even Piper had to be shaken up by her much-loved aunt, uncle, and nephew being stranded on an alien world and now apparently the focus of Nick Mason's petty point scoring. Carrick was thinking much the same. This could help us help Terra, and it could help us take down Mason at the same time, he said to Piper, similarly trying to boost her spirits on the assumption she must be feeling down, rather than because of any outward sign she was. Oh, he's going down, the girl replied, turning her full focus to the TV for the first time as the second segment was set to begin. That's not an if, it's a when. G-60, RMXT Studio No. 1, Manhattan, New York The commercial break gave Godfrey a chance to compose himself in the face of Mason's unexpected public announcement that Tara McCarthy was stranded on New Kergill End. Unfortunately, the ironclad rules of the show didn't grant him the chance to discuss this with Emma, and all he could do was try to imagine what kind of advice she would give. That Godfrey would listen to his own mentally imagined advice from Emma said an awful lot about how much weight he placed in her opinions and judgments when it came to dealing with characters like Mason. On previous occasions when Godfrey had thought about this, considering how little attention he used to pay to any aides and advisors in contrast to how much he paid to Emma, he figured it was largely because she was more insightful than anyone he'd worked with in the past. It wasn't solely down to that, however, since he also saw an unmistakable change in the kind of characters he'd had to deal with. Emma had cut her teeth in the dog-eat-dog -dog PR world of the city they were sitting in, dealing with billionaires and athletes and actors and the Empire State-sized egos that went with the territory. Godfrey had, meanwhile, been used to dealing with the more reserved and generally proper individuals who operated at the top level of British politics. Much had changed when the influence of brash individuals like Jack Neal and John Cole began to take hold on either side of the Atlantic and Nick Mason was the final evolutionary form of that archetype. It always took a minute each morning for Godfrey to remember that the President of the United States could no longer be expected to be a generally respectable and polite individual any more than could the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. And in a world like that, an aging traditionalist like Godfrey sometimes needed a steady young hand like Emma's to keep him on track in handling the foes who came their way. As the intro music kicked in to signal the beginning of the show's second and final segment, Godfrey psyched himself up. 
The two words Emma never let a client tackle the world without hearing rattled around his mind as he stared at Mason, and his game face was well and truly engaged. Well, there is clearly only one place for us to resume, Maria Janzik began, unable to believe her luck that a revelation of this magnitude had been made on her show. If she felt any concern for Tara's well-being, which might have been expected given how closely she had worked with the family some fifteen years earlier, it certainly didn't shine through. There is, Godfrey sighed, diving into the best response he'd been able to think of. As usual, we can always count on a man like Nicholas to conjure the spirit of John Cole and deliver bad news with all the tact of an egg on a windshield. Tara McCarthy is on the wrong side of the gate, along with her immediate family and all the resident human scientists we are desperate to bring home as soon as we can. I told the world very directly that we've lost contact with New Kergelen and lost all signs of the gate. That was important to Devold because it directly affects the urgency of exploring the vault in search of a remedy. Tara's presence on New Kergelen doesn't change that and public knowledge of Terra's presence on New Kergelen does nothing but add sadness and panic to an already challenging situation. I understand that men like Nicholas use panic as a means of seeking advantage and shielding their countless and varied inadequacies, but I take my responsibility to my office seriously. It saddens me that the man sitting opposite me doesn't treat his own office or his own citizens with the same respect. Maria turned to Mason, inviting his response. He solemnly shook his head. I just think it's a damn sad indictment of the world we live in that it's one rule for the McCarthys and one rule for the rest. What are you even talking about? Godfrey prodded, unable to resist. Half of Scotland was evacuated, Mason replied, because projections showed it would be destroyed by the pulses, but when you came to think that the effects of the Twelfth Pulse might be considerably broader than that, Tara McCarthy was evacuated to New Kergelen. Don't you think other people deserve that opportunity? You know, people with other surnames? People who weren't born or married into the Birchwood Mafia? Godfrey upturned his palms. Only Clark and Aiden went with her, and she only went because her history with the Uplift Powers meant she was feeling the pulses far more painfully than anyone else besides Dan, and... And that was something we had to consider, the ICA chairman said, infinitely glad that he'd stopped himself from committing what would have been the cardinal sin of saying, and Piper. The point stands, Mason countered. We all know Tara is pregnant, which you're neglecting to mention as though it wasn't a factor. I feel like other expectant mothers would have deserved a seat on the evacuation at least as much as Tara did, but hey, I don't know, maybe that's just me. So what point stands, exactly? Godfrey asked, looking as bemused as he sounded. You're asking why I didn't send more pregnant women into space and through an alien portal to an alien planet, with which we've since lost contact, with no reason to think they would be affected more by the pulse than anyone else, which couldn't be said for Terra? Just so I'm clear, that's what you would have wanted me to do? Mason shrugged. The McCarthys aren't the only people who deserve your attention, that's all. Believe me, I'm not alone in thinking that. At this, Godfrey looked away from Mason and directly to the studio audience. What... Nicholas is neglecting to tell you is that when the final pulse hit while I was on the ground in London working with Diane Logan to support the other side of the McCarthy family on the ground in Thurso, he was hiding in an upstate New York bunker like a dormouse with his tail between his legs. With venom in his gaze as well as his words, Godfrey then turned back to Mason. So tell us, you spineless coward, how many pregnant women did you invite down there with you? A long, oh, sound filtered through the studio, coming from several audience members who couldn't believe how savagely Godfrey had turned the conversation on its head and how ruthlessly he was holding Mason's feet to the fire. I'm surprised Timo didn't cross the gate, Mason said so quickly that it seemed like he was replying to a question that hadn't been asked instead of the one that had. What does that have to do with anything? Godfrey asked, knocked off his train of thought by the segue exactly as Mason had intended. Mason shrugged. 
How is Timo anyway? he asked. This apparent non sequitur laced in far more significance than any viewers and even Godfrey realized at first. The next part, however, hit him like a brick to the temple. I don't think I've seen Timo since that night in Buenos Aires, Mason said, holding eye contact so intense it almost challenged Godfrey to react. Remember? In your building? It wasn't the best summit. The atmosphere was toxic that night. Poisonous. In the face of this revelatory provocation, even more unexpected and intolerable than the last, Godfrey had to firmly bite the insides of his cheeks to stop himself from lashing out. An hour ago, he and Emma had been talking about the pros and cons of hinting that they knew something about Mason's poisoning of Timo. Now, with a brass neck, the likes of which Godfrey had never seen, Mason was goading him with the same subject. How Mason knew they knew was a question and a concern for later, but for now, Godfrey just couldn't believe how close to the sun the president was flying. As a one-minute warning flashed up in Godfrey's eyeline, his mind focused on making the most of the time he had left. Mason hadn't brought up anything about his supposed plan to force a vote at the ICA that would block vault exploration, and had likewise neglected to mention his prior ridiculous assertion that he thought the UK might have created the whole story about the vault to cover up an experiment gone wrong. Those, seemingly, had been red herrings after all. State your position on the gate, Godfrey requested as calmly as he could. We don't have long and no one has any more patience for your childish diversions. You've rallied against cooperation and research for years, for reasons I can't even begin to guess, and this tragedy has temporarily given you what you want. So my question is a simple one. Do you think we should attempt to restore the gate and its full functionality? If I'm calling the shots, the gate stays closed, Mason said. Is that clear enough for you? Glad to have gotten this tremendously unpopular opinion out of Mason so directly, Godfrey shook his head in disgust. Then it's a good thing you're not calling the shots. Now are you, Nick? No, I'm not, Mason replied, a slow and snake-like smile spreading across his face before he added the final words either panelist had time to get in. Not yet. G-59, Infirmary, New Birchwood, New Kerguelen. Leisha, looped in on the news by one of the alien members of the infirmary staff, was waiting for the McCarthys before they even got there. The alien didn't have to say anything, telepathically or otherwise, for his discomfort to come through loud and clear. Would the gate be safe for the baby to cross once he's been born? Tara asked her alien friend the one she would have chosen to be there for this over any other except Melly. This concern wouldn't leave her head despite the fact that it wouldn't have much bearing on any decisions she would have to make since it wasn't as if she could decide to hold off if the doctors and nurses were going to confirm that inducing the birth very soon was as necessary as the first nurse suggested. It will be safe, Leisha replied. As ever, he didn't make a sound when speaking to the humans by way of their patches and his innate upliftability. But I feel great sadness, Terra. New Kerguelen is no place for a human child to be born, any more than Earth would be for one of our own. We will continue to make you and the child feel as comfortable as we can, but I fear there is only so much we can do. There are people here, good people. But this is not their home. This is not the home a human child should know. While gladly hearing Leisha's confident reply that the baby would safely be able to cross the gate if and when the gate was passable for anyone, Clark couldn't help but wonder what benefit there was to everything else he'd said. Things were already difficult enough for Terra, more difficult than they should ever be for anyone, he figured, and stating the obvious that the baby would be better off being born on Earth didn't seem to serve any purpose beyond twisting a knife of sadness. Leisha didn't mean anything by it, of course, but Clark considered that this was perhaps symptomatic of what he was saying. The messengers were very different from humans, mentally and emotionally as well as physically, 
and their world probably was lacking in a lot of things that would be taken for granted in the rearing of a child on earth. Things they hadn't even noticed were missing, because until now they had never had a reason to look. When the door opened again behind Clark and Tara, two human doctors and a nurse entered the room. None looked anything close to relaxed. How soon does he have to come? Tara asked them. Clark, for his part, could silence his own mental voice as it screamed in uncomfortable wonder about why the baby apparently had to come early in the first place. Within minutes, all of their questions would be answered. Your baby is okay, Tara, one of the doctors began, seeing it as crucially important to start with this. He wore a badge bearing the name Dr. Cardulo and had a gentle manner that made him well suited to the delicate task at hand. But upon close examination of some of your test results, we feel like the best way to ensure he remains okay is to induce labor as a matter of urgency. Is she okay? Clark asked, his fears suddenly turning to Tara's condition now that it had seemingly emerged as the doctor's prime concern. Dr. Cardulo hesitated, choosing his words and their order even more carefully than last time. We've seen a lot of things we would expect, Tara, including a spike in your cortisol levels to a point that would be a cause for concern even if there was nothing else to consider. Our interventions there appear to have made a significant impact already, but some of the final and more advanced tests we carried out just before you were discharged have revealed another area of concern now that the data has been collated alongside everything else. By compiling results from various tests, we've identified some slightly concerning cellular changes in the area around the back of your neck, where you were uplifted and where the pulses were felt. It looks like this worsened over time, presumably with each successive pulse. What does that mean? she asked, taking the same words from Clark's lips. Well, we don't quite know what it means, Dr. Cardulo readily admitted, but we don't think it's good. Some of our specialists believe your body has been reacting to something as though fighting an infection. Others believe the shock of the unusual pain has generated that kind of reaction. However, we all agree on one thing. For the baby's well-being, we can't in good conscience recommend that you wait several more weeks for nature to take its course. Tara's expression stiffened. Let's do it, she announced, her tone leaving no room for doubt. Clark, let's just do it. To her left, Clark barely reacted to the words. His gaze remained fixed on Dr. Cardulo, running and rerunning through the exact words the man had used and trying to figure out exactly what he was getting at. Cellular changes sounded far too much like a euphemism for something else for his liking. No regrets of waiting too long, Tara reiterated. Let's just do it. We can't sit around counting on the gate coming back so soon, and Leisha says the gate is just as safe for a newborn baby as it is for anyone else. It's not what we wanted, but it's the best move we can make. Clark looked at her silently, wondering how on earth she could state the position so clearly. He didn't disagree with it, as this did seem like the only smart move they could make on the basis of the available evidence, but amidst Tara's focused clarity, he started to wonder whether she possessed some instinct he didn't have, one that kicked in to say that when there was any kind of question mark about the baby's health, hers stopped mattering until it was safely delivered. It won't be today, Dr. Cardulo stated, his expression relaxing slightly in the face of the positive development that Terra wasn't dead set against having her baby on an alien planet. We have an excellent staff, and we are well equipped for a safe delivery, but to be blunt, we haven't done this before, and until a few minutes ago we weren't expecting to be doing it imminently. Surely this is either urgent or it's not, Clark replied. He didn't mean to sound frustrated at the doctor, but he was certainly frustrated with the situation and baffled by the apparent contradiction of saying the baby had to be born early, but not right away. Dr. Cardulo exhaled slowly. I understand your question, but that's not really the case. We have seen some cellular changes between Terra's scans from two days ago and those from this morning, but the changes are very slight compared to the changes that had occurred before then. 
My medical opinion is that the energy emitted by the pulses has caused issues no one on Earth was aware of. Clark, we don't see the same thing in any of your scans from Friday, so our line of thought at the moment is that perhaps the pulse caused a different reaction in individuals who were fully uplifted, rather than via the patches. Which means Dan, Tara said, and maybe Piper? There's no reason to be concerned about that, the doctor insisted. For one thing, they have access to the best testing equipment humanity has ever imagined. We are well equipped, but if we were on the station and had everything they have, I think I'd be able to give you a much clearer idea of what we're seeing. But for another, and more importantly, we don't have any reason to think these changes are a symptom of anything dangerous. It could simply be a reaction to the unprecedented pulses. If there was no child to consider, we wouldn't be overly concerned for you at the moment, Terra. No? Clark asked, again speaking when Terra didn't, and again seeming more concerned for her well-being than she was. Dr. Cardulo shook his head, retaining his warm, if slightly troubled, expression. Like I said, the current pace of change isn't our cause for concern. Hopefully the scans we perform tomorrow will show very little difference from today, and hopefully the little change we are still seeing is an after-effect of whatever was happening in your neck when each of those pulses hit. On that point, one thing I will say is that I'm extremely glad you came here, even if Earth is perfectly safe now and the convergent final pulse didn't have the worst of the predicted effects, the power of that pulse might well have done something to you that would have been irreversible and likely dangerous for the baby. We would like you to spend the night here for observation, Mrs. McCarthy, a second doctor chimed in, speaking for the first time. He was younger than Dr. Cardulo and was either more concerned or had a permanently worried expression. Clark hadn't seen him before, so couldn't tell which it was, but needless to say was dearly rooting for the latter. Tara's eyes closed in disappointment. After just getting out of hospital that morning, having the prospect of at least one relatively normal night with Clark and Aiden ripped away was hard to take. Clark put an arm around her shoulder, which at least reminded her that she wasn't alone. Her eyes reopened slowly, dry of tears but heavy with sadness and worry. Can I at least go back to the HRZ and come back here for the night? We were going to take Aiden to the courtyard. Of course, Dr. Cardulo said. We'll have everything ready for you, even more comfortable than last time. Unless you have any other questions for now, I'll report to the rest of the team and continue with our preparations. Tara shook her head. Not right now, she said. Thanks. Clark waited until the man had taken a few steps into the hallway, then announced that he'd forgotten to ask something and walked after him. Be right back, he said. Leisha, now alone in the room with Tara, was reeling from everything he'd heard and felt terribly worried for one of his closest human friends. We'll get through this, he insisted, placing his very alien hand on Tara's arm in imitation of a supportive gesture he had witnessed from several humans over the years. Thanks, she replied, meaning it very sincerely. Memories flooded back in that moment from almost fourteen years earlier, when they were at a crucial UN summit about the future of human-alien relations and Leisha had been more interested in Tara's photos of Baby Piper than the baying mob of anti-alien protesters who had gathered to greet his arrival. There was so much more sentiment to the messengers than most people knew, and Tara counted herself lucky to be among the few who got to see this side of them, and of Leisha in particular. Luck certainly seemed like it was in short supply of late, but while Tara would naturally have preferred to be on Earth or the station with Emma and Piper at her side, Leisha's supportive kindness was more than welcome. We will get through this, Tara, the alien reiterated. Whatever it takes. Although she couldn't think of much Leisha could really do to ensure that, Tara was grateful of the sentiment. On the other side of the door, meanwhile, Clark had timed the moment he caught up with Dr. Cardulo to make sure he was out of Tara's earshot. Hey, Doc, he whispered. The doctor and his colleagues stopped and turned around. Just him, Clark said. Dr. Cardulo gestured with his hand for them to continue on their way. I'll catch up, he said before focusing squarely on Clark. 
A question you didn't want to ask in front of Terra? Clark held the man's eyes. Just level with me. Cellular changes? It's not cancer, Dr. Cardulo said. Clark breathed an audible sigh of relief. Word of advice? Maybe open with that next time? He replied, chuckling briefly and grinning. Such was his relief. But Dr. Cardulo clearly wasn't so happy. Wait, you're not saying you think this is something worse? Worse is hard to quantify at this stage, the doctor said. If I'm leveling with you here, I don't know what the hell we're looking at, and I don't think there's anything we can do to stop it besides wait and hope. It might not be a symptom of anything, and it might be a straightforward reaction to the pain of the pulses and nothing else, but I don't know. All I know is that delivering the baby as soon as we're completely ready is the responsible thing to do. After that, we'll turn our full attention to whatever kind of reaction this is. Clark didn't say anything. I don't think there's any immediate cause for concern, Clark, Dr. Cardulo went on. I just don't like looking at something I don't know how to fix. But you'll figure it out, Clark gulped, the words sounding like a question despite lacking the typical inflection. Dr. Cardulo forced a sympathetic smile. We'll throw everything at it, he vowed. Clark watched the doctor leave, hurrying to catch up with his colleagues. The past few minutes had turned his world on end not once but twice, first with the news that the baby would have to be delivered ahead of schedule, and secondly that Tara's body was dealing with something the doctors didn't understand and that she wasn't paying much attention to. As he walked back towards the room where she was still sitting with Leisha, Clark tried to take a leaf from Tara's book and focus on one thing at a time. It seemed like Aiden was only a day away from being a big brother, and he was sure to be absolutely delighted by that news. Becoming a father for the second time was also something Clark had been looking forward to ever since the first, and something he'd begun to lose faith would ever happen again. He made a conscious effort to think in those terms, but all such efforts were proven futile when he reached the doorway. Tara, the light of his life, was smiling about something Leisha had said, but while all of the most miraculous life-giving processes were well underway in one part of her, something altogether less welcome was happening in another. Concentrated around the all-important incision mark on her neck, where the uplift powers had been painfully granted, it sounded like her body was trying to fight off a problem the doctors had sought to underplay for her own good. But while Tara seemingly had the ability to avoid, or at least postpone, worrying about this second development until a new life was resting in her arms, Clark McCarthy most certainly did not. Monday G-58 Control Deck, Space Station, Il Tricatore. As soon as Emma stepped back on the station after the two-stage journey from New York, she convened an urgent meeting in the control deck. He's in our heads, she stated very plainly, seeing no sense in denying it. And that's exactly where he wants to be. Godfrey and I have talked about how Mason could know we were onto him about the toxin and how he could know about Terra, and neither of those are really concerning us. No? Timo asked. Emma shook her head. A lot of people know about Terra. Everyone on the station, really, and you know some of them are talking to their families all the time. There's no reason to think there was anything malicious in that getting out. It's just the usual thing of everyone always thinking they can trust one person, which they can, until the chain gets too long. And as for the toxin, you're starting to show it, Timo. Your walk, your eyes, it's subtle, but it's starting. Timo met Dan's eyes, but not without a great deal of sadness. He knows it'll have to be detected by now, Dan went on. He knows you'll have retraced your steps, he knows he's an obvious suspect, and he knows the ICA has cameras everywhere. The way he's done this is just a giant middle finger to all of us, and I think if we ever made the footage public, he would double down and say it was doctored. He'd say we were setting him up, and Chip... As excellent and as totally convincing as all the evidence you've brought together is, every piece of it requires a tiny jump or assumption. The links are all clear as day, 
but if you were defending him, I think you would win. Nothing literally ties him to anything. Ruefully, Chip nodded. I thought that when I got back from Russia, he sighed. Obviously, this is enough for us to know what he's done, but there's a difference between evidence and proof. The Ice Cube video is as close as we get, but even then I would ask a prosecutor to prove it was laced, and they wouldn't be able to. But Emma is right, Godfrey chimed in. The bastard is in our heads, and that's what counts. He has us doubting everything except each other, and he has us guessing what else he might know and what he might be about to do next. He's even got me thinking about what he might be thinking about what we'll do next. And with how reckless and aggressive he was on the show, Emma and I have come to the conclusion that we need to expedite on all fronts. How are we doing on the water tower? Do we know where the source of the uplift connection was? We just finished collating what we found with what the kids found, Chip said. Timo, standing next to him, was as unusually quiet as Alessandro. They have three towers, and we have very plausible links to buildings near two of them. Emma turned to Carrick and Serena, who weren't sure whether they should be flattered by Chip's description of them as kids. Great work, she said. Seriously, Piper was right to ask for you guys. Chop liver over here? Chip said with a slight chuckle and upturned palms. Searching and scheming is your natural state of being? Emma retorted with a grin. But yeah, it sounds promising, thanks. Where are we looking at? Probably Wyoming. Piper interjected. Emma glanced between her and Chip. It's 50-50 between Wyoming and New Mexico. There's a for-profit prison with a boundary less than half a mile from the tower in Wyoming, and it's owned by a corporation Mason has been in with balls deep for years. Emma raised her eyebrows sternly. Oh, uh, sorry, Chip said, remembering that Piper was younger than her brain made her seem, and that Emma liked to shield her from bad language. He's been knee-deep with this company for years, but in New Mexico, there's a biotech lab four miles from the water tower. The big caveat is that's too far to see the tower from the building, but the big counterpoint is that Mason was there for a photo op last year. And although it's not run by the same company that modified the toxin in Honduras, the two companies do have a non-executive director in common. Nothing else stands out about the guy so far, but we're looking into him. Emma nodded thoroughly pleased with all the work they'd done in her absence. I think it's Wyoming too, Dan offered. Parts of the prison are within sight of the tower, and if you had to keep someone in a secure location, what's better than a location where you can have as much security as you need without raising any eyebrows? I want absolutely everything on this, Godfrey demanded. Both locations, the company director, everything. Everyone can pull together with Chip taking the lead. Well, not everyone, Emma replied, tilting her head as if reminding Godfrey of something. Hmm, he nodded. Okay, I don't know what Mason is going to do tomorrow, with the ICA vote he threatened, or with whatever he might be using that as a distraction for. We're all going to have to stop at some point, but if Alessandro okays the latest atmospheric data from the vault as being safe, and if any of you are willing, I think it's time to stop scanning and start exploring. It's time for someone to try the inner door. For several seconds, eyes flitted around the room as if wondering which arm would shoot up to volunteer first. The wondering didn't last long. You know who it has to be, Piper said. Godfrey blinked several times, suddenly conflicted. He had expected this, but that didn't make it easy. That's not my decision to make, he said, addressing the reply to Piper before turning to her parents. Dad? Piper said, seeing him as the likeliest stumbling block after some productive conversations she'd had with Emma recently. Aiden is stranded. We don't know if this will help, but it might. Dan flicked his eyes to Emma before committing either way, then felt his chest inhale more deeply than he could ever remember. Okay, he gulped. But this time, I'm coming with you. G-57, Children's Courtyard, New Birchwood, New Care Galen. Fresh from their disconcerting news of the infirmary, 
Terra and Clark returned to their makeshift home in the human residential zone and quickly reapplied Aiden's telepathy patch ahead of his promised trip to the courtyard. The two young nurses who had kindly stopped by to watch him at short notice reported that he had talked about little else than the baby brother who would be on the way soon. Neither of them knew any more than Aiden had told them, but Terra quickly looped them in that she was now set for an induced delivery the next day. Neither of the young women had much success in hiding their concern, since this didn't seem like a decision that would be made at short notice unless something was wrong. Not amid the current mild upswing in optimism on New Kergalen, where renewed hope was swirling that something could be done to fix the gate to Earth on a time scale of days rather than weeks. Terra told them everything was going to be fine and thanked them again, but had to excuse herself from getting into it any more deeply, given there wasn't a lot of time left for their family trip to the courtyard. Aiden said he's going to make some new friends now that he can talk to them. One of the nurses smiled. His new patch was the only other thing he mentioned when he wasn't talking about the baby. Tara smiled and looked over at the boy. He was animatedly discussing something with Clark while he put his shoes on, then wasted no time in running to the door as soon as the laces were tied. The walk to the courtyard was a short one, with the conversation oscillating between two topics due to Aiden's apparent inability to decide whether he was more excited about the imminent arrival of his baby brother or his even more imminent meeting with some new aliens. With their destination drawing near, the boy combined these two things he was so looking forward to by wondering out loud how long it would be until the baby could use a patch to talk to them. While they didn't want to say anything that would dampen Aiden's good mood, one that was very welcome and not a little remarkable to them amidst all that was going on, neither Clark nor Tara wanted to respond in any way that indicated they expected being on New Kergalen for much longer. They certainly weren't thinking about making a life here, or of being here when the baby started walking and talking. That situation would only come to pass if the gate couldn't be fixed, which they in turn believed could only happen if a terrible and unthinkable fate really had befallen everyone on Earth and the station when the final pulse hit. It then crossed Clark's mind that Aiden might not be linking an ability to use the patches to their presence on New Care Galen, since his and Terra's decision to shelter the child as far as possible from everything alien-related had extended to not telling him when the first pulse suddenly stopped the patches and everything else related to the uplift powers from working on Earth's side of the gate. The fact that the powers had died before the gate also gave them no confidence in assuming that the gate's repair or reinstatement would simultaneously fix the uplift powers. But like so much else, this was a matter of great uncertainty that seemed of little benefit to consider too deeply at the moment. Madness that way lay, they figured, with so much uncertainty meaning that assumptions would have to be stacked ten high to support any particular outcome over another. I think we'll let him learn to talk for real before we let him play with any patches, kiddo. Clark grinned, ruffling Aiden's hair. But all of my new friends here will be wearing patches today, won't they? The boy asked, looking up with suddenly concerned eyes. They should be, Tara chimed in. All of the messengers usually wear one of those patches, even the kids. Not Leisha, Aiden retorted, an inquisitive lilt to the words. He didn't have one. Clark let a nuh -uh utterance to confirm the boy was right. Good spot, detective. Leisha doesn't need one. He has all the powers built in. Him and a few others. While a slight simplification, what Clark said was true. Leisha was one of few messengers who was permanently uplifted by a method not unlike the kind he and Sacco in turn used on Dan and Terra. Along with the two aliens best known on Earth, only the surviving members of the once powerful squadron cast and a small handful of others had been uplifted before contact was ever made with the humans. New Kergalen's post-contact era had coincided with a loss of contact with the deceitful architects who had sent orders disguised as wisdom delivered by the radio-like elders they installed on the planet, which was the point at which the even-handed and benevolent Leisha had begun to call the shots. Since then, and certainly not by coincidence, Leisha had been very conservative about granting uplift powers and even access to the patches, which could temporarily grant abilities like telekinesis. 
Lisha considered limited and non-invasive telepathy as safe and appropriate for everyone, however, and also considered it as an active force for good. In his mind, there was huge benefit in enabling the natives to communicate with the planet's fairly sizable cohort of resident humans. Communication was good for cohesion, Lisha reasoned, and every human on the planet now wore a telepathy patch either all the time or at least whenever they expected to have direct interaction with the native. As far as Clark knew, all of the messengers who weren't innately uplifted wore telepathy patches at all times with the sole exception of brief moments when they had to wear a different one. It was his understanding that this extended fully to the planet's children, since he had seen patches on the back of every neck he'd noticed, and had also heard a few friendly or awestruck comments from the few children he'd seen up close in the past few days. Aiden had been close enough to a group of alien children during their impromptu dance party when Billy Kendrick left for the Isle of Answers, too, and his evident attention to detail in noticing Leisha's naked neck made Clark think he would have noticed if the children hadn't been wearing patches of their own. If this point needed any final confirmation, it arrived as soon as Aiden came into view of the group of alien children who were playing with water and a sand-like sediment next to a small but intricate ground-based maze which featured flowing water in place of a hedge. Hey, he called, waving his hand in the usual human way. Clark smiled widely. Remember, you don't have to speak. Tara silenced Clark with an elbow to the side. She mouthed, shh and gave him a stern look while Aiden, with permission, ran ahead. What? Clark asked. I want to hear what they're talking about, Tara replied. It'll be nice. Ah, he replied, pleased by the warm simplicity of the reason. We'll probably only be able to hear his side of it, Tara went on, mainly thinking out loud, unless the messenger kids don't know how to direct their thoughts only to the person they're talking to, and that works automatically when it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, so we wouldn't be able to pick up Aiden's thoughts either, whenever he's only talking to one of them. The couple continued forward, and were soon at the edge of the courtyard, which contained around ten children with four adult messengers scattered around the edges. The scene really was uncannily like one that could have been found at any small-town play park in any country on Earth, which shouldn't have surprised Clark and Tara, but for some reason still did. Seeing the messengers doing normal things and getting on with their daily lives wasn't something they were used to, and it was in times like these that the social similarities between the species really shone through. The big differences were societal rather than social, with New Kerguelen having far more basic institutions with no formalized civic or political structures to speak of. How different things might have been if the architects hadn't shown up and upended the messenger's entire way of life and sense of identity for thousands of years was something they could only guess. The only hope of answers to a question like that came from Billy Kendrick's second expedition to an island where a distinct and seemingly highly advanced civilization of messengers had thrived prior to the architect's arrival. The present arrival of three humans at a courtyard, where none normally ventured, meanwhile, was enthusiastically greeted by everyone there. Little Aiden reached the group of alien children in no time, thanks to their joint decision to run as fast as their little feet would carry them to meet him halfway. The adults, too, were all either on their way to Clark and Tara, or were waving from where they stood. My name is Aiden, the boy excitedly announced. Nal si bunak, one of the tiny aliens replied, its sing-song voice higher-pitched and even more melodic than the grown-up equivalents the humans were used to hearing. Nal si vaku, another chimed in. Nal si fila, added a third. Clark leaned in close to Terra and whispered, I think Nal si means my name is. Yeah, she replied in mock amazement. Wow. And to think Alessandro recruited Piper instead of you to help program the vocal translator. He laughed at her jibe. He thought about it, but him and Melly couldn't keep up with how fast my brain works, you know, just like you can't. Up ahead, Aiden seemed to have abandoned remembering ten alien names at once and was instead talking again. I'm going to have a little brother tomorrow, he stated, enthusiasm and pride dripping from his words. Yeah, of course you can see him, 
the boy went on, answering a question Clark and Tara hadn't heard. I'll bring him here to play as soon as he's allowed. Once again, the last thing either of his parents wanted to do was interject with a dose of realism that they expected and certainly hoped to be back on the other side of the gate before too long. As they were watching Aiden happily make friends with the natives, two adult messengers approached from side on. Tara, the female of the pair said, both aloud and in a deliberately sent telepathic thought, while she looked so happy and overawed that she could have started crying at any moment. Context strongly suggested that she was one or more of the children's mothers, and that the male at her side was her husband in all but name, since the messengers without exception paired off for life, but didn't have any formal institutions of marriage. Hey, Tara replied. The speechless alien wiped one of her eyes, confirming Tara's early suspicion that tears might have been on the way. I'm so glad you came back. You have done so much for us, and you were so missed. Aw, oh, thanks, Tara said, genuinely moved by the touching words. In her peripheral vision, she saw the children moving quickly towards something, so naturally turned around to make sure Aiden wasn't doing anything he shouldn't have been, or getting too far away. The other children were simply taking him to the rudimentary maze, it turned out, and they stood back in very visible amazement as he navigated it with effortless balance. It was the kind of setup that might have been found in the toddler section of a play area on Earth, but most of these messengers were at least as tall as Aiden, which hinted they were at least as old, too, given that the tallest of the species only tended to reach around five feet, and all were impressed by what struck them as a skillful feat. That was easy, the boy said, sounding less boastful than similarly surprised by their enthusiastic reactions to him reaching the end in such a short time. He is very special, the messenger next to Tara then said. A very special child from very special parents, she added, repeating her slightly awkward smile as she addressed Clark for the first time. It was an odd kind of smile, very genuine, but delivered in an unpracticed way that suggested she didn't spend much time with humans and didn't get many in-person examples to imitate. And we are truly very blessed that you made it here in time. In time for what? Clark smiled back wondering if there was some special event coming up in the courtyard that they hadn't known about. At this, the messenger and her partner looked at each other in surprise. The male then spoke for the first time, stating something in a warm manner that was meant to sound nice, but came across as more than a little unsettling. To birth a child who will rule over us for years to come, he said. This truly is a wonderful gift. G-56, Departure Point, Space Station Il Cercatore After hanging in the air for several days, the ultimate question of who would enter the vault and when was settled within the space of a few minutes. Given the differences Alessandro Bonucci and his colleagues consistently detected between the brain activity that Piper and anyone else had experienced when exposed to pulse or any general uplift-related stimuli, it really was beyond argument that she was the most suited of the group to enter. Suited was an operative word on this occasion, however, with Alessandro's own insistent suggestion that anyone who entered the vault should wear a full exploration suit, gaining firm support from Emma and no real opposition from anyone. Piper saw a suit as unnecessary and would ordinarily have pointed out that the observable data was clear on that. Today, however, understanding that Emma would be worried about her, she saw no harm in wearing it for her sake. Dan, meanwhile, insisted that Emma had taken enough risk in descending to the vault's door with Piper prior to the final pulse, and that it was his turn now. He didn't even try to deny that a huge part of him, alien obsessed since he was younger than Piper was now, actively wanted to explore a bona fide alien vault, at least now that the data was so clear about its safety. He shared Piper's unspoken view on the suits doing no harm and smiled as he put his on ahead of the flight to Earth. Just remember, Emma said as they were getting ready to leave, if putting one of your hands on the handprint does open a hidden door, 
Under no circumstances do you go in that door before the drones have checked it out, okay? Of course not, Dan said. Piper? Emma prompted. Yeah, I mean, no, the girl replied. We won't. We'll just wait in the cabin until the data comes in. That makes more sense than coming all the way back up here right away. From the moment William Godfrey announced the group's need to expedite their actions in the face of Nick Mason's unpredictable escalations and troublemaking, things had moved extremely fast. The biggest holdup proved to be sourcing an exploration suit that was a good fit for Piper's very slender frame. It took a call to the equipment room at the other side of the station to find one, and then involved a relatively short but still frustrating wait for it to get there. Once it was, Dan and Piper had both managed to get into their suits without help and now stood side by side while very much striking the pose of an interplanetary father-daughter team. The suits' helmets would click in place without assistance from anyone else, too, and Alessandro ran both of them through the process of ensuring the helmets were firmly closed. With undying faith in his own data, Alessandro was even more confident in the safety of the vault for human explorers than Dan or Piper. But in the billion-to-one shot that something undetected might make it dangerous, he would never have forgiven himself if an oversight on teaching proper helmet etiquette for all of two minutes had led to an eminently avoidable tragedy. The individual least enthused about Piper's decision to return to the vault and this time to enter it was the perhaps predictably conservative Melly. Having less innate belief in the value of exploration and first-hand information gathering more broadly as forces for progress and good, Melly saw entering something created by the architects in an uncertain attempt to open an inner door, which no one could even guess what lay behind, as a risky decision to make in the spirit of scientific discovery. While the vocal translator enabled Melly to know what the humans were saying, and vice versa, there was often a cultural understanding barrier as well as strictly linguistic language barrier to contend with. Piper tried and tried and tried again to explain that the vault might lead to some means of reactivating the gate and that attempting to open an unseen door was thus a worthwhile endeavor when considered as part of a balanced risk analysis. All Melly wanted was to keep Piper safe and to have Tara and her family back, but she simply couldn't see the reason to think anything related to the gate could be behind the vault's locked door in the way her human friends seemed to be taking as a given. Melly wished Piper luck and asked Dan to be extra careful with her, which she took in the spirit it was intended. After that was all done and various goodbyes and good lucks were exchanged, the station's three remaining McCarthys made their way across its remarkable star tunnel walkway before entering a craft that was by now very familiar but would never get old. Emma was the only one of the trio not suited up, but even she was carrying one in a heavy-duty backpack just in case it became necessary for her to enter the vault once she reached Earth. Just like the presence of suits on Dan and Piper's persons, this was what Emma considered a low-cost way to mitigate risk and maintain a better-safe-than-sorry approach that was more sensible now than ever when they were facing so many unknowns. We'll be back soon. Piper promised Timo, who had made a walk that felt much longer to his deteriorating bones than it would have until recently. Hopefully, bearing gifts, the Italian smiled. Godspeed, my friends. Godspeed. G-55, Infirmary, New Birchwood, New Kergalen. Clark sat in the hospital waiting room for several hours with no one but Leisha for company. Aiden was there, as he had been all along to make sure he didn't miss seeing his soon-to-arrive baby brother as soon as he possibly could, but his overdue sleep didn't look like ending any time soon. Tara was safe and well, the doctors insisted during the periodic updates, but a fully natural birth had been deemed unwise, not due to any particular reason for thinking anything might go wrong, but rather a sensible consideration that the staff's lack of emergency childbirth specialists may have been struggling if it did. This ran counter to the spirit of some of the earlier reassurances Tara had been given about New Kergalen having a state-of-the-art medical facility, and one that was fully prepared for an eventuality like this, despite great care always being taken to ensure no one fell pregnant while resident on the planet. 
Safety came first, second, and third, however, and she accepted the suggestion without any argument. Leisha distracted Clark's mind as best he could, although in truth, Clark wasn't all that worried about the birth itself. What troubled him was the previous day's discovery that the pulses on Earth had caused some kind of cellular changes within Terra, focused in the area of her neck where Leisha himself had inserted an uplift cable and where she had recently felt the effects of those pulses. Results from the follow-up tests and scans taken right before she went into the makeshift delivery ward were now available and appeared to be positive, or at least not frighteningly negative, since the spread of the ill-defined anomaly in her neck was continuing to slow. Clark would much have preferred to hear that it wasn't continuing at all, but slowing was better news than staying steady, and clearly much better news than accelerating. For his part, Leisha was surprised to hear all of this. The human doctors didn't normally report to him, but a lack of familiarity with the standard expectations of confidentiality and patient privacy left him wondering why something so potentially important hadn't been shared immediately. He was more surprised than concerned, however, and told Clark that it was probably nothing and that future scans would put his mind at full ease. Clark also mentioned the bizarre comment a well-meaning messenger had said the previous afternoon when expressing his gratitude that Terra had come to New Kergolen in time to provide the gift of a child who would rule the planet for years to come. This time, Leisha was considerably less surprised than Clark. Look at it from their perspective, the alien leader said. Terra came here with Dan and dealt with the squadron when things were heating up for a war no one wanted. They were the first humans anyone here ever saw. And then, when the Sanctuary Skygate was setting off another violent conflict, who came here and risked their lives to fly through it? Terra and Dan. Clark was listening, if not quite following. And then there's you, Leisha went on. Everyone here knows our history, all about the shooter in Buenos Aires when you threw yourself in front of the bullet. Everyone knows how highly I think of you. Your physical stature certainly lived up to the billing, too, in case you missed their faces when you arrived. But on top of all that, Clark, you're also Dan's brother. Clark couldn't help but chuckle. I get that last part a lot. But really, Leisha said through a smile of his own, individually you are both held in extremely high regard. Terra is almost neck and neck with Dan, and you are much closer to them than anyone else is. So when you show up here together, the Savior and the Protector arriving at a time of great uncertainty, and a time when Terra is days away from giving birth. Before Clark could reply, the creaking of a door took both of their attention. They looked down the corridor and saw the door to Terra's room open. Dr. Cardulo stepped out and looked at them. Only once before had Clark experienced a moment like this, standing in a hospital and waiting for the first crack of an expression to tell him whether the news was good or bad. On the last occasion, well in the past but suddenly feeling too familiar for comfort, the news hadn't been good. Today, hoping even harder than he had back then, he stared and stared while time seemed to stand still. At last, Dr. Cardulo's ever-professional poker face gave way to a hint of how things had gone. Clark's expression took no such time to react, and his arm barely took a moment longer to reach over and shake Aiden awake. A.D., he called. Wake up! The boy sat up and stretched, taking a moment to realize where he was as his eyes blinked away the sleep. Is he here? Dr. Cardulo smiled from along the hallway. There's someone who'd like to meet you, Aiden he said, and the boy was halfway there before he even finished the sentence. Clark brought his hands to his face in a mixture of joy, relief, and more than a little gratitude for all the messengers and human residents who had made his family feel welcome since their unexpected arrival, and particularly for the proactive medical team who had taken the necessary precautions while expediting the labor process to ensure that this welcome outcome had come to pass. I'll leave you to it, Leisha said, but not before holding out a hand for Clark to shake. Clark accepted the handshake, but followed through into a full hug, and then set Leisha straight. You're not leaving anyone, he said. Come on, buddy. She'll love to see you. 
The alien looked touched by this invitation. Thank you. I remember how proud Tara was to show me pictures of Piper when she first became an aunt. I knew from then that she would make an excellent mother. It will be my honor to meet the child. G-54, Fraser Stedding, Thurso, Scotland Aware of the McCarthy's imminent landing and of Dan and Piper's planned descent into the vault, the only three men anywhere near the devastated town of Thurso were ready and waiting when the alien spacecraft they were starting to get used to landed and uncloaked itself on the other side of what used to be the Pulse's Eye of the Storm safe zone. You and the catch me going down there, I'll tell you that. Stevie, the drill operator, muttered under his breath before the new arrivals stepped out onto the ramp. Braver than me. I'm just glad someone is going, Gio Nunez replied. The archaeologist didn't feel affronted in any way that he hadn't been chosen, but he was nevertheless disappointed. It did make perfect sense for Piper to go, though, given all that was known about her unique responses to anything related to the uplift powers or the thankfully concluded pulses. Gio also understood why his presence was desired in the cabin, where his Scottish hosts were infinitely more adept at controlling most of the equipment, but where only he could competently pilot the many drones situated within the vault, or interpret the data, the vast array of constantly refreshing data they provided. Before long, Piper was first to step out from the human-piloted craft. She smiled as soon as she saw the men, especially the two Scotsmen she had come to know and like during her brief visits to conduct ground-based tests during some of the early pulses. She didn't know Geo so well, but knew he had played a big part alongside Carrick and Serena in getting hold of the artifact she used to open the vault's door in the first place, so he had certainly earned a warm greeting too. So how do you doing, pal? Stevie asked the girl with a warm smile. You didn't have half us worried that day when the pulse knocked you out. Are you back to yourself? Yeah, Piper said, relying on context to fill in some of the blanks left by the man's unusual accent and syntax. And Geo, Timo said you'll be able to get a live video feed in the cabin from my helmet. Is that right? They've already sent the instructions, yes, he confirmed. Just give me a minute and I'll make sure it's working. I think any connection once you get down there might weaken as you move further from the main door, though, based on what we've seen with the drones. Can you set up an array? She asked. You know, pass the feed to one of the drones and then they pass it one by one, then the drone nearest the door sends it up to you? Aye, Davy mused. Like if you've got a bunch of guys moving bricks and you line up and keep passing them along. That makes sense, doesn't it, Gio? Gio tilted his head slightly in thought. It actually does, he decided. All the drones and the suits are from the station, so they will be able to talk to each other, and I'll be able to set them all up remotely if I have to. Good thinking, Piper. Thanks, she replied. Emma and Dan, slower to disembark, reached the guys a few moments later. Are you staying with us? Stevie asked the suitless Emma. Timo wants me in charge of the drill, she replied. Stevie's brow furrowed in confusion, but when he turned to Davy and saw a laughing face, he knew he'd fallen for another joke. Don't up like a kipper, Davy chuckled at his colleague's expense. Ah, oh, Stevie, you're some lad. I'm going down with Piper this time, Dan said, speaking for the first time, and we want to do it as soon as we can. He appreciated the need for levity and welcomed it as a means of keeping spirits up and stress at bay, but there was a time for all things, and he felt like the all-consuming urgency felt on the station after everything that went down on Focus 2020 shouldn't be derailed any longer than it already had been. You've got us, boss, Stevie said. I'll get you in the lift whenever you're ready, and then it's just a couple of minutes to get down. With his suit's helmets in his hands, Dan kissed Emma goodbye before putting it on. He then clicked it in place like Alessandro had shown him, and quite understandably, felt more like a spaceman than he had at any point in his life. Even during his trips to New Kerguelen and Sanctuary, he'd never worn a real suit like this, more streamlined than the suits of space exploration's golden age, but otherwise classic and utterly fetching in its design. Piper, less physically affectionate, moved towards Emma for a hug and the expected kiss on the forehead. 
Don't worry about us, she said. This is what we're supposed to do. And thanks for letting me. Don't make me regret it, Emma replied in a playful tone. But really, you know the plan. Open the door and come back out, whatever you see, until Geo can map the next room. Perfectly aware of what they had to do, Piper and Dan then climbed onto the lift platform and waited for Stevie to gently lower them to the bottom of the shaft he had carefully drilled with Davy around a week earlier. Dan didn't normally feel claustrophobic, but there was something unsettling about being surrounded on all sides by high walls of earth rather than concrete or anything else man-made. In an unexpected development, he reached the bottom looking forward to entering the expansive vault as much to escape the shaft than to see what was in there. The door Piper had successfully opened just in time with a little help from the artifact remained ajar. She and Dan had repeatedly been told how crucial it was that this stayed the case to ensure not only that signals could escape the otherwise impenetrable vault, but more importantly, to ensure that they would be able to get out. A rudimentary but highly effective series of door stops and redundant backups, all put in place by the Scottish drillers, ensured that there could be no accidents trapping the first two human entrants to the vault. From the threshold, Dan and Piper stared into a vault that had a much bluer hue in real life than on the video monitors in the cabin. It looked bigger in person, too, with a considerable walking distance between them and the Far Edge's mysterious floor-based imprints of human and architect handprints they believed to be two distinct opening mechanisms for a hidden door. Something about the vault felt cold and uninviting to Piper all of a sudden, even while the controlled environment of her suit maintained a constant body temperature. What do you think is going to be in there? She asked Dan a few seconds later. Her words reached him via the speakers within his helmet. He gulped, suddenly realizing how real this had just gotten. Something that's been hidden away for thousands of years. For both of their benefit, Piper reached out and took hold of Dan's gloved hand with her own. She looked up at him and smiled. Don't worry, Dad. Whatever it is, I've got a major feeling it's been waiting for me to find it. Together, they stepped into the vault. Part 4. Breakout Delay always breeds danger. Miguel de Cervantes G-53 Entry Chamber, Subterranean Vault, Scotland the only way Piper or Dan could have described the vault to someone who had no idea what it looked like was with two simple words, metal, cave. Each step they took into the vast expanse felt less unnerving than the last, but the level of incline on the downwards sloping ramp that led in from the door was considerably greater than they expected and demanded they paid some attention to their footwork. Fortunately, their suit's boots weren't at all clunky, even with the hard clips that made the whole get-up airtight so it could function as a controlled environment. The readings in the HUD of Piper's helmet reaffirmed that the atmospheric conditions were fine, but she still saw no reason to take the suit off and didn't want to unnecessarily worry Emma as she doubtlessly watched on from the cabin. For Piper, who lacked Dan's experience in a secret government hangar and on various expansive areas of New Kerguelen, the sheer, chasmic emptiness of the vault was a lot to contend with. The light-emitting boundary drones, which had stuck themselves to the walls at regular intervals, were literally all she could see in any direction, and as the minutes passed, she grew surer and surer that human eyes weren't made for that level of monotony. It took all of seven fairly brisk minutes of walking for Dan and Piper to reach the far side of the vault, and the extremely welcome sight of two handprints imprinted in the floor. One was clearly human, while the other equally clearly fit the hand of the architect who touched down in New York and connected itself to Dan. He would never forget that hand, so truly and unnervingly alien, while countless viewings of the TV recordings was enough for Piper to be equally sure. Trying to guess why an architect and human handprint were together at all made Piper's head spin, but their placement gave her a fairly confident impression that the imprints were effectively locks and that hands which would fit within them would effectively function as keys. It made no degree of sense from any angle for both hands to be needed, she figured, 
since the ancient writings found on New Kerguelen suggested that the architects had left an artifact key for the outer door with the intention that the natives would use it to gain entry. Assuming the vaults on each planet were broadly similar in nature, which was the only sensible assumption she could make, Piper thus considered it implausible that the architects would grant the natives access to an empty entry chamber they couldn't pass. Do you want to go for it? Dan asked. Piper responded by lowering to her knees. One small Piper's palm, she said, drawing some tension-breaking laughter from Dan, just before she outstretched her fingers and got ready to place her right hand in the groove. Okay, here I go for real. Dan held his breath while Piper's hand remained in the imprint. This lasted for the ten or so seconds it took her to accept defeat in this first attempt to deactivate the lock. Your turn, she said. Dan, always game, got down onto his knees like she had and placed his hand in the groove. But just like for Piper, nothing happened. Hmm, Piper mused. I think it might be the gloves, Dan said. If it's activated by touch rather than just pressure, it might not work through the gloves, just like a phone screen wouldn't. This had been exactly what Piper was thinking. She'd hesitated to say it not because she was worried about touching the floor with her bare hand, but instead because she felt Dan might have reacted negatively if she suggested it. Protective instincts were weird in that way, as she'd recently come to see herself as Aiden had gotten older and begun to develop more of a distinct personality. I don't have to say it has to be me, do I? She asked. Dan inhaled deeply. He looked at Piper without committing to an answer. It's like the earplugs all over again, the girl went on. I'm less susceptible to the interference and stuff like that, but you can see from the suits there's nothing being picked up. I'm going to do it now. I'm going to take my glove off. Okay, Dan said, gulping away his doubt. I'll be ready to put it back on if you need me to. Piper smiled. Thanks, Dad. It's going to be totally fine. Seconds later, as the glove clicked out of its high-tech fasteners and the seal of Piper's controlled environment was broken, she instantly confirmed to Dan that she could still breathe perfectly and couldn't hear any new sounds or anything like that. Heartened by this, and more than a little relieved, Dan watched like a hawk for signs of discomfort as Piper prepared to place her hand in the imprint. But as soon as her bare skin made contact with the groove on the floor, an unmissable clicking sound took Dan's eyes away from the floor and to the back wall. As he looked, a previously invisible door parted horizontally in a way that took him back to his first time in an alien spacecraft. You did it, he called, turning back to Piper with excitement on his face as well as in his voice. Both faded in an instant, however, when he saw that instead of appreciating the fruit of her labor, Piper was still staring at the floor while her right hand, still connected to the ground, shook wildly like a cheap jackhammer. He ran over to help her, but when he tried to pull her right hand from the floor, she pushed him away with her left. It's happening, she said. I see it again. The tower. He's there. Dad! Dan stood up and stood back, understanding why Piper had pushed him away, to maintain her connection to whoever was looking at the distant water tower and was somehow linked to her mind in this frighteningly mysterious way. As the shaking got worse, Dan stepped forward again and decided that enough was enough. Piper beat him to it, though, pulling her hand away from the floor and rolling onto her side in something not a million miles away from a fetal position. Are you okay, darling? Dan asked. She nodded right away. Just, it's tiring. It doesn't hurt, it just, it's a lot. Don't worry, it's over, he assured her. And Piper, look, you opened the door. Belatedly, the girl turned and saw the enticing sight of a passageway into the deepest depths of the vault, where the hidden wonder was bound to be waiting. We need to go back first so Geo can map it, Dan went on. But if there's another reason for anyone to come back down and you want it to be us, I'll vouch for you. Thanks, Piper said, pushing herself slowly to her knees and then her feet. She tried walking and found it surprisingly easy, with her brief mental haze also clearing quickly. But as soon as we get back, I need to talk to the guys on the station. Dad, someone else definitely has the power. 
I felt it so much more clearly than last time. Do you know where? Dan asked. It's Wyoming, the girl nodded, utter certainty in the words. It's the prison. G-52, Infirmary, New Birchwood, New Kerguelen. Tired and heavily medicated, but joyful and endlessly relieved, Tara welcomed Clark into her hospital room with the sweetest smile he'd ever seen. A beautiful, healthy baby boy, Dr. Cardulo said, glancing to Clark with a warm smile of his own while hovering over the wide-eyed Aiden. Clark leaned in to gently embrace Tara and tell her how well she'd done, which set her off into slow sobs of the greatest relief she had ever felt. After a difficult few weeks and an almost impossibly challenging few days, the one thing that absolutely had to go to plan, now had. The original plan of giving birth on Earth, like every other human mother in history, had changed along the way, needless to say, but Tara felt the greatest joy of her life that the trip across the gate to keep herself and the baby safe from the effects of the final pulse had not been in vain. Much of her attention, and all of her hope, would now turn to making a return journey to reunite with Emma and everyone else, bringing the baby to meet them, despite the apparent belief of some on New Kerguelen that fate had brought him there to lead them well into the future. That idea would die a death as soon as it reared its head again, and although it might have been the drugs talking and whipping up hypothetical scenarios that would never come to pass, Tara found herself thinking that if anyone tried to stand in her way of a quick return as soon as the gate was operational again, they would be dying a death of their own. Leisha sensed these unwelcome thoughts and sent Tara a quick one in return. I promise that anyone who causes you a problem will have me to deal with, he silently assured her. And a promise I make is a promise I keep. This interjection had the desired effect of getting the thought out of Tara's mind, and she pushed it further away with an announcement for Leisha and Aiden's benefit. His name is Liam, she said softly and proudly. Aiden clearly liked this, while Leisha happily noticed that it sounded a little bit like his own. What happened to Clark Jr.? Her husband asked in mock disappointment, naturally already well aware of the naming decision having played an equal role in the selection. If you want a Clark Jr., you can get a new dog, Tara retorted. At this, Aiden looked up from the baby for the first time since laying eyes on him. We're getting a new dog, too? Uh, <laughs> maybe one day, kiddo, Clark laughed. Tara was smiling, too taking in the moment and being grateful for all she had, rather than rueful of who and what she didn't. We can look for dogs when we get home, she said, if you promise to walk it every day like you sometimes walked Prince, but there can't be any sometimes anymore, okay? Aiden nodded so keenly and quickly that the others were worried his head might fall off. So when do we go home? he asked stating the million-dollar question with the straightforwardness that only a child could ever muster. The answer came immediately and telepathically from Leisha. As soon as possible, and trust me, little one, I'm working on that. G-51, Fraser Steading, Thurso, Scotland when Dan and Piper emerged from the vault and stepped into the lift that would return them to the surface, Emma was already waiting for them. If the lift had been at the top, she would have already gone down and sprinted inside as soon as Piper started shaking upon placing her hand in the imprinted lock that opened a door to a new and mysterious chamber. It hadn't been, though, and by the time Stevie had run outside to start moving the lift, he got word from Davy and Geo that Piper had moved away from the handprint and seemed to be fine. Emma then had an impatient wait for her husband and daughter to return, but the relief that Piper was okay left less room for anger than would normally have been the case, following on from a risk like the one she had taken. What was that? Emma asked when they came into sight, still angry enough for this to be the first thing she said. Piper removed her helmet as soon as she was outside the vault and smiled up at Emma. We're in, she said. 
Emma couldn't stay angry for long. When they reached the surface, Piper immediately began to describe the clarity of insight she had gained regarding the location of the seemingly uplifted individual whose eyes she had once again seen through for a brief period. The news that the pre-identified prison in Wyoming was categorically the site they were looking for was very welcome, and Emma wasted no time in asking Geo to get Godfrey and the rest of the station-based team on the line. Geo gladly did this, taking a break from his focused work of sending boundary drones and his rover into the vault's newly accessible second chamber. Ah, hello, Alessandro said, answering the video with a hopeful expression. Did we get anywhere? Piper took it upon herself to fill him in, on both her successful opening of the door and her breakthrough insight about the distant and powerful person who was of so much interest to the group, not only because of his power, but because of some unsettling links to Nick Mason. Alessandro's eyes widened not once, but twice as the double scoop of news arrived, and from there he called all of the others to come and listen. Once they were there, Piper and Dan fielded countless questions about the vault, and Piper fielded countless more about her vision. Since Geo was currently in the process of scanning the second chamber, Piper felt like the vault issue was being handled for now, and the focus should be on the source of her vision. I saw a van with an SCF logo, she said, and I know the prison on our shortlist is called Sunforth Correctional Facility, but that's not all. I paid attention to all the things I wish I had last time, and I saw the trees and the marking on the base of the water tower. It's definitely the Highville Tower. H for Highville, and with those markings. This fits perfectly with everything we thought, Chip Petrovich chimed in. But this guy with the powers, this researcher, or whatever the hell we're dealing with, do you think he just sits staring out the window all day? I really don't know. Piper admitted. There's definitely someone there, though. It's not just a view. It's a view through someone's eyes. There were blinks, and I could sense a kind of... impatience this time. They weren't scared, like when the pulse was hitting, which makes sense, and I don't think it was anger. Dan turned away from the screen and looked at Piper. Are you sure it wasn't anger? He asked, hearing all of this part for the first time. I didn't say I was sure, she stated seeing less reason for concern in these words than some of the others quite visibly were. But guys, Chip, Carrick, Serena, I'm going to sketch a drawing as close as I can to the image of my mind, because right now it's crystal clear. I made sure to focus on the peripherals, and I know the field of vision I could see, which might even let us figure out which window the view was from if we can get detailed ground view images from the site to cross-reference. I know the relative angles of some of the biggest trees in the distance. It was dark, obviously but there are a lot of floodlights there. This is all just excellent, William Godfrey said. Thank you, Piper. She smiled. And if we need anything else, I could go back down and connect again. No, I really don't think we want to risk them finding out we're onto them, Godfrey replied. We don't know if this connection is two-way in any sense, but you've just given us a great deal to go on, and if you can send up your sketch soon, we'll have even more. It would be risky to push for further information now, when a third connection might spook the other party. I'm reminded of the fable of the dog and his reflection, when he drops his bone in a bid to grab another from the dog staring up at him, only to lose both as his own falls into the water. We don't want to push it, not when we finally have a next step. What is the next step on that? Emma interjected. I won't do anything until you're back on the station, the ICA chairman somewhat evasively promised. I'll plan, but I won't act. What's the next step down there? Emma glanced at Geo's monitor to see how the rapid scan of the new chamber was coming along. Depending on what the drones find, we should be going back into the vault, she said. We? Dan asked. Emma raised her eyebrows and chuckled. After last time, you really think I'm letting the two of you go in there alone again? G-50, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Turcatore This is our place, Chip Petrovich said, 
pointing to a satellite image of Sunford Correctional Facility with a red circle superimposed on a small building situated around 200 meters from the main complex. The others crowded around his screen. I already thought it was, he continued, because I've got delivery logs from hauliers that brought stuff here from a biotech lab operating under the same umbrella as the one in Honduras where they modified the toxin they used on Timo. I've got social media GPS walking data from a dumbass recycling consultant who splits his time between a lab and this prison, whose social media not only shows me where he's been, but also tells me he went to high school with Mason and graduated with a degree in neurology. Hmm, Godfrey mused. It's all good, and it paints a picture. I know we don't need that information now, but it's all part of why I thought this was a candidate location, Chip went on. But you've got Carrick and Serena to thank for finding the tower that led me here in the first place. Godfrey turned to the young couple and doffed his imaginary cap. His joviality lasted all of two seconds, however, before giving way to a somber expression and a statement to suit. But now that we know where this individual is, we have a moral responsibility to deal with them. Mason and previous generations of anti-alien politicians always said how much they feared the powers in wrong hands. And if these aren't the wrong hands, I don't know what are. No one disagreed. So what are you suggesting? Alessandro asked. Godfrey inhaled slowly. Look, we know what these powers can do. Piper has detected the holder, and regardless of how they came to possess the powers, if they really have somehow retained them after the pulses, then we could be facing someone with not only telekinesis and telepathy at their disposal, but also anything else Mason's cohorts may have been researching that we don't even know about. We made a translator. They really might have made a mind-reading thought transcriber. They really might have weaponized the powers in a more literal and physical sense. There's just no telling what they've been doing, and what range of nefarious benefits Mason's monopoly on access to this uplifted individual could have given him. No one said anything. Godfrey still hadn't stated what he was suggesting as their course of action, but he was clearly getting to it. The level of danger to the world this could ultimately pose is hard to contemplate, the ICA chairman said. At the summit in Lanzarote, I likened Logan and Mason leading their countries to chimps on horseback. But this is a chimp with a machine gun, and no one walks away from that unless you get there before he sees you coming. Get there? Alessandro asked. Godfrey nodded. I intend to authorize a ground team of ICA operatives to secure the target as soon as possible. They can come in from above and... Enough! Timo Fiori interjected. You're talking about an airdrop of armed ICA security on U.S. soil. Chairman Godfrey, can you hear yourself? Godfrey didn't flinch. Needs must. But he would take this as encroachment of their sovereignty, by the ICA, by you, by me. He knows we're all in this together. Who knows what he would do? Well, what is it you think he actually could do in retaliation? Godfrey pressed. Timo, if I was seen to be clearly acting with Logan and we were airdropping ground forces to swarm a public building, that would be something else, and he would immediately hit Britain with sanctions and probably worse. But what is he going to do to me? Firstly, how can he do anything significant without raising questions about why this private prison is so important to him? And secondly, where would he hit? My administrative building in Buenos Aires, staffed by hundreds of workers of almost two hundred nations, including his own. Could he hit us here? Chip asked with a question of his own. He sounded more curious than concerned. No, Alessandro instantly replied. He knew more about the station's equipment, defensive or otherwise, than anyone with the possible exception of Timo, who was sitting silently as this remarkable and highly consequential conversation played out. Godfrey appreciated that Alessandro openly gave this answer despite its running counter to the scientist's broader concerns about the risks of attempt to reach and detain a seemingly uplifted individual they knew almost nothing about. There's another point there, Godfrey said. 
Even if the forces under Mason's command physically could hit us, believe me, they wouldn't. The machinery of the state despises him, and so do his generals. Things aren't how they used to be even fifteen years ago. These contexts and upheavals we've lived through have changed everything. An order to attack a civilian target, let alone a target where we and the McCarthys are all known to be staying. I would bet my life, and all yours, that such an order is one that wouldn't be followed. Timo scratched his forehead and looked up at the ceiling. No one else was saying anything, with Chip broadly on Godfrey's side, and Carrick and Serena overawed by the scene they found themselves in. Eventually, Timo looked to Godfrey once more. You know I'm not the one you really have to convince, anyway. Emma will see sense, Godfrey confidently asserted. We're all on the same side here, Timo, and I appreciate all the assistance you've provided, but we face a fork in the road here, and we must not allow ourselves to be blindly pulled down the path of least resistance. Expedience and ease are rarely contemporaneous. Timo held Godfrey's eyes. I just don't think this is your best idea. I think anger, an anger I share, is making you rash. Call me rash, but I want this person out of there, and I want to know what's been going on in there, Godfrey insisted. I want a tight and decisive ground operation with my top ICA special forces, and I want it as soon as possible. Piper is 100% sure where this person is, down to the very window they were looking through, and she is equally certain they are, as she put it, different like her. Combined with Chip's work nailing these triangular connections between Mason, this prison, and the biotech firm who modified the toxin, this situation isn't just encouraging us to act fast, it's imploring us. Just so I'm clear on this... Chip said over a slow exhalation. You're saying it's imploring us to do a prison break? Godfrey raised his eyebrows and tilted his head. Call it what you want, Chip, but it has to happen. They're using the natural shield of a prison's security to keep this research site and research subject under wraps. We'll use the advantages at our disposal to balance the scales as much as we can, Things like a cloaked approach in the craft, and ideally a targeted kinetic strike on the building's structure. Alessandro, who would I speak to about utilizing the craft's emergency anti-impact defense system for a ground-based assault? The Italian scientist looked every inch like the deer in headlights the metaphor was inspired by, simply stunned to be hearing these kinds of suggestions. Well... I suppose it would be the impact avoidance team, he eventually replied. I don't know how much control anyone could have over the extent and spread of the damage, because the bombardment shells are meant for space junk and small asteroids, not buildings. I suppose what I'm really asking is whether we can point them downwards, Godfrey stated in a very direct manner. The merits and risks aren't part of my consideration right now, I don't want us to concern ourselves with shoulds. I need to know what we can do. Alessandro gulped. We can aim them at the ground, he confirmed, leaving it there in accordance with the limited scope of Godfrey's question. So we're looking at a prison break where the guy doesn't want to come out? Chip, the group's jack of many trades, followed up. First time for everything, I guess. In Emma's absence, Chairman Godfrey then instinctively turned to Timo for a sign of support. After a few tense seconds, it came in the form of a delayed but decisive half-nod, not unlike the nod of someone bidding in a live auction. The stakes were far higher here than in any auction, needless to say, and no one was quite sure exactly what kind of action Godfrey was suggesting. We move before the American sunrise, Godfrey continued suddenly slapping a time frame of just a few short hours. There's no telling what that Cretan might do next, and we don't know if the holder of the powers will have felt Piper's connection. If they did, I'd wager Mason knows by now. Gentlemen, the time for overthinking is through. Today, we act. G-49, Fraser Stedding, Thurso, Scotland.
With a much smaller area to cover than inside the vault's main chamber, it didn't take long for Gio Nunez and his army of drones to scan and illuminate the newly accessed chamber. The new chamber was, in fact, very small in comparison, no larger than the McCarthy's home, whereas by way of comparison, the main chamber was several times larger than the entirety of Clark's ranch. It didn't take many lights to fully illuminate the new area, and the sensors built into Geo's drone ensured no more were used than necessary. More importantly, those sensors confirmed what the McCarthys already knew, thanks to Piper's moments down there without her glove sealing her suit. The environmental and atmospheric conditions within the second chamber were no different from those in the first and posed no obvious danger to human skin or lungs. The chamber was empty, but for a waist-high plinth, topped by a platform which contained something that demanded a much closer look than that provided by the feed from a ceiling-based drone that currently filled the screen in the cabin. The drones and rover were still able to communicate through the open doors, too, but Geo wasn't sure how much more distance they could handle. Davy and Stevie, the trustworthy drilling operators who had lived and breathed this search for answers as much as anyone else, looked on keenly. Dan and Emma did too, but no one wanted to see the detail of the platform more than Piper. Would it be another handprint, she wondered. Would the group soon be facing a straight decision on whether to continue diving ever deeper into the vault or staying cautious in the face of Godfrey's concern about a distant, uplifted individual becoming aware of Piper's intrusions? Another handprint would probably mean another risky connection, the girl figured, and for that reason she was glad when Geo's remote control rover used its telescopic legs to rise above the plinth and aim its high-definition camera at the platform. Emma was the first to groan when the details came into view, but certainly not the last. The platform contained a circular etching divided into four quarters, each of which was in turn etched with a different pictograph. One of the quarters, however, rose above the others by virtue of a stone artifact which fit perfectly within the outer etching. Although nothing was certain, it looked very much as though four stone fragments would combine to complete an image identical to the one etched directly on the platform. Three more artifacts to open the next door, Geo sighed. Not even one, three. It was difficult not to feel deflated by this, given that there was no guarantee the artifacts would still be all of the things that would probably be required to unlock the door. Intact, on land, not within the borders of an uncooperative government. But despite that, Piper most certainly didn't feel defeated. We can do it, she said. Carrick and Serena and Geo can do it. Godfrey can put out a global call to museums and collectors. Timo can offer a reward, whatever it takes. Guys, we can do this. Aye, Stevie chimed in, enlivened and boosted by the girl's spirit. Look what we did last time. We found the vault. They found the key. Yous blocked the pulse. This is nothing. A cheeky wee treasure hunt. Dan and Emma shared a glance. And remember the time we found the fourth plaque in the Feathers junkyard out at Salida? He said. Okay, so that one was fake and these fragments are real, but we still did it. I know, Emma sighed. It's just, finding something in here that can help us fix the gate is our best shot of getting Tara's family home. I wanted it to be quicker than this. This could be quick, Piper offered in an upbeat tone. It's like the key. For whatever reason, the architects gave that to one group of people. They maybe gave the artifacts to other groups, and if some civilization got a gift from aliens, it's probably going to be one they took care of. The round key for the main door was put in the wrong place with Viking stuff, and we still found it without knowing what it looked like besides the size and shape. This time we have an example from the first of the four already being in place. When we share photos of this, it could take hardly any time at all. And this room could have been empty, or it could have needed 50 artifact fragments. It could be a lot worse. In the face of such reason and maturity from her own daughter, Emma couldn't stay disillusioned for long. She clapped her hands together in decision. Geo, call the station. Within seconds, Alessandro was on the screen. Within a few more, the others were by his side and looking at the first images of the plinth. Three more? 
Godfrey sighed, reacting much like Emma had. But he then listened to Piper's more positive outlook, again like Emma, and quickly agreed that sharing this publicly would be a wise move. He turned to Carrick and Serena and asked them to get down to whatever kind of work they thought might help in locating the three stone fragments with their three distinct etchings. My hands are rather full at the moment, the ICA chairman said, but if you two can perhaps work with Geo to put together a press release, together with clear images and whatever notes you think will get these artifacts in our hands as quickly as possible, it can go out as an official communication from my office just as soon as it's ready. We have to prepare ourselves for the chance that one or more of the three fragments could be in the hands of someone who won't be inclined to cooperate when they find out what it could do, but we have to take that chance. Agreed, Emma said. You guys up there can start analyzing these etchings, and Geo, you too, but don't send out any press releases until we've been down there again. There might be something else useful we can find out. The weight of the fragment or what's on the underside of it. Anything like that. Lining up clues and looking for treasure. It's almost like the old days. Alessandro chimed in with a tired smile. Even under the weight of the moment and the stakes, he could recognize how much more preferable a treasure hunt was to the discussions he'd been having on the station about using a spacecraft to airdrop ICA operatives in Wyoming and blow a hole in the side of a prison. Emma leaned down to pick up the backpack that contained her exploration suit, glad she'd brought it from the station, then signed off. Almost, she said, but this time the treasure is a key to something else, and when the architects who built this vault went to so much trouble, you know it's got to be big. No one could disagree. As the call ended and they all got ready to sit down to their slice of the teamwork pie, even William Godfrey so busy with his own audacious plan, couldn't help but ponder just what the vault's hidden wonder might be. G-48, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Cercatore While most of the others on the space station concentrated on analyzing the intriguing pictographs found on the vault's eye-catching plinth, William Godfrey was dealing with altogether more explosive matters— Having persuaded Timo and Alessandro to save any further objections until Emma was back on the station, at which point it would all come out before a final decision was made, Godfrey was now benefiting from the Italian's assistance in getting everything set up so they would be ready to engage the plan if the group did ultimately and collectively decide to pull the trigger. Lining up some elite ICA security operatives was the easy part for Godfrey, with six already on standby in Buenos Aires. What proved much more difficult was recruiting an impact avoidance specialist, typically tasked with protecting the station from space junk and incoming asteroids, to sign up for a flight to Earth during which they would be asked to fire upon an occupied terrestrial building. Godfrey wanted to tell them it wasn't as crazy as it sounded, but he also didn't want to lie to their faces. Consider how bold this action is, he had opted to say and then imagine how grave my concerns have to be for me to ask you to do something like this. A young woman from Albania, introducing herself as Alira Dervishi, was first to step forward to meet the call. Godfrey's request for backup from one of Alira's three departmental colleagues led to a five-second silence that he decided was long enough to tell him that none of them were up to the task. Oh well, I would rather have one lion than four mice he acerbically commented as he thanked Alira for volunteering and led her to the control deck. Alessandro was pleased to see her, glad that if this plan was going ahead, one of the most important parts would be in her capable hands. She listened intently to the plan as it stood so far, her face whitening as the sheer boldness sunk in. You don't worry about what happens on the ground, Godfrey said. The men who go in know what they're signing up for, and your part will be done before theirs. Everything that happens is on me, Alira. I will share credit, but I will own all responsibility. With Alira on board, Godfrey turned to Chip. I wish Clark was here, he said. I mean, of course, I wish they were all here, but I wish we had him for this. I trust my men and their talents to the ends of this earth. 
but I would love to have someone on the ground who is personally invested in this. Someone who understands why we want the target alive and why it's so important to put a stop to this. A hired gun still fires, but you can't buy personal investment. When things get hairy, that can be what makes the difference. Are you talking about me? Chip asked. Godfrey's eyebrows furrowed in confusion. What do you mean? I'll do it, Chip went on. Just don't expect too much. Stunned, Godfrey said nothing. That bastard Mason poisoned Timo, Chip scowled. He knew about the prepulse warning and he told no one. He knew where Terra is and he used it to goad you, goad us, on live TV. Whoever is in that building at the prison, they have to be what makes him tick. They have to be how he knows so much, how his fortunes flipped on a dime and he rode the wave right to the top. You want this piece of shit alive, Godfrey, and for me, that's going to be the hardest part. Godfrey held out his hand and firmly shook that of Chip Petrovich. Few had ever considered Chip a man of honesty, but three generations of the McCarthy family had always considered him a man of honor. For William Godfrey, that was the best endorsement going, and more to the point, he could now see where it came from. His search for a personally invested member of the ground team had just uncovered a gem right under his nose, and with Alira on board to round out the crew, Godfrey could fully focus on finalizing the strategic operation. Alessandro's attention had already turned to Piper's sketch of the view from the window, enabling the exact location of the target to be isolated. From there, all that was left for Godfrey to do was to first persuade Emma to okay the audacious plan, and then to put the whole thing into action. As the time until her return from Thurso ticked down, he didn't know which hurdle would be highest. G-47, Guest Dormitory, Space Station, Il Cercatore While glad that the McCarthys were going back into the vault for a closer look at the plinth and the stone fragment that rested upon one of its quarters, Carrick Thomas and Serena couldn't help but wish it had been them. They were, however, more than happy to help by playing whatever part they could, and couldn't deny they were also glad of a task that took them away from the heated discussion around a potential raid on the prison where an apparently uplifted individual was hiding out with Nick Mason's knowledge and cooperation. Most of all, though, the couple were excited to decipher the pictographs in the images from the vault in an effort to bring the group one hopefully decisive step closer to unlocking the mystery of the vault and finding some means of reinstating the planet-linking gate its pulses had destroyed. In the photos, they saw that the only fragment in place contained a basic etching that consisted of two shapes, a horizontal line and a circle. The arrangement of these shapes was enough for Serena to have a breakthrough, however, when she suggested, after only a minute or so of thought, that the line represented the ground and the circle underneath it represented the four-part circular platform itself. I think it's telling us this one is under the ground, she said. See, the ground, and then a circle under it. This circle, maybe. Forget about why this makes sense for now, but I think these are clues about where they left the other three fragments, and this fragment was left there to explain that. Carrick began to smile so widely Serena could hear it as well as see it. You're so smart, he said. Thanks, but we don't know I'm right yet, she replied, not out of forced humility, but rather out of caution. No, you're right, he said. Look at this one with the three open triangles, like upside-down Vs. What are they called? Chevrons. Just three shapes, but one of them is taller than the others, and I think they're all mountains. Everest? she asked, unsure if that's what he was getting at. That's where my money is going, and this one with the squiggle. If we have one showing underground and one showing a mountain, I'm going to say river. Then it's maybe a coin toss between the Amazon and the Nile, depending if we're going for largest or longest. You know, assuming they're hinting at the biggest example, like with Everest. I know we're making jumps here, but it's not like we're ruling anything out. This is just potential commentary for the press release, if we say that's what we think it means. Serena fully agreed that there was no harm in making and sharing educated guesses. But what about this last one? She asked, hovering her finger over the fourth and final fragment. 
Neither would have known quite how to describe its single etched shape, which was more irregular and more particular than any of the others. It's almost like a buffalo or something, Carrick thought out loud. But if you turn it sideways, it kind of looks like the shape of Scotland. Not exactly, and it's hard to tell when it's so rudimentary compared to a map. But if I squint, I can kind of see it. See, Edinburgh would be there. Thurso, way up here. Hmm, I don't know. Would you have made that link if the vault wasn't in Scotland? Carrick shook his head. But the vault is in Scotland. But the fragment that's in place already covers Scotland, Serena countered. If we have Asia for Everest, then either Africa or South America for the river, why would we have Scotland twice? Although applying any human logic to the task at hand was fraught with assumptions, Carrick definitely saw where Serena was coming from. Maybe this is supposed to be a pyramid then, on its side, the same way I thought it could be Scotland. It's kind of like an eroded pyramid. I just think it's too irregular, Serena mused. But hey, if we're right about the other two, that's a hell of a start. I think we should write something up and run it by Geo to see what he thinks. Then Godfrey can sign it off. Let's roll, Carrick replied. They might have been high in Earth's orbit while the McCarthys were deep under its surface, but it was comforting to feel united in the quest for answers. Together, Carrick Thomas knew in his heart that they could do it. Whether the ultimate goal of bringing Terra home from New Kerguelen could be achieved wasn't in his hands, but feeling like he and Serena were making progress in the part they could control was boosting both of their spirits. And if anything they did could play even the tiniest part in bringing Terra back, they felt as if they would be smiling for the rest of their lives. G-46, Inner Chamber, Subterranean Vault, Scotland Emma, fully suited and booted along with her husband and daughter, spent a full minute closely studying the pair of unmatched handprints at the edge of the vault's main chamber. She thought out loud. So the first door, outside, needed a key the architects left on Orkney, where we think they originally planned to shelter some people while they cleansed the planet like they did on New Kerguelen. Then in here, it seems like a human or an architect can get past this door, but all that gets you is another door that needs three more artifacts. Maybe they were going to shelter four groups? Dan mused. Four civilizations for the four artifacts, and the only person who could ever get through this next door would be a person who brought them together? Oh, I like that, Piper said. Yeah, I mean, none of this is ever going to make sense, but at least that's an idea with some structure to it. I just don't get the whole context of the shelters and the pulses, Emma pondered. And, well, the total absence of the architects even after the pulses hit. Something happened to them, Dan said. They left New Kerguelen in a hurry, and they ran into trouble with their time manipulation experiments, and I still think the one I talked to in New York might even be the only one left. Maybe he had nothing to do with putting this here, then couldn't stop the pulses? Of all the discussions Emma didn't want to get into at the moment, the familiar one in which Dan defended the opaque motives of the only architect a living human had ever met was on a level of its own. Fellow members of that alien's species had caused the pulses that left Emma's pregnant little sister and nephew stranded on an unreachable world and it would take a lot more than a hunch for her to start considering one architect any less demonic than the rest. Piper led the way into the newly opened room as this conversation fizzled out, and soon the only thing anyone was talking about were the etchings on the plinth's platform. Dan was particularly entranced, having fruitlessly dreamed of finding something like this, admittedly in any other kind of situation, for the first half of his life. He kept looking even as Piper and Emma filtered away in search of potential doorways. Emma found one before long, but the barely discernible edges were perfectly sealed and left no prospect of ever being breached by force. Piper's shoulders sank after her own effort to budge it. We'll get in, darling, Dan insisted. He was now holding the heavy stone through the gloves of his airtight suit and turned it over to look for markings on the back. There were none, but that didn't take anything whatsoever away from the awe he felt while holding it. I hope so, Piper said. Otherwise, this has all been a waste of time. No, 
Dan firmly insisted as he carefully placed the fragment back on its spot. Piper, every step we take brings us to the next one, and listen, Serena and Carrick are on this. They helped identify the water tower at the prison, so I wouldn't count them out here. And Godfrey's planning something about the prison right now, so things are really moving for us even if it doesn't feel like it. What do you think he's planning about the prison anyway? Piper asked. Meeting the girl's gaze, Emma knowingly raised her eyebrows. Oh, I have a few ideas. G-45, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Tricatore. After touching base with the trio in the cabin to share their findings from the vault's inner chamber, the McCarthys returned to the station ready to move forward and hopeful that good news would soon follow an ICA press release about the world's most wanted artifacts. The most unsung of all heroes in recent weeks were perhaps the small cohort of human pilots who had bussed equipment and personnel to and from the station in the rapid and uniquely maneuvered spacecraft. Oftentimes, such as this one, the pilots had to wait around for hours on end and never said a word about it. They were always on call and ready to serve, and like Stevie and Davey in the cabin, Dan hoped they would be well compensated and rewarded when things calmed down and the dust settled. In a bid to make sure that dust settled over the right outcome, Emma wasted no time in hurrying across the station's star tunnel walkway and making a beeline for the control deck. As she hoped and expected, William Godfrey was there with Timo. Where are we on the prison? she asked. Godfrey and Timo shared a lingering period of eye contact. Their silence left room for Alessandro Bonucci to step in. Well, Emma, at the moment we seem to be around 45 minutes away from blowing a hole in the side of it and seizing the subject of our interest by force. Oh, and Chip will be part of the ground team. Naturally, Emma looked straight to Chip Petrovich. You? Just in case, he replied, taking no offense to her understandable surprise. Chip had never been one to back down from a fight, but that didn't mean he won all that many. Emma couldn't hide her continued confusion. Just in case what? Just in case things go south, Chip said. And just in case the ICA guys don't want to do whatever it takes to make sure things don't go souther, if you know what I mean. She didn't, not even close, but that hardly seemed like the place to start. Somewhat belatedly, Godfrey then delivered a succinct but thorough statement of his reasons for considering immediate and decisive action as important as he did, as well as an overview of the simple plan itself. Despite the gravity of the situation and the stakes in play, simple was most certainly an appropriate word, because although the plan's execution would be the furthest thing from easy, its structure really couldn't have been any simpler. Piper, having arrived shortly enough after Emma to hear almost everything, noticed that her sketch from the cabin was on Alessandro's computer screen. Have you been using that to work out where the view was coming from? She asked, walking over for a closer look. Alessandro switched to another image, taken from a premium app containing ground view maps. The image showed a small building detached from the rest of the prison complex, and when Alessandro zoomed out to show a broader view, Piper immediately saw the trees and water tower she had paid such close attention to. They're definitely in there? she asked. Alessandro replied by dropping the mapping circle on the ground again, but this time near the building. He rotated the view and then flicked back and forth between that image and Piper's sketch. It wasn't similar. It was the same. Well, Emma? Godfrey asked. I'm far more strongly in favor than Timo is opposed but we have effectively agreed to grant you a tiebreaker vote. My team are ready, and the plan is in place to strike before the sun is up, but time is ticking. It's yes or no. No one was sure what would happen if she said no. Godfrey had been unchecked in calling the shots in her absence, quite clearly, but ultimately he was doing so with Timo's revocable blessing. The craft Godfrey needed for his plan to have any chance of working was docked on Timo's station for one thing, and the crucial aerial bombardment would be performed by Alira Dervishi, a Fiori Frontieri employee, rather than an ICA officer. Timo, with a deeper personal reason to detest Nick Mason than any of the others, 
and with a burning urge to see the full extent of his illegal activities brought to light, had been worrying about the overreach and bravado of Godfrey's bold plan since it was first suggested. But if there was one person in the world whose opinion could change his mind, one person with an unmatched track record of weighing up the side effects and consequences of an action before it was taken, she was undoubtedly standing before him in the shape of Emma McCarthy. Godfrey knew this too, and could only hold his breath while the whole room waited for a sign of Emma's position. We want him alive, she said, and that was all. G-44, Infirmary, New Birchwood, New Kerguelen During her various visits to New Kerguelen, Tara McCarthy had seen her fair share of crowds. More than once they had gathered to wave her off, and as recently as a few days earlier, there had been a similar gathering to wish Billy luck on his latest voyage to the Isle of Answers. Clark had been taken aback by the size of that crowd, but neither he nor the more experienced Tara could believe their eyes when they left New Kerguelen's infirmary as soon as the doctors were sure she was safe to leave. Having requested to be allowed back to her makeshift home in the HRZ as soon as it was medically responsible, Tara was discharged under close observation via remotely monitored sensors. She was also given a wheelchair at their firm suggestion, but remained sprightly and relaxed as Clark pushed her with baby Liam in her arms. Or at least, she had remained sprightly and relaxed, right until the doors opened and the sound of the crowd hit them. No one had ever seen a crowd like this here, and Clark could barely remember seeing a crowd like this anywhere. In Central Plaza, the wider area's circular layout changed the way the crowd looked, and the limited size of the area limited how many could be present and within sight at any time. Outside of the infirmary, however, a vast and undeveloped expanse created no such barriers. And in the absence of any barriers, either literal or figurative, a truly colossal crowd of messengers surged forward for a look at the child many of them apparently considered a divine gift bestowed upon them. Clark took one look at the crowd, which consisted of no doubt well-meaning individuals who became an intimidating mass when pressed together so tightly and expansively, and immediately turned around to return his family to the safety of the hospital building. Maybe I should talk to them, Tara said, the first to speak after a stunned silence. They just want to see me and hear that we're all okay. Or I could tell them all I have a new brother called Liam, Aiden said, still proud as punch and seemingly keen to say this as often as he could. Clark ruffled his hair. Maybe later, kiddo. He then turned to Tara and simply shook his head to rule out the idea of her addressing the unmanaged crowd. However well they meant, Clark knew from bitter experience on duty in far-flung corners of Earth that it only took a few stumbles to turn a crowd into a stampede and a celebration into a tragedy. Dr. Cardulo, the gentle man who had led the team who safely delivered Liam in a challenging and imperfectly equipped environment, emerged from a door in the hallway having heard the commotion when the external door was briefly open. Oh, my goodness, he said, looking through that door and witnessing the full extent of the remarkable crowd. I'll call Leisha to disperse this. I don't think it's a good idea for you to go out there. While the doctor spoke, he signaled to one of the alien staff members and sent a telepathic request for them to beckon Leisha. You're telling me it's a bad idea, Clark said. Aiden, glancing between the grown-ups without knowing what was bothering them, gave a theatrical shrug. Everyone is friendly. They just want to say hi. Dr. Cardulo lowered himself to Aiden's level. That's right, but so many people all saying hi at once would be very loud. I think it would hurt Liam's ears. Oh, Aiden gasped in realization. Yeah, maybe it would. We shouldn't go out. Before anyone else could say anything, a bright flash filled the air from the other side of the door. Tara and Clark had experienced this enough times to know that the light wasn't really blinding, as it sometimes seemed, and had no concerns for Liam or Aiden on that front. They were, in fact, glad of the flash, knowing what it meant even before Leisha came inside and began apologizing. I'll take care of this as quickly as I possibly can, 
the alien leader vowed. Terra, I hope you still feel comfortable and safe. The crowd will be gone within minutes, and I'll make sure we have personnel in place to prevent gatherings anywhere near the HRZ. They all mean well, so an instruction to disperse and to avoid doing so again should be enough. Then again, I've heard enough comments since yesterday to know that a lot of our citizens want to see young Liam more than they've ever wanted to see anything. That's why I'll make sure we have security personnel in place, human personnel, to ensure no repeat of anything like this, just in case. She nodded. Thanks. It was just a shock to see so many people, and it really would have been too loud for Liam. But I didn't feel unsafe. Thanks for coming out so quickly, too, Clark said. Like Terra, he directed his thoughts solely to Leisha, so that Aiden, happily patched, wouldn't hear anything that it might be better for him not to. I thought you didn't want to use the teleportation right now unless it was an emergency. This constitutes an emergency, the alien stated like it was the most obvious thing in the world. When they discussed the idea of teleporting Billy to the Isle of Answers, Leisha had expressed a technically valid, if outlandishly unlikely, fear that all of the uplift powers could somehow stop working at the precise moment of the teleportation and thus strand the teleportees in some neither-here-nor-there state of limbo. And given just how adamant he had been that the risk was too great in anything but a true emergency, Clark truly did appreciate his speedy arrival. I was with Kajil discussing something very consequential, Leisha explained. But I won't flash myself back. I'll deal with this and then return on foot to his lab in Sector Zero. This won't take long. I'll ask everyone to leave and tell anyone who doesn't. The Sector Zero labs? Terra mused. Heavy stuff, huh? Leisha nodded more briskly than normal but still in his almost comically articulated up and down motion. Kajil believes the gate still works and that the signals that seem to bounce back are bouncing back from the other side. He says that while none of his latest data confirms his idea, but it doesn't deny it either. Effectively, he thinks the tiny delay between when a signal hits the gate and when it comes back, is a sign that it's going somewhere. Neither Clark nor Terra could even pretend to understand where this was going. Spotting this confusion, Leisha delivered the punchline. So tomorrow, Kajil is going to fly through the gate. A few seconds of silence passed. Without knowing what's on the other side? Terra asked. Without knowing where is on the other side, if the pulse really messed with the portal aspect of it all? Without knowing if he'll be able to come back? Clark added. Yes, yes, and yes, Leisha confirmed. He has a theory that the gate is somehow blocked on Earth's side and that he can punch it open from this side. Needless to say, if he's right... Again... Neither Clark nor Terra said anything right away. To Terra, it sounded like Kajil optimistically thought the operation would be as simple as forcing an earring through a partially closed-up piercing. To Clark, it sounded like a shot worth taking. When is he going to try? Clark eventually asked. I need to thank him. Very soon, I believe, Leisha replied. I've seen his data which, like I said, is fairly neutral on the idea, and given his insistence on doing this, I have approved him to pilot one of our gate-worthy spacecraft. He will fly alone, since the lack of supporting data makes me reluctant to authorize a fully crewed flight. Kajil holds a lot of influence in our data analysis and flight research divisions, so I am mindful that any young workers who volunteered to join him might not be doing so entirely in accordance with their own better judgment. But I don't think any thanks are in order. Clark's brow furrowed in confusion. This is a risky trip. But he's not doing it for you, Leisha explained. He didn't mention any of you once, even when he was searching for reasons to justify the risk. 
Kajil's life work is studying cross-gate travel and communication. He has performed it with a single-minded dedication that has cost him friendships and relationships, and I don't think he sees a life without his work as a life worth sticking around for. Hmm, Clark responded ponderously. Well, I guess now I won't feel bad about him taking the risk, Tara said over a light chuckle. I like Kajil. He's the guy who found the data anomaly that lets me brag about being one of the three people who's ever traveled through time, but it sounds like he would have done this whether we were here or not. Absolutely he would, Leisha confirmed, and we're not going to publicize his flight ahead of time to avoid yet another large gathering at a time when I'm going to be asking people to avoid them. But it goes without saying, I'll let you three know when to look up. Although he kept a lid on it to avoid getting everyone else's hopes up for a plan that might not come good, Clark McCarthy was suddenly feeling far more optimistic than he had at any point in his stay on New Care Galen so far. Billy was already searching for the vault that everyone hoped could usefully illuminate the workings of the gate in some way, but that wasn't going to lead to anything immediate. Kajil's plan, on the other hand, was, in fact, a lot more than a plan. It was a bold but simple action, and one he was going to take the very next day. In the few minutes it took for Leisha to disperse the crowd as promised, and throughout the first few pleasant hours the newly enlarged family spent in their lodgings until everyone else fell soundly asleep, Clark persisted in keeping a lid on his excitement. Once he was the only person left awake in the house, though, he let his mind run free and sat smiling up at the gate until tiredness fell upon him too. It might have been a long shot, but it was a shot, and if Kajil could pull this off, the four strong McCarthy family's first night separated from the rest of their clan on the other side of the gate might be the only one they ever had to get through. That thought made Clark more than excited. It made him giddy. He imagined Dan and Emma looking up at their sky all those millions upon millions of miles away, still entirely refusing to let his mind consider any possibility that they weren't alive and well, and he would have loved nothing more than to be able to reassure them that it wouldn't be long. As an unfamiliar sky full of stars danced overhead, Clark McCarthy wished upon every single one that he would soon be home, pointing Aiden and now Liam to the stars whose names Henry had taught him more than forty years earlier. A life like that was all Clark wanted, for himself and Tara, as well as for the boys. And for the first time in several days, it felt like it might just be within his reach. For this first time in a while, things seemed to be looking up. On one planet, at least. G-43, Sunforth Correctional Facility, Highville, Wyoming. Chip Petrovich had found himself in some sticky situations over the years, usually of his own making, but none had been anything like this. In the early hours of a cold and wet American morning, he was in an oversized SUV with six intense-looking members of William Godfrey's elite ICA ground ops force, none of whom looked particularly glad of his presence. He understood their position, but also understood Godfrey's view that there was nothing like personal investment to make sure a job got done right. And rather than any fear for his own well-being, the only fear Chip felt as the SUV pulled up to the high-security prison's fence was the fear of letting the McCarthys and Godfrey down. Expected in fourteen, one of the officers said to their driver. Eleven. Ten. As the countdown continued, seeming to get slower with each passing second, Chip focused on regulating his breathing. Some old-fashioned fear of death was kicking in now, right on cue, but he knew he had a job to do. Six. It had only been fifteen minutes since the craft dropped him off in an isolated location following a quick stop for the officers in Buenos Aires. Chip knew it would now be almost directly overhead, as Alira Dervishi usually accustomed to blasting holes in space junk rather than prison fences and outbuildings, prepared to deliver two rapid-fire tactical strikes. One. Exactly as planned, 
Alira then fired first at the near corner of the building before taking several less focused shots at the fence. In the first instance, precision was everything, since the mission objective was explicit about seizing the target alive. For the fence, however, Alira had to manually adjust the cumbersome bombardment cannons before firing away. Since all that counted was making sure some nearby part of the fence was passable, she held her finger down until she was sure. The SUV's driver then accelerated like his life depended on it, which for all Chip knew it maybe did, and continued forward before performing an aggressive handbrake turn near the burning hole. Let's go, the officer next to Chip prompted, pulling his arm to break an understandable stupor as his colleagues began flooding out of the car and towards the building. And look alive, Petrovich. We didn't come to dance. G-42, National Museum of Brazil, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Within less than two hours of a press release announcing to the world that the alien vault in the ground under Thurso hinted at the importance of three ancient stone fragments, the first of them was proudly displayed to the world's media in Rio de Janeiro. Cristiano de Souza, curator of the National Museum, had recognized the stone as soon as he saw it, with the only reasons it had taken two hours to show it to the world being the need to source the necessary security keys in the dead of night and the need to give the media some notice to attend. The McCarthys and their allies were too busy with something else to notice this media event immediately, and if they had been paying attention, they may well have wished the curator had kept it private, to avoid making himself and his museum a target for opportunists and anti-alien activists alike. Cristiano proudly stated that the museum's cultural fund would gratefully accept Timo Fiori's offer of a reward in exchange for the stone fragment, which they would provide to an ICA-appointed recipient at the earliest opportunity. If everything was this straightforward, the group members spread between the station and Wyoming would be in for an easier mission than they expected. Things, however, were seldom this straightforward. G-41, Sunforth Correctional Facility, Highville, Wyoming. Chip stepped out of the SUV with what felt like more adrenaline coursing through his veins not only than at any previous times in his life, but more than in all those times put together. As instructed by Godfrey, he hung back very slightly as the prison alarms blared. He glanced backwards and saw that the spacecraft wasn't visible on the ground yet, it would be soon, uncloaked so that the team could make their getaway up the ramp as soon as the target was in their grasp. At least, that had been the plan. It was hard to hear much over the alarms, and Chip Petrovich soon questioned whether his eyes were also playing tricks on him as one of his comrades entered the building only to be suddenly thrust backwards through the air, colliding with the only section of wall Chip could see. A second man followed, hurtling through the air in a manner Chip could only liken to the British agent who had been similarly thrust backwards like a beach ball in a hurricane by the first main pulse in Thurso. There was no pulse this time, but the reason for the ICA force's presence on the ground gave Chip an uncomfortable idea of what was going on. They were here to seize an individual who was either uplifted or otherwise special enough to have had a remote connection with Piper, and Chip knew only too well the telekinesis and even mastery of force fields were core components of those powers. Two more men then shot past Chip's eyeline in a single motion, making his stomach nod at the thought of who the hell was in there and what else they might be capable of. Chip backed up against the wall, as close to the burning hole in the building as he could get without catching fire himself, and reached for his ICA regulation sidearm. None of the men had fired any shots, but the flying bodies convincingly suggested that this was probably less to do with their desire to fulfill the mission objective of seizing the target alive and more to do with that target's remarkable powers. Chip raised his weapon and held his breath. Emma and Godfrey wanted the target alive, but they weren't here. Chip's unspoken understanding was that Godfrey had sent him to break that order if it had to be broken, which none of his highly trained and hierarchy-respecting officers would have considered. 
Right after two more of the final three men slammed against the same wall as the earlier three, the sixth and final officer, who he had arrived with in the SUV, scrambled out of the door on his knees and ran in the wrong direction. Abort the mission, he yelled, glancing at the gun-toting lawyer and sprinting beyond to the newly uncloaked spacecraft. Don't go in! Phil Norris had once told Chip that strong men fell hardest because strong men stood where weak men ran. Those words gave him a strength many would have considered foolhardy in a moment like this, but they gave strength nonetheless. One of the officers who had been thrown against the wall crawled out of the building and struggled to his feet in a bid to reach the craft, signaling for Chip to follow him in getting the hell out of there. As that man fled, there was no sign of the others. Some of the impacts had been wince-inducing enough to make Chip consider it unlikely they weren't fatal, but he tried not to think about that. What counted now was what happened next, and now that the things had played out like this, Chip was even more certain why Godfrey had agreed to send him and encouraged him to hang back. The goal had been simple. Seize the target alive. But for Chip, Godfrey's eyes had made the subtext just as clear. Unless you can't. There was no way in hell of meeting the goal now, so Chip knew what had to be done. Clutching a weapon he was no stranger to, but which he had never fired in anger, he made a single darting motion away from the wall and through the door. And then he saw it. With his weapon raised and locked expertly on the target's forehead, Chip Petrovich felt his blood turn cold. Face to face with the only other person in the room other than his fallen comrades, Chip wished for the earth to swallow him whole. But try as he might, he just couldn't look away from the only other person in the room, powerful beyond human comprehension. He couldn't look away from the only other person in the room, now wearing the most frightened expression Chip had ever seen. He couldn't look away from the only other person in the room, a twelve-year-old boy, pleading for his life. Part 5. Zeus It's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog. Mark Twain G-40, Sunforth Correctional Facility, Highville, Wyoming a million questions were spinning through Chip Petrovich's mind as he stared at an incredibly powerful child who had just killed several of his comrades. While those men's bodies lay lifeless and limp at the base of the wall they had been thrown against, the boy stood with a quivering lip and tears in his eyes. Shaking his head and breathing only in disconcerting nasal sobs, he raised his hands in an appeal for mercy. Amid the multitude of questions Chip was wrestling with, he knew one thing for sure. He was still alive and unharmed. An individual in possession of the power this boy had at his fingertips surely didn't need to play tricks like this, Chip figured, not when he could have hurled him against the wall or snapped his neck like a twig without a second thought. You're with them, the terrified child stammered. You're with Piper. Although he even hadn't been thinking about pulling the trigger since he saw he was facing down a child, Chip only regained full control of his previously stunned body when the boy said this. What do you know about Piper? he asked. She found me, the boy replied, calming down more with every passing second now that Chip was slightly more relaxed. But why did she send those bad men? Why are you with them? Listen, kid. We need to get out of here, Chip said. I'll take care of you, okay? I'll take you somewhere far away, somewhere safe. Yeah, the boy gulped. And then we'll take care of the people who did this to you, Chip added. This time, the boy inhaled sharply and gave an enthusiastic nod. He picked up some kind of headset from the ground and moved to Chip's side. Chip looked around the room, decorated like a self-catered hotel suite, in search of anything that might be worth taking. A laptop on a desk by the bed was the obvious choice, but before he could even move for it, the object was moving towards him. 
Good idea, the boy said, in one moment exhibiting his powers of both telepathy and telekinesis in knowing what Chip wanted and effortlessly sending it his way. They then headed outside, catching sight of several prison guards approaching the ramp of the parked spacecraft. No, 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 Chip groaned as one of them stepped onto it. But before the guard could take a second step up the ramp, an alien-originated force sent him soaring backwards on a parabolic curve. Chip glanced at the remarkable child beside him and watched as he balled his hand, then opened the fingers in a sudden burst which cleared a path to the ramp by knocking the other responding guards to one side. When Chip reached the craft, Alira Dervishi became the first other person to see the boy. She didn't know what to make of it, even though she hadn't seen his powers firsthand. Go! Chip yelled into the bowels of the craft, addressing the pilot. Everyone who isn't already back is dead! As the boy began wandering around like he was in a museum on a Sunday afternoon, rather than a getaway craft in the wake of an incident whose consequences would be far-reaching indeed, Alira's face fell into despair. No, Chip said, putting a supportive arm around her shoulder. You were perfect. And Alira? We did it. Alira looked up at him through her tears and then across to the evidently inquisitive and remarkably powerful child. Chip tried to smile. I don't know what the hell we just did, but we definitely did it. G-39 Weltringham Estate, Sussex, England Despite having attended both school and university with William Godfrey and flitting in and out of his life in various ways since then, Arthur Brent was most certainly not on the ICA chairman's Christmas card list. He was also among the last people Godfrey would have chosen to receive any of the acclaim and credit that was about to come his way. Brent, a wealthy landowner and renowned collector of antiquities, had recognized the artifact immediately. The perfect quarter-circle shape of the stone and three rudimentary mountain-like shapes etched onto its surface were unique enough to send his mind right back to the day he bought it from the widow of a famed mountaineer. Some of the experts Brent ran the stone by were confounded as to its provenance, while the one he trusted most of all told him it was almost certainly a cheap and modern creation intended to extract a premium from early explorers. The artifact had sat in storage since then, with Brent too embarrassed to put it back on the market and always loath to adorn his privately displayed collection with anything of dubious origin. Today, however, that had all changed. Completely out of the blue, a press release from Godfrey's office had just settled the mystery of the stone's origin in a way Brent could never have imagined. He certainly didn't need the money, and would probably turn down Timo Fiori's reward as a means of winning public favor and pressuring Diane Logan's government to stop their infernal investigations into his tax affairs and employment practices. The satisfaction he would get from knowing Godfrey owed him one was worth more to a man like Arthur Brent than any commas in a bank account, and he took great glee from engaging in a phone call with the ICA. It's ready whenever they can collect it, Arthur said, his voice perhaps the first the receptionist had ever heard that was even posher than Godfrey's. As long as we can film the handover on my front steps, I'm ready and waiting. Arthur Brent wasn't the first name Godfrey would have written in a list of people he wanted to be in possession of one of the all-important artifacts, but it could certainly have been a lot worse. G-38, Arrival Point, Space Station, Il Circatore. During the short trip from Earth to the station, Chip sent a short voice message to William Godfrey to share the headlines of what had just happened. There were inherent risks to bringing someone so powerful onto the station, but upon hearing that the boy had asked about her, Piper was a firm proponent of bringing him on. When the reality sank in that Nick Mason and his cohorts had been conducting their uplift research on an isolated and skittish child, the group's hatred for the man rose to all new and previously unimaginable levels. The boy put on his helmet-like headset during the flight, 
which he told Chip was for blocking the loud thoughts that usually came at him from every angle. It also stopped him from using telekinesis, he explained, and Chip replied by saying it was probably best to keep the headset in place on the station to avoid alarming anyone by accidentally utilizing the powers. The boy agreed. So do you have a name? I'm Chip. He shook his head. Well, some of the nicer ones used to call me Cody. They said all of my files were codenamed Zeus. They could have gone with Zeus and they chose Cody? Chip asked, grinning at a brief moment of self-delivered levity. Cody didn't get it, and Chip opted not to bug him any further during the short flight. Enough attention would be coming the boy's way when they got there, Chip figured, so a few extra minutes of solace in the meantime could only help. When it became known on the station that a young child was arriving with Chip, possessor of remarkable powers or not, Emma wisely decided that almost everyone, including herself, should stay out of his way for a while. The station was an overwhelming place at the best of times, let alone for someone who had quite possibly been indefensibly locked away from the world for a number of years. Only Piper and Alessandro greeted young Cody at the far end of the star tunnel, which took him a few minutes to get through. Such was his awestruck wonder at the sight of so many stars. Piper was there because the boy had asked about her, while Alessandro was the obvious and outstanding candidate to perform as many non-invasive tests as Chip and Piper could persuade the boy to undergo. Quite understandably, Cody already viewed Chip as not only his rescuer, but his savior. If anything, however, he expressed even greater affection for Piper. As soon as he reached her, the boy stared straight into her eyes. You found me. You heard me and you looked for me. Thank you. Piper's mouth opened slowly in realization. You were looking out the window so I could see where you were. Cody nodded. And you found me. You saved me. A pain hit Piper's heart. He might only have been two years younger than her and might have sounded older than he was in more ways than one, but Cody was a lot shorter than her and certainly looked like the innocent young child he was. She had already hated Nick Mason for what he'd done to Timo and what he'd said about other members of her family. But for the first time in her life, Piper McCarthy suddenly knew how it felt to truly despise someone. Whatever they did to you, they can't do it anymore, she promised. You're safe now. I want to see what's in the vault, the boy replied, either keen to change the subject or suddenly reminded of that. He didn't want anyone to see it, but he can't stop us. No, he can't, Alessandro interjected, smiling warmly at Cody and introducing himself. But before we do that, would you like to come with us and play with some things that will help us to understand what makes you so special? You mean tests? Cody asked. Alessandro hesitated. Well, I... No, it's okay, the boy said. As long as Piper and Chip can come. Cody seemed remarkably resilient and adaptable for one so young, no doubt due to the specialness of his mind and the dubious gifts he possessed, but the others were finding themselves more and more surprised and impressed by his strength of character, even as considered independently to his remarkable powers. Chip put a hand on the boy's shoulder. I'll be here as long as you want me, Cody. The boy smiled up at Chip, glad to be referred to by the name the nicer guards had always called him before they stopped visiting his quarters. The small group then proceeded to the control deck, where Alessandro had already gathered various devices and some medical scanning equipment for the key tests he wanted to perform as a matter of urgency. When Alessandro asked if Cody would mind taking off his unusual headset, the boy obliged but explained, as he had to chip, that it protected him from other people's thoughts and also stopped him from accidentally engaging his highly sensitive ability to move objects without touching them. Alessandro made a careful mental note of this, as he did for every remarkable detail he was learning of this most remarkable child. Though it seemed likely that the biggest questions of all would be beyond the remit of the boy's knowledge, such as those regarding how he came to be as special as he was, the Italian had very high hopes about how much they could learn. Piper did all she could to distract Cody from the machines and equipment in an effort to extend the time available to Alessandro before he got bored. She first tried a Rubik's Cube, but quickly had to move on to questions about this and that after Cody solved it within less than a minute 
in what was his first ever attempt. She took the lead in asking the bulk of the planned questions, too, making them all as conversational as she could. When she asked what he knew about Nick Mason, Cody's response was a very simple one. He's in charge. Of what? She pushed. Everything. She considered her next question carefully. Have you ever met him? Cody shook his head. But the things they make me watch and the things they make me think about, they're always things he uses. When Piper asked what this meant, Cody explained that he was often asked to watch footage of someone and tell his guards whether they were lying or telling the truth. He said sometimes it was about business investments and sometimes it was about other politicians, but his insights were always things Mason acted on. Free access to a television was just about the only luxury it seemed like Cody ever had, so his familiarity with nightly news shows made it easy to see that Nick Mason was benefiting from the insights he was asked to provide for unspecified reasons. During the multitude of tests Alessandro carried out while the others speculated maniacally about Cody and his powers on the other side of the door, by far the most immediately consequential came when Alessandro showed him an image of Antarctica that included a giant and invisible alien transcript. Anyone wearing a patch used to be able to see transcripts and images like this as well as in person, but from the moment the first pulse hit, even Leisha's fully uplifted transcript reading ability had been lost on Earth's side of the gate. Cody, however, spotted it immediately and rattled off what he saw. Wow, Alessandro said, immediately turning to Piper. She stared right back at him, just as aware of how much of a game-changer it would be for the group to once again have a member capable of reading transcripts. The potential for what kinds of previously unnoticed transcripts might be in the vault sent Piper's head spinning with hope and expectation, but also gave her an idea. Alessandro, can you pull up a picture of the platform from the vault? The Italian did as he was asked, seeing where Piper was going. Cody, can you see anything here apart from the basic shape on each quarter of the circle? He took a few moments, but had the answer soon. Current position, highest peak, longest river, he said, rattling off the first three. And protruding rock. Oh, Alessandro gasped, drawing it out slowly. His fingers typed frantically, and within a few seconds, several small images filled the screen underneath his term, Uluru. Once known as Ayers Rock, an aerial view of the colossal mass of rock very obviously matched the shape of the etching on the final segment, when you knew to look for it. I'll post this news publicly while the data from everything is settling, the Italian continued. Cody, thank you for everything. I'm so glad you're here. Cody smiled, and for a moment only he and Piper were left in the room. Have you ever seen an alien? she asked. Only on TV, the boy said. I'd like you to meet a friendly one, if you want to, Piper offered. Her name is Melly, and she really wants to meet you. She's helped me a lot through all the years I've thought there was no one else like me. The boy shrugged. Sure. Piper walked ahead and asked him to follow her to her bedroom, where the kindly alien would meet them and introduce herself, all while Alessandro analyzed the multitude of data he had gathered with Cody's active and enthusiastic cooperation. Look, the boy said, referencing a TV which was muted but still playing. It's him. Piper turned around and saw that Alessandro's TV screen was filled with a large image of Nick Mason. She grabbed the remote and jumped back a few minutes to the point when Mason first popped up, then hit play. Do you want me to tell you if he's lying? Cody asked, speaking sincerely and out of what was clearly a well-ingrained habit that had given his evil keeper an advantage in the game of life without even having to take the poor boy out into the world at large. Piper tried not to laugh. Cody, it's Nick Mason. When he's talking, he's lying. G-37 RMXT Studio No. 1, Manhattan, New York for the second time in less than 48 hours, President Nick Mason found himself sitting down with Maria Janzik in New York's famous RMXT studio complex. The cameras were again rolling, but this time they were not broadcasting live. 
Mason was instead here to give Maria a taped interview for the early morning news cycle. She hadn't expected the request to come in after midnight, but an exclusive like this wasn't the kind of offer any journalist worth their salt would turn down at any hour. Ten minutes into an interview that wouldn't air in full until later in the day, with snippets and sound bites on the topics of Mason's key talking points set to hit the airwaves over breakfast, things had gone exactly as Maria would have expected. Mason was still doubling down on his position that engaging with alien technology of any kind was both irresponsible and unwise. Reacting to more recent developments, meanwhile, he pulled no punches whatsoever in calling for anyone in possession of the two remaining artifacts Godfrey and the McCarthys needed to open a locked door within the alien vault to avoid handing them over. He wasn't alone in talking about the Pandora's box-like risks at play. But as usual, the real reason for his opposition was a lot more self-centered than that. Oh, my, Maria suddenly said. Mason stopped talking and did a double-take. He hadn't been saying anything especially aggressive or controversial when she cut in, so really didn't know what she was reacting to. He figured it out when Maria adjusted a tiny earpiece, one so tiny he hadn't even noticed it until now. She squinted her eyes as she listened very carefully to the news she was being given. Mason glanced over to his advisors off-screen, one of whom was beckoning him over with an urgent hand gesture. The last thing he wanted to do was slink off and look either evasive or weak, however, so he gritted his teeth and waited. I'm receiving word right now that within the last few minutes, an alien craft with a human crew has touched down in the United States, Maria said. I'm hearing some remarkable additional details that I don't want to repeat until we receive some verification, but the landing is confirmed by multiple credible eyewitness reports. Mason put every ounce of energy he possessed into looking calm. Let me guess. Birchwood? No, Maria replied. Highville, Wyoming. By the time the word Wyoming had left Maria's mouth, Nick Mason had left his chair. Looking weak and evasive was suddenly the last concern in his mind, replaced by one so catastrophic he knew it could bring him down for good if mitigation measures, or at least some powerful distractions, weren't put in place immediately. Mason physically pushed one of his three present advisors away and told another to stay where he was, before running outside with the only one he trusted and the only one who knew almost everything about the prison and the dastardly secret that underpinned Mason's rapid political ascent. I want no trace, he hissed at the man as they hurried into the waiting car. Operation Nero, right now. The advisor, no soft soul himself, swallowed hard. But, sir, there are- You heard me, Mason cut him off. Scorch the fucking earth! G-36, McCarthy Dorm, Space Station, Il Cercatore. Melly is my friend from New Kerguelen, Piper told Cody in anticipation of the alien's arrival. The boy had gone quiet when Mason appeared on TV, and she was keen to get him back to his formerly talkative self now that the short clip was over and there was no TV in sight. Do you know much about New Kerguelen? And the gate, maybe? she added, suddenly hopeful about this last part. I know some, he replied, sounding somewhat distracted as he looked around the room where she slept on the station. But it's so nice here. I wish I could live here. I'm sure Timo will find you a room. I know Timo, Cody said. He really doesn't like Timo. Piper didn't see any sense in mentioning right now that he, clearly being Nick Mason, had poisoned Timo in cold blood, she really wanted to get back to the topic of the gate, but was reluctant to make Cody feel like he was an animal in a cage, good for the test results it provided and little else. God knew the boy had gone through enough of that, she solemnly reflected, and the all-important issue of the gate could come back to the surface in a few minutes. For now, Piper wanted to see what Melly made of her new friend. This took no time at all, as it turned out, because Melly literally jumped backwards when she first caught sight of Cody. His vulcan shanafoop deck, she shrieked in a voice far less melodic than normal. Piper instinctively took Cody's hand to ensure he stayed calm. The reason for Melly's discomfort was clear and manageable. He is much more powerful than you ever were, and the priority was making sure Cody didn't get spooked too. 
Do you understand her? Piper gently asked, momentarily not realizing there was no way he possibly could, since there were no written records or audio recordings of anything more than brief snippets of the messenger's language. Cody shook his head. Do you? Yako Binsaf, Lo Sin, Piper said in reply to both of her friends at once. Wow, Cody smiled. You are really smart. Piper chuckled. No, Melly was scared because you're so much smarter than me. She's an empath. She senses things, things even we can't sense. Eased by Piper's reassurance that Cody was firmly on their side, meanwhile, Melly walked further into the room. Piper had deliberately set up the meeting here, well out of the vocal translator's range, precisely so she could act as an intermediary if any misunderstandings arose. What does she sense about me? Cody asked. Piper didn't translate this, instead choosing to let things play out as Melly held out a hand, a very alien hand, in invitation for Cody to take it. It's okay, Piper urged him. She then touched Melly's hand with her own, gently running her thumb against the odd-looking double-wide divisions that served as the messenger's fingers, and then down the very long and dexterous thumb the aliens used for so much of their daily activities. Relaxed by Piper's example, with actions truly speaking more than a thousand words, Cody gently clasped Melly's hand. Within a few seconds of connecting deeply with the boy's soul, Melly closed her eyes. It's okay. Piper repeated, again encouraging Cody to stay with it. In reality, though, it was Melly she had to worry about. Melly forced her eyes open and gazed into Cody's, but she couldn't do so for long. After far less time than Piper expected, the alien pulled her hand away. In an unusually low and joyless tone, Melly then proceeded to tell Piper that Cody had known suffering too great for anyone so young, or anyone at all. He had known only loneliness for his whole life, but had somehow come through it with an unbroken spirit. I recognize so much of you in him, Piper, the gentle alien said in the language of her kind. He is so different, like you, but he is good, like you. He is good. What's she saying? Cody asked. Piper took a slow breath. She said you've been lonely for a long time. You've been sad, but your spirit has never been broken. And she said you are a lot like me, different from everyone else, but good. Cody smiled at Melly. Thank you. For the first time since being taken aback by the power of his mind, Melly smiled back. When Piper suggested it might be time for Cody to meet everyone else and make his way to the vault, to which he reacted with glee, Melly asked her to pass on one last message. Piper gladly relayed it. And Cody, when everything calms down and we can go back to Earth, Melly says she can help you to manage any of the powers you don't like. You won't have to wear your headset either. You're not broken, but she can make you less different if that's what you want. More than anything, the boy said, very much liking the thought of anything approaching a normal life. More than anything. G-35, Sunforth Correctional Facility, Highville, Wyoming. How it had happened was a question for later. For Nick Mason, all that counted now was doing whatever it took to make sure there would even be a later to think about. When the first images came in from the prison and Mason saw the enormous hole a spacecraft had blown in the side of the boys' building, a sick hope swelled within him that the blast might have taken him out. Word from Mason's loyal boots on the ground in Highville shot a hole through that particular hope almost as wide as the one in the building, confirming that the boy had made it out and fled in the craft. Further bad news came with confirmation that the ICA operatives left on the ground were dead, which removed one time-tested way of getting to the bottom of further details surrounding the raid. The sheer gall of the raid riled Mason as much as anything else, because despite his high guard he was realizing far too late that he had massively underestimated the ends Godfrey and the McCarthys would go to just to have their way. Nick Mason was so far gone as a sociopathic fiend that he never even stopped to consider the differences between what Godfrey and the McCarthys wanted, to protect Earth from alien-related problems and to reunite their family, respectively, 
and the equal-in-his-mind goal that drove him, that of maintaining and expanding his own power and influence. Mason's mind couldn't shake an element of grudging recognition for a plan well executed, but it offered him no comfort that it was one so bold and reckless that he would never have seen it coming, even if he'd had any reason to think Godfrey and his cronies knew about the boy. But if the issue of how they knew was one Mason was still thinking about days or even hours later, he would be a happy man. That would be a relatively high-class problem, and one his mind would move on to only when he had survived this one. With the child now in Godfrey's possession, and the truth about his origins almost inevitably going to come out as soon as they started running tests on him, Mason was in flat-out survival mode. On his orders, the boys' quarters were now burning to cinder, and every piece of priceless equipment and every shred of irreplaceable data were being wiped from the face of the earth. This felt very much like closing the stable doors after the horse had bolted, what with the boy himself no longer standing on the surface of the earth, but Mason had to do whatever he could to minimize just how bad this might get. But though Mason would never admit it to the few individuals he trusted enough to work with on the cleanup, chiefly because any defeatist feelings could reduce their effectiveness, in his heart of hearts, he knew it was all over. What counted now? for his opponents far more than himself, was just how spiteful Nick Mason could be. G-34, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Cercatore From his workstation in the Control Deck, where he had just made a discovery so incredible that he barely believed his own data, Alessandro Bonucci sprinted to the research annex where everyone else was staying out of the way for now. Did you see this thing with Mason? Dan asked as soon as Alessandro opened the door. He was doing an interview. Mid-word, Dan stopped speaking. The look on Alessandro's face had utterly implored him to, and it likewise immediately captured everyone's total attention. My data is incontrovertible, the Italian began speaking much more slowly than he usually did. The child is far more powerful than Piper ever was, and fortunately he has been entirely cooperative. He can read transcripts, even now, and he wants to go into the vault. Sweet! Carrick Thomas exclaimed from near the back of the group. Transcripts? That alone can help us so much! Serena was smiling too, but those who had known Alessandro for longer could see that something was troubling him greatly. The boy has been used by Nick Mason for years, the Italian went on. As some of us had come to assume the test subject might have been, and he firmly is on our side, but I have discovered the source of his powers, and it is not what we thought. Mason and his associates have not mastered anything related to the uplift powers. They've been using the boy, but they didn't grant him anything. Every spine stiffened and everyone focused intently on Alessandro, from Carrick and Serena to Emma and Dan, all the way to Timo and Godfrey. No one knew where he was going with all this, but they didn't like the sound of it. Is he an alien? Dan blurted out. He wouldn't have asked this if he'd spent more than a few seconds thinking about it, but in a search for an answer as to where else the powers could have come from, his mind was coming up blank. The rapid sequencer has confirmed that his DNA is 100% human. Alessandro gulped. And that is the point. His DNA is 100% human, and Dan, his DNA is 100% yours. This child is your clone. G-33, British Museum, Bloomsbury, London. To many with an interest in antiquities or ancient studies in general, there wasn't all that much to be surprised about when two of the three widely dispersed artifacts identified by etchings in the alien vault under Scotland turned up in England. The stone featuring an etching of the Amazon rainforest was found in Brazil, as logic might have predicted. But both the Everest and Uluru stones, both originally placed in the general area of the natural wonders they depicted, had within a few hours of each other been identified in British collections. The irony was strong, 
but given the reach of the Empire and the prideful importance that had once been placed on gathering artifacts from foreign lands, it wasn't quite a turn-up for the books. To the extent the stones were so-called out-of-place artifacts, the error had been in believing they belonged in any human collection at all. As one relatively unspectacular object among the eight million in the British Museum's collection, the Uluru Stone had never been on prominent public display, and until a few short hours earlier, had been in behind-the-scenes storage. The two ICA press releases about lost alien artifacts, the first featuring a photograph of the etching seen on the Uluru Stone, and the second including a note as to its presumed origin, changed all that very quickly. With so much attention on alien-related stories in the aftermath of the destructive Scottish pulses and now the news of some kind of flying saucer-supported ground raid in the United States, every word out of the ICA was big news. News about artifacts was particularly big for the museum's staff, meanwhile, and several archivists and experts on Australian and Aboriginal collections immediately recognized the etching. Now, as was the case in Brazil, and the less exotic surroundings of Sussex's Weltringham estate, the artifact was in safe hands and ready to be handed over to those who could use it to forward humanity's best interests. Or, at least, to those who thought they were forwarding humanity's best interests. G-32 Control Deck, Space Station Il Cercatore Reeling from the news that the remarkable child Nick Mason had been despicably using for his own gain was a bona fide clone of Dan McCarthy, everyone flooded out of the annex and headed to the control deck for a first-hand look at the data. Just after they got there, though, Piper and Cody emerged from the opposite hallway. Hey, the girl said to the group. There's someone here who would like to meet you all. Everyone, this is Cody. Cody, this is everyone. Dan stared at the boy in utter disbelief. For all the world, he felt like he was looking at an old-school photo of himself. How? was all he could say. The boy was wearing his headset, which, ironically, was the only thing keeping him from learning that the others now knew he was in fact a clone of Dan McCarthy, presumably genetically engineered using DNA taken somehow while Dan was uplifted. Cody certainly wasn't as old as Piper, who had been conceived in that brief window, so the theory was internally consistent, even if it didn't make sense in any standard understanding of that term. Since Cody was 100% composed of uplifted DNA, his power was considerably greater in all regards than that of Piper. In one mind-bending technical sense, his biological daughter, since the uplifted DNA she inherited from Dan was diluted by Emma's. All of this would come out, and very soon, but for now the group's focus simply had to be on the task at hand. Emma nudged Dan very firmly in the side, leaving no room for misunderstanding of the point that he had to keep his mouth shut for now. She knew that the last thing the boy needed was more upheaval, much less of a kind that even a group of adults were struggling to comprehend. The presence of his headset really was a lifesaver. Emma, too, could see the likeness when she looked at Cody, and as he stood side by side with Piper, there was a natural and undeniable resemblance there, too. I hear you want to go to the vault, she said, drawing upon every ounce of speaking experience and high-pressure memories at her disposal to keep a straight face when the inside of her head was spinning every bit as dizzily as Dan's. It's really cool down there. You'll like it. I'm going to look for transcripts, he said. That sounds like so much fun. I wish I could see transcripts. Emma replied. Maybe there will be one that says something about the gate to New Kerguelen. Has anyone ever taught you about that? TV, Cody replied. I know Tara and Clark and Aiden and Billy Kendrick are all on the other side, and that he doesn't want any of you to fix it. I watch TV all the time, and I remember everything I see. Melly said I'm a lot like Piper. More than you know, Emma thought to herself. Her brain begged for answers to questions she would have considered ridiculous just a few minutes earlier, but the urgency of exploring had never been greater now that Mason's back was against the ropes and there was no telling what he might do. The who's and how's and why's regarding Cody's unnatural birth would have to wait for now. But they wouldn't leave her mind and wouldn't be left for long. As much for his own sake as anyone else's, 
Emma would make sure the full truth of how the boy came to be would come out before long. Today, however, Cody's unique gifts and heaven-sent ability to still read transcripts made a trip into the vault the only next step. We don't want to use you like he did, Emma said, but we would really like it if you could help us in the vault. Would you do that, just as soon as we gather the three artifacts we need to open another door down there? That won't take long. Can Chip come? Cody asked, looking around and not spotting him. I'm safe when Chip is with me. Clearly stemming from the kidnapping turned rescue of a short while earlier, it was understandable to everyone why Cody had bonded to the man who led him to freedom. Chip returned at that very moment, back from an ill-timed bathroom break, and had no idea what he'd missed. Hey, kid, he said, sensing an odd dynamic as Piper and Cody stood directly in front of a shocked-looking group of adults. What's up? We're going into the vault, Cody smiled. That's what's up. G-31, Inner Basin, Isle of Answers, New Kerguelen. The Isle of Answers held just as much interest for Billy Kendrick on his second visit as it had during the first, albeit for very different reasons. The first time, which he found it hard to believe had only been a week earlier, Billy had set off into the unexplored center of the unmapped island with no idea of what he might find. Today, on the other hand, he knew exactly what he was looking for. The team was smaller this time, and all wore full exploration suits from the get-go after Billy's close call with a particularly frightening example of the island's unique fauna. That first expedition had led Billy to an incredible pyramid constructed by the ancient islanders, a distinct civilization of the same messengers who called the far-off city of New Birchwood home. Within it, he and his right-hand alien Boone discovered a written account left by the islanders a day before their deaths at the hands of a pulse just like the kind that had been experienced on Earth very recently. This discovery raised the stakes on Earth, and a related discovery enabled Billy's distant friends to save their planet by placing an artifact on the door to the vault they'd already unearthed in Scotland. With a determination like none he'd ever known, Billy was now seeking the equivalent vault on New Kerguelen, which he knew to be somewhere on the Isle of Answers. The large area his team had explored last time was easy to tick off as not containing any sign of the vault, and with that in mind, Billy headed straight for the other side of the volcano which dominated the island's inner basin. It took a full day's travel to get there, but the trip was worth every second. For defying the limits of even Billy's eternal optimism, an auspicious mound came into view in the distance almost as soon as he set his sights on the new horizon. Billy and his team continued forward with renewed vigor, dreaming of what they might find. He had a transcript reading patch ready in his backpack, and with every step he pondered what might be the best thing he could see. A giant button reading, press here to fix the gate, was a little too much to hope for, he figured, but he was certainly praying for something useful to that end, rather than anything that was merely revelatory about the islanders or their architect visitors. Those topics interested Billy to no end, of course, but with news of Tara's baby having recently reached the group, his driving focus was doing whatever it took to enable the family to return home. The mound Billy saw from afar seemed to grow in scale with each step, and when he reached it he couldn't help but think of a submarine only lightly covered in earth. It was an incredible sight to behold, and the very minor curvature suggested that the protruding part was only the uppermost section of a truly colossal structure. Here, a human explorer called, Billy, there's a hatch. Billy's heart skipped a beat. A tentative smile broke out on his face, filling out into a wide beam moments later when the man called again, And it's wide open! G-30, National Museum of Brazil, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. In scenes more than a little reminiscent of Dan McCarthy's arrival at Edinburgh Castle to pick up the vault's all-important key just a matter of days earlier, stunned locals looked on as an alien spacecraft landed in a specially cleared area in front of Rio de Janeiro's National Museum of Brazil. Gino Nunes stepped out of the craft and warmly greeted the museum's director, Cristiano de Souza, before posing for some photo ops at the Brazilian's request. 
Cristiano played for the cameras a lot more than the staff had at Gio's first stopover at the British Museum, where things played out more discreetly, with a curator driving the artifact to a quiet location on the edge of the city in a bid to help the utter chaos that would have come with a landing in Bloomsbury. The Brazilian was far less desperate for the spotlight than Arthur Brent, however. The owner of the Weltringham estate and fortuitous private holder of the Everest Stone, Arthur Brent, insisted upon a five-minute press conference in which he did little more than pat his own back and state how lucky William Godfrey was that he was willing to be the bigger man in overlooking their long-standing personal animosity for the greater good. Gio had been as diplomatic as he could with Brent, forcing a neutral expression despite the urgency of his situation and the depth of his disdain for a man using such a moment to bask in the spotlight. He couldn't begrudge Cristiano de Souza or his museum their brief moment in the sun, however, particularly with how proud the man was that his country, where many had long resented the ICA's deeply entrenched relationship with Argentina, could assist the world in this way. With three artifacts in his possession after three very different pickups, Gio Nunes hurried back into the spacecraft and returned to the station. He had done his part, with tremendous support once again from Carrick Thomas and Serena Cruz, and it was now over to the others. A plan was in place to continue deeper into the vault in the hope of reactivating the gate to New Kerguelen, or at the very least, ensuring the vault itself could wreak no more destruction on a planet that had already endured far too much. Like last time, alien artifacts left on Earth by the architects were set to open a door and humanity was set to learn what was inside. Unlike last time, however, it seemed like the ultimate fate of this plan rested no longer on the 14-year-old shoulders of Piper McCarthy, but instead on those of an even younger and even more powerful child. Thanks to Alessandro's tests, the group already knew what Cody was. And... As the spacecraft neared the station with the priceless artifacts in tow, they wouldn't have to wait too much longer to find out just what the boy was capable of. G-29, Vault Entrance, Isle of Answers, New Kerguelen Billy crouched down for a closer look at the hatch, which was indeed prized open by a latch-like beam. There was space for an artifact on the front surface, but none was in place, raising an immediate question as to how exactly the door had been opened in the first place. He wasn't even entirely sure how much weight could be put in anything he read within the pyramid, given that all the physical writing had been accompanied by transcripts left by the lying and deceitful architects. The working theory was that they had left labels for future visitors of their own kind, almost like the informational notes in a human museum. When the architects were involved, though, Billy knew better than to rely on working theories. He peered into the hatch, which was set horizontally into the base of the mound at one side, and saw a long and steep ramp descending deep into the belly of the structure. After a single step in, Billy swung his backpack off his shoulder to remove a miner's headlamp and some flashbulbs in order to tackle the deathly darkness that all but swallowed the beam from his handheld flashlight but disaster struck as the backpack swung around, knocking against the latch that held the door open. The last thing Billy saw was Boone's foot, selflessly and desperately thrust where the door was going to slam shut. This effort to save a good friend wasn't just fruitless for Boone, but came at the price of at least one toe, which rolled in and out of Billy's flashlight beam like an egg down a hill. Boone's squeal of pain had been deafening for the millisecond before the door sealed and shut it out. Billy felt worry and sorrow for his friend in that moment, as well as gratitude for his bravery, but all of this was replaced with a much stronger series of negative feelings when he reached up to push the door open and realized that it had truly resealed. Not only too heavy for anyone to move, but locked in place. There's a key. Billy said, speaking out loud in an effort to ease his own racing mind. The eerie echo of his voice in the chasmic void did more harm than good, however, so his follow-up thoughts were silent. They're going to look for it and they're going to find it, he reassured himself. Billy then opened his backpack, trying not to curse its bulkiness too much for having caused this problem in the first place, and removed a handful of flashbulbs. 
He threw them forward and watched as they slayed the worst of the darkness, activating on impact and spreading an impressive aura in all directions. The bottom of the ramp was clearly beyond the limits of Billy's throwing distance, so he wasn't too surprised that nothing had yet come into view up ahead. He glanced back to the door, hoping Boone and his foot would be all right, then swallowed away his hesitations and began to march down the ramp. Picking up flashbulbs as he went and momentarily amusing himself with the thought that they were almost like reverse breadcrumbs, Billy vowed to do it for Boone. Because when there was no way out, the only thing to do was go further in. G-28, Fraser Stedding, Thurso, Scotland With a powerful new ally at their side, the McCarthys and Chip Petrovich descended to Scotland and wasted little time in getting down to business. Gio Nunes was also there, having collected the artifacts from England and Brazil and brought them to the station. He didn't even take off his jacket before heading back into the craft for this journey to the ground, where he was looking forward to sharing stories from his travels with his new friends in the cabin. The big story he picked up on the station about Cody was like nothing he had even imagined as a remote possibility. The others on the station remained there, meanwhile, with Alessandro leading an understandably confused roundtable discussion about how Cody could have come to be and what wider implications could lie ahead. William Godfrey was, meanwhile, engaged in all manner of fraught discussions with typically allied world leaders, furious at the remarkable raid he had seemingly authorized on an American prison. On the back of how effective his two written statements about the artifacts had been, Godfrey opted to dodge the media for now and issue a statement through the ICA press office. In it, he simply stated that he had come into possession of incontrovertible evidence that illegal uplift research was being conducted at the site in question. He insisted very plainly that the cold light of day would illuminate all things, as it always did, and that those who were criticizing his actions now would soon be retracting their comments. What Godfrey didn't mention, or rather, who he didn't mention, was anything but a coincidence. A heads-up came in from Diane Logan, who was still keeping her head down as much as possible in a bid to recover as quickly as possible from the political as well as human costs of the pulses, stating that British intelligence had been tipped off that Mason was in the process of fleeing to seek asylum in a Pacific Island nation whose government had made a recent habit of enriching itself by rolling out the red carpet for disgraced Westerners. Mason was done, and letting him flee in vain while the investigations were carried out wasn't something Godfrey was worried about. Everything about Mason and everything about Cody would be addressed more fully and ultimately with the brilliant child's involvement very soon, but for today, his absolute focus was on helping the people who had saved Earth by doing whatever he could to save their friends and family members from a life stranded on the other side of the gate. The group on the station had all played their individual and collective parts, and when the craft touched down in Scotland, they gathered around Alessandro's main computer screen to watch a feed from the drilling cabin. Soon, it would relay a live stream of the most important and consequential expedition into the vault yet. On the ground, Stevie and Davy looked more than a little confused to see two new faces step out of the craft in the shape of Chip and Cody. The smiling Geo immediately promised he would explain everything. This prompted Chip, lugging a heavy backpack with the three stone fragments Geo had gathered now wrapped carefully inside, to suggest this maybe wasn't such a good idea. Dan quickly, but politely, cut in to tell him Stevie and Davy had been in on everything else for a while, Piper's powers included, and were two salt-of-the-earth guys as trustworthy as the day was long. No one took any offense to Chip's suggestion, which was founded in an eminently valid concern, and when the drilling operators started speaking excitedly to Piper and Geo in their working-class accents, Chip suddenly saw a lot of himself in them and got the immediate impression that they were the kind of guys who would have gotten along with Clark. Emma and Dan were both going into the vault this time, making a total of five, with Piper at their side, and the all-important Cody feeling brave enough to enter the darkness only in the company of the man he saw as his fearless savior. Two trips in the lift were thus required, with the McCarthys going first. Remember to tell us as soon as you see any transcripts, Piper gently told the boy when he joined them at the entrance ramp with Chip. He was wearing his headset under his helmet, 
but a quick test performed on the station had confirmed that wouldn't be any obstacle to his transcript reading ability in the way it was to his powers of telepathy and telekinesis. I will, he said, his voice crystal clear in the other's helmet-based speakers, just as theirs were in his. Let's just hope they say something good. Dan and Emma shared a lingering glance. This went without saying, obviously, but hearing it stated so plainly by a straight-talking child really hammered it home. Yeah, Dan agreed, slowly turning away and leading the group into the vault. Let's hope they say something good. G-27, Entry Chamber, Subterranean Vault, New Kerguelen. With each passing step and each tossed handful of flashbulbs, Billy Kendrick had wondered all over again how much further the thus far empty vault could possibly stretch. He moved as quickly as he could and was heartened to finally spot a wall and a second door. As he neared it, his eyes caught sight of two handprints on the ground which were fully illuminated by a nearby flashbulb. Crouching to look closer, Billy saw that one was unmistakably in the shape of the messenger's hand. He would know those two wide finger-like divisions and that remarkably dexterous long thumb anywhere. The other, however, looked just like the hand of the architect that had visited New York and thrust Dan McCarthy high into the air while communicating with him via a painful-looking cable in his neck. Maybe this was some kind of lock for the door, Billy figured, guessing rather than thinking. In any event, and persisting with his current tunnel vision focus of finding out what was in the vault rather than wondering about the hows and whys of it all, he continued through the door. Beyond it, he found a much smaller chamber with a plinth in its center. The plinth's round platform was perfectly flat and etched in four distinct quarters with a different pictograph in each. One consisted of a horizontal line with a circle beneath it, which made Billy's well-honed archaeologist's mind think it was a reference to the underground plinth itself. Two of the others looked like a five-pointed star and a rudimentary forest of trees, respectively, but for all he knew, the last might as well have been a snowman. He guessed that this was probably some kind of key, too, but once again a door on the far side of the chamber called him forward into the Unity Room. This chamber, the smallest yet, provided another new object for Billy's eyes to take in, a single, tower-like device that he instantly recognized as a radio of the same type as those in the Great Shelter, which the messengers used to believe were their own sentient elders. Billy continued past this machine, careful not to touch it in any way that might accidentally prompt the monsters to return. Beyond the Unity Room lay the somewhat inauspiciously named Source Room. Billy held his breath as he passed through the vault's final door. On the other side, the first things he saw were the tall chairs, familiar from the abandoned architect outpost he had once explored on the outskirts of New Birchwood. More machines were present, too, again very like those he had seen in the outpost. While Billy's mind searched for an angle that made sense on that front, his eyes moved to the walls on either side of him. As his flashlight brought one side into focus first, Billy Kendrick fell backwards in shock. Horror would have been a better word in truth for the sight before Billy's eyes was like none he would wish on his worst enemy. The chairs against the back wall told him that the architects had been in this room, and what lay against the side walls told him that the architects were even more wicked and abominable than he had already known. This visual alone brought a sickness to the pit of his stomach, but the implications of what Billy was looking at knocked him for six. If his eyes weren't deceiving him, this discovery could rewrite everything, and in the worst possible way. G-26, Inner Chamber, Subterranean Vault, Scotland Definitely none yet, Cody said, reiterating that he still hadn't seen any transcripts, even as the group reached the handprints which led to the inner chamber and its all-important plinth. The others, who could all hear him as well as the ambient noise of their footsteps, thanks to their helmet's noise management features, were by now worrying that Cody's headset may have been causing a problem on the transcript front after all. But with the plinth in sight, they knew they wouldn't have to wait long to find out. A photograph of the platforms and its etching 
had been what revealed his transcript reading power in the first place, when Alessandro hadn't even been looking for it, so a lot would be determined as soon as the boy looked at the real thing. Chip swung his backpack from his shoulder as he walked through the door, taking care not to bang into anything or otherwise risk damaging the artifacts. No one knew if they would have to be in one unbroken piece to unlock the next door, but they expected so, and certainly didn't want to risk having to find out. Anyone want to do it? Chip asked. Piper gestured to Cody, who gladly took the opportunity. I can see the transcript on here, he said, putting that concern to rest. Just like in the photo, I'll tell you guys if anything changes when the stones are on top. One by one, Chip handed Cody the stones and watched with as much excitement and tension as the others as the boy placed them in position. Chip presented them in the order Geo had gathered them, in London, Sussex, and Rio, respectively, by coincidence rather than design. Uluru, Everest, Amazon. Cody hesitated before placing the Amazon stone in the only remaining space. What if something bad happens, he said. It won't, Piper reassured him. I don't want to get in trouble if it does, he replied, speaking to her but looking instinctively at Chip. I don't like it when I get in trouble. Chip crouched down to his level. You're safe with us, Cody. Trust me. The boy inhaled deeply and gave Chip a brave nod. Okay, he said, pivoting back to the platform and slowly placing the Amazon stone in position. Within a second, everyone heard a quiet hiss as the door in front of them parted. The room it revealed was dark until Chip threw in some flashbulbs, which Geo had suggested and Timo had provided for this very purpose. The light-emitting boundary drones would be in there soon, instructed by Geo as he watched from the cabin, but the flashbulbs enabled the group to see right away. First off came a handprint on the floor, right at the entrance. It was this time a single handprint, and the handprint of an architect. I don't think we're going to be able to get through the next door. Emma sighed in disappointment. Out in the main chamber, the handprints were the only way through. It's like they have different rooms with different levels of restrictions, and I don't think the next one is meant for us. We wouldn't be in it if it wasn't, Piper replied, the tone suggesting she wasn't so much trying to reassure Emma as she was to correct her. There has to be a way for us to get through. As Chip Petrovich threw another handful of flashbulbs further beyond the newly opened door, the entirety of the small room became illuminated. Beyond the handprint lock, which needed a certain species of alien's hand as its key, a second object was now visible. Dan wasn't alone in knowing what it was, but he recognized it most of all from his first trip to New Kerguelen. Like the objects he saw that day, this one was a tall pillar, and like the objects he saw that day, he was absolutely certain it was a radio-like device pre-tuned to a single frequency, a direct line to a single source. There was only one way to open the door, and with it, perhaps only one way to reinstate the gate and bring Tara and Clark's family home, but Dan McCarthy's heart sank as he realized what that one way was. Clearly, only too clearly, if the group were to continue forward, then their only means of doing so was to beckon back to the scene of their crime, those who had not only created the gate, but also the vault and the cataclysmic pulses it released. There was only one thing to be done if they wished to open the door. For better or worse, they would have to call an architect. G-25, Fraser Stedding, Thurso, Scotland I hope they know what they're doing, Gino Nunez said through tense and shallow breaths. He could barely even watch the screen. Relax, mate, Stevie calmly replied. When have they ever steered this wrong? The man's faith in the McCarthys was laudable, but in this case, perhaps not best placed. G-24, Inner Chamber, Subterranean Vault, Scotland the sound of Emma's tears echoed through Dan's helmet, and he cursed the suits between them that prevented him from comforting her properly. We can't, she sobbed. I would do anything for Tara, but we can't bring those things back here. We'd be rolling the dice that it would do less harm than good. 
I mean, look what they did here. Half of the highlands is gone, flattened. Piper, darling, we can't. Piper's ears perked up at the sound of her name. It wasn't that she had shut out her mother's evident distress, but her own mental gears were rolling too quickly to hear much of it. I always said that, the girl replied. I never wanted anyone to fix the elders and try to use them, even when Dad said the architect he talked to didn't seem so bad. But why is this here? If they wanted to hurt us, why is this here, and why aren't they? Dan closed his eyes and wondered how it had come to this. A Hobson's Choice and Catch-22 all rolled into one. Guys? A quiet voice called. They all turned immediately to young Cody, who was pointing at a section of the wall where they could see nothing at all. Is there a transcript? Piper asked him. The boy nodded, striking an odd pose in the heavy helmet that made his head look three sizes too big, but there was nothing funny about what came next. It says placing their hand in the handprint is the only way to enter the source room, the boy said. That's the only place where they can engage an emergency stop on the final release that comes soon after the cleansing pulse. Final release? Chip echoed in a deep voice of panic, first to get his reaction out, but certainly not the only one to be feeling the same way. And after the cleansing pulse? Piper said. So the pulse we contained, that could have destroyed everything, wasn't even the final release? And when? Dan chimed in. Cody turned back to the wall. It's a lot to understand, he said. It's not just like I'm reading it. Dan, with far more transcript experience than the others, knew exactly what the boy meant. His own mind had felt genuinely overwhelmed on some occasions, by what sometimes felt like a barrage of multi-sensory stimuli from the incredible QR-like technology. Take your time, he said gently. Try to focus on what the final release would be, and if it says when it might happen. How soon after the last pulse? The others all watched as Cody stared at the wall, which looked like the blankest of canvases to all of them, and especially closely as his eyes started to twitch. Seconds later, he pulled his gaze away. Are you okay? Chip asked, rushing over. Cody shook his head quickly and repeatedly. I don't know what it is, but it's bad. And Chip? It's happening today. G-23, Source Room, Subterranean Vault, New Kerrigalen Lining either side of the walls in the vault's final chamber, Billy Kendrick's horrified eyes fell upon a series of what seemed to be pod-like cages. Each contained a well-aged skeleton, or more accurately, a pile of bones. After a few minutes in the room, Billy's curiosity brought him close enough to see that the bones in the pods on one of the walls were all from members of the messenger's race. The hands made this clear just as the messenger handprint in the main chamber had been so unmistakable. Out there, the other handprint had been an architect's. In here, however, the opposite pods were not filled with remains matching the long skulls and tall bodies of the architects. Instead, to Billy's horror and dismay, these bones were human. Billy couldn't even begin to try to comprehend this, and was lost just knowing where to start. As his eyes looked around the semi-illuminated room for anything else that might bring context to what he was looking at, they fell upon a blank circle on the ground. Oh yeah, Billy called out in belated realization. Transcripts! Having been so focused on getting deeper into the vault and moving ahead quickly enough to avoid too many self-defeating thoughts about the futility of his situation sinking in, Billy had temporarily forgotten about the uplift patch in his backpack. He then lifted it out, quickly placing it on his neck in place of the telepathy patch that had been there all day. As soon as Billy looked down at the circle in the middle of the floor, his mind was almost overwhelmed by an information-rich insight into where he was. The message was a warning, effectively, stating that the energy pulses emitted from the vault had been confirmed as sufficient to eliminate both of the species under observation and that all architects had to make sure they were sheltered when the cleansing pulses occurred on each of the observed planet's appointed timescales. They brought ancient humans here, Billy realized. 
and they did it to make sure the pulses were strong enough to kill us. Utterly sickened, Billy felt like smashing up the machines at the back of the room but lacked the energy to do so. Instead, he glumly trudged off in the other direction. Back in the midway chamber with its conspicuous plinth, Billy gazed at the etchings and immediately gained a new transcript-based understanding about where they could be found on New Kerguelen. Only once fragments had been brought together would their collective holders be granted access to the so-called Unity Room and then have the chance to continue into the Source Room, it said. But Billy still didn't know for the life of him why anyone would want to go in there, or indeed why the architects had left keys and doors to be used after a series of pulses whose whole purpose seemed to be to make sure there would be no one around to do anything. As his mind whirred, Billy's heart warmed for a moment at the first welcome development of the day. As developments went, it was a big one, announced by the sound of familiar voices yelling into the void from all the way across at the vault's entrance. Billy ran out to the main chamber and yelled back. Shortly after his voice rang out, a flash defeated the darkness in every corner of the vault and subsided to reveal Leisha standing in its place. Nad Fusan? the alien asked. Billy scrambled for his telepathy patch and put it on the back of his neck. Are you okay? Leisha repeated, this time understood. All six of us with full telekinesis powers teleported here and blew through the door. I'm so glad you're alive, but are you okay? What have you found? Just promise me that even when I'm gone you'll never, ever do any work to restore the elders, Billy replied. Leisha, they're worse than we ever imagined. Leisha looked over Billy's shoulder, intrigued by the open door. Billy stepped in the way. Promise me, Leisha, whatever you do, do not reactivate the elders or use the one that's in there. Whatever you do, do not call for the architects. The alien, leader of his kind, stepped past Billy and into the final room to see it all for himself. Within seconds... Billy heard a colossal thud. He ran back in and saw that Leisha had used his power of telepathy to lift the machines and chairs into the air before sending them crashing to the ground. Each machine and each chair was now in pieces, like the skeletons of their creator's innocent victims. Leisha turned to his human friend with a look of anger and sadness on his face. I am sorry you had to find this, he said, but I am glad it has been found. I will flash us back to the surface, and then we will destroy the remaining elders today. No research, no repair, no reactivation. For the good of our people and the sake of our planet's future, we must take that decision out of future generations' hands. A call to the architects is a call to evil, and a call to destruction. As his heart continued to pound far quicker than its usual rate, Billy nodded, he was shaken up like never before and felt like a considerable amount of decompression time at home would be needed to get over it. And before flashing them back to the doorway and ultimately New Birchwood from there, Leisha had one more thing to say to draw a line under the whole sorry discovery. A call to the architects is a call that must never be made. G-22 Inner Chamber, Subterranean Vault, Scotland. Today? Everyone asked in disbelief. Emma walked urgently to Cody's side and put her hands on his shoulders, looking directly into his eyes. You need to tell me if you're absolutely sure about what you just saw, she said. In that moment, she would have given everything for a second opinion, for anyone else to have been able to use the uplift powers on Earth, which had been completely ruled out for everyone else except Piper, and even in her case, had only left some telekinesis. Clearly, something about the children having inherited the powers was at play here, with Cody's 100% uplifted DNA explaining the difference. Despite all that, Emma couldn't shake the feeling that counting on such a young child's interpretation of an information source he'd never seen before was one hell of a leap of faith. I'm sure, Cody insisted, speaking through a quivering lip. Some of it was like pictures, some of it was like sounds, and some of it was just like feelings. And I just know it's happening today. 
Not just today, soon. Really, really soon. Dan spoke up in defense of the unspecific nature of Cody's recollections. He's exactly right. Sometimes with the dynamic transcripts, they give you a feeling more than anything else. And if Cody feels like it's happening really, really soon, then guys, it's happening really, really soon. This changes everything, Piper said. Guys, I would do it for Aunt Tara because she would do it for us, but this is bigger than us now. This is the whole world, again, just like when the final pulse from the same vault almost killed everyone last week. And don't forget that a lot of people didn't want you guys to open the door when the final pulse hit, Chip said, or that those people are only still alive because you didn't listen. Despite Emma's earlier and long-standing opposition to the idea of ever reaching out to the deceitful architects, Piper's words chimed with her own new thoughts and chips were enough to seal the deal. In a single movement that told everyone else where the moment was taking them, Emma McCarthy nodded in decision. No one could hear anything but their own breath for several seconds, until just after Emma turned to her husband and held her hand out. She gestured towards the pillar-like object in front of them a bona fide and seemingly still functional example of the alien radios his determination had first uncovered on New Kerguelen before Piper or Cody were even born. We wouldn't be anywhere near here without you, she said. We wouldn't even have known the comet was coming, and we wouldn't have had a kid as special as Piper to warn us about the pulses. Everyone on this planet would be dead two times over if you hadn't picked up that folder and kept on believing even when the world was against you. Dan didn't know what to say to any of that. And you're the only one they've spoken to, Emma continued. I hope you're right about the rogue architect from New York being on our side, but we don't have a choice anymore. And if one of us is pushing this button, it should be you. Seeing little sense in prolonging the moment, Dan McCarthy stepped forward and held his finger over the button. He had just two warm and ironically delivered words for Emma, as he pressed it. Game face. G-21, Fraser Steading, Thurso, Scotland. Gio Nunez was watching through his fingers as Dan McCarthy lowered one of his own onto the button that looked set to beckon one or more architects to Earth for a second meeting no one had been hoping for. Stevie and Davy were each sitting back with a hand covering their mouth instead, looking as though they might have been watching a particularly dramatic penalty shootout. The stakes of what was happening in the vault were much higher than in any game, however, and barely a moment later, it became crystal clear that the effects had already spread from there. The video feed from the vault cut out without warning, and so did the link up to the station. Shit, Geo cursed. Stevie shot to his feet and ran outside, closely followed by the slightly less nimble Davy. Geo knew them well enough by now to know that neither were running away. They were going for a better view. By the time he worked up the courage to follow them, the most intimidating sight he had ever seen was waiting to greet them. High over their heads, something unseen since one fateful night in New York City thirteen years earlier, was descending from the sky. It would perhaps have been more accurate to say that the architect mothership was in fact blocking out an ever greater portion of the sky rather than descending from it, because a colossal shadow was rolling in over Thurso. The men would be standing in darkness before long, such was the scale of the incoming craft, but that was the least of their concerns right now. Ah, well... Stevie said, sighing out the words as he nervously bit his lip. I guess they answered the phone. Part 6. Rogue Everyone, at some time or another, sits down to a banquet of consequences. Robert Louis Stevenson G-20 MacDonald Hotel, Orkney, Scotland in the Orkney Hotel, where Carrick Thomas and Serena Cruz had seen out the countdown to the final pulse of several days earlier, things had very slowly been returning to normal. New bookings were up, and some visitors were arriving day by day now that some limited ferry services were back up and running. A regular flight schedule hadn't resumed yet, but word had it that that wasn't too far away either. This was good news for the staff. 
particularly in the bar and restaurant where tips were such an important source of income. The waiter who had looked after Carrick and Serena certainly missed their generosity, but other guests were slowly beginning to fill the void. Window seats were always in hot demand, with winers and diners alike always looking for a view of the rugged landscapes that attracted them from near and far. One Scottish couple who had been sitting at the window for a while were now ready for the dessert menu, but as the waiter brought it towards them, he suddenly froze in fear. Are you all right there? The male diner asked. But while he was looking at the waiter's shocked expression, a gasp from his girlfriend tore his focus away. She, too, was staring out of the window. Out and up. Only then did the man see it, but the size of the alien mothership and the speed with which it was descending told him that before long he would see nothing else. Although the shape of the incoming craft was instantly recognizable due to how familiar it was from the world-famous New York footage, the scale had to be seen to be believed. Guests in other areas of the restaurant got up and ran from what they knew was inside the craft, again from the New York footage, but the stunned couple and their waiter remained exactly where they were. They were frozen in shock, but their lack of movement would have proven no disadvantage given that there was quite simply nowhere to hide. As the hundreds of thousands of people who would see the colossal craft from their current position would all soon be able to attest, there was no outrunning the sky. G-19, Fraser Steading, Thurso, Scotland As the architect mothership settled at an incalculable altitude that blocked out literally the entire sky, Geo and the drillers had no doubt that the group within the vault were running as quickly as they could to get out and see it for themselves. As the minutes ticked on, they got the impression that the devious architects in the sky might be waiting for bold or foolhardy humans who had beckoned them to earth once more. This was borne out very quickly. Stevie reported from the shaft that he could hear the group coming, and as soon as he had lifted the first subgroup from the lift, Geo and Chip, at the McCarthy's offering, a smaller and more familiar-looking craft emerged from the mothership's holding bay and made its way to Earth. No one could have ever imagined feeling anything other than terror in a moment like this, which those old enough to remember New York had all hoped to never see again, but the times had changed. For Emma in particular, thirteen years of hoping they would never be back had given way to a few minutes of praying they would be in the sky when she emerged from the vault. The incoming saucer wasn't in the air for long, zooming towards Colin Fraser's well-used field and engaging its exit ramp before long. Cody's discovery that calling an architect to Earth with the radio built into the vault was the only way to prevent an imminent post-pulse final release had changed everything in Emma's mind, and the driving goal of reactivating the gate to bring her sister home to Earth had not only been joined, but superseded by the need to ensure there would still be an Earth waiting for her. But as much as Emma had hoped for its presence in those few heart-pounding minutes, actually seeing the evil-looking being emerge from its craft made her hair stand on end and her stomach turn in knots. The long skull, the overlong fingers, the striking height. It all contributed to the overall feelings of revulsion the architect inspired in all who saw it. Primarily, though, it was crocodilian eyes, the nostrils only nose, and the tight lipped mouth that made the difference when looking at an architect rather than a messenger. Put simply, it just didn't look friendly. It was also an it, as opposed to two or more being a they, which raised the likelihood in everyone's mind that it really was the same one Dan had spoken to in New York. That face was permanently etched in his mind, and he could have sworn this was it, but he also couldn't be totally sure they all didn't simply look too similar for him to discern anything without a side-by-side -side comparison. The architect stepped forward, closer but not quite close, and surveyed the ragtag group of humans who stood before it. Cody, intrigued but not scared, removed the helmet of his exploration suit. He then removed his headset a few seconds later, and at that precise moment, the architect fearfully recoiled like a dog fleeing a water hose. The monstrous-looking alien scrambled backwards, getting away from the child as quickly as it could. It senses your power, Emma said, 
her own helmet already on the ground. Trying to remain calm, she breathed slowly and deliberately. Leisha could sense Piper's and was frightened by it at first, she went on. This could be the same. We want to talk, Dan yelled, now as helmetless as the others. He turned around and pointed to his own neck, then slowly stepped forward. I've done it before. I'll do it again. Cody caught up with Dan and put a small hand in front of his chest to hold him back. We don't need a cable, the boy insisted, staring at the architect as it appeared to visibly calm down and began inching forward. Dan, I'm already talking to him. G-18, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Cercatore. With all communications and data signals from Thurso and a broad surrounding area completely blocked, no one on the station had any idea of what was happening on the ground. All they knew was what they had seen, beginning when a colossal architect mothership seemingly materialized from nowhere, another gate, they unanimously reckoned, and ending when it descended on Thurso. Everything that had been broadcast to Il Tricatori via the cabin made it clear that the McCarthys had ultimately intended to call the architect to Earth and only to block an exceptionally ominous-sounding final release. Alessandro Bonucci was using the dead time to oversee as much analysis and observation of the hovering mothership as humanly possible, but even his mind was anything but focused. The threat of a final release made the Italian feel like his world was under threat from something within the vault all over again, just after disaster had been averted at the time of the convergent pulse. Simultaneously, he would have given anything to get the McCarthys and their unlikely teammates to safety, while also recognizing that he would have chosen no one else before them if tasked with picking those capable of giving humanity its best chance of persuading a demonic-looking alien to assist them in a crucial and urgent plan. And in the face of a challenge of which everyone's understanding had far more holes than details, Alessandro was holding out a lot of hope that young Cody could be the ace in the pack they needed. He was powerful, almost beyond comprehension, and there was never going to be a better or more important time to let that power shine. G-17, Fraser Stetting, Thurso, Scotland. As the others looked on in amazement, Cody and the lone architect stepped closer towards each other and stopped within touching distance. That they could communicate like this was far less outlandish than it might have sounded to someone who didn't know the background behind Cody's power. After all, he had been born with the powers due to source DNA he was engineered from, being 100% uplifted, and that had come about because the messengers had shared with Dan the uplift powers their kind in turn received from the architects. The line between Rogue's mastery of telepathy and Cody's had a few intermediary points, but it was unbroken and easily traceable. Chip was naturally protective of the child due to the circumstances of their meeting and everything that had become apparent since then, but he stayed back for two reasons. First of all, he knew that distance was no issue for this architect. If it wanted to hurt someone, it was going to do it. And secondly, there wasn't a damn thing Chip could do about it. He says he's sorry, Cody relayed. For everything. Emma and Dan turned to each other, as they so often automatically did after so many harmonious years together. Neither had known what to expect, but it sure as hell wasn't that. He couldn't stop the pulses, here or on New Kergolen, because he didn't put them in motion, Cody went on. The more senior architects did all the groundwork with the vaults and the gates and the great shelter, and all of that was before he was around. He says he warned the natives on New Kergolen as soon as he learned about what was going to happen there, but it was too late for them and he got in trouble for it. He didn't know anything about our pulses until they started. He didn't even know there was a vault here like there was on New Kergolen. If this meeting had been called in a quest for illuminating information about the details Dan and some of the others had been wondering at every stage, like why certain locations had been deemed important by the architects or why the vault was arranged in differently secured chambers, they would have realized it was a bust after just these opening exchanges. 
Two questions counted more than any others, though, and the newest was extremely urgent. Emma spelled them out clearly. Could you ask if he knows what the final release is going to do and whether he can fix the gate to New Kerguelen? She requested. Cody asked the first question first, quite reasonably, and did so out loud. His follow-up question revealed a lot. Final release, he repeated. In the vault, there's a transcript warning about it and saying that only one of your species can stop it. You don't know? A few seconds later, Cody turned to the others and shook his head. But will you try to help us? The boy pushed. When the reply came, he raised a thumb for the other's benefit. And can you fix the gate? This time, Cody didn't speak or gesture for much longer. After a few silent exchanges, during which he paid close attention to every small detail of the grotesque-looking but surprisingly forthcoming alien's thoughts. He can't do it on his own, Cody relayed with a sigh. And he thinks the gate is gone, so it would need to be replaced, not repaired. Thinks? Emma asked. So he doesn't know? Cody listened again and then answered. The gate has been around for a lot longer than him. He could close a gate, like the gate to... Sanctuary? A gate to sanctuary. Does that mean anything? But he couldn't reopen that gate, just like he alone can't reopen the gate to New Kerguelen. But he says there is hope. To the rest of the humans, the sanctuary reference certainly did mean something, including in the broader context of proving their suspicions correct that this really was the architect from New York. Tell him I remember talking to him, Dan requested and that I always wished I'd asked if he was rogue from the rest of his kind. The boy nodded. Are you rogue? He asked, talking out loud to the alien as often as he consciously remembered to do so, mainly so the others knew he was asking exactly what they wanted him to. The architect didn't need to hear anything to know what he was thinking, but there was no harm in it. Rogue is a cool name, he added a few seconds later. I'm Cody. Rogue. Dan considered. Whether the question had been answered clearly or not, he had to agree that Rogue was a pretty cool name. So he was Rogue from the rest? Emma pressed, most full of pertinent questions. And still is? Where even are the rest? Without thinking about it, Cody asked this question through thought alone. Rogue replied as clearly as ever, and with the others rightly trusting Cody implicitly, they were all coming to see there was no need for him to vocally repeat their questions going forward. He doesn't know that either, the boy eventually said. He's been alone for a long time, since a group left the outpost in New Kerguelen. He was never there, and he doesn't know why they abandoned it. He thinks they were called back. Where? Piper chimed in. To the other side of their home gate, Cody said. It's a gate between galaxies. He thinks he's the only one still on this side, in this galaxy, where Earth and New Kerguelen are their only two planets of interest. He has never been home, at least that he remembers. He always used to follow orders from the senior architects on this side of their gate, but they always took orders from the ones at home. Dan gulped. Wait, he's telling us he took orders from an unseen authority on the other side of a gate he's never crossed, and that doesn't sound a little bit too much like the messengers for anyone else? He's making it sound like the architects could be just another link in some chain, one step above the messengers, but definitely not at the top. Does he know where he was born? Emma asked. Cody relayed the question to Rogue and then his answer to the others, as was the pattern that had developed and would continue from here on. This answer was simple. He doesn't know. He doesn't remember things from long ago. Emma couldn't even try to hide her confusion here. But he remembers talking to the islanders on New Kerguelen thousands of years ago? He says that's not a long time, Cody replied almost immediately. And that we're starting to be more suspicious than we should be, but he knows that's a very human trait. Oh, he does? Emma pressed, resisting the urge to roll her eyes. Cody nodded without turning around. He says humans are so suspicious because of our, uh, because of the complex nature of our social evolutionary development? Socio-evolutionary development? Thinking back to New York, 
Dan could remember the verbose and sometimes grandiose pseudo-linguistic thoughts he had received from Rogue via the cable, perfectly in line with the kinds of things young Cody was relaying now. And he says that, in turn, is partly because Earth was so perfect for life, the boy went on. We had to outcompete a lot of other life forms, and then once we made it to the top, we spread so effectively and so dominantly that we reached more complex levels of personal interaction and had to think about trust and lies and all kinds of things they never did. After relaying all of this, Cody said nothing for several seconds. When a further comment came from Rogue, he turned around and passed it directly to Dan. He says I remind him a lot of you. We think the same way. Dan struggled to meet the boy's eyes, not wanting to give too much away. And certainly here, like this, when Cody's emotions and adrenaline surely had to be heightened enough without learning that he was a clone, and as far as anyone knew, the first successfully cloned human ever. It's okay. I know what I am. Cody then stated in one sentence revealing both that the others hadn't had to walk on eggshells around him and also that he'd noticed they had been. I know why I remind him of you. Huh? Piper asked, the only one still out of the loop. Following another of their automatic glances, Emma gave Dan a nod. This is going to sound crazy, he said, seemingly auditioning for understatement of the year. But Cody is a clone of me. They must have gotten hold of a DNA sample taken in the week when I was uplifted or something like that. We'll find out. A wave of realization hit Piper. So he's more powerful than me because he isn't even half normal, and I had the connection to him because I had the connection to you. Dan nodded. Exactly. But listen, we can all talk about this for the rest of our lives, if that's how long it takes to get to grips with it, but not right now. Cody, can you ask him if he can come down there with us as soon as possible to deal with the final release? And tell him we're not going to send him away as soon as we're done with him. We just need to do this now. He understands, Cody replied, before waiting for a few seconds and then continuing. He wants to say something about the gate? When he said he can't do it on his own, that doesn't mean he can't do it. He says we shouldn't doubt ourselves, and he'll help in any way he can. He wishes his kind had stuck together. Stuck with him. Like we always stick together. No one knew quite what to say to this. An unexpectedly sentimental turn from an alien whose surface appearance didn't look conducive to any such thing. I want to see what Melly would make of him, Piper mused. I bet she could tell him things he doesn't know about himself. I wonder what Alessandro would make of him, Dan said, his eyes lighting up. And I wonder what he would make of Alessandro and all his gate research on interdimensionality. Maybe with his theoretical understandings and Rogue's power working together. You beautiful genius, Emma replied with an excited expression and a peck on his lips. Once he deals with this final release thing, we'll ask him to come up with us to the station. It could be like Cody. We find him, he surprises us, and his power comes in handier than we could have believed. Looking across to Chip, Piper, Cody, and Rogue, all bunched together a short distance from Geo and the Scottish drillers, the couple couldn't help but briefly see the amusing side of how their already unlikely team just got a whole lot unlikelier. Come on, guys, he's ready now, Cody called to them. Bunch up and get ready for a flash. Once they were there, safely resuited and helmeted up along with the others, it came almost instantly. It had been a while since the McCarthys had seen a flash, particularly on the surface of Earth where messengers have been banned for several years, but this flash definitely seemed much brighter than any Leisha had ever caused, and they were sure it didn't just seem that way because it was the first in so long. When the flash subsided, they found themselves in the vault's cavernous main chamber. It's like a ten-minute walk from here, Chip said, saying what everyone was thinking. Cody, can you ask? Before the full question was out, Cody had passed the gist of it on, and Rogue had gladly delivered the entire group much closer to their destination. They were, in fact, at their destination. Of his own accord, Rogue stepped forward and viewed the transcript which had warned Cody of the final release. 
Continuing to act with decision and urgency, he then walked back to the handprint on the floor and rather awkwardly maneuvered his body to the ground. Once there, he placed his hand in position. The hissing sound of an opening door was music to the group's ears, and the sight of Rogue striding forward to tackle whatever lay ahead was a sight for sore eyes. Whether the sight that was waiting for them on the other side would prove quite so welcome, time would soon tell. And whatever it was, Rogue would see it first. G-16, Source Room, Subterranean Vault, Scotland. When Rogue stepped into the Source Room, identified as such by a transcript in the previous chamber, no one knew what the name referred to. A fair guess might have related to the incredible pulses of energy which had rocked Scotland and had deadly effects in other locations around the world, since it stood to reason that there had to be some kind of energy source located somewhere within the vault. Directly linked to this, the unsettlingly termed final release the group were seeking to stop with Rogue's assistance had universally been assumed to be related to a pulse-like release of stored energy. Fair though they might have been, all such guesses and assumptions were quickly proven incorrect when first Rogue's eyes, and then everyone else's, fell upon the contents of the source room. Twelve tall pods ran along each side of the wall, totaling twenty-four. None were empty. Inside each pod, surrounded by a gently bubbling bluish liquid, floated an unborn but highly developed architect fetus. Rogue moved silently between the pods, gazing into each and at the faces that stared back at him like the reflections of a funhouse mirror. The pulses were cleansing the earth for them, Dan stated in disbelief. They're the final release. And I can believe it's coming soon. Just look at them, they're as big as him. No one expressed any disagreement with Dan's conjecture, and no one could possibly deny his observation. If these growing architects were in a biological host, a mother, if that was an appropriate word for them, he would likely have opted for a fitting term like ready to pop, and for all he knew the pods could be about to do just that at any minute. But the growing architects weren't developing within a biological host, and that raised many questions in its own right. When Dan looked away from Rogue, he saw Cody staring at a circle in the middle of the floor. It was undoubtedly another transcript, judging by how intent the boy's gaze was and when Cody's focus returned to the world around him, his expression was not reflective of good news. Rogue, the boy called, catching the alien's attention with a combination of the sudden vocalization and the thought that went with it. You've been lied to. Although the others were already looking at Cody, they now stared all the more intently and hung on his every word. You can't remember where you were born because you weren't born anywhere, he continued. You came from a tube like this, fully grown and ready to follow orders. You were created and you were used. No one could believe what they were hearing as Cody focused fully on the alien he was talking to. Rogue, you were engineered, the boy said. Just like me. Part 7. Emergence The extinction of old forms is the almost inevitable consequence of the production of new forms. Charles Darwin G-15. Source Room, Subterranean Vault, Scotland When Rogue heard Cody's revelation that he had been engineered just like the boy, his focus on the developing architects within the Source Room's 24 pods shattered in an instant. Without wasting another second, he approached Cody and looked squarely at the same transcript the boy had digested moments earlier. Cody turned to the others while Rogue absorbed the information. There are warnings and instructions about how to handle these new architects, he explained. It says they should always be specialized to one cast, like the messengers were, and that they'll bond with the first individual they see after the release, and they'll view that individual as their leader. 
But worst of it all, it says they'll run on their default instincts if no one is here when the final release kicks in. But they should be shown one of the set programs of adjustment transcripts as soon as possible after being released. Those programs fill each of their minds with a predefined identity and memories based on the role they're being groomed to fill. Jesus, Dan sighed. That sounds like New Care Galen's old caste system dialed up to a million. So the transcripts are a propaganda tool the architects developed to use against themselves? Emma asked. Or tools the bosses developed to use against the workers, at least? Dan shook his head. Emma, I think the transcripts and the architects were engineered by someone else altogether. I think you could be right, Cody replied, uncertain and keen to get back to the main thing. But listen, there was one more part about how if one of them is left alone for too long after coming out, their attachment to their implanted identity and their loyalty to the leadership can fade. It doesn't use this word, but it basically says they can go rogue. With more than a little humility, Emma reflected that the group, and indeed vast swaths of humanity as a whole, had been so angry at the architects for so long. Dan's reality, experience-based hunch, had been right all along. Rogue didn't deserve to be lumped in with the higher-ups who delivered his orders any more than Leisha and Sacco should have been judged by the laws laid down by their architect overlords until quite recently. The sins of the father were not the sons to bear, she considered, and this axiom was somehow even more true when the individual in question had been genetically engineered with no father or family to speak of. What was becoming apparent now was that the architects, or at least a low-level individual like Rogue, fell between their bosses and the messengers they had been tasked with keeping an eye on. Just like the messengers had fallen between the architects and the humans, they had been tasked with keeping an eye on. Effectively, it was very much starting to look like the messengers had monitored humanity on behalf of the architects who subdelegated that work on behalf of someone else. And now that Rogue's talk of his immediate superiors following orders from the other side of a gate he had never crossed, not to mention that his own race seemed to have been exposed as a genetically engineered workforce, Emma was coming to accept the likelihood that Dan was right in suggesting that the architect's ultimate bosses might be of a different race altogether. This was all supposition, and not any that Rogue seemed like he was in a mood to get into, but some of the details Cody relayed pointed very much to that conclusion. At long last, after what Cody thought must have been long enough to take in all the information embedded within the transcript twice, Rogue looked up from the floor. He says he can pause the final release without stopping it, the boy said. These guys will stay here in the blue liquid stuff for as long as he wants, until he comes to terms with this and decides if he wants to bring more of his kind into the world and try to make them good, or whether subjecting any more sentient beings to the kind of impersonation of a life he had endured would be crueler than releasing them. So this is on hold for now? For absolutely sure? Emma asked. Cody nodded a few seconds later after receiving confirmation from Rogue. He's sure. Ask about the gate again now, she pushed. Tell him we didn't have anything to do with what they did to him, and we know he didn't have anything to do with what they did to us, but all of us together can maybe fix the gate so they can't hurt anyone else. Isn't that what he wants? Chris bish nick nick me Rogue alternatingly grunted and shrieked into the air. His voice was harsh and dissonant, really the furthest thing from Leisha's, and even more so Melly's. What's he saying? Emma asked. It didn't sound pleasant but then Rogue didn't exactly look pleasant, and yet had proven himself to be apologetic and even fairly considerate before this double bombshell of fetuses and transcripts had blunted his spirits. She had very much come to see that making many assumptions about Rogue was a fool's game. He says he's 100% he's with you, the boy said, relieving everyone greatly. Sir, shit, young creature, Rogue added. Cody smiled for the first time in a while. And he's ready when you are. G-14, Fraser Stedding, Thurso, Scotland After a rapid flash back to the surface, skipping the lift and emerging right at the cabin, the returning group were understandably inundated with questions from Geo and the drillers. 
If it wasn't for Cody and his equally understandable desire to stick with Chip after he saved him from a life of confinement and servitude at the prison in Wyoming, Chip would have stayed behind to fill the guys in on every last thing. But his role for now was keeping the boy calm despite all he'd been through. And that gave him a job on the station that felt at least as important as anyone else's. Piper gave the cabin-based trio a quick rundown on the main points, drawing gasps and reactions of anger in all the expected places, and promised they could be on the line while everyone on the station heard about it all. On the subject of the station, where Rogue had quite enthusiastically agreed to visit in a bid to reactivate the gate in defiance of his heartless engineers, who had used others of his kind to wreak havoc on the two planets it linked while they hid like cowards in the distant reaches of space. We can't call the station to let them know he's coming, Geo said, scratching his chin in thought. That seems like something they should know ahead of time, but the mothership blocks everything. Piper looked straight to Cody. Can you ask if he could move the mothership out into orbit and just come to the station on the small craft with us? Cody very quickly confirmed that this was both possible and acceptable. He'll take his small craft to the mothership, move that out to orbit, come back down in the small craft, then come up with us, because the station won't have a docking point for his small craft, will it? I doubt it, Dan said. But yeah, that all works. Rogue was gone a moment later, lacking any of the messenger's slowly ingrained habits of human politeness, such as handshakes and waves. This short but necessary delay to proceedings allowed some time for Geo and the drillers to get much more of the full story and as soon as Rogue's mothership was out of the sky, they were able to call the station and break the news before Rogue got back. You're bringing it here? Godfrey asked, speaking for everyone on Il Cercatore. After unspeakable gladness that everyone on the ground was all right after such a long architect-related signal blackout, every last one of their minds jumped straight to shock. Rogue is good. Piper replied, breaking firmly and decisively from her long-held view that Dan had overread some signs that made him think the same thing thirteen years earlier. She wasn't too big to admit she'd been wrong, and used these simple words as a callback to her initial conversation with Cody and Melly. He's different, but he's still good. With all of the McCarthys so firmly on board with the notion that Rogue could be trusted and could perhaps work with Alessandro on the crucial issue of the gate, Timo Fiori had no hesitation in making an executive decision to allow him on board the station. Oh, and Alessandro? Emma spoke into Gio's computer, spotting the Italian to the side of the camera shot. Yeah? he asked, looking up from some documents. Gather up all the data you have from those experiments you told me about, from the heartbeat probe? You know the ones I mean? On it? Alessandro nodded. Out of the cabin window and the corner of her eye, Emma saw Rogue returning into view overhead. Thanks, she said, smiling at the sight and getting ready to head back out for the short flight up. You never know what kinds of theories can come good in the right hands. G-13 Arrival Point, Space Station, Il Cercatore in all of the group's previous walks across Il Tricatore's awe-inspiring star tunnel, no one had ever had to duck their head. No one until Rogue, that was, whose size came into sharpest focus within enclosed spaces like this. Melly proved to be the full extent of the welcome committee who had gathered to meet him, with the others having accepted he should speak to her first and in most cases making no effort to disagree. For despite their trust in the McCarthy's view that Rogue was firmly on their side, a natural degree of trepidation still existed for many of the others, and it would be a while until Rogue's frightening aura faded in their minds. They also by now knew the gist of what had been discovered in the vault and were digesting their implications, which really could have been a full-time job capable of seeing four people through an entire year. Melly, for her part, in this case, trusted not only the judgment of the McCarthys, but also of young Cody. She warmly greeted him again and tried to welcome the architect with a handshake, but he appeared not to know what she was doing. Crucially, Melly was noticing nothing major emanating from the architect in the way of worrying thoughts or feelings. With Cody as an interpreter, she invited the rogue forward for a deeper, empathic scan, and when it was complete, 
She placed a hand on Rogues and tried to tell him that he was now free to be whoever he wanted and should take recent events as a positive catalyst to that end. Watching on as two aliens from very different races communicated silently with a cloned human as their intermediary, Dan McCarthy couldn't help but humorlessly wonder exactly when he had drifted off into these crazy dreams and when he could expect to wake up. In that reflective moment, he let himself wonder at which point in time he would wake up, since plenty of events that had felt unbelievable at the time had their place in the path that brought him here. He didn't linger on the thought for long, and as soon as Melly felt she had gotten as much as possible, at least without risking an overly intense and potentially upsetting first intensive session, it was Alessandro's turn. Dan encouraged Cody to bring Rogue through to the control deck, where he would meet the others for the first time, and they were all on the way within a few more seconds. Tell him he'll like Alessandro, Dan said, trying to set up positive expectations and associations, and that even if it takes a minute for him to loosen up, Alessandro is going to love what they can do together. G-12 Control Deck Space Station Il Tricatore when Rogue reached the control deck, standing in the absence of a chair that wouldn't hurt his lanky frame or leave his long skull unsupported, Alessandro wasn't alone in waiting to meet him. Most of the others still weren't there, namely Godfrey, Carrick, and Serena, and Timo's presence was anything but incidental. Before we get started, the philanthropic billionaire began, There's something I need to say. It's not up for negotiation, so please don't make me rehash the arguments I've already had with Alessandro. Emma and Dan, still flanking Rogue along with Piper, Chip, and Cody, shared an unsettled glance. If any kind of workable plan emerges, and we think the gate might be passable, Timo went on, I will be the one who tests it. I don't have long left, and if I go out like this... At least I go out swinging. I couldn't in good conscience sanction anyone else to make a test flight when I am already losing my health, so I really would thank you to respect my wishes on this. So be it, Emma said, and nothing else. So be it, Timo asked in reply, unable to hide his surprise at the curtness of her answer. She shrugged. We both know there are 50 scientists on this station who would volunteer in your place if they knew you were thinking about doing this, but if you're set on being this stubborn, I don't see any sense in wasting our time. More than Emma intended, Timo looked hurt. Look, she sighed, I know you don't want me to beg, so I'm doing the opposite, but for God's sake, Timo, you know we don't want this. I won't stand in your way if you literally say it's you or no one, but I hope you won't. Timo scratched his chin and turned to Alessandro, encouraging him to get to business. And get to business, Alessandro did. His efforts to mentally connect with Rogue by granting the tall alien an uplift patch proved fruitless for one reason or another, so the two communicated via the impressively tireless Cody. It got very technical very fast, and to Alessandro's disappointment, Rogue seemed to lose track around the same time as the humans who similarly lacked a firm grounding in theories relating to dimensional flux and the role he thought it might play in the functioning of the gate. He says the new Kerguelen gate was dimensional, Cody announced a few seconds after Alessandro stopped talking and to everyone's surprise. It sounded hopelessly complicated to their minds, but Alessandro clearly didn't think so, and the fact that Rogue knew anything about the nature of the gate was a potential boost to Alessandro's own understandings. The two sought common ground in terms of a handful of definitions, with Cody manfully bridging the language and telepathy gap, and within a few minutes the others didn't have to understand everything they were talking about to get a sense that real progress was being made. Timo caught Dan's eye and winked, expressing his confidence in a way that proved quite contagious. Before much longer, Alessandro looked away from Rogue to address everyone and no one in particular. I think the gate is still there, he announced, just deactivated in some way, but Rogue thinks he can reactivate it if we provide him with the course and flux data we've recorded on previous trips, 
Some of those variables are consistent with phenomena we've detected at small scale in experiments conducted remotely on board the Heartbeat Probe. I can try to talk you through it more if you want, but we both think this is a real shot. We both think we can effectively correct the problem caused by the pulse, which would almost involve punching our way through and restoring the passage. And if you're wrong? Emma asked. What are the scenarios if the gate isn't there or can't be reactivated? Well, there's a chance nothing happens, Alessandro shrugged. If the gate is more gone than I think, the craft would just fly through the space where it used to be. There's a chance the craft crashes into the gate and whoever is on board dies. And there's a chance they punch their way through and fix the gate, but arrive on New Kerguelen dead due to forces their bodies can't withstand. Last of all, for the bad chances, there's a chance something is wrong in the data and they get stuck in the wrong dimension. I wouldn't put too much stock in that one, but I'm being open here. And the good chance? Piper asked, ever the optimist. The craft gets through, everyone is safe, and your Aunt Terra is sitting here with us ten minutes later. We can't say no to that, Timo chimed in. And Emma, they know more than us. If they think there's a real chance of this working... Alessandro jumped back in. But that is still an if, albeit a likely one. Rogue has to look closely at our historic trip data and see if there are enough answers in there to satisfy his risk threshold... What we're basically doing here is using data and theories we have that he doesn't, and using some fairly incredible powers he has that we don't. It's a synergistic approach. Our strengths are complementary and can hopefully cover our opposite weak spots. Absolutely. Timo nodded. And yes, be thorough. Dot the I's and cross the T's by all means. But Emma, if the if comes to pass and they okay this... I want us to be ready, so please, just say yes. Well, I'm not saying no, she said, and it was more than enough for him. Alessandro's tone, particularly when talking about the synergistic collaboration between his scientists and Rogue, told her well-honed ear for true expectations that the Italians saw their final work as an albeit crucial formality. Barring a spanner in the works, she was almost certain that Timo would soon be making a risky flight into a questionably functional gate that could, a remote chance, but still a chance, helplessly strand him, not just on another planet, but in another dimension. But above and beyond the potential bad consequences Alessandro had openly rattled off, one potential consequence was so far-reaching and unforeseeable that it wasn't even considered, let alone discussed. If it came to pass, all bets would be off, and all games would be over. Tuesday G-11 Human Residential Zone, New Birchwood, New Kerguelen Relaxing for the moment in his family's comfortable but still unfamiliar lodgings, and only able to do so because he hadn't been looped in on Billy Kendrick's harrowing find in New Kerguelen's vault, Clark McCarthy was surprised to hear from Leisha that Kajil would be crossing the gate in a matter of minutes. Everyone else was asleep. Aiden, and the understandably exhausted Tara, still asleep, and baby Liam, back asleep. And Clark had a spur-of-the-moment decision to make as to whether to wake them. He decided on yes, thinking the worst he would get was a few minutes of complaining. If he didn't wake them for the potentially momentous event and they later wished he had, he would probably never live it down. They hadn't discussed this eventuality because the prospect of Kajil making his trip this early and at such short notice wasn't one that had even crossed their minds. But as Clark tiptoed into Tara's bedroom, he was just glad that he had been awake to hear Leisha's communication. Tiptoeing towards Tara in a desperate effort not to wake Liam, Clark stopped at the end of the bed and shook her foot through the covers. Mm, she mumbled. It's Kajil, Clark whispered. Mm, Tara, he tried again. Clark, just... Uh -uh. Having come this far, Clark tried one last time. Kajil is going to cross the gate right now, he explained. Are you sure you don't want to see? Tara huffed, then turned her head on the pillow. 
Her eyes stayed tightly closed. I really think you might want to. At last, her eyes partially opened. Maybe you should have the baby next time, then I can wake you the next morning and tell you how much you want to see some guy in a plane. Until then... Clark had to stifle a laugh. Tara was at an odd point of exhaustion where she was still her usual playful and quick-witted self, but where she didn't seem to remember how consequential Kajil's mission was, despite being excited about it when Leisha first mentioned it the previous afternoon. This time, however, he took no for an answer. Successfully making it out of the room without waking Liam, Clark then moved on to someone who he expected to be far more enthusiastic. Buddy, he whispered, gently shaking Aiden awake. Do you want to see a spaceship flying through the gate? Never one to let him down, Aiden was sitting bolt upright within a few seconds and standing at the door within a few more. Kajil's flight was no secret, but likewise hadn't been publicly announced, so no crowd was audible or visible in any direction when Clark and Aiden stepped outside. The day was young, with the unusual light that came with sunrise on a two-sun planet casting a unique picture even before a large spacecraft first came into sight. Because this side of the gate was well within New Kerguelen's atmosphere, unlike Earth's, which for one reason or another lay in an orbital position well beyond even Il Tricatore, the craft was flying low enough for a reasonable amount of detail to be visible to the naked eye. Clark felt his heart pounding as Kajil continued in his single-minded quest towards the gate and what lay beyond. In less than a minute he would reach it, and if past experience was anything to go by, he could then be expected to appear on Earth's side effectively instantly. In making the trip, Kajil hoped to not only find out exactly what had happened, but also to fully reactivate the gate by punching his way through a blockage. It was certainly an attractive theory, but Clark wasn't sure if this was because it actually made any intrinsic sense or just because he so badly wanted it to. There wasn't long left until they would all find out, and little Aiden took it upon himself to begin a countdown at ten and modify the pace to make sure he reached zero at the right time. He got on track by around four, and Clark then felt his already pounding heart rate quicken even more with each successive word. Three, Aiden said. Two, one, Clark joined in. There would have been time for a zero, as it turned out, but Kajil reached the gate after that one extra second and answered the main question immediately. In the sky above New Kerguelen, the huge spacecraft, piloted by the brilliant and brave analyst, collided with the gate instead of crossing it. And unlike the signals he had detected bouncing off it, Kajil's craft exploded on impact. The sound, arriving a few seconds after the terrible visual of flaming debris and a nose-diving craft, woke everyone across the entirety of New Birchwood. Come on, Clark said, pulling Aiden back inside. He had a bad feeling a very tough day was in store, with possible unrest over the botched mission and potentially disastrous consequences sure to emerge soon if the craft went down over a populated area. Searching for some solace, Clark was glad at least that neither Terra nor a huge crowd had witnessed the terrible accident. This was scant consolation in the face of a reality that not only had the messenger's first and only tangible action plan to restore the gate's function failed spectacularly, but that both Kajil's obvious death and the uncomfortable questions it raised about the gate more generally could cause problems in themselves, it all weighing heavily on Clark's shoulders. Was there someone inside that spaceship? Aiden asked as soon as they were back inside. I don't think so, Clark said, telling his oldest son an outright lie, white or not, for the first time he could remember. Tara, roused by the unmissable sound of the explosion, was standing by the bedroom. She was able to stand easily and had decided to now, despite not being supposed to, but Clark could understand. If he had heard a blast like that while his family was around but out of his sight, he would have crawled over glass to make sure they were okay. In picking up the brief conversation between Clark and Aiden, she had heard enough to know what happened. She put on a blank face rather than a brave one, but Aiden soon relayed the event as though it had been a cool scene in an action movie. A good messenger was dead, and an intriguing theory for how to force open the gate had died with him. 
Clark didn't have the heart nor the inclination to mention this to Aiden, and Tara clearly didn't either. She called Aiden over for a good morning kiss before shuffling back to bed, tired and sore from the previous day. Glancing down at Liam as she passed his cot, she briefly turned back to Clark. Still asleep even through all of that? She said quietly, forcing a smile. We got another good one. But through the smile, Clark saw that a great weight was weighing on Tara too. Neither of them knew what was coming as the day wore on, and with Tara's emotions as understandably fragile as they were, that was perhaps for the best. In the skies above New Kerguelen, a swing for the fences moment had brought death and dismay with no positives to show for it and on the other side of the same non-functional gate, a parallel attempt was about to take flight. G-10, Control Deck, Space Station, Il Tricatore. In the course of a highly detailed three-hour discussion between Alessandro and Rogue, others flitted in and out of the control deck to raise points or ask questions as they came to them. William Godfrey struck some as surprisingly cavalier about the plan, simply insisting that politics, force, and archaeology had all played their parts in getting the group this far, and that it was indeed science's turn to step up. The only firm point Godfrey made was that Rogue himself could not make the trip under any circumstances, in case anything was to go wrong, and Earth was thus left with twenty-four architects deep under the ground in Scotland, for however long a pause Rogue placed on their final development would last. After such a time, no one knew what would happen if the army of 24 genetically engineered alien beings reached the surface of a world that was supposed to have been cleansed of human life before their awakening. Rogue, having never planned to return to the planet of New Kerguelen, where his species was quite legitimately despised for their actions of the past, accepted Godfrey's reasoning without argument and took a moment to reassure the ICA chairman that the gestating architects would be dealt with soon and in a manner that caused no problems for Earth or its political leaders. During the course of the important planning, where every tiny measurement and the placement of every decimal point could be the difference between success and a level of failure no one wanted to consider, Timo performed a leisurely circuit of the station. He told everyone of his plan, thinking they all deserved the truth, and received a predictably mixed bag of responses. No great care was taken in keeping the plan secret, quite evidently. In essence, this was because, rightly or wrongly, the station was politically and physically untouchable when William Godfrey and the McCarthys were stationed there along with Timo, and with immediate action steps to follow, none of them felt much need to pay attention to what was happening. Godfrey did check in with the lesser-spotted UK Prime Minister Diane Logan a few times, chiefly for updates on Nick Mason's whereabouts and behavior. Confirmation that Mason was en route to exile in the South Pacific ensured he was out of the picture, which was a major positive. It did, however, also ensure that a political shit show like few anyone had ever seen was sure to spark up. In this world where nuance was taken as weakness, every serious candidate to replace Mason would come down hard either for or against alien cooperation, and those allied to either side would clash mercilessly with the other. There were few things the networks liked more than that kind of conflict, even when it was utterly toxic. It wasn't a welcome thought. In more welcome news, a prototype transition suit was sourced by the time Timo returned from his circuit. We've been working on this for a while, Alessandro proudly announced as he prepared to hand it over. It's a double-lined exploration suit, but the space between the layers is filled with the same charged air as the insulation in the larger craft's transition room. That's what makes passage across the gate safe for all humans, but sadly the craft is on New Kerguelen. This suit is our portable solution, and while it hasn't been tested in the wild, we do believe it will hold up. We wouldn't be sending you if we didn't, Timo. Timo gratefully took the suit, then smiled like a kid on Christmas morning when he unfolded it and saw the yellow and orange flame-like symbol of Fiori Frontieri. This plan is all about forcing the gate back open, not about getting me through it unscathed, he said. I'll consider this suit my lottery ticket. If it wins, 
Great. I get to see Billy again and Terra's family make it home. If the suit doesn't work but I do punch open the gate, Terra and Clark still get home. That's what counts. Alessandro didn't say anything to argue against this, although he didn't agree with either the k sera sera approach to an avoidable death or the suggestion that Timo's survival was somehow an afterthought. He knew safety was a priority, and it wasn't worth arguing with Timo over semantics. With the suit in hand, Timo then caught sight of Serena in an unexpected pose next to Carrick, with her hands clasped and eyes closed. I didn't know you were the praying type he said when she was finished. Serena smiled. Stumbling across the bird cam footage, being irresistibly pulled to Scarabray, landing on the prison as our first serious suggestion? Timo, if you don't think there's a plan to all this, I don't know what to tell you. You don't have to tell me, sweetheart, Timo replied in a warm tone, carrying his suit under his arm as he went to get ready for the imminent flight. I know where I'm going. G-9, Central Plaza, New Birchwood, New Kerguelen. Leisha's opening words to Clark had been simple, setting the tone clearly for what would follow. I wouldn't ask if this wasn't crucial, and I'm only here because it is. Coming very shortly after the news of Kajil's explosive demise, the fact that Leisha's arrival was accompanied by another teleportation flash only further illustrated the urgency of the situation. He had gone on to explain that a large crowd had gathered in Central Plaza without permission, focusing their attention on the Planetary Research Committee's office in the mistaken belief that whoever was running things in Billy's absence had authorized, or perhaps even ordered, the ill-fated flight. Billy remained at home, uncharacteristically shaken by the shock of what he had found in the vault. Word that Kajil had been on board got out immediately, and so far the only welcome words that came Clark's way were those revealing that the main sections of debris from the destroyed craft had landed well clear of anyone on the ground and also clear of any important empty buildings. New Kerguelen's citizens were angry, according to Leisha, that such an important and inherently risky mission had been okayed without any public discussion and apparently deliberately scheduled for a time when hardly any of them would see it in the flesh. Some of the more vocal were arguing this had to be because the planet's leadership was cognizant of the risks involved and tried to sneak the test flight under the radar, so to speak, by conducting it early in the morning. But most troublingly, the crowd had refused Leisha's requests to disperse and had openly heckled his second-in-command, Sacco. Our kind typically respect authority, Leisha had said, and even today we can see that they respect the hierarchy. In calling for dispersal, I was treated better than Sacco, who was in turn treated better than some low-ranking staff from the various departments based in Central Plaza. There is less deference to authority than normal, but the hierarchy remains. And Clark, in the eyes of our population, there is no one higher in that hierarchy than you and Terra. The request seemed clear before it was explicitly stated, but Clark waited just in case Leisha was getting at something else. I would very much appreciate it if you could say a few words to calm the crowd, Leisha said, confirming Clark's suspicion. The request was accepted as soon as it was uttered. Clark wouldn't have entertained the notion of bringing Terra and the children along, even if she had been in a physical state to help out, and if baby Liam hadn't been quite so young, so he chose to keep the nature of his trip quiet for now, to avoid bringing her any unnecessary stress. He mentioned a need to check everything was okay in Central Plaza, which wasn't a million miles from the reality of the situation, and only used any deceit by omission, because in this case it really was for Terra's own good. There was no legitimate cause for concern since the messengers did look up to him like some kind of visiting god, and also since he could clearly more than handle himself if any of the diminutive pacifists got too close or too rowdy for his liking. Tara was fine with all this and only asked if Clark could call one of the young nurses who lived very nearby and had helped out by watching Aiden a few times. 
The boy was never any trouble, but Tara only had two hands and two very shaky legs for the time being, so didn't want to be alone with him and the newborn if it was at all possible. Clark headed out with Leisha as soon as the nurse was there and as soon as he was sure Tara and the boys were okay. He kissed them all goodbye and received his next surprise from Leisha when he stepped out of the door and was immediately flash teleported to Central Plaza. A heads up would have been nice, Clark said before they even finished arriving, more than a little irritated by Leisha's unusual lack of consideration. When they did arrive, however, Clark could very well understand the alien's urgency and greatly appreciated that Leisha had been patient while he attended to his family business, only engaging the teleportation when the door to their hopefully temporary home was closed. Clark didn't even know where to look first. All around him was chaos. Messengers of all ages really were trying to force their way into the Planetary Research Committee, visibly angry and apparently seeking direct justice of a kind Clark would never have expected them to seek. He had sensed unease on many of their faces on the day they gathered to see off Billy's expedition, which seemed natural enough given the upheaval and uncertainty that came with the gate's sudden breakdown. All of that had fallen within the broad parameters of how he might expect the messengers to behave, however, whereas this was further beyond those parameters than he would ever have expected. Clark had never been comfortable with the idea of being seen as a leader on New Kerguelen and felt that if they were looking for a figurehead, they could just keep on looking. But if what they needed was someone to lay down the law and set some things straight, they were looking at him. Enough! He boomed from the elevated podium Leisha had flashed them to. Almost all of the messengers who had been looking the other way, towards the building their collective ire was directed towards for no good reason, turned in automatic reaction to the sound. I said enough, Clark repeated, bellowing the word in a voice Aiden would have described as sounding like something between a dinosaur and a whale. What would Billy say if he saw you tearing his building apart? What would Dan say if he knew you were doing this after all he's done for you? Hell, my wife, sitting in a house without me with our day-old baby next to her, because I have to come and deal with this. What would she say? Clark hadn't planned what he was going to say, and Leisha hadn't given any pointers, but there was an unspoken understanding between them that if Leisha had wanted diplomacy, he would have sooner gone to anyone else. The messengers were behaving in a manner New Kerguelen usually didn't see, a mob rather than a crowd, and it made sense that what was needed to snap them out of it was something they didn't usually hear. Firm, unflinching orders from someone who spoke like he meant every word and looked like he wouldn't be shy in enforcing them. The near-mythical esteem in which Clark had frequently been told he was held on New Kerguelen owed much to stories of the forcefulness of his presence and his finely balanced mix of power and restraint. For the messengers, the better part of two feet shorter than Clark, and probably each weighing about as much as his legs alone, it briefly crossed his mind that he might have looked to them something like the architect who visited New York looked to him, at least in terms of relative stature. Kajil is dead, he went on, talking bluntly and still shouting, but no one else got hurt. Kajil took a risk for the greater good, and he did it because he wanted to. No one is to blame for any of this because no one asked him to do it, and no one could have stopped him. While the latter part of this statement was more than a slight stretch of the truth, Clark was very much in the flow of thinking that a white lie that calmed things down wasn't something to get hung up on. And you know what I call what Kajil did today? I call it acting in the spirit of my brother Dan. I call it acting in spirit of Billy Kendrick and spirit of my wife Tara. But do you know who else that's the spirit of? It's the spirit of Leisha. It's the spirit of Sacco. Hell, it's the spirit of your old squadron. All of the names I just mentioned have crossed that gate at one time or another without having any idea what was waiting for them on the other side. The messengers were by now gathered around Clark looking up at him rather than crowding around the PRC building. I've never taken a blind leap like that, he went on, and none of you have ever done that. The bravest and the best among us take selfless risks so the rest of us can live safe and free. And this is how you're going to repay them? This is what Kajil's memory gets? An angry mob who don't even know what they're angry at? 
Bringing a sudden dose of extra surrealness, one of the messengers nearest Clark raised his arms and began to wave them from side to side. Within seconds, it spread throughout the crowd like applause. An organically building applause wouldn't have felt out of place after his heartfelt statement, but that didn't mean the bizarre alien equivalent, although anything but out of place in this bizarre society, would ever seem normal to Clark. He didn't have much else to say and could see that his words so far were having the desired effect, so he decided to close with one of the old techniques Emma always recommended, hit the crowd with appeals to different emotions to multiply the impact of successive points instead of merely adding to them. I told my son Aiden that New Kergolen was a nice place full of friendly aliens, Clark said, laying it on pretty thick. He doesn't know any of this has happened, and if you all go home right now, I'll make sure he doesn't find out. We're going back to Earth when we can, because Earth is our home just like New Kergolen is yours. But until that happens, I want you all to show me the real New Kergolen. Believe me, I've seen the best and worst of Earth, so I know today isn't what you're all about. This is a blip, and it's happening because of the stress we're all feeling about what happened to the gate. But we didn't do that, and you didn't do that. Pointing up to the gate, Clark didn't have to fake the scowl that came with his next words. The architects did that, he hissed. They set off the pulses that broke the gate, and don't forget that. You see... There's a time for anger and it's natural to feel it, but you have to direct it in the right place. That place isn't at each other, it's at the architects. With that, Clark turned to Leisha and nodded. You heard the man, Leisha said to the crowd, speaking in their native tongue as the words entered Clark's mind in a manner he could understand via the telepathy patch on the back of his neck. The messengers began shuffling away, many looking sheepish and with their proverbial tails tucked between their legs. One double flash and a few seconds later, Clark was back in the HRZ. He stood at the front door of his current residence while Leisha held his eyes. Was that okay? Clark asked, hoping it was the kind of thing Leisha had been looking for. The alien smiled and gave an extra slow version of his trademark nod, as though doing so for Clark's amusement. I knew I could count on you, my friend, he replied, before flashing himself away once more. But a flash of a very different kind was about to light up the sky over New Kergolen, packing Central Plaza with onlookers all over again. Whether they would be gathered in celebration or mourning was yet to be determined, but the moment of truth was much nearer than any of them could have imagined. G-8, Departure Point, Space Station Il Cercatore. After thorough consultations with the station's expert pilots as well as its physicists and doctors, not to mention a previously unlikely ally in the form of an architect named Rogue, a clear plan was in place. Everything relating to the gate itself and the programming of the craft was on Alessandro and Rogue, who had played their parts before departure and would continue to monitor and, if necessary, remotely control certain variables as Timo neared the gate. Crucially, when Timo did near the gate, he would be alone. He was more insistent of that than anyone, holding up his toxin-shortened lifespan as justification. Mitigation and contingency plans were in place in case something went wrong, but the most important thing was that when this kind of craft cleared a gate, it would automatically maintain altitude even without any input from a pilot. This was important since Timo was clearly no pilot, although he had been shown how to perform an emergency landing and felt assured that the craft really could more or less land itself once he initiated it. If Rogue's energy-based attempts to restore the gate's function worked, which, if they did, would be largely down to the theory laid out by Alessandro Bonucci, the group knew that one of the messengers on the other side could immediately flash themselves up to perform a landing if it seemed absolutely necessary. Alessandro wrote an explanatory message and placed it in the craft in case it made it through, but Timo didn't make it alive. And without telling the others, Emma gave Timo a note to hand Terra in case he made it to New Kergolen, but none of them could make it back. With the moment of truth ever approaching, 
Timo took a moment to stress that he was doing this because he wanted to, and not out of some desperate end-of-life search for a thrill or even a shortcut to the finish line. I've spent my life pushing for interplanetary cooperation, he said, addressing the small and familiar inner circle who had gathered to see him off. Sixteen years ago, it was me, Dan, Emma, and Billy against the world. Alessandro was in Italy, in my favorite observatory. We were together when that damned sphere was discovered in Argentina. This drew a mixture of laughter and amused groans. Enough time had passed for elements of Richard Walker's incredible hoax to seem funny in hindsight, and there was something cathartic about recognizing that. But with the closure of this gate, the cooperation we worked so hard to achieve has been snatched away. Terra, Clark, and Aiden are stranded too, of course, and I can't pretend that isn't driving me to do this. But even if they weren't, this would be an emergency situation worthy of great risks in search of a remedy. If the gate is somehow weakened or altered but not gone, each passing hour may make the odds grow further against us. We don't know. But while we can't always know, we can always act. This is going to work, Piper said. Don't get all sad on us, Timo. You'll be back here before you know it, and then we'll keep looking for an antidote. You just said we can always act, so we can keep looking. There is always hope. Timo smiled at the girl, a child he'd come to know and love, if not quite as his own, then certainly more closely than any other he'd had the good fortune of knowing. With people like Piper McCarthy in the world, he knew there was always hope. Timo insisted upon brevity and levity, repeating the mantra that short trips didn't need long goodbyes, so his pre-departure process didn't take long. With only Alessandro hanging back to help Timo into the craft when the others left on cue, Emma lingered slightly near the back of the pack and then snuck away to deliver some parting words she could never have forgiven herself for not sharing if things didn't go to plan. They really did go back a long way, and had shared good times and bad. She often remembered back to the year before she became a mother, when she and Timo were badly injured in the Fiori Frontieri terrorist bombing in Colorado Springs, and most pertinently, she remembered that when Timo was slowly recovering in hospital, having taken the brunt of it, his main concern was always to ask how she was doing. She remembered even further back than that, when he extended an invitation to her as well as Dan and Clark to shelter at his house in Italy, even when she was a PR hawk and a very different person to the one standing before him now. But when Emma considered the risk Timo was about to take, what hurt most was the thought of him dying alone. She had long known from her old line of work that money truly could be a curse in ways most people didn't understand, and that curse was the reason a man as kind as Timo had lived alone for most of his life, too. I just want to say thank you for everything you've ever done for us, Timo, she choked out. You're coming back, but I want you to know we wouldn't be anywhere without your support over so many years, especially when times were tough and the Fairweather friends dried up. You didn't. You were always... To protect his own facade of measured calmness rather than out of rudeness, Timo raised a finger and gently placed it against Emma's lips to cut off her dangerously sentimental goodbye. Emma, he said, a slow smile rising. Just say game face. This caught her completely off guard, drawing a brief but uncontrolled burst of laughter of a kind anyone rarely heard from her. Game face, Timo, she said, holding his eyes and nodding slowly. Game face. Part 8. Hail Mary. I shall either find a way or make one. Hannibal. G-7. Threshold. High Earth Orbit. Alone in an alien craft he had never piloted, airtight in a spacesuit he had never worn, and making a beeline for a gate that still couldn't be detected by any of the instrumentation that surrounded him, Timo Fiori had never faced a moment like this one. The Italian had no regrets, knowing full well Clark and Terra would have done the same for him, 
and knowing, likewise, that only success would re-establish cooperation between two planets that the McCarthys and many others, himself included, had worked tirelessly to bring together. Now that a horrific pulse had severed the link between worlds, it was on Timo to bring that connection back. But as he grew nearer and nearer to the spot where the craft had been told to expect the gate and still nothing was picked up, Timo, for the first time, had significant doubts about the plan's likelihood of success. He had made peace with that very quickly, aided by his recent need to make peace in general following the discovery of an incurable toxin coursing through his veins, and tried to stay present in the moment. Timo Fiori did not regret stepping onto the spacecraft and heading for the gate, but he was a big enough man to admit that he was terrified of what would come when he reached it. G-6, Human Residential Zone, New Birchwood, New Kerguelen. Did you hear that? Tara asked, turning towards Clark from the couch where baby Liam was feeding. Clark was already on his feet, reacting to a sound that he didn't think anyone on New Kerguelen could have missed. Most of the human scientists who lived in the nearby houses were either outside when Clark got there or appeared at the doorsteps soon afterwards all keen to find out what the hell had made that infernal racket. Before anyone called it out, Clark glanced up towards the gate that had killed Kajil so recently and so brutally, and the sight he saw there made him doubt his eyes. Craft, he yelled, so stunned he could only get out that one word. Coming in. Cheers and hollers erupted all around, along with more than a few disbelieving gasps from those who had started to give up hope and begin trying to reconcile themselves with a future cut off from their friends and families on Earth. Clark knew everyone on the station and seats of power at the ICA far too well to have ever given up on them, though, and the smile on his face came from a swirling mix of gratitude for their work and pride to call them his friends. Just as Clark turned back to go inside and fetch Aiden so he could see the big moment occurring above their heads, a blinding flash filled the air. Leisha wore an expression of urgency and blurted out two sentences to match. The pilots aren't responding to our radio calls. Clark, I don't know who's flying that thing or where it's going. Take me, Clark said, needing to say no more. Another rapid flash later, he and Leisha were standing in the craft. Leisha quickly reported that there was no one in the control deck, which didn't make sense to him from any angle. From Clark's angle of vision, however, someone was visible. He couldn't tell who it was, partly because they were wearing a full suit which hid their body shape, and partly because they were lying face down on the floor. Leisha was first to reach the fallen pilot, and when he lifted the head to see the face, it looked for all the world like his heart broke in two when he saw who it was. I'll take us in for a safe landing, the alien said, desolate as he stood up and walked to the control deck. As Clark inched towards the pilot, he paused to consider the worst thing he could see. He naturally felt nothing but sorrow that anyone who had willingly risked their life to get the gate open now looked to have paid the ultimate price, but his mind equally naturally jumped to considering who he didn't want to see most of all. And as soon as Clark saw who it was, he dearly wished he hadn't looked. If he was thinking straight, he would have known that was a wasted wish, which could do no good to bring them back, but thinking straight with an image like this burned into his retinas was hardly a reasonable thing to expect. For when Clark moved into a position to identify the brave traveler, he saw the closed eyes and lifeless body of one of his dearest friends, Timo Fiore. G-5, Control Deck, Space Station Il Tricatori. Never before had anyone on the station, or for their money anyone in the world, been so excited to hear the crackling of a radio than Alessandro Bonucci was when he first picked it up. Signal from New Kerguelen, he yelled. Everyone within earshot hurried over, which was a fair number of people, as well as two very different aliens, thanks to the volume at which Alessandro had announced it. The next voice any of them heard was Leisha, and this was when the reality really sank in. They had done it. 
Almost everyone shot to their feet and rejoiced immediately, with the two noticeable exceptions of Piper and Melly, the only two members of the group who knew what Leisha had said. The looks on their faces didn't spell good news, but by the time Alessandro reached to power up the translator, that all changed. A second voice entered the fray at that point, not Leisha's, but Clark's. Leisha, the elderly McCarthy brother boomed. He blinked. He's alive. Quick, flash him to the infirmary and send someone else up to help me land this thing. General sounds of commotion then played through Alessandro's speakers and Leisha took care of Timo on the other side of the gate, leaving Clark alone. Are we on? Dan asked Alessandro. The Italian replied by moving a slider on his desk all the way up and giving a thumbs up when it was done. Clark, Dan said loudly. Can you hear me? Dan, Clark replied. Oh, oh my God, Dan, is everyone okay? What happened? We're fine, Emma cut in. Piper stopped the last pulse just in time, but it knocked the gate out. Alessandro and... Uh, Alessandro managed to fix the gate, but listen, how's Tara? They're both doing great, Clark replied, beaming a proud smile without a care in the world. There was no one there to see it. She had the baby, Liam McCarthy. Emma leaned all the way back in her chair and began to cry tears of sheer relief. Clark, this is Alessandro, the Italian said. I need you to do three things for me, okay? Clark blew air from his lips. Three hundred for you, buddy. Whatever you did to fix the gate, I can never thank you enough. Pass all of this on to Leisha and Kajil, okay? Before I'm comfortable with you guys coming back, I need to see a human and a messenger passing safely through the gate in the big craft. Alessandro went on, wasting no time whatsoever. I need them to be wearing full monitoring equipment, too. Kajil will be able to help you source that stuff. Clark said nothing, choosing to leave out Kajil's death, just as Alessandro had opted to leave out the news about Rogue. There would be time for talking and explaining later. What counted now was keeping things as simple as possible until they were all once again safe and in the same place. Alessandro had one more instruction. And tell everyone it's urgent. We fixed the gate, but it might not be forever, so I don't want any unnecessary delays. And the sooner I see a test flight in the mothership, the sooner I send it back to pick you guys up. Stay safe, Clark. We'll have you home soon. See you all soon. Clark replied. Man, I've never been so happy to say that. Charming, Emma laughed. For the first time in far too long, the air was light. G-4, Infirmary, New Birchwood, New Kerguelen. When Clark reached the hospital a little while after Timo, he had some important information for the doctors. Timo was poisoned on Earth a few months ago, he whispered. He's known for a while, he'll probably detect the toxin or maybe its other effects, but if he wants to come home, nothing you find because of that should stop him, okay? He flew here in the small craft knowing his body was weak, so it's his call. We're not totally sure how long the gate is going to stay open. He's been flitting in and out of consciousness, the doctor replied. We don't have major concerns about his immediate condition, but he's not going anywhere today if you're talking about that kind of time frame. Clark tried not to get too frustrated. The doctor was doing his job and was probably right. And on top of that, an hour ago, Clark and Leisha had thought for sure that Timo was dead. Whenever he might get home, it was a bonus compared to the situation they'd been looking at in the craft. Hey, Clark. A telepathic voice addressed him from the bed next to Timo. Nice to meet you. Clark turned to the messenger who had said it. I know you, he smiled. Boone, right? Billy's buddy? Boone positively beamed with pride that Clark McCarthy knew who he was, especially since they hadn't been formally introduced in Clark's relatively short time on the planet. What are you in for? Clark asked. He then could have sworn he saw Boone roll his eyes in a way only a messenger who spent a lot of time with old Billy was likely to pick up. That buddy of mine cut off my toe by jamming it under a door. Careful as never. Clark grimaced, able to see a slightly lighthearted side to the story since Boone had been chuckling as he shared it. Clark had only seen Billy once since the incident in the vault when Billy had stumbled upon a harrowing find and Leisha had later reported that he was seriously shaken up. Billy had been badly shaken up and for the good of his own health was still at home resting up and decompressing. Uh, is Clark...
Clark? A familiar voice, albeit weaker than usual, forced out. The sight of Timo's eyes opening fully and staying that way warmed Clark's heart like few things he had ever seen. You're a maniac, Clark said to him, lovingly patting his arm. I read the note in the craft. You didn't even know if the gate was open and you flew into it. You would have done the same for me, Timo replied, never surer of anything in his life. But listen, go home today. Leave without me. I'll come when I can. And please don't argue, Clark. I didn't do this not to get your family home safely. Clark held Timo's eyes. Thank you, my friend. I'll make sure you get home, and then I'll make damn sure Mason pays for what he did to you. Boy, oh boy, Timo said, a knowing smile filling his face. Do you have a lot to catch up on? G-3 Control Deck, Space Station, Il Cercatori when word got out that Timo Fiori had led from the front in riskily punching a hole in the gate to restore links between Earth and New Kerguelen, there was no shortage of volunteers to make the requested return test flight in one of the messenger's much larger motherships. As requested, the crew consisted of one individual from each species. Leisha vetoed a few individuals, chiefly those in high-ranking or critically important roles, such as Dr. Cardulo in the infirmary. The messenger making the trip was a young pilot, while the human was a communications engineer, which Leisha figured would be a useful combination. A key difference between this test flight and Timo's was that those on the arrival end of the gate were expecting visitors and had the benefit of a full comms link with the pilot. Everyone in the station thus shared an excited countdown with the crew, culminating in the mothership soaring through the gate without incident, right on cue. He really did it. William Godfrey mused with a warm smile on his face. He really bloody did it. Everyone was smiling. Alessandro wanted to make sure he saw the full data from the traveler's monitoring kits, but it really was starting to look like Terra and her family would be home soon and everything would be rosy. Sadly, an as yet undetected event elsewhere suggested that only half of this expectation might come to pass. G-2, Infirmary, New Birchwood, New Kerguelen. With news in from the station that the mothership's test flight had arrived safely and its crew's health metrics from the moment of passage were all clear, Tara McCarthy and her newly expanded family decided to make the short walk to the New Kerguelen's infirmary. They would be going home on the next flight out, just as soon as the mothership that would carry them had returned. Tara, steady on her feet and feeling far more comfortable than she had in the morning, asked some very specific questions about the safety of a flight for a newborn baby. Fortunately, the experts on both sides of the gate were unanimous in their agreement that there was nothing to worry about on that front. Tara's gut instinct was to get home as soon as she could, not only because she missed the rest of her family and friends, but more consequentially, because there was no guarantee the fix Timo and Alessandro had concocted to repair the gate would hold forever or even for very long. There was also a sense in Tara's heart that her departure would only be a goodbye for now to New Kerguelen, which had always been a special place for her, but was now also the birthplace of her second child. Many of the natives had come to attribute a very different and almost religious significance to that quirk of circumstances, but there was certainly never any decision to be made about which planet Liam would call home. Tara's trip to the hospital came for the simple reason of wanting to take her chance to thank Timo for the incredible risk he'd taken. Aiden recognized the Italian from TV, despite never having met him in person, while it clearly meant the world to Timo to see little Liam. We were so worried, Timo said. She'll play it down, but Emma was tearing her hair out. We thought Earth might have been destroyed, and that was why no one was sending any signals, Terra replied. I guess it just goes to show that there's no sense in assuming the worst. You'll either be worried and then upset, or worried and then relieved. There's worry either way. But if you're optimistic, you're guaranteed some positivity instead of being guaranteed some negativity. It's just math, Timo. Or science. Or whatever. 
The Italian smiled easily and warmly. He was feeling much better, but had been more than a little short of breath on a few occasions, and for that reason wasn't going to try to force an early discharge. His faith in the gate was strong on the back of earlier discussions with Alessandro, but a big part of Timo felt like exploring this planet to which he had never before ventured was as good a way as any to see out some of his final days. Clark shook Timo's hand as firmly as he deserved before the time came for the flight back to Earth just a short while after the pilot and communications officer were back in Central Plaza. Aiden asked if he could take a telepathy patch home, but the only unanswered question was whether Tara or Clark had said no first. Predictably, a supportive and somewhat sad crowd had gathered in Central Plaza to see off their first couple. Leisha stood next to them and whispered that if it hadn't been for Kajil's tragic and untimely hero's death, Leisha would have made the trip alongside them. Such was his faith in the gate. But with that upsetting upheaval coming after some regrettable recent instances of crowd-related incidents, which sometimes flirted close to the line of mob-related incidents, being a better term, it didn't seem like the wisest of times for Leisha to be leaving his whole world behind. The McCarthys said their warm goodbyes to their hosts, who, despite a challenging situation, had kept them all safe and happy, and had even delivered a healthy baby without any major difficulties. From the front of the crowd, Tara waved her hand like a visiting dignitary and held up her baby like a cartoon lion. She then boarded the craft and felt the reality sink in that she really would soon be introducing the baby to Emma and Piper. At long last, after so much stress and uncertainty, there was much to look forward to. G-1. Control Deck, Space Station, Il Cercatori. Ahead of Terra and Clark's overdue return from New Kerguelen, it was decided that no one should be present to greet them who wasn't there to see them off. In practice, this meant they wouldn't be introduced to Rogue or Cody immediately, since the presence of both would require a great deal of potentially upsetting explanation at a time when all that counted was being reunited. Rogue and Cody the oddest of fast friends due to Cody's necessary role in helping the architect communicate with the humans without having to insert a painful cable into their necks, fully understood. Even Godfrey and Chip opted to take a step back along with Serena and Carrick, leaving only the returning couple's immediate family. Piper stood patiently with Dan and Emma at the far end of the star tunnel, but as soon as she saw them coming, she couldn't wait anymore and sprinted ahead. Aiden met her halfway, wrapping his arms around her and telling her that his brother had been born on a different planet. The way Aiden said this dripped with amusement and pride, suggesting it was a line he was going to be using for a long time to come. With New Kerguelen sorely lacking in baby accessories, little Liam was in his father's arms as he moved across the remarkable star tunnel. Tara was now able to walk relatively short distances like this freely, if not entirely painlessly, but her joy at seeing Emma, Dan, and Piper again was so great that she could have been walking on nails and hardly noticed the difference. I thought you were dead, Tara said, starting to cry as soon as she wrapped her arms around Emma. I really didn't know what to think, Emma replied, moving back after a few seconds. And look at you. You did it. Dan and Clark were face to face, slightly further down the walkway, with Liam looking decidedly happy at the meeting. Dan gave Clark a pat on the shoulder, naturally reluctant to go for a hug with the baby where he was. You did great, man, he said. I can't even imagine. Don't, Clark chuckled dryly. So what's been happening here? Timo was pretty tight-lipped about some of it. How long you got? Dan asked. This brought a much fuller laugh from Clark. But seriously... Is everything cool? Dan inhaled slowly. There's just... There's a lot, man. Nothing to worry about, but a lot to think about. Let's just have today, okay? Fair enough. Clark replied in a tone that suggested he wasn't going to run away and ask someone else. He seemed to agree with Dan's reasoning. Emma then snuck in at Clark's shoulder for her first real peek at Liam, which set off her own waterworks for the first time. I didn't know if I was ever going to get to meet you, 
she said, nuzzling his cheek. It was so much to process, and as Emma considered that point, she felt incredibly relieved that they had decided to hold off on the two introductions for another day. Realizing Piper and Aiden had fallen further behind to gaze down at Earth from the tunnel, Clark then turned around and encouraged them along. Come on, you two, he yelled. We're gonna say hi to Godfrey and say thanks to Alessandro. Home, sweet home, Tara smiled, speaking as the majesty of Earth came into view again through a perfectly positioned round window. Emma put her arm around her little sister's shoulder, even prouder of her than she'd ever been before, and echoed the sentiment. Home, sweet home. G-0, Fraser Stedding, Thurso, Scotland. With the incident at a prison in Wyoming currently dominating national headlines and Nick Mason's cowardly decision to abscond to the South Pacific confirmed but not yet publicly known, William Godfrey knew it was only a matter of time before things really blew up. He had to address the world, but wanted to do so more personally than a press release would allow, so, after catching up with the McCarthys, he decided that a quick trip to Thurso was in order. The cabin and drill shaft presented a perfect backdrop for what turned out to be one of the most conciliatory speeches Godfrey had delivered in many years. He lamented the need for his recent action and couldn't avoid pinning a great deal of blame on Mason and his deliberately provocative behavior. Time and again, events have reminded us of the fragility of our planet and our societies, Godfrey said. But time and time again, we seem to have forgotten those reminders. And so it was that just days after life as we know it was almost ended in an instant, by a pulse originating right here in the ground under my feet, I found myself in confrontation with a populist politician who has rallied against interspecies cooperation for several years, all the while being in bed with corporations who have secretly and illegally engaged in uplift-related operations for his benefit. I talk, of course, of Nick Mason. But he is the symptom rather than the disease. Our world is a safer place than it was twenty-four hours ago. But when it is responsible to do so, I will soon share news of other recent discoveries which may expand our knowledge and understanding in wholly positive ways. The gate between Earth and New Kerguelen has been restored, thanks to a perfect combination of human ingenuity and interspecies cooperation. That is what will carry us into a future as bright as the stars we seek to explore. I can also confirm that the vault has been fully mapped and fully swept, and we are certain there will be no further pulses. The precise details of what was found will be revealed in due course, but as you can see, I am no longer concerned for our planet's safety. Lastly, I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone at the National Museum of Brazil and the British Museum for their prompt assistance in locating and providing the artifacts we put out an appeal for. There was a third artifact, but the name of the convicted tax fraudster who provided that one is escaping me right now. In any case, if he's watching, I'm sure he knows who he is, even if no one else does. It was undeniably childish to throw in the jab at his old personal foe, Arthur Brent, but Godfrey considered it harmless and certainly well-deserved. Brent had certainly thrown enough Godfrey's way when he roped Geo into a five-minute press conference, and perhaps this would teach him a lesson. We are back in connection with our great friends from New Kerguelen, and the pulse-related threat beneath our feet has been dealt with, Godfrey said, speaking in a positive tone, if not quite smiling. True peace between nations and planets alike shouldn't stay on the horizon, my friends. Right now, peace is here if we want it. Thank you all for listening. William Godfrey fully believed he was speaking the truth when his sign-off promised peace, but if he had been making this announcement just fifteen minutes later, it would have been a very different one. Because high above Thurso, on the control deck of Il Cercatori, the true impact of what they'd done in forcing open the gate was about to become known. 
If Alessandro Bonucci's initial observations were correct, what lay ahead for an unlikely but powerful band of allies, as well as both of the inhabited planets they sought to protect, could be nothing less than a final fight for survival against a threat like none they had ever imagined. William Godfrey continued to defy the odds by remaining at the helm of the ICA after countless incidents that would have taken lesser men down. But even he would have his work cut out against what was relentlessly heading Earth's way. Impact. Control Deck. Space Station Il Cercatore. On a day when some pieces of news and even some remarkable new visitors to the station had been kept from Terra's family in the name of a gentle return to her loved ones, Alessandro Bonucci uncharacteristically burst into the control deck while they were all lounging around. They had done little else, other than when Terra walked to the medical center for some neck scans to put her mind at ease. After reassuring her that the temporary cellular changes in her neck were nothing to worry about, and consistent with what the others had experienced, the station's doctor also called Dr. Cardulo on New Care Galen to reassure him, as Cardulo had openly expected, that better scanning equipment had brought clearer results. Since then, it had been lounge, lounge, lounge. Carrick and Serena were there too, along with a relaxed-looking William Godfrey, who had moved around about as much as the soundly sleeping Liam since getting back from his televised address in Thurso. Some of the things he'd talked about came up in conversation, sparking Clark's curiosity, but the topics of Cody, Rogue, and the contents of the 24 pods in the vault's final room remained what Emma termed tomorrow topics. But by the time tomorrow came, and indeed by the time Alessandro stopped talking, one new topic would come to dominate for a lot longer than that. We lost track of the heartbeat probe when Timo went through the gate, Alessandro announced. It took a while for us to notice that, because the distance means it takes time for the data to reach us, but the timestamps are perfectly aligned. Hmm, some kind of interference from the gate being reactivated? Godfrey mused. Alessandro gulped. It's on the other side of the sun. No one said anything, so far worried more by Alessandro's unusually terse tone than the words he had spoken in it. The good news is that Heartbeat is back online and transmitting data, the Italian went on, but I don't know how to dress this up, so I will tell you straight. The probe went offline because it briefly fell into the extreme edge of something's shadow, something which appeared from nowhere at the instant Timo passed through the gate. Through another gate, maybe? Piper suggested. Punching a hole in one brought another old one back, too? I don't know what kind of gate it would need to be for this to get through. Alessandro sighed as he sat down and prompted the others to gather around his computer. He then pulled up an image, with a timestamp of six minutes before Timo passed through the gate. After this, he pulled up images captured two minutes and then four minutes before the passage. Everything looked exactly the same with a striking heavenly body prominently featured that none of them could confidently identify. And then we have this, Alessandro said, showing a completely black image taken zero minutes from the time of Timo's passage. The probe wasn't transmitting while it was in this shadow, but it did keep taking its photos at two-minute intervals. Alessandro said nothing else letting the images do the talking as he held down the arrow key to move through them like the pages of a flipbook. A picture became clear of a truly colossal, non-natural object, but it was only once the probe responded to its first post-gate instruction, again delayed by the distance, that what the group was looking at became clear. It's a spacecraft, Alessandro said. We know how big it is, we know the path it's on, and we know how long it'll take to get here. Here? Dan asked. The Italian nodded. It just can't be as big as it looks in the last picture, Godfrey chimed in. If it is, it would have to be moving at a speed. Six weeks, Alessandro said, sharing the second of the three crucial data points he mentioned. So it's a craft, it's coming to Earth, 
and it'll be here in six weeks. The ICA chairman followed up. But how big? Alessandro looked directly into his eyes. Chairman Godfrey, this spacecraft is considerably larger than our moon. And after what we just learned about the architects being engineered and manipulated by someone else, well, I think I know who's inside it. Thank you for listening to Not Alone, Hidden Wonder. Written by Craig A. Falconer. Narrated by James Patrick Cronin, a member of SAG-AFTRA. Produced by Blue Nose Audio. Production coordination by Candace Lawrence. Post-production by Michael Straza. Copyright 2021, Craig A. Falconer. All rights reserved.